in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In the year of our Lord, 1976, and I use the appellation with some sadness, there were 18,780 murders committed in the United States. These are the latest figures from the FBI. And the only pleasant thing about them is the fact that the rate decreased 8.3% from the previous year. A trend I fervently hope will continue. But where murder seems the only way out, there is always a story. This is one of them. Our mystery drama, A Better Mousetrap was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars John Beale. While on the subject of statistics, here's one for you. 1970 was the last year most metropolises in the U.S. enjoyed a population advance. Ever since then, the amount of people in the cities has been declining. Where have they gone? Mostly to the suburbs. Here's Ralph Lester, a typical suburbanite. He moved out of New York before 1970. At the time, it seemed a great idea. A garden, a house, a family, good schools. How has it worked out for him? Let me say only that Ralph Lester is tired, hates the train ride has had at least one too many drinks, and is worried about, among other things, finances. He doesn't know yet how worried he ought to be. Lucy, the laundry boy is home. For crying out loud. Where are you? Lucy? Where is she? Hey, Lucy, I'm home. Where are you? I'm upstairs, Ralph. Oh, okay. What are you doing? I'm packing. Huh? Never mind. I'll be right down. No, no, that's all right. I'm up here already. How about a drink if I rush them? What time is dinner? I haven't any idea. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Dinner is your problem, Ralph. Oh, you mean you've eaten already or something? No, I haven't. Did I forget? Are we going out? I'm eating out, yes. I don't know about you. Well, if you're going out, you mean you didn't leave me something? I'm supposed to scrounge it up by myself? Why not? I think it might make good practice. Good practice for what? For the future. When I'm not here. When you're not here? That's right, Ralph. I'm leaving you. Le leaving me? What for? It isn't so much what for as why. Yes, I, I think that's the correct question. All right, then why? Two things. Money and Gloria. Gloria? Your uh, secretary. That's the politest term I can think of. Oh, you can't think that there's anything between me and Gloria. I don't you... think I know. Oh, how do you know? I'm ashamed to say it, but I hired a man to follow you. Oh, brother, I think I better get that drink. I wouldn't. Not quite yet. You'll need a clear head for the other discussion. What discussion? Money, Ralph. My money. I hope you still have it, because I want it. And if you don't have it, I'll make you account for every penny, no matter what court I drag you through. Oh, now, wait a minute, Lucy. Wait a minute. I'm really bushed tonight. It was a tough day. Just give me a chance to pull myself together so I can... So you can what? Make up some new lies? Now, just hold up. I don't know what kind of lies people have been telling you. And if that dried up middle-aged old witch next door... Don't you who... take off on Ellie Pratt. She's the best friend I have in this stupid town. Maybe the only one. The whole thing is going to be brought out in the open. Unless you can convince me in black and white that you haven't been cheating on me two ways. Robbing me blind and carrying on with another woman. Oh, Lucy, I swear I don't know what you're talking don't about. Don't lie to me anymore. You talked me into giving you $300,000 worth of bearer bonds to turn into cash. Sure, it's a time to stay liquid. The minute I decide the market's right, we can jump in and make we? a joint... It's my money. You know what I mean. No, Ralph, I don't. 
Because, you see, I've been checking into something else about all the money Father left me. And that you were holding, building into a fortune. What do you mean? I got Father's old lawyer to dig into just what securities I hold. The ones you were supposed to have bought for me. What happened to those securities, Ralph? Where are they? You know the firm is holding them for you in your account. Mr. Stearns couldn't find any record of them. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Lucy. The old man is senile. He I have all the proof and the documentation. It may be too late to get my money back. But I'm going to fix it so you get punished for stealing it. And I'm not going to let you have a chance to squander any of it on a cheap little tart you pretend is your secretary. Look, 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 look you don't understand. It's... It, it's been a difficult period, Lucy. I've, I've had to try to cover short sales and option deals, and, and, and if there was any question now, I could be ruined, Lucy. I could be sent to jail. Oh, I know, Ralph. That's just where I'd like to send you. Lucy, please. Listen, you don't know what a spot I'm in right at the moment. You mean you embezzled other people's funds, too? Well, it isn't embezzling. You don't understand business and the, and the market. It's just that sometimes you have to to, to 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 manipulate. And now, just at the moment, just while the market turns, I'm in such terrible shape it would be the end for me. But I, I promise you... I wouldn't you... believe you whatever you told me. And I'm going to tell you, no matter what it costs me, I'm going to call the turn. I'm going to shout it out. Oh, no, you're not. Yes, just watch me. Don't think... <laughs> Let, let go of me. What are you doing? I'm trying to shut your mouth if you... Ralph, well, be, be careful. You're, you're choking Lucy, me. are you going to ride along with me until I get out I'll of... I'll see you in hell first. I'm trying to... Ralph, you're trying to... No, it's not until you promise... Uh, uh, are you going to promise to button up? Lucy, if you think for one moment that I'm going to let you nail me to the wall, you get another guess coming. After all I've put up with, an older woman mewling and scolding just because you thought you had the whip hand of money, just because you... <laughs> Lucy. Lucy, I'm sorry. I, I didn't... Oh, good Lord. Lucy. Lucy. Oh, no. No, no, she, she can't be... She's dead. Oh. What am I going to do now? Call Gloria. Here. Yeah. I got to call Gloria. Hello? Uh, Gloria? Yeah, Ralphie. Hey, you sound kind of funny. What is it? She's. She's dead. Who? My wife, Lucy. Gee, that's terrible. Well, honey, I'm sorry, you know, but... Honey bun, it solves a lot of trouble for us, doesn't it? No, not a bit. Only makes it worse. What do you mean? Oh, Gloria, she didn't just up and die for herself to make it convenient for us. Well, then what? I... I killed her. You... You what? I didn't mean to. It was an accident. I mean, she found out about us, and I lost my head, and I... I... You, you murdered her? But she was threatening to scream out about us, and I wanted to keep her quiet. All I did was put my hands on her throat, and before I knew it... Well, I don't want to hear any more. I'm getting out of it. I can't. Oh, no, you're in it up to your neck. You, huh? me, how we've been kiting accounts. You can't involve me in that. Can you? Ralphie, what are we going to do? Well, I... I, I got a notion, a real crazy notion. It's the only way I can see out of it. Yeah? What is it? We'll have to kidnap her. How do you kidnap someone who's already dead? I don't mean for real glory. I mean pretend to. No one else knows she's dead yet. You, oh, Lucy. Oh, oh, Where are you, darling? Peach stick. What is it? Ralph? That silly old Snoop L.A. Pratt from next door. I gotta hang up. Nobody home? Oh, she's in the house for the love of Mike. She's on her way upstairs. I'll, I'll, I'll call you back. You! Gloria, the woman is in the house. I'll call you right back. I know you're there. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Oh, brother. Uh, that you, Ellie? In the flesh, not a picture. Can I come up? No, no, no. I'll, uh, I'll be right down. Don't slip on the soap. <laughs> soap. 
Yeah. And you'll never know how tempted I am to invite you up here to the bathroom and drown you in the... Sorry to keep you waiting, Ellie. Oh, that's all right. You know me. I just make myself at home. Uh, where's Lucy? Uh, Lucy? Mm. Oh, no, she's uh, she's uh, getting ready for dinner. Oh, well, then I won't be a minute. I'll just run up and talk no, to her. No, I mean, she's in the shower. She's taking a shower, can't you hear? Oh, oh, yes. Well, look, uh, tell her I'll drop back in 10 or 15 minutes. Well, we, and... uh, we won't be here. At dinner time? No, we, we, we're going out for dinner. Oh, that's funny. What's funny? Well, I talked to Lucy on the phone just before you came home. She told me she'd be here till 9 o'clock, and I'd better pick it up before then. Uh, uh, pick what up? The envelope. What envelope? Uh, from the brownies. From the brownies? Yes, you see, it's the annual charity drive, and each den mother collects the pledges the little dears bring back to the den. Oh. Now, Lucy's is the last one this year. Oh, maybe if I just looked no, around... No, really, Ellie, we, we've got to get out to dinner. Oh, well, who are you dining with so early? Uh, uh no one. Uh, I mean, that is, we're, we're uh, just going out to, to, uh, to celebrate for a change. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. You know, I haven't liked the way Lucy's been looking lately. And she didn't seem herself at all today. Do you know what's, what's troubling her? Oh, that's, that's a private matter. But I can promise you nothing's troubling Lucy now. Oh, good. Uh, I wish I did have the envelope, though. I I peeked about, but it doesn't seem to be down here. Uh, Maybe if I just ran up and called to it through the door... I promise you, I'll get the envelope and deliver it to you. Well, I really must run. It was just... um, uh, My, Lucy does take a long shower, doesn't she? Huh? Oh, oh, well, she she was uh, working in the garden all day. Really? I I didn't see her out there. Well, most of the day. Now, Ellie, I, I, I have to change, too, and I... Oh, of course. You don't have to treat me as anything else but family. I'll let myself out. No, I, I'll do it. I, I want to lock the door anyway. Lock the door? Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we'll be going out through the garage. Ralph, are you all right? You look a bit drawn. Oh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> oh, now, how did he get out, that fool cat? Oh, now, don't you talk to poor Ginger like that. He's Lucy's best baby, aren't you, darling? What's he mewling about? Oh, Ellie, will you put him down? Oh, the poor baby's just looking for his supper. I'm surprised Lucy hasn't fed him. Oh, she, 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 she probably forgot. It's not like her. Uh, there isn't anything wrong between you and Lucy, Ralph. Oh, what could be wrong? Oh, I don't know. She hasn't seemed herself lately, and and you seem so nervous tonight. I'm just tired. Look, Ellie, I don't want to keep Lucy waiting. Yeah, of course, of course. I'll run along. Now, tell Lucy I'll drop by first thing in the morning to pick up the envelope. No, no, there's no need. I'll drop it in in your mailbox on my way to the train. Oh, shut up. I don't need any trouble from you. (laughs) What am I going to do? What am I going to do? What indeed, Ralph Lester? Murder in itself is a shocking enough thing, but when you are practically caught in the act... It's enough to unnerve the strongest mind. Still, you've been quite clever keeping Ellie away. No one knows yet that Lucy is dead. You still have a chance. But, and that's the large question, how are you going to use it? I shall return shortly with Act Two. left Ralph Lester in sheer panic, wondering what on earth he could do. The effort of controlling his emotions and trying to act normally with his next-door neighbor after he had just murdered his wife has left him drained, his knees weak, his mind a blank that tries to shut out the terrible reality. Now, suddenly remembering a vagrant thought that had crossed it earlier, he goes to the phone to talk to his girlfriend, Gloria. 
Gloria, it's our only chance. I didn't know, Ralphie. I certainly didn't bargain on murder. It isn't going to be murder. I told you, it's going to be a kidnapping. Only the victim will never turn up. Do you think you can make the police believe that? With your help, yes, I think I can. I'll even seem to pay a ransom and make it look like the money's been picked up. And I have a way to get it back. Why don't you just take the money and run, Ralph? Spend my life hiding out and looking over my shoulder? No, no way. After the kidnappers don't return Lucy, I'm taking that money to cover all we've stolen out of our customers' accounts. We? Oh, yes, you're in this too, Gloria. You try to sit back and let me get hooked for murder and I'll drag you in with me. You wouldn't do that to me. Don't tempt me. Ah, uh, look, Gloria, baby, don't you see? After, I mean, as, as soon as the heat's off, her will leaves everything to me. So you and I can live like royalty the rest of our lives. Will we still be that rich? Lucy was ruling in money. Honey, don't let me down. Oh, of course I'm with you. Now, just just tell me what I have to do. Okay. Okay, here it is. I want you to send a letter a very special way. But it's important that the postmark is New York. What do you mean, a special way? I want you to take a bunch of old newspapers, magazines, circulars, anything with print, and cut out the letters to spell out the message. And now, here's what it should say. <laughs> This is Fairbairn Police Detective Sergeant Castelli speaking. Yes, sir. Uh, could I have the name and address, please? That's Ralph Lester. L E S T E R. Yeah. Check. And uh, you just got home. You're quite sure your wife is missing? Uh, just for the record, you got back at what time? 12.05. All right. Now, uh, try not to worry, sir. Your wife may have been scared and run to the neighbors. Yes, sir. We'll be there right away. You uh, want me to use the siren, Lieutenant? No, Sergeant Castelli. No sense waking up the whole community this time of night. You think this is just a false alarm, huh? To break in? Nope. The wife? Who knows? Could be some domestic squabble. All right, the guy sounded cold sober, Lieutenant. And I figure you must think there's more to it than that since you hiked along. Uh, Ralph Lester's an important citizen in this town, Ricky. He pays enough taxes he could expect VIP treatment. Yeah, rich neighborhood. Yep, he's a big stockbroker in New York. And his wife was the daughter of A.B. Trumbull. Cosmetic business. Millions. It could just be that she was snatched. Kidnapped? Huh? I thought you figured she just walked out. I don't figure nothing till I get all the facts. Or as many of them as I can. Better take Long Point Road. We make better time. And Mr. Lester, when you got back from the movie, you found that the house had been broken into. And your wife was missing, huh? Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant. What movie did you see? Uh, it was at the uh, Fine Arts Theater. Mm -hmm. And you went alone, huh? Well, it was the last night the film was going to be showing. But you and Mrs. Lester had had dinner together, huh? In, uh, in a manner of speaking. Sir? Well, you see, we started to go out because I thought that Lucy... I thought Lucy was looking tired. But on the way to the restaurant, she decided she didn't feel up to dining out. So I just got some roast beef and coleslaw and that sort of thing, and we we came back home to eat. I was a little worried about Lucy. Yes, sir. And then you went out to the movie by yourself, huh? Well, she didn't want me to miss the film. She'd been to it earlier in the week, as a matter of fact, with a friend of hers. Oh. A friend? Uh, Mrs. Eleanor Pratt. She lives next door. Well, then perhaps she might have seen something. Oh, I, I doubt it. They... They broke in on the side of the house away from her. And besides, there's quite a bit of vegetation screening us from each other. Oh, well, we'll check that out later. Um, can you think of any reason why your wife might have been kidnapped? Well, not really, except that, of course, her father was a very prominent man. Well, he's been dead for many years, hasn't he? Yes, nearly seven years now. But, of course, my wife was his sole heir. So you're more or less convinced that that's what happened? 
I beg pardon? I mean, uh, there isn't any possibility that the break-in and your wife's disappearance are not connected. I, uh, I, I don't follow you. You don't think Mrs. Lester could have just left by herself, walked out? Oh, why? I mean, we've been married for nearly 20 years. We were happy. I'm we? sorry, sir. My job is to ask questions and to find your wife as fast as I can. Now, look, if there's any danger to her life in any way, I don't want police interference. We'll work with you, Mr. Lester, as carefully as we can, if it's a kidnapping. What else can it be? We'll know that soon enough. One way or another. Now, you say, Mrs. Pratt, it is Mrs., correct? That's right. I'm a widow. My husband died almost ten years ago. I'm sorry. So am I. Um, now, Mrs. Lester didn't say anything to you by any chance about uh, going away. No. Why should she? Well, I thought you were the best of friends. Oh, we are, but I didn't mean that. I meant... Why would she want to go away? Oh, any number of reasons. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Lester didn't have any marital problems, did they? Oh, I never heard of it. Lucy never said anything at all like that to me. I didn't say that they had. It's just, it's just something we always ask. She's a little older than him, isn't she? Yes, uh, nearer my age. When was the last time you saw Mrs. Lester? Oh, uh, uh, the day before yesterday. Mm hmm I did run over just before dinner tonight to pick up something from her, but I didn't get it, and I couldn't see her. Why not? Well, you see, she was taking a shower, and Ralph and she were getting ready to go out. Ralph seemed to be a bit nervous and in kind of a hurry, so I didn't stay. Mm -hmm. Um, What was it you were going to pick up? Oh, just some money for the Girl Scouts. But Ralph promised to drop it by tomorrow morning. Do you... You think Lucy was kidnapped? Mm, all the evidence points that way. But if she was, we'll all know soon enough. Or at least Mr. Lester will. Thank you, Mrs. Pratt. I don't think we'll have to bother you again. Oh, uh, good morning, Lieutenant. Almost afternoon, Mr. Lester. Heard anything? No. They didn't contact you by phone? Who? Well, the kidnappers. Oh, oh, no, 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 no contact. You wouldn't be keeping quiet about it if they had. Why? It isn't a good idea, Mr. Lester. The police can help. No, I wouldn't take any chances on risking my wife's life. Oh, I can understand that. Nothing through the mail? No. If this is a kidnapping... Don't try to handle it yourself. Please. You need help. Professional help. We won't endanger your wife's life in any way. What we'll try to do is to protect it. Just help us do our duty. Okay, Lieutenant, up to a point. As soon as I know anything, I, I'll let you know. And now, if you'll excuse me, I, I couldn't go into New York today, and I'm trying to handle my business by phone. It's... Oh, that's... That's probably a customer now. See you. Yeah, I'll be around. Okay, Sergeant Castelli. No news yet. Uh, where to now, Luke? Let's take a short hop next door to Mrs. Pratt. So you got your envelope all right, Mrs. Pratt, huh? Oh, yes. Ralph must have put it in my mailbox early this morning. Uh, you look a little, a little strange. Something troubling you? Oh, it's just something personal. And I I didn't get much sleep. I'll try not to let this bother you, ma'am. Mrs. Lester will be all right, I'm sure. Oh, I, I'm not worried about Lucy's disappearance anymore. At least not that way. That wasn't what kept me awake. Well, what did, ma'am? The cat. Ginger. Lucy's cat. Yowling like a little banshee. I guess she missed Lucy as much as me. Mm-hmm. What stopped you from worrying about Mrs. Lester? Oh, why, the note she'd put in the envelope. 
I wonder if I could see it, Mr. Pratt. Well, I don't know. It, it's rather personal. But it might have something to do with the case. Hmm. I suppose it might. Well, may I see it then? Oh, I, I guess Lucy wouldn't mind my showing it to you. Oh, ma'am. Dearest Ellie, just a scribble to say goodbye for a while. I'm going away. And I can't face anyone with why just at the moment. I suppose you've noticed that I haven't exactly been myself lately. If I had to tell you why, I'd just break down and fall apart. I'll write you all about it once I'm settled. I have valued, and always will value, your friendship. Yours, Lucy. Just what would you figure this had to do with the case, ma'am? Why, it, it accounts for her disappearance. Does that sound like she was kidnapped? No, ma'am, it doesn't. But then, this was written before the break-in. Sounds like. So? It seems like it doesn't change things after all. Is Ralph Lester going to get away with his dangerous and desperate gamble? Has Lieutenant Barth picked up any of the tenuous clues that are falling his way? And if he has, can he possibly strengthen them enough to make them stand up in court to obtain a conviction? In short... Can Ralph Lester get away with murder? I shall return shortly with Act Three. There is a very simple and totally laid out suspense to this story. Can a man who has committed a murder cover his tracks by making it seem to be a kidnapping from which the victim never returned? In the first act, we witnessed the crime. In the second act, we watched the investigation. Now in the third, we are watching, or listening, if you will, to the big question. Can Ralph Lester get away with murder? Morning, Mr. Lester. Morning, Lieutenant. Come, come right on in. Uh, you say you've had a communication from the kidnappers? Yes, here it is. You can read it yourself. Oh. We have Mrs. Lester. She is safe. Oh. She'll stay that way unless you refuse to pay the ransom. We want $300,000 in small bills. Nothing over a twenty. You will be notified where to leave the money. Do not call in the police, or we cannot answer for the safety of your wife. This came in today's mail? Ah, uh, yes. So it is a kidnapping. What kind of statement is that? What else? May I see the envelope? Sure. Postmark New York. The message pasted up with letters out of newspapers, magazines, and so on. That's pretty clever. How can we trace them? I don't know. Of course, I'll take this and subject it to latent fuming tests and blood print kits. Oh, wh what for? Well, we may be able to lift hidden fingerprints, find out if criminals are involved. And now we can set up an overseas team. Now, let's get this straight, Lieutenant. I don't want anyone interfering in my wife's safe return. We don't want any danger to her either. But there are things that can be done to monitor... No, sir, I want the police out of this entirely. You'll pay the ransom? I'm already making arrangements for that. How can you be 100% sure that this message isn't a phony? Oh, uh, I, I never thought of that. Well, then let us work with you. Uh, no, I, I'm afraid to. All I care about is Lucy's safe return. We'll maintain a low profile. Low enough not to interfere with that. The thing is, with kidnappers, you can't trust them. Um... Lieutenant, tell me something. Do you have some idea that my wife wasn't kidnapped? Why? I don't know. It's just your attitude? Let's put it, Mr. Lester, that I'm afraid you want to handle too much of this by yourself. And it's tricky business. Now, if someone's holding your wife, you're going to be contacted, probably by phone. You going to try to handle it from there on in? 
I mean, the, the drop-off and the exchange? Well, that's what this note told me to do. Well, supposing you pay the ransom and you don't get your wife back. If you don't work with us, who's to know what happened? Oh. Okay, I'll, I'll work with you. Check. Well, the normal thing is, you'll get a phone call. We'll try to trace it. But I'd guess no chance. Whatever they tell you, we'll take it from there, okay? Now, what we wait for is a phone call. Yeah? This is Ralph, Gloria. Oh, yeah. Hi. Now, look. I'm calling from a payphone. I gotta give you some instructions and you gotta listen close. Are you with me? Oh, sure, honey. All right, then listen. At exactly 8 p.m. this evening, I want you to go to a public phone booth and call me at my place here in Connecticut. Have enough change to put the call through from your side. Now, look, you know that sexy whisper you have? You mean like when I say, <laughs> Are you my big, strong baby? Who's going to make his mama happy? Yeah, that's it. I want you to use just that tone. Call me at exactly eight. And here's what you say. Tomorrow morning, you will take the train. Arriving Grand Central, 9.42. You will have the money with you. You will go to box 431 which you will find open. The money must be in a brown paper bag. Put it there and shut the box. Walk away immediately. Obey us, or your wife's life is on your conscience. Did you hear that, Lieutenant? Yeah, I heard it. Any chance of tracing it? None. Not long enough. Was that a man or a woman? Oh, hard to tell with the whisper. You recognize the voice? No. What are you going to do? Well, leave the money exactly as I was told to do. And I want the police out of this. I'm not taking any chances on Lucy's life. It'd be better to have us standing by. No. Uh, you can talk us out of it, Mr. Lester, but the FBI is another story. The, the FBI? Well, more than one state is involved now. They have to be called in. But, but if they interfere, it, it could be my, my wife's well, life. They're very discreet. They won't move openly until your wife is returned. Or until they know they can rescue her. Well, I, I don't like it. Maybe maybe I'll just call off the whole thing. Don't you want your wife back? Well, of course. Well, then you'd just better follow along the way they tell you. I don't know. I, I have a strange hunch that... No, no, I can't say it. You don't think that your wife is dead already, do you? It is a possibility, isn't it? Yes, it's it's always a possibility. Well, I have to get back to the station house. Good luck tomorrow. I guess I'll need it. Hey, but uh, what happened, Lieutenant? Come on back in my office out of this racket. He, uh, he left the door, didn't he? Well, just as ordered. Let's get in the office. But no one picked it up, huh? Oh, that's the whole foul up. The locker was checked. They're only good for 24 hours, and the FBI knew it would run out at 12 noon. But when no one showed up to pick up the ransom, they moved in. And when they had it opened, the locker was empty. Why? Well, yeah, they goofed somehow. Don't ask me. Someone managed to sneak in and pick up the dough. But uh, Mrs. Lester hasn't been returned. Not yet. If ever. Hey, you think... <laughs> Lieutenant Boss speaking. Oh, yes, Mr. Pratt. I see. Well, did you call Mr. Lester? He's not home. Well, that's strange. Oh. Oh. I tell you what. Let me come right over. Come on, Ricky. We're going over to Mrs. Pratt's. Why, right, what's the matter? She's having cat trouble. Cat trouble? Yeah, somebody killed her neighbor's cat. And you say you heard the cat all last night till about one this morning? That's right, Lieutenant. Crying as if his heart would break. Crying? Oh, he was really howling up a storm. Poor little thing. 
<laughs> like, like he was a mourner at a wake. Where was the cat making all this noise? Oh, you can see right out the window. It was bright moonlight last night, and there he was, sitting on the old well, just howling. You mean the one right out in back of Mr. Lester's place there? That's right. Mm. <laughs> I remember years ago when we all depended on it for water, before the Farndale Hydraulic put the pipes in. And that's where the cat was yowling? Yes. I thought he'd never stop. But he did? Yes. Just as I thought I'd have to go out and do something about it. Poor little pussycat. Morning, Lucy, not being here. And then this afternoon... You found the cat's body. Yes. In the bushes between your property and Mr. Lester's. Yes. Strangled. Yes. No possibility another animal could have killed him. I I don't see how. There, there wasn't a mark on him otherwise. Who do you think would kill a cat like that, Mrs. Pratt? I don't know. There'd have to be some motive other than the fact that the poor animal was making a noise. That's what occurred to me. I think we both guessed what it was. But proving it is something else again. Would you be willing to help me? Any way I can. Do you think you could sound like the, like the late Mrs. Lester? Well, I suppose you must know that we found her body there. Do you think that you could sound like Mrs. Lester? But why is this necessary? If Ralph killed Lucy and you found her and you know it, why don't you just arrest him? Well, the kidnap plot was very clever. How could we ever prove that the supposed kidnappers didn't kill her? The only way we can be sure he gets punished is if he convicts himself out of his own mouth. I think if you help, we can make him do that. Then for Lucy's sake... Count me in. Lieutenant, I, I, I really don't understand the purpose of all this. I, I was fond of Ginger, but in my present position, I can't worry too much about the accidental death of a cat. Well, I was just wondering why you didn't hear him caterwauling last night. I didn't even know he was out. I was dead to the world after what I've been through. You sure you didn't hear him? How many times do I have to tell you? No. Well, who do you suppose killed him? Lieutenant Barth, you should know in a country like this, animals meet accidental deaths. There are raccoons and foxes and cars and any number of ways an animal can meet an accidental death. By strangling? Uh, is that how Ginger died? Apparently. Now, well, suppose you tell me why the cat picked this particular spot to howl. I'm sure I don't know. You know who we found in this well, Mr. Lester? Also strangled, but about 20 hours before? Your wife. Lucy? Oh, well, that, that's, that's awful. How, 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 how did you find her? The police are not fools, Mr. Lester. And you're not so smart. Ever since you killed her, oh. you left a trail of clues. I didn't kill her. You, you'll never prove that. Then who did? The, the, the kidnappers, of course. They, they, they never intended to let her go. What kidnappers? I'll try and prove there weren't any. I can do that for you, Lieutenant. What? What, what did you say? Who, who? It's me, Ralph. Lucy. But it can't be. You're dead. How can you be so sure? Because I killed you. I killed you myself. You, you, you were dead before I threw you in the well. Not quite dead, Ralph. Kept alive long enough to convict you and make you and Gloria pay for my death. Now that you have convicted yourself out of your own mouth, I can rest at peace. <laughs> Lieutenant, I still don't see why it was all necessary. We knew the guy killed her. Well, too many loose ends, Ricky. This one I wanted to nail for sure. Now, with all the witnesses we had last night, we got him dead to rights, huh? There's only one thing. What's that? The, uh, so-called ransom. Now, we know he had the dough. The FBI watched him put it in the locker. But, uh, who picked it up? Mr. Lester. 
It was simple. He also had the key to a box right next to the one his girlfriend had specified. His body was enough to cover the fact that he put the money in that box instead of the one the supposed kidnapper had named. He intended to go back and pick it up later. Only time ran out on him now. <laughs> Thanks to an interested neighbor and a poor little cat who mourned his mistress too much, but not wisely. I'm kind of sorry for the cat. Yeah, so am I. Except that if it hadn't been for him and Mrs. Pratt, he might have got away with it. It's a lucky thing the cat was let out of the bank. The best laid plans of mice and men, etc., etc. But then mice are notoriously unlucky where cats are concerned. And any man that marries an older woman for her money is scarcely a lion. Ralph Lester was a mouse who tried to roar, but didn't quite have the native ability or cleverness. He ended up in his own mousetrap, and deservedly so. I'll be back shortly. The crime of passion is a sad thing, because it cannot by its very nature, be totally reprehensible. But when human nature has taken its course to the ultimate end, any concealment or attempt to escape consequences is indefensible. Thanks to Lieutenant Bart's handling of the case, no judge or jury on record could do less than to give Ralph Lester the full sentence he deserved. And for Gloria, who had been an accessory, if not before, at least after the fact, she was lucky to escape with a long term on probation. Our cast included John Beale, Joan Lovejoy, Ian Martin, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall... There's a haunting, lovely song in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night which has troubled my dreams, and perhaps yours. Come away, come away, death. Let me in sad Cyprus be laid. If it hasn't haunted you yet, perhaps it might after the story I bring you now. A story which, not unsurprisingly, has to do with death. <laughs> Mystery drama, Come Away Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars William Griffiths and Norman Rose. You've all heard of the old Brokar Mansion, naturally. Facing the river, occupying a full block in the heart of the city, with its gardens stretching all the way to the river, and its towering shade trees shielding the imposing bulk of the Renaissance house with its great copper roof. 
It's gone now, of course, to be replaced by a huge high-rise apartment building. But it isn't so long ago that the last of the Brokars, Simon, lived and refused to die there, no matter how many people in and out of the real estate business were eagerly awaiting his demise. Oh, good evening, Mr. Rensselaer. Good evening, Mrs. Marbles. How is Mr. Brokaw? Why, he seems to be better, sir. Is the doctor still with him? No, Dr. Manning left just a few minutes ago. Uh, They're not putting him in the hospital again? Oh, Dr. Manning said not. I... I... Yes, yes, yes. What is it, Mrs. Marples? Forgive me, Mr. Rensselaer. Just the doctor, and now you here... Oh, I've been with Mr. Brokaw as housekeeper for over 35 years. And I don't know anyone else who could have taken it, Mrs. Marples. Oh, he's a difficult man. Like all strong men. Oh, that's what's so awful, I suppose. He's still a big, lusty, healthy man. That he should be cut down in his prime like this. Dr. Manning thinks it's that uh, imminent? Well, you'll have to ask Mr. Brokaw about that. Or the doctor himself. Well, well, since I've been called in, I... I can guess perhaps it is. I'd better get on up. Or is he resting? Uh, No, no, he wanted you shown up right away. I'd better not keep him waiting. Uh, uh, Mr. Rensselaer? Yes? uh, Do... do you... Will will he be changing his will? Is, Is that what it is? Now, I don't think you have anything to worry about, Mrs. Marple. Oh, it wasn't myself I was concerned about it. It was Miss Nita. Oh, yes. Well, you understand there's nothing I can say one way or another. Oh, that sweet little niece of his has given up her private life to move in here and help nurse Mr. Brokaw ever since that first attack of... Well, ever since they discovered that he was ill... And I'd hate to see her left out in the cold if anything happens. I don't want to see her lose out to that cold, greedy little trollop who, in my opinion, is more than anything else responsible for the state he is in now. Oh, can't you do something? Mrs. Marples, I am a lawyer. I appreciate and applaud your concern, but uh, that's as far as I can go. Is uh, Nita here now? Yes. Uh, she's in the library with her fiance, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, very well. Perhaps I'll have a chance to talk to her for a moment when I come down. Now I'd better get upstairs. Harry, what are you doing at that half-open door? Nita, hold it a minute. Will you stop acting like a private eye? I am a private eye. Watching the legal beagle ascend to Mount Olympus and listening at the same time for the below stairs gossip. Oh, come away from that door. What do you care, anyway? <laughs> but I do care, lover. Mr. Brokaw looms very large in my life, since he's all that stands between me and the love of my life. Oh, that isn't fair. Uncle Simon isn't keeping us apart. Oh, oh isn't he? Then how come we're not married and you won't let me take you away from all this? But you know how ill Uncle Simon is. He needs me. I- I'm the only family he has. Uh, 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 correction, love bug. He has Mrs. Marples to take care of him. Oh, no, she... she's not a relative. So, all right. He has that snaky secretary, that voluptuous Venus, Miss Bunny Huggins, to provide that. Well, I'm not going to let that... She's angling to marry him. Now she knows he's dying. So? Well, I just don't want to see him taken. Have you ever thought maybe he deserves it? Well, he spent his life doing that to everyone else that crosses his path. How about maybe he ought to get his comeuppance for a change? Perry, he was my mom's brother. When she died, I swear she worried more about him than anything or anyone else. I mean, it was crazy. She was ten years younger, but she always treated him like her baby brother. That barracuda? (laughs) Mom said all that hard stuff was just a front. Come on, Nita. As far as her brother Simon was concerned, your mother was blind as a bat. Maybe, but but I've still got to hang in, do what I can. Nita. What? It, uh, it isn't the dough, is it? I mean, look, I'm not going to be an intern forever. No, it isn't the dough. It's just, well, I don't want to see someone who's, well, sort of my own, get taken. 
And as long as there's any way of shutting out Miss Bunny Huggins, I feel I owe at least that much to my mom. How about me? Oh, darling. Can't you wait just this little bit longer? You're sure of Dr. Manning's diagnosis? I am a registered nurse. That's why I came here. I mean, there's no chance of remission. It is terminal. No chance. It's terminal. Damn it, Rensselaer, I won't accept it. A little pain, all right. But die? Oh, not me. Not Simon Brokar. I have too much left to do. I'm not about to die, no matter what the doctor says. And uh, what am I here for? To change my will. Why does it have to be changed in the prime of health? Because I've made up my mind. I'm going to take the final step at last. At 55, I'm going to be married. Well, congratulations, I suppose. Do I know the intended bride? Well, of course you do. Who else would I... Oh, want me to get done? No, no, I'll get up myself. Hello. Simon? Oh, Bunny. <laughs> Who else? No one. Oh, I knew that deep, tickly, sexy voice the moment it answered. <laughs> oh, am I interrupting anything? Oh, no, no, no. Well, uh, just a conference with my lawyer. Oh. Oh, do you have him there, darling? Why? Well, it seemed about time. Honey, you haven't been feeling sick again, have you? Oh, no, it's nothing for you to worry about. Oh, but of course it is. You know how I worry all the time. Now, Bunny, when, when I get through with my lawyer, you won't ever have to worry again. Oh, but I do, darling. I don't want anything to happen to my baby. <laughs> but a girl has to be practical just a reasonable settlement. Yeah, well, let me suggest it. Joint property when we're married and sole heir if anything happens to me. M married? Bunny, is, is that enough? I... I need you so much. Oh, you draw those papers up, darling, and at last will be what we've always should have been together. If you need me, call me. If not, Let's have a lovely drink together when we sign the wedding agreement. Oh, I love you. Yeah, I love you. Bye now. Bunny, I... Oh, bye. <clears throat> All right, Rensselaer. Let's get down to business. I want to redraw my will. Well, before we do that, can we talk just a moment? Oh, lawyers. All right, what about what is your hurry to rush into this marriage? Well, I don't know how long I'll be around to enjoy it. Simon, I can't. There isn't any discussion, you see. Now or never. And I choose now. All right, this is for the present, Simon. But do you have to mortgage yourself for the future, too? You're a man of my age. Wouldn't you be tempted to mortgage your future, too, for a girl like this? Or someone like her? That no man could ever sensibly dream of having unless... Unless... She was bought and paid for. Well, we'll pretend that that was never said. Just let me go in my own way and the devil take the hindmost. Yes? Who, who is it? Mr. Morris. For Mr. Brokaw. Oh, is he expecting you? He very well should be. Well, we have strict orders. I'm not... Sure, I can let you in. It doesn't matter, because you really can't keep me out. What did you say your name was? Uh, Morris. Uh, the name is a convenience. What does that mean? It's not exact, and it is borrowed. You're an imposter. Oh, no. That's the last thing I am. What are you doing here? What do you want? I've come for you, Mr. Brokaw. It's time. What do you mean you come for me? It's time. The name of Morris is good enough for day-to-day -day use and creates no difficulties. As I said, it's borrowed from the Latin, Mors, which in turn means death. My name is Death, Mr. Brokaw. And as I said, I have an appointment with you. No. No, no, I'm not ready to die yet. Ah, uh, but then, who is? Oh, well, this can't be happening. I'll have you thrown out. I am the one unwelcome visitor no one can refuse. Now, I beg you not to excite yourself... For this encounter, time is standing still. And you are frozen at the brink between life 
and afterlife. Get out of here. Oh, really? You cannot threaten me. I'm, I'm not going to ready to die. I... Well, the choice isn't yours. No, but, but I'm not ready. As I said, whoever is... You don't understand. I'm rich. I have my health. Never mind what that stupid doctor says. I've never been married, but I've just found the woman I wanted who excites me, thrills me. I don't mean to interrupt. <laughs> It's rather a silly thing to say, isn't it? What? I mean, that's really basically what I do. I make a career of interrupting. You come right down to it. Do you have to be so casual about the whole thing? Oh, I don't mean to be. You see, it's all become such a ritual. It's hard not to be bored. The same thing over and over again. Well, I'm glad it bores you that much. Shall we just call off the whole thing? Well, unfortunately, I have no say in the matter. I am only an instrument, a messenger. And the message I have to bring you is that you are dead. But I can't die. I keep trying to tell you... I'm 56 years old. I have millions. I'm going to be married to a wonderful and exciting woman named Bunny Huggins, and it isn't fair that I can't be left alive to enjoy her. Now, look, I'll, gi I'll give anything, whatever you are. Now, come, Mr. Brokaw. Don't you think that I've been offered every kind of bribe through the years? Yeah, but, but, here, here, look, look. Here's a picture of Bunny. Now, could, uh, could you take any man away from that? <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> she is attractive. Uh, there is no doubt. Oh, you, you see uh, why I have to stay alive? No, eh? no, not at all. Well, it's it's hopeless. I I have to die. Well, there is one possibility. I'll take it. What? Uh, as I said, I am world weary. I'm tired to exhaustion. Uh -huh. And um, so this bunny is a most extraordinary looking woman. Yeah. Now, I might be persuaded to take a brief hiatus. Well, how long? How long? Well, that somewhat depends on Bunny and uh, what develops. What do you mean, Bunny? Mr. Brokaw, if I should make any arrangement with you to hold off your demise, well, naturally, there would have to be some transference of personality. Oh, what, 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 what does that mean? Well, it's not very difficult. You see, I would take your place... And you would take mine. For how long? Well, I can't answer that. Well, for as long as it suits. Well, now, wait, well, wait a minute. You you take my place, I can imagine, but uh, I take your place? Why, what? Yes, you would become a messenger like me. Oh, it's quite a busy job. I'd go around telling people they're dead? Oh, somebody has to. But, uh, why? Well, how would I know which ones to go to? No problem at all. You'll be told. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the more I think of it, a vacation from my appointed rounds could be very uh, invigorating. All right, Mr. Brokaw, you brought it up. Would you like to make the swap? This is a curious and rather new situation, isn't it? The devil tempts. The devil makes a bargain for the human soul. But the devil never makes an open trade, does he? And then, of course, this isn't the devil. It's death. Isn't he as sure as taxes? Or is there some escape? I shall return shortly with Act Two. Turn to our strange confrontation. In the master bedroom of the huge, gloomy old Brokaw mansion, two men face each other. Men? The one in the bed, Simon Brokaw, is certainly mortal, since he is dying. The one who sits facing him, Mr. Morris, claims to be death. He has just offered Simon one way out from the inevitable. To avoid dying... He can exchange places with that grim, gray specter who has been sent to claim his life. I'm waiting for your answer, Simon Brokaw. Uh, what proof do I have? Proof? That you're really dead. Well, I'm here, am I not? How could I have forced my way into the house? 
Oh, I'll need more than that. Oh, dear. Dear me. Hold out your hand. Why? So I can touch it. You asked for proof. Very well. Now remember, this is only the first brush of death. Ah! Oh! Oh! A horrible, cold, clammy blankness. <laughs> You're convinced now? Supposing I am, I... What is it like to be dead? Well, I'm the last person to ask that. I work only this side. Pass the message. Deliver the goods. And then? Then? I don't know. You see... You see, I really don't want to know. I'm satisfied enough with my own job, though it tends to be a little lonely and repetitive. It's why the idea of a vacation appeals to me. Maybe I... I wouldn't like your job. Maybe. It's a chance you take. But then the arrangement can't be permanent. Why not? Why not? Because... Well, because eventually it must come to an end. Hmm. On the other hand, must it? What, what do you mean? It's an interesting speculation. If I've taken over your life and delegated my responsibilities to you, why should we not, in fact, both be immortal? Immortal. Yes, that's your wish. And mine is to have a little more fun, which I certainly might have by living your life. <laughs> yes, the more I think of it. It's a very good exchange. But uh, what would I take with me from my life? Nothing but yourself. All the rest is mine. Now, are you ready to make the swap? What uh, other choice have I? To die. All right. How, uh, how do we go about this? Well, we, we just exchange places. You mean I get out of bed and give you my clothes? Oh, I, I think it can be simpler than that. If you're ready. All right, I'm ready. Now, let's make it as simple as possible. Just take a deep breath. Yeah. Oh, and uh, close your eyes. <laughs> should do it, I think. You can open your eyes. You feel any different? Well, of course I feel different. I'm sitting in the chair now while you're in the bed. Naturally. We've exchanged places. That was the idea, wasn't it? Yes, but... It, but I... I'm not ready. I don't know what to do. I told you. You don't have to. You will be told. Yes, but I can't... You... You hear something? Yes. I can't stay. I'm being called. I'm needed somewhere else. <laughs> oh, that's the way it goes. I began to find it deadly tiresome. He's gone. Oh, the poor fellow. He's going to be very busy from now on, while I... Ah... Oh. Satin sheets. Down pillows. Oh, it's very luxurious. No wonder Miss Bunny finds herself attracted. Uh, Bunny, where is that picture? Ah, if the presence lives up to the picture. Now, let's see. He must have her phone number in a book somewhere. Ah, uh, what was the name? Ah, yes, Huggins. Oh, what promise in that name. Ah, here we are. Bunny Huggins. Uncle Simon, what are you doing downstairs? Uh, you must be Nita. Of course, I... Uncle, are you all right? Oh, never better, Nita, dear. Where's your, uh, uh, the young doctor? Perry? Well, you know, he's a little edgy about coming around here. Because of me? Well, yes and no. Well, what's he worried about? I'll cut you out of my will. He couldn't care less. If he had his way, he'd have me cut out of here. Can't say as I blame him. It's a gloomy old dump. Why don't you take his advice and fly the musty coop? What? Why don't you marry him and be done with it? But I... Th I well, I, I feel a kind of responsibility for you. Why? Well, after all, I am a nurse. One thing I don't need anymore. So feel free. But I just can't walk out like that. All right. Let's have a wedding here. 
Would you like me to give you away? Give me... Oh, I can't think of anything I'd like better, if you really mean it. Of course I do. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I'll, I'll get it. That must be my secretary, Miss Huggins. This is a moment I'm really looking forward to. He's agreed to the wedding and wants to give you away? Yes, Perry, darling. I can't tell you what he's... I mean, he's a different man. There are remissions in this kind of disease, aren't there? Oh, not from what I learned from Dr. Manning. Well, Manning's kind of old-fashioned. I'd swear that Uncle has to be in some kind of remission. I mean, he's in marvelous shape. Isn't that great? <laughs> if we can get married to this, so set the date. Let's gather ye rosebuds while we may. It, uh, it is what you want, isn't it? You're what I want. <laughs> sweetie, why couldn't we make it a double wedding? Because I'm not quite sure that I want to get married. But I thought that was all wrapped up and delivered some time ago. Oh, I swear to heaven, sugar, I just don't know you anymore. You're like another man. <laughs> you know, I feel like another man. I reckon that's just great, isn't it? I don't plan on dying anymore, Bunny. Well, I should hope not. You are not going to be a quick widow ready to wallow in the lap of luxury. Who said I wanted to be a widow? Well, it's part of the game, isn't it? I'm not interested in games, Simon. Even the ones of chance? You still could win the jackpot. If I decided to go. You would walk out on me just like that? Oh, I swear, Simon, honey, I don't know how to talk to you anymore. You're... you're like a stranger. Well, I have to admit that I have changed. Well, if that's the way you feel and you want to get rid of poor little Bunny, I can bow out. Mm-hmm. If you want. It's going to cost you. There's the settlement. Hmm? What settlement? <gasps> Why, Simon Broker, how can you talk like that? How can you expect to use up the best years of my life and think you can walk away free? Now, whoever said I wanted to walk away free? As a matter of fact, I was looking forward to some of the best years of my life with you. Uh, but I mean, with you and on my terms. Well, that might not satisfy me all the way. So, see my lawyer. Or let me see him first. And after that... Well, after that, we can talk again. Uh, naturally, I had the new will drawn up, Simon. And this is it? Well, to the best of my belief, is substantially what you indicated to me at our last meeting. Uh, basically, except for a very token amounts, it leaves my entire fortune to Miss Bunny Huggins. According to your wish. A wish with which I sense you are not in agreement. Well, it's an old argument. I have no wish to reopen it. I'll call in a couple of my people to witness your signature. Of what? A new will. Oh, oh, yes, that. Well, we won't have any need of this anymore. The old one will do well enough since I don't plan to die. Not for a long time yet. I'm sorry that you had all this work for nothing. Oh, <laughs> I'm not... I never saw any labor go more cheerfully down the drain. I'd even break my lawyer's old moss back and say, I don't know what the devil has gotten into you, Simon Broker. But whatever it is, I'm for it all the way. Oh, good evening, Mr. Morris. It's you again. Yes, Mrs. Marples, uh... May I come in? If you feel you must. But it won't do any good. Mr. Brokaw isn't here. He's still in Las Vegas? Why, no. He left there a week or so ago on a trip around the world. Around the world? Is, uh, is, uh, Miss Huggins with him, do you know? His secretary? Yes. Why, I, I believe so. I, uh... I thought I heard something about a wedding. Oh, heavens, no. That was Mr. Brokaw's niece. Oh, such a lovely ceremony. And he gave the bride away himself. Nita. Little Nita. 
Miss Nita, uh, Mrs. Lawrence, it would be now, is here at the moment. Uh, uh, if you would like to see her. Oh, uh, no, no, she wouldn't know me from... She, she, she wouldn't know me. Uh, tell Mr. Brokar I'll look in again. As soon as he's back. Good evening. Can I help you? Oh, good evening, uh, Mrs. Lawrence. You know me. Well, of you. My name is uh, Morris. I'm uh, an acquaintance of your Uncle Simon. May I see him? I'm afraid he's not here. Oh, why? Well, I thought he was due back from his trip. Oh, yes. We're expecting him as it happens. Well, then I wonder if I could just come in and wait. Well, you, uh, tonight it might be a little inconvenient. Uh, it's rather pressing, and I seldom have time don't to... bother about the bags, buddy. The man will get them. Well, I just need my cosmetic bag. You don't need that or anything else. Now, let's get in and tell everybody the good news. Hello. What are you doing here? I have to see you, Mr. Brokaw. It's rather urgent. Well... Well, uh, tonight is scarcely the best time. I have a busy schedule. It's my only time. I'm desperate. All right. Come in. Let's all get inside where it's warm. You picked an awkward time. Well, I've been trying to see you ever since we made our ill-advised bargain. Ill-advised? At least from my side. So, what is it you want? I want to call it off. I want to go back being myself, er, being you. I wouldn't blame you for a moment, dear boy. I find it just as delightful as perhaps you remember. Uh, too delightful for me to think of giving up. You see, I am perfectly satisfied as things are. And I wouldn't change them back again for the world. Now, this is an interesting twist. Death calls for someone and is refused out of hand. Of course, he did relinquish his peculiar power over this one individual when they struck a bargain. Or did he? Come to think of it, there are so many ramifications from that special agreement which we have never probed or looked into. That will be for when I return shortly with Act Three. with another confrontation. The same principles, but a vastly different set of circumstances. A man comes to death to beg for his questionable gift and is refused by death, who has found that the joys of worldly living are infinitely preferable to the cold, lonely world he used to occupy, while apparently Simon Brokar, who eagerly exchanged his world for death's barren one in order to escape dying is bitterly regretting his bargain. You've got to call it off. Got to? Why? Because I can't stand this ghoulish job you foisted on me. I want to be back in my own body again, to be myself. If you should become Simon Brokaw again, my first commission as death would be to claim you, as I was sent to do in the first place. You would have to die immediately. Well, I'll take my chances on that. Hmm? What chances? Well, you look robust enough to me. You're healthy as a pig and eat and drink like one. You throw my money around like water. You've stolen my mistress and enjoy her. You charter planes to fly like an Arabian oil sheik. Gamble as though you were King Farouk. Enjoy wine, song, and my woman to a fault. You certainly seem remarkably healthy to me. My dear Mr. Morris. Don't call me that. It's your present name. Oh, very well. Death, if you prefer. I don't prefer. I'm Simon Brokaw. Were, my dear man, were. I am now Simon Brokaw. And after such a long contact with the dead and dying, I haven't the slightest intention of giving up my contact with the living. First, I have never been so happy and satisfied in my life. Second, while I occupy the body of Simon Brokaw, it functions at peak performance. Oh. To let you reoccupy it would be a total waste, since life would be snuffed out in that moment. And last, 
I don't want to return to being the messenger of death ever. I can't blame you for that. There isn't a moment's peace. It does keep you hopping. There's no enjoyment in it. My friend, you chose to be where you are. You live with it. Supposing I just plane up and quit. <laughs> you can't do that. How do you know? Did you ever try it? Hmm? Well, no, but... Oh. Ah, there you see. You hear that? What am I going to do? Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to dash away, Mr. Morris. So, here we are. A little cognac all around to celebrate the first uh, family dinner since Bunny and I returned. Oh, thank you, Uncle Simon. Mr. Brokaw? It's sweetheart. A little toast to our future together. Whatever it may be. Cheers. Oh, yes, oh, yeah, <laughs> Perry? Perry, why are you looking at me so quizzically? Oh, was I? I'm, I'm sorry. Well, don't be. You have every right. I would just like to know what you what you were thinking. Perry, dear, I... No, no, Wait. Nita. I really want to hear. Well, all right, sir. I, uh... I was thinking to myself how incredible it is... What's happened to you in the last weeks? I mean, you're you're a different man. Of course I'm a different man. Why shouldn't I be? I walked away from death, out of the shadows. And for the first time in my life, I've learned how to enjoy myself. I've learned to give instead of eternally taking. Oh, that's my kind, generous, sweet darling. But there are limits, you know. Yes, well, we can discuss those when we're alone, Bunny. For the moment, let me enjoy my family gathered around me. <gasps> what was that? It's Mrs. Marples. An accident? Come on, Perry. It sounded as though she could have fallen down the stairs. <laughs> oh. What is it, Perry? Oh. I can't tell yet. Back, oh. internal injuries. Oh. Maybe a stroke. Oh. we got to get her to the hospital immediately. Oh. Bunny's phoning for an ambulance. Oh. Well, I'd better get on the phone myself. I should have enough clock oh. to shake out emergency oh. faster. Oh, Mr. Brokaw, I, I have to say something. She wants to try to tell you something, oh. Uncle. Very well. Uh, Mrs. Marples, what are you trying to say? Uh, the man... The, the, the thing, he, he was here. What man? What thing? He said the bell tolled f for him to come for me. But to tell you, he would come no, no more. Is, is she dead? No, I think she's just lapsed into a coma. Oh, Perry... Yeah, what is it, Nina? Is the ambulance coming? Yeah, it's on the way. Well, you'd better have a look at her. What? She dead? I don't know. There's no pulse, no heartbeat, but she's still breathing. It's like she was... I don't know how to say it. It's... Like she had died, but death hadn't come to claim her. Simon Brokaw, whatever you want to call yourself, where are you? Come on, man, you can't do it. You can't stop the process. Death is a fact of life. You can't stop people from dying. Is that what you're up to? Is that what you're trying? Yes, who is it? Wait a minute. Why don't you come in, Mas... Ma ma oh, 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 Bunny, uh, what do you want? Well, I... I thought I heard you talking to someone. Oh, I was talking, uh, and this has a very special truth. I was... Well, you see, I was... I was trying to talk to myself. Simon, are you all right? Mm, I wish I could answer that sensibly. Why? Well, well, you were so funny after they took that poor old Mrs. Marples away. I know you must have been very fond of her, but... Well, she was an old, old lady, and even if it was an accident, she had to die sometime. <laughs> Only she didn't. Didn't what? She didn't die. Won't die. Can't die. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. It was Macbeth who said he heard a voice say, Macbeth does murder sleep. Ma 
Well, who's Macbeth? He's a character in a Shakespeare play. Well, what's he got to do with us? With me, Bunny, with me. You see, I just may have... <laughs> I may have murdered death. What do you think, Perry? What could I think? I'm only a month out of internship. Every big shot doctor in the hospital has done his own work up on Mrs. Marples, and no one can explain it. Look, this isn't like you could pull any plugs. I know, Nita. We're not sustaining life in that old lady. I mean, medical science isn't... But what life is there? No heartbeat. No circulation. The encephalograms are flat. No sign there's any brain Honey, you don't have to lay it out. By every clinical test, Mrs. Marples is dead. Except one. She's still breathing. I tell you, it's weird. And she's only part of it. What do you mean, Perry? Look, look, honey, how many of our terminal cases would we have expected to lose in the last three days while Mrs. Marple has been here? I mean, in the ordinary course of events. I don't know. Five or ten, maybe. In a hospital this size? More like fifteen. And how many have we lost? None. I can think of six of them in my wing alone that are just like her. And, and we're not alone. I mean, I, I've been checking with other hospitals and the police, and even the papers have been making cracks about it. Do you know there hasn't been one obituary notice in these last few days? No homicides, no people died in traffic accidents, nobody drowned or strangled or, or, or slipped in the bathtub or fell off a building or burned up or... I tell you, Nita, it's like... I... I'm afraid to say it. Say what, Perry? Come on. Say it. It's like maybe... Nobody's gonna die anymore. Oh, Mr. Rensselaer, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, come hi. in, come in. Hi, Miss Huggins. What is it? Well, it's fine. I, I mean, Mr. Broker... He's been like a wild man this evening. Oh, what did he say to you on the phone? Uh, just that he wanted to see me. Well, you don't think he's going to change his will again? I'm sure I haven't any idea. Where is he? Uh, upstairs in his bedroom. Then if you'll excuse me. Oh, Mr. Rensselaer. Yeah? I, I told you he was out of his mind. I warn you, he has a gun. Well, he always has had... I don't think he'll want to use it on me. There isn't any more to say. I just wanted you to see that I am rational and in possession of all my senses. Well, we've made tape, as you suggested, which will attest to that better than any words I could use in testimony. So, the will stands up. I can see no reason why not. No matter what happens subsequently... I promise you that I will see to it personally that your last wishes are carried out. But I hope not for a long while yet. That's as it may be. Bunny deserves some consideration, but not all of it. Never all of it. Or most of it. I want Nita and Perry to have that. Yeah, as you have indicated, they'll have it. Good. And, uh, now I like to be alone. Well, are you sure? That... I'm as sure as I am that the world deserves to be a good place to live in. Good night, Rensselaer. Good night, Simon. <sighs> Which it never can be unless death has a place in it again. My name was Death. I relinquished it for trivial reasons. All over the world, a frightening horde of those who should have passed over are waiting for this moment. I took this body that was Simon Brokaw's, and I was weak enough not to relinquish it. I want to give it back. Return, Simon Brokaw, who has broken the faith. Return! For if you think you have still the bell that tolls, for you I will make it ring with the sound of this gun. Where are you? Then wherever you have gone, 
I consign our immortal souls to oblivion or whatever judgment shall be rendered there and your mortal flesh by this act to the resumption of what man may turn his face against but which he cannot live without. It was a night long to be remembered. There were a record number of deaths. A strange epidemic that had no discernible cause, but which seemed to restore a balance in nature. Among the obituaries was one for Simon Brokar. In none of them was there any mention of a Mr. Morris. Which is not too surprising, of course, since he himself was the one who pointed out that his alias was merely a convenience. That his real name was Death. I'll be back shortly. Come away, come away, Death. Let me in sad cypress be laid. But if you ponder it a while, is it so sad? So many deaths are merciful. So many prayed for. So many long delayed. And all of them at the last, not to be questioned, but accepted. For who can cancel, change, escape that one last appointment? Our cast included Norman Rose, William Griffiths, Marion Seldes, Joan Shea, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. what we love. The pessimist claims we are what we hate. The philosopher says perhaps we are a little of each. The idealist says there's a bit of good in the worst of us. The cynic insists there's a touch of evil in the best of us. All of which is just another way of saying that there are two sides to every story, especially the one you're about to hear. mystery drama, Don't Play With Matches, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer. You can't tell the players without a scorecard, and you cannot distinguish the actors without the program. These problems, insofar as they arise at all, are easily solved in ballparks and theaters. However, what we might call the game of life is played on a bigger stage in a greater arena. And sometimes you can't tell who's who until it's too late. Consider Mr. Delbert Casserole. 
healthiest thing a man can have is a hobby. Yes. We have to be taken out of ourselves. We have to try something different. Have a means of self-expression. Now, I have a job. A responsible job, and I perform it well. I enjoy it. But I can't wait for my day off. Then I'm my own man. I get into my car... I drive off somewhere, a change of scene, another atmosphere. Sometimes I'll stop at a bar, strike up a conversation with a stranger. No, 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 this one's on me, I insist. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you kindly. Uh, Parsons is the name. Peter Parsons. Uh, well, I'm Jim Stacy. Oh, what, uh, what business are you in, Mr. Stacy? Well, I work for the city. Is that a fact? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm in the uh, newspaper game myself. I'm a foreign correspondent. Of course, you know my name isn't Peter Parsons. It's Delbert Casserole. And I'm not in the journalism game or anything even near it. But you see, when you go off by yourself, you have an opportunity to live many lives, to play a variety of roles, and it's no end of fun. Uh, thank you kindly for the drink, Mr. Uh... Parsons. Uh, Peter Parsons. Ah, uh, Parsons, Peter Parsons. <laughs> but I have to leave. I promised this friend of mine I'd... Uh, what did you say that your name was again? Uh, Stacy. Uh, oh, a bartender? Um, the same way. Now, uh, just relax, Mr. Stacy. I've interviewed the crowned heads of Europe. Of course, you know, there aren't as many as there used to be. Nor of generals and statesmen and wheeler dealers of all makes and sizes. Well, I promised that they all had one thing in common, these great men. They all knew how to relax. Thank you, bartender. Now, Miss Stacy, here you go. Relax and drink up. Well, this is this has got to be the last one. Ah, savor it, my friend. Savor it. Relish. Enjoy. Do you know what you're doing, Mister Stacy? You are doing something for you. Hmm? You understand that? Uh, no. Something for you. Now, almost all of your time, all of your time and effort is devoted to the well-being of other people. Isn't that right? Your wife, children, and then you labor for the banker, the butcher, the grocer, the oil companies, and all the list is endless. Now, you follow this? Well, I... Uh, when you drink, when you eat, these are actions that are performed for you and for you alone. This is what you do for yourself, Mr. Stacy. Yes, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh... Parsons. Peter Parsons. Yes, but I really must be running. <laughs> Good night. Now the evening has begun, and I am properly primed. I am intellectually stimulated. My mind is firing on all cylinders. So, I'm ready for a good dinner. I look for a fine eating place. A man should widen his outlook. Broaden his tastes, as it were. And tonight I choose a Russian restaurant. Now, let me see. The cutlets Kiev or the shashlik? Uh, which do you recommend? They're both good, sir. Well, I must say that one should be better, would you agree? But they're both good, Oh, but sir. all restaurants specialize. Now, the shashlik is Georgian, the cutlets Kiev are Ukrainian. Uh, tell me, wh where does the chef come from? Kiev or Tiflis? I, uh, I, I think he comes from Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> Well, the menu is splendid. I haven't seen better even in Russia. Oh, you've been to Russia? Oh, many times. Many times. You see, uh, I'm a construction engineer. Oh? Uh, I I've never really known Russia. My folks brought me here when I was just a little kid. Oh, it's a beautiful country. Yes? I've built railroads in the snowy Ural Mountains, constructed dams in the Dunitz Basin, oil refineries near the Black Sea city of Sevastopol in the Crimea. I am someone unusual. Someone out of the ordinary. I can see her eyes examining my expensive handmade suit, my custom tailored shirt. And the hard glance of appraisal dissolves into a soft look of invitation. My folks told me a great deal about the old country. No, I could tell you more. Oh, could you? Uh, well, when they close this place tonight, we might go somewhere that's quiet and comfortable. Have a glass of wine. 
and talk about Russia. The motel is small. It might be considered somewhat seedy. But it's run by a sleepy-eyed desk clerk who doesn't ask a single question, doesn't look twice at the phony information you inscribe in the register, and wastes no time taking your money and handing you your room key. I don't even know your name. <laughs> I don't know yours either. Anya. Anya Petrov. That's what my parents gave me. I call myself Anna Peters. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, my name is, uh, Woodrow Wilson. What? That sounds familiar. Yes, I'm named after President Woodrow Wilson. Oh. Well, we're distantly related. Our family name is Wilson, so Woodrow comes quite naturally. Oh, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? I mean, he was one of those World War One-ish presidents, wasn't he? Yes. Woodrow, I hope you don't think I do this all the time. Do what? This. Go to a motel with the man I just met. There's just something about you so different. Different? How? I don't know. I just feel you're an unusual person. That even what you're doing now is something serious and important to you. It is, isn't it? Yes. I'm very serious. Oh, and I'm very lonesome. I don't see why. No. No, it's more than lonesome. I'm lonely. Do you know what it is to be lonely? I don't see why you should be lonely. You're a very beautiful woman. Oh, yes. Yeah, there are plenty of men who'd want to be with me. But you're the first one, the only one, who ever made me feel important. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Oh, Woodrow, hold me. Kiss me. All I wanted was to take her in my arms. And then, then as I kissed her, there was a feeling of... There was a feeling of... Let me make sure that I say this right. There was a feeling of nothing. I felt nothing. A moment before, my heart had been pounding, my pulse racing. And now, suddenly, without warning, the excitement was ended. As if the frantic desire that had been surging within me had either died or disappeared... And then, then did I hear a laugh, a low mocking laugh. What are you laughing at? I, I, I'm not laughing. Yes, you are. All right, I'm laughing. Why are you laughing? Oh, it's better than crying. Now cut that out. I'm sorry. Well, well what's so funny? Oh, well, I guess nothing. Then why did you laugh? Oh, I said I was sorry. I want to go home. Why? We shouldn't have come here. Why? You shouldn't have asked me. Because I'm somebody you can laugh at, is that it? Please, I want You'll to go home. You'll be sorry you laughed at me. You, you don't have to take me home. I, I can get a cab. You're laughing at me. No, no, I'm not. I can hear it in your voice. I swear you I'm You have that not. grin on your face. I don't. Look in the mirror. Please, let go of me. Turn your head. Please. Turn your head and look in the mirror. Please, let go of me. You see that grin <laughs> like an obscene, <laughs> filthy little rat? Let go of take me. Take that grin off your face. Take it off. I'll teach you to laugh at me. I'll teach you. The grin vanishes from her mouth. Her eyes bulge. A look of horror contorts her face. A shudder wrecks her body. And now she becomes limp. I take my hands away from my throat and she slides noiselessly to the floor. I leave the room and close the door behind me. There's no one in sight. I get into my car, back out of the parking lot, into the highway. I floor the accelerator until the needle reads 90. The night is cold, the sky is clear, the air is crisp. I thrill to the chill of the wind that sweeps over me. I am at peace. Because I know now what it is I must do to find fulfillment. Up ahead, about 100 yards, I see the lights of a gas station. I pull over to the side of the road and I get out of the car. I approach the station on foot. Can you help me? Uh, I ran out of gas a couple of miles down the road. I can give you a couple of gallons in a can. Uh, how many gallons that can hold? Five. Well, you might as well fill it up. Be heavy to carry. No, I don't mind. <laughs> I'd give you a lift, but the kid's out with the tow truck. Oh, that's perfectly all right. If you're just a couple of miles down the road, you don't need five gallons to get back here. Well, uh, once bitten, twice shy. I just don't want to run dry again. Okay. Five years. 
Very good. Now, what do I owe you? That's two seventy for the gas, and I uh, got to charge you a three dollar deposit for the can. Uh, 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 just give me the two seventy. I trust you. You got an honest face. Well, thank you. I can't tell you how wonderful you make me feel. I'm a minister. And to meet a man who uh, truly lives the word. God bless you. Well, <laughs> thank you, Reverend. I walk back to the car. I make a U-turn. I tingle all over. I know now that I am accepting the truth. And I shall be truly committed. In a few minutes, I see exactly what I'm looking for. I turn off the highway and I drive slowly, cautiously, because it's a most deserted part of town. Still, I must take no chances. I pull up in front of the building, a large, rambling two-story warehouse made of wood, ramshackle, old, obviously deserted. I move quickly to the rear, carrying the five-gallon can. I have never felt so alive, so vital. I find a broken window. In a moment, I'm inside, and the floor is covered with piles of rags and papers. I pour the gasoline. Soak everything thoroughly. Now, I strike a match, and I feel a shock run through my entire body. There's a burst of flame. I run to the window. I jump clear. On the corner near my car, a firebox. I pull the alarm, and I get back into the car. I drive down the block, park in an alleyway where I can watch. By now, the flames from the burning building are shooting up to the sky. And here they come, the engines. The engines, the gleaming red engines. And the crowd begins to gather. Where do they come from? Why do they want to watch? Are they like me? Oh, it's so warm, so pleasant, so relaxing. There's nothing like this. Nothing in the world. I thought I'd wait up for you last night, Dell, and I fell asleep. Uh, what time did you finally get home? Oh, it must have been close to three, Rhoda. Where were you? I tried to reach you at Frank O'Malley. I never got there. I was on the Pleasantville Road, and I stopped at a diner. Oh, P Porgies? I remember I was supposed to see Frank next week. As long as I was out that way, I decided to uh, drop in on Joe Stevens. Well, that's 40 miles further up the road. Oh, I just thought I'd surprise him, but there was no one home. Oh, that whole drive for nothing. And then on the way back, I had a flat. <laughs> I guess it just wasn't your night. No, it wouldn't have been so bad, except that I didn't have that, uh... Oh, you know, the thing you need to change the tire. Uh, you, you mean the jack? No, no, the, the lug wrench, you know. There it was, pitch dark, miles from anywhere, and I'm trying to flag down cars. Oh, poor Dad. Anyway, finally somebody stopped, and I was able to change the tire. Oh, what a night. Why did you try to reach me at Frank O'Malley's? Oh, I didn't have a moment's peace last night. As I said, that phone wouldn't stop ringing. Well, couldn't you tell people it was my night off? I mean, everyone's entitled to a night off. Oh, yes, dear, everyone but you. Evidently, you're not supposed to have one. Why? Because you're the fire chief. that what he does for a living? Well, you must admit he has the strangest hobby for a man in his position. Yes, and you must also admit you meet a most colorful crop of strange characters here. But this is only the first act. Give our characters a chance to ripen in Act Two, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. Obviously, what we're concerned with here is what might be called the double life of Delbert Casserole. We've shown you Delbert on his day off, away from home, relaxing, enjoying himself. Now we would like to show you the serious workaday Delbert as an important member and a concerned citizen of his community. Good morning, I'm Jerry Behagen, and this is the program where you meet the people who make the world go round. Today's guest is a man you never think about until you need him. But when you do need him, you simply can't think of anyone else. He is fireman. Actually, he's the fire chief of Caswell's Corners, Delbert Casserole. 
Well, how are you this morning, Chief Caswell? Just fine, Jerry. Just fine. The Chief has a most unique distinction. Caswell Corners has the lowest number of fires per capita of any community in the United States. Well, how do you account for that, Chief? Well, I guess it's because... Well, the... we'll find out in just a few moments. First, I have some fascinating news for all our viewers. Andy, this is Rhoda Casserole. Oh, fine. Uh, did Eddie tell you I left the car at the garage this morning after I dropped Dell off at the TV station? He's being interviewed. Oh, look, the commercials are on now, so just let me tell you quickly. He had a flat late last night... So I guess the tire had better be fixed. He never thinks of those things. He just puts on the spare and throws the flat tire in the trunk. Andy, can you have it by noon? Oh, great. Thanks a lot. I have to get back to the show. Now, Chief, uh, according to the records, there wasn't a single residential or commercial fire in Caswell Corners during the past year. That's correct. Well, uh, how do you count for it? Prevention, Jerry. Very strict comprehensive system of prevention. Oh, well, can you explain that? Well, unless you're dealing with an act of God, and that doesn't occur too often, you get a fire because A, someone was careless, B, someone's violating a rule, or C, a combination of both. As for how about D, those people who deliberately start fires, the arsonists? Well, there you have unfortunate sick people. And there's nothing a fire department can do about them. They belong to the psychiatrists. That's well, I raise the point, Chief, because not too far from here, over in Dawson County, there was a fire late last night that was definitely of suspicious origin, according to the authorities. Yes, I read about that in the morning paper. A huge old deserted warehouse. You know, six firemen were injured, and three rather seriously. Mm. Now, what should be done to people, to arsonists who do... Jerry, I feel too strongly about it to be quoted on the air, frankly. The only words that I could possibly use would have to be censored. Yes, well, now about your program of prevention. Yes. Well, now we have... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I must interrupt again. We'll be right back with Chief Casserole. But first... And now, before we return to Chief Casserole, a message of fantastic importance. Are you the manager here? Yeah. Lieutenant Stacy, homicide. Yeah, what can I do for you, Lieutenant? Uh, first, you can turn off that set. Oh. You uh, want to ask about that girl that was murdered here last night, huh? I already talked to other cops. I don't know nothing. Believe me, nothing. You never saw the girl before? Nope. And when I tell you I don't know nothing, it ain't because I don't happen to know nothing. With me, it's deliberate. The man who was with her... I'm in the kind of business where if you don't know nothing, you're better off. The man. i uh, never seen him for either. He signs the register, John Smith. Did he show any uh, identification? He paid cash. He didn't have to. Well, can you describe him? Uh, tall, thin, kind of whitish blonde hair. Mm -hmm. Dressed? A uh, blue sport jacket, gray pants. Mm -hmm. uh, now, wait, 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 wait a minute. He uh, looks familiar. Well, if you never saw him before, why should he look familiar? Yeah. Uh, uh, why should he look familiar? Uh, let me think. You were about to tell us there are practically no fires in Castle Corners, Chief. Well, we have a program of rigid inspection, Jerry, for all commercial and industrial buildings. Yes. And a very comprehensive safety program in the schools. I see. Prevention, Jerry, that's the key word. Well, this may be a silly question, but doesn't it get boring? I mean, here are all you firemen sitting around the firehouse, and you never get to go to a fire. Hello? Yes, this is Mrs. Casserole. Oh, Andy. Yes? What's that? What do you mean, which tire do I want you to fix? The one that has the flat in it. But that's impossible. Delbert said he had a flat... Oh... Well, I, 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 I... Well, maybe I made a mistake. I'll be by to pick up the car. Uh, why does this guy look familiar? I, uh, I know i seen him someplace, Lieutenant. Where? Oh, it'll come to me. <laughs> Crazy. Turn the tip of my tongue. A tall, kind of slender guy with whitish blonde hair. Uh, make that uh, grayish blonde. That's funny. Yeah? What's... Funny, Lieutenant. Sounds like a guy I think I saw myself. Where? Uh, you say you've seen this guy too, Lieutenant? Now, now, look. You keep thinking. 
And when you remember where you saw him, call headquarters. We were asking Chief Delbert Casserole if life didn't get boring around the firehouse. Well, Chief, does it? No, oh, no, no, not a bit. Well, don't you miss the excitement of racing down the streets full speed? You know, with the sirens screaming, the bells clanging? No, no. Uh, and the thrill of conquering the fire itself, of subduing the flames, the uh, adventure of rescuing trapped people from burning buildings. No, no, no. No, the greatest excitement a fireman can experience, Jerry, is the quiet excitement of sitting in the firehouse and knowing that all is well, all is safe in the city. I'm Lieutenant Stacy Homicide. No, it's Homicide. Look, I told the other cops I... I... Wait, what are the cops? The arson cops. What arson cops? Oh, they had this fire last night. I don't know if I'm in a gym or not. Which fire? Over in Southland. The old Magruder warehouse went up like a Roman candle. Well, that's not what I'm here for. I'm looking for a guy who might have stopped off to buy gasoline here. He spent the night at Plum's Motel down the line. Well, how would I know? He was a tall, thin guy with whitish blonde hair. He could have worn a... A blue uh, sport jacket with gray pants. Yes, that's the one. Tell me about him. What make car was he driving? I don't know. This guy said he was a preacher. How could he have been a preacher? But anyhow, he says he ran out of gas. So I fill him up a five-gallon can. And he got such an honest face, I don't even ask him a deposit. He'll like that. Uh, keep telling me about him. What can I tell you? Next I know, the arson cops are here. This can, this five-gallon can of gas, turns up, guess where? In the burnt-out ruins of the warehouse. Were they sure it was the same can? Oh, yeah. It was kind of twisted out of shape by the flames and all. But you could read where I scratched my name on it, Paul's service station. Uh, this tall, whitish, blonde-haired guy with the blue sports jacket and gray pants. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's him. You mean he done something else last night? Chief Chesterall, now, in conclusion, do you have any parting words for our audience? Well, Jerry, I'd just like to say that fire can be the most tragic loss of all because it's the most needless. Well, thank you, Chief. Folks, our guest this morning has been Chief Delbert Casserole of the Casserole Corners Fire Department, a fireman who very rarely gets a chance to go to a fire. Rhoda, I'm home. Yes. Did you catch the show? Uh, yes. Well, how'd I do? Uh, well, I mean, people I... kept calling me office all day. You know what they said? They said I looked sensational. What did you think? Uh, well, what did I think? Uh, about what? Oh, what about the show? How did I come over? Oh, uh, very nice. Very nice? Is that all? I mean, people kept calling all day. They said I was a born TV personality. Hey, let me get that. Hello? Oh, Frank, yeah. How you saw it, huh? <laughs> sure. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks, Frank. That, uh, that was Mayor Frank Houghtonborn himself. Said the show was absolutely the greatest. How come you, uh, you thought it was just nice? Well, it was all right. Well, what was wrong? What do you mean, wrong? I mean, why didn't you like it? Well, I didn't say I didn't like it. I wrote it, something's bothering you. Now, what is it? Oh, I, I don't know. Now, something's bothering you. Look, Rhoda, we've always been absolutely honest with each other, haven't we? Have we? What are you saying? Delbert. At first, I didn't know if I should bring this up. Then I knew if I didn't, it would just fester and grow bigger and uglier. What are you driving at? Let me finish. It's hard enough. And now that I've decided to do it, I don't know how to put it. Will you get to the point for crying out loud? I'm not sure what the point is. Bill, we decided when we got married that each of us would have a night alone. Well? Friday. Well, I never really go anywhere Friday. I sit home and read or I relax or I might watch TV. Rhoda, where is all this headed? Where do you go, Delbert? I know we're supposed to respect each other's privacy, but where do you go? Where, for instance, did you go last night? Last night? Why did you say you came home late because you had a flat tire? Why? You said you had to wait hours to flag down a motorist to borrow a lug wrench. But we have one in the trunk. I looked. Oh, well, I, I might have kept this guy's by mistake. No. It's ours. Anyway, you didn't have a flat tire. 
Andy at the garage told me all the tires were okay. The same spare he sold us was in the well. Dell, look at me. Where do you go on Friday nights? Where do I go? Where were you last night? I don't know. And what did you do last night? I don't know. Tell me, Dell. Tell me. I don't know, Rhoda. I swear to you, I don't know. All right. That's an answer. He either does or he doesn't know. We, however, do know. And the portrait of Chief Delbert Casserole slowly but surely begins to emerge. A little fire seems to have started in the chief's own house. And we'll see if it can be put out in the third act. It is accurate, if somewhat redundant, to say that an honest relationship between a man and a woman must be based on the truth. However, how many relationships are truly honest? And how many people could actually tolerate them? And so, people make little adjustments to keep peace and harmony. But sooner or later... Do you mean you have no idea where you go on Friday night? Rhoda, please, don't keep... Don't keep what? Prying, probing. All right. Tell me it's none of my business. Tell me you have a right to a secret. Tell me anything at all, Dell, but don't tell me you don't know. It's the truth. And you don't know where you were last night either? I've already told you that. And the story of the tire, the flat tire. That was a lie. All right, it was a lie. Why? Why? I don't know. I just thought I'd give you a reason why I was so late. Well, where were you last night? You're beginning to sound like a broken record. Well, where I don't were know where I was. There are some things we'll never know. There are mysteries. Dale, I want you to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor. Golden says there's nothing wrong with me. You know the kind of doctor I mean. No. Why not? You know why not. I can't afford it. You have to go. A man who holds public office the way I do cannot afford to go to a psychiatrist. Period. And we're not going to discuss it either. If we're not going to discuss this, we're not going to discuss anything, anything at all. We'll have no relationship of any kind. We'll never even see each other because I will get a divorce. Rhoda. There's something wrong with you, Dell. We don't have very much of a life together as it is. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Well, look, I... I, I, I get home late. I mean, there, there, there's so much to do. I'm, I'm, I'm so tired. I... That's why you have to see a psychiatrist. Rhoda, honey, please. Please. Give me a chance to work my own way out of this, will you? Dell, you need a doctor. Now, look, Rhoda, I'll, I'll get home earlier. I'll even cut out the Friday nights altogether, all right? We'll, we'll try to work it out together. Come on, Rhoda, please. Let, let's at least try. Was she going with anybody? No. I never seen her with a man. Uh, how about friends? Uh, no, not so many friends. Uh, last night, here in the restaurant... Oh, she had lots of moods. You know moods? Women, they they, they have moods. Uh, did anyone pick her up after I was always in the kitchen. I could never figure her out. Did she say anything about where she was going? I don't know. My brother and his wife, they're both dead now. They brought her here from Russia. She was a baby. I've known her all my life. Did you see anyone who might have gone out? A quiet girl. Kept to herself. Stays home in her little apartment. They find her dead in a motel room. Why? How? Does she have some secret life I know nothing about? Uh, last night in this restaurant, did you notice a tall, thin man with blondish white hair and a blue jacket with gray slacks? Did I notice? Why, of course. Of course. Why didn't you ask me in the first place? Of course. The place was crowded last night. The biggest crowd in, in a long time. So ask me, how would I remember a man? Okay, okay. How? Because he was a single. He came in here alone. 
Most people, they come couples, a party of four, a party of six, you understand? But him, he was the only single all night. Where would you have seated him? Over there, in that small little table. And did Anya Petrov wait on him? Sure, why not? It was our stage. Have you ever seen him before? No. Well, did Anya ever speak of anyone who uh, may have looked like him? I told you, she never talked about anybody. All right, all right. This, this person, this, this man, do you think he's the one who... Thank you for your help. Homicide, Lieutenant Stacy speaking. Lieutenant, uh, this is Marvin Plum, uh, Plum's Hotel. Uh, oh, yes, yes, Mr. Plum. You said I was to call if I ever remembered where I'd seen that guy before. Uh, you know, the one who... Oh, yes, yes, Mr. Plum. Well, Lieutenant, what's the hardest thing in the world to find? I don't know. Something that's been right under your nose all along. Uh, about the man... Yes, yes, sir. The thing, it wasn't where I'd seen him before. That's what threw me. I'd never seen him before. Uh, then why did you say you'd seen him before? It was where I'd seen him since. Since? Since the murder. But the murder had only taken place the night before. This was the next morning. Now, where would you have seen him since? He was right in front of my eyes. Where? He'd have been right in front of your eyes, too, if you'd have been facing the TV set. He was on the program. Who? This guy who is a dead ringer for the one you're looking for. The guy who checked into the motel. The guy who killed the waitress. Who? It's got to be his double or his twin brother. He was on the show. He's the guy, the fire chief over at Caswell's Corners. You haven't touched your dinner, Del. I'm not hungry. But you should eat something. But I am not hungry. Delbert, this is exactly what we talked about. You have to lead a more calm, a more relaxed, a less pressure-filled life. Okay, I'll try. Darling, I'm trying to help you. I know, I know. Oh, I still think you should see a psychiatrist. Let's not talk about it right now. But when should we talk about it? Tomorrow. Now I have to go out. Where? Where? It's Friday night. We never ask each other about Friday night. Wait a minute, Dell. We agreed there would be no more Friday nights. When did we agree? Last week. Don't you remember? Well, I, I, I just thought I'd go out for a drive and relax and have a few drinks. No, Dell. No, you're going to stay home and relax from now on. Rhoda, we agreed when we got married that... Dell, you're in trouble. You won't let a psychiatrist help you, and if you won't let me help you, I'll walk out. No, Rhoda, no. Now, we're going to spend a quiet, relaxing evening at home. Homicide, Lieutenant Stacy. Oh... Yes, I know, Inspector. Yes, it's a bad time for the department. The waitress killing, the arson. But I'm doing the best I can, sir. No, no, I, I don't don't have a thing. But, uh, no, no, okay, okay, maybe I do, but it's so far out. I, I mean, I could have a suspect. No, but it, it's impossible. It just simply couldn't be this guy. No, no, I won't tell you who he is either, because you'll drop me over at the nut house. What do you want me to do? Go to the public library. Ye yes. And read what? The story about Sherlock Holmes called The Sign of the Four? And now, Inspector, is this a gag? Oh, well, yes, sir. Yes, sir, if it's an order. Now, darling, isn't this pleasant? Yeah, I just, uh... You just what? No, I'm just not used to being home on a Friday night, that's all. Why? Why do you find it so necessary to go out? I don't know. Well, try to think. There is something lacking in our relationship that you have to find it elsewhere. Is something lacking? Well? Yes. You know what it is. Delbert, I'm willing to be patient. And perhaps if both of us try... No, Rhoda, it isn't that. Why do you women always think that? That it has to do with... With... Then what else is lacking? It's something that... Yes? 
And I think he said it. Who said the it? The one on the program, that Jerry, whatever his name is, he said it. Well, what did he say? I can hear him. I can hear exactly how he said it. Doesn't it ever get boring? I mean, here are all you firemen sitting around the firehouse, and you never get to go to a fire. Now, don't you miss the excitement of racing down the street, sirens screaming? Bells clanging and the thrill of conquering the fire itself, of subduing the flames, the adventure? But I also heard what you answered, Del. The greatest excitement a fireman can experience is the quiet excitement of sitting in the firehouse and knowing that all is well, all is safe in the city. If I said that, I lied. Del! Because I miss it. I miss it. I need it. What? What do you need? The fire. What? Fire. The fire. The fire shooting up into the sky. The searing flames, the billowing smoke. The shots of the fire and the police, the crowds. And the flames. Ooh, those flames. Have you ever seen the rest of the street, the other houses? How the shadows play over them, the shadows of the leading flames? And you can almost feel those houses and buildings shudder and moan with fear and dread and apprehension. Shall they be destroyed or shall they be saved? Del, don't say any more. Just sit here with me. Let me put my arms around you. No, that won't help. She tried that. They all try that. It's the same as it is with you. It's no good. A doctor. Dell, you'll have to see a doctor. No. A fire. I want to see a fire. You know, you never see a fire in this town. And it's my fault. Because I'm too good a fire chief. That's why we have no fires. Because I'm too smart, too conscientious. I'm being cheated. Let me go get you something. I need a fire. That's what I need. You understand? A fire. Any fire. In here. Where's my cigarette lighter? No. You see, I light up this pile of newspapers. Delbert! Ah, it's going to scatter them around the room. Oh, we're going to have a fire in here. We're going to have a real fire. No, no, don't! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! I want you to stay here with me and watch it. Watch the beautiful flame. Let go! A new experience for you. I've watched so many fires from the outside. Now we shall see one from the inside. Just the two of us. No! Shut up! We'll be burned to death! I said be quiet! Yes! You're joking me! Good Lord, it is you! What are you doing in my house? Who let you in? It's you, the white haired guy. You're a maniac. Let go of her! Let me go! Get out of here! Let go of her before we all get killed! This place is going up! Now let go! Take it easy, ma'am. Take it easy. Oh, oh, I remember now. My husband's in there. I'm sorry. I was able to get you out. I was not able to make it back for him. He he tried to kill me. Why? Why? I I don't know. I don't know. I thought I'd come here on a fool's errand. I I guess the inspector was right. He set fire to the house. Oh, I can't believe he'd do such a thing. Neither would anybody else, ma'am. Neither would anybody else. Oh, but it's impossible. Impossible. Yes, that reminds me. I I have to make a call. I guess you were right, Inspector. What it said in that book. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. What is the impossible? Is it something that cannot happen under any conditions? Or is it something that we believe cannot happen? The longer we live, the less firm we are in our beliefs about the impossible. Soon, who knows, that very word impossible shall disappear from our language. But I won't disappear. I shall return shortly. was it we asked at the very beginning? Oh, yes. Are we what we love, or are we what we hate? Or are we a mixture of each? Is each of us a formula of highly volatile chemical properties which can explode suddenly, violently, unpredictably? Yes, it is an unpredictable world. And the only certainty you can cling to is the knowledge that we at least shall be here seven nights each week. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Joan Shea, Earl Hammond, and Gilbert Mack. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Neither judge nor jury, but I can state categorically, as a purveyor of tales and histories, that no one is all evil, or to the contrary, all good. We are the sum of what all our attributes add up to, and we can only be judged by our peers, or if that seems too literate, by the people who have to live with us, or whose lives may depend on us. That is the substance of the story of Harry Taylor. Yes? Yes, of course. Send him in. Come in, Harry. Thank you, Warden. It uh, isn't the first time you've been in this office. No, sir. And with due respect, I hope it's the last. Uh, so do I. Harry, I'm not a judge. You were sent to this penitentiary through the due process of law for killing your wife. You've done your time and are now being released on parole. Harry, you've been a model prisoner. I wanted to say goodbye personally. Thank you. And I hope it is goodbye. I won't harp on the past, but for 25 years, society shut me up for something I didn't do. I just hope to God... And I mean this from the heart, Warden. That I'm never tempted to get even. Our mystery drama, For Tomorrow We Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Beatrice Strait. If any one of us was unjustly accused and sentenced, upon gaining freedom again, what would our state of mind be? Would we accept injustice as one accepts a major illness? Or in this case, since man was the villain, would we be inclined to think that we had a ticket to retaliation, a right to hit back at society? Was Harry Taylor unjustly accused and sentenced? And did he try to get even? Let's find out. Just a meal, Mom. I'll get it. Oh, fine, Pesh. And give Don a call. I'm just about ready to put on the eggs. I will. Donald Craig, now hear this. You get your rear out of a sling and get downstairs. This is the captain speaking. Repeat that. Your wife. Your slightest command is my wish. Uh, you want me as I am, all wet and dripping from the shower, or, uh, should I stop to put on at least a towel, Captain Sir White? I'll take you as you are, you gorgeous, able-bodied hunk. But give Mother a break and put something on. (laughs) A fine way to talk. I gave up men with your father. Oh, I wouldn't want you to change your mind this late. (laughs) I was just kidding. Oh, I know, honey. But while you're on the subject of kidding, don't be so smart. There's juice in this old prune yet. Why, Mom, you know, that's kind of embarrassing. Well, so it evens us up. You never liked your nickname, but you learned to live with it. Oh, well, come on. Precious? That's a name for this century? (laughs) We shortened it to Pesh. You'd rather go with your grandmother's name, Gertrude? Oh, no, no, no. I'll I'll take Pesh and climb out easy. Here's the mail. Oh, big thrill. Amanda's boutique has a sale. 
The Fortune supermarket is reducing all the stringy meat they couldn't sell last month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the oil company sending a bill you wouldn't believe it. Wait a moment. I hit the jackpot. What? A real honest-to-God person letter. Oh, from who? A writing I don't recognize. A New York address. The Waldorf Plaza Towers. And... Oh, what is it? I don't believe it. But I just don't believe it. Mom, don't believe what? Harry Taylor. <laughs> well, it couldn't be the same Harry Taylor... Could it? I don't know, Mom. Who is Harry Taylor? Well, if I hadn't married your father, he could just as soon have been your father. What? Harry Taylor. Oh, all the years. You go get your husband out of the shower. I'll hold breakfast and, and let me read this letter to myself. <laughs> Dear Jesse. I suppose it will seem sort of incredible to you hearing from me after all these years. The reason I'm writing is that I might be making a business visit your way to Cincinnati. The street, Wall Street that is, has been very kind to me through the years. My wife died many years ago and I was wondering if I could run up to Dayville and take you out to dinner while I was passing through. Unfortunately, time is, like they say, of the essence. So if you could drop me a line in return, I'd know whether I was welcome to call on you or not. You can write me at the above address with fond memories. Hopefully, Harry. Mom, are you all right? <laughs> it's not anything sad. It's not anything like that. It's... Then what's with the tears? Just nostalgia. Because this letter took me back so far, so far back. I is it really from some old bow that you were serious about? Oh, yes. I sort of broke his heart. Mm. Oh, and speaking of that, let's get those eggs broken into the pan before we burn up all the butter. Well, I'll, I'll get the eggs. You're the coffee pourer, Don. <laughs> Great. And we'll let Jessie <laughs> handle the toast. And I'll bet that's just what she was 25 years or so ago, the toast of the town. Oh. <laughs> Femme fatale who remains forgotten by a rich New Yorker. What does he have to say to you, Mom? This old flame? Well, he's a Wall Street broker, and his wife died many years ago, and he has to come through Cincinnati on business, and he wanted to stop by and say hello. He wants me to write and tell him if I'd like him to. Oh, are you going to? Oh, I don't know. Maybe not after all these years. Oh, you're not that old. You just told me there's life in the old prune yet. <laughs> and the Waldorf Plaza Towers. Well, he must be really rich. And, and you know what, Don? No. Well, Mom told me this morning when the letter came that uh, this Harry... Uh, what, what was his name, Mother? Harry Taylor. Mm. Pass me the butter, please, Don. Harry Taylor. If Mom hadn't married my dad, it could have been him. Uh, bacon coming up. He was a boy who wanted to marry me. Oh, go ahead and you start with the toast and eat, Don. You have an office to go to. Bacon, everybody. Oh, not just any boy, though. Oh, no. Matter of fact, we were, we were sort of engaged. Or oh, till I met your father. Oh, oh. <laughs> Was Harry mad? He was ready to go fight with Jim over me. Mm, I only need one guess why he didn't. <laughs> oh, Jim wouldn't have hurt him. You know how gentle he was. Oh, sure, but uh, still a jolly green giant. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to tangle with him, I'll oh, tell you. Oh, Jim would never have hurt a fly, but... Well, Harry... What about Harry? What a temper he had. I remember... Uh, remember what? Well, he kind of scared me. I mean, when he realized he couldn't take on Jim. He had a temper. Oh, the way he carried on, he, he even threatened to kill me. Mom! Oh, of course, he didn't really mean it. But he was a wild one. And kind of sweet. So easy to hurt. Poor boy. Wall Street! Well, he always did have a head for figures. Mm, yeah, and an eye for him. Uh, Jesse, uh... 
Mama, <laughs> maybe you'd better let him pass on through and not rake over any old coals. Huh? Well, there might just be a little fire left in them. Well, it might be just what I need to shake me out of a rut. Oh, you don't like it here with Don and me? Oh, of course I do, dear. I have plenty of money to go live by myself if I want to, and... I did have an idea that I was going to be useful around here as a built-in babysitter. Well, sorry to disappoint you, Mom. You won't have to worry till things get a little more unscrambled here. Oh, which reminds me, I've got to scramble, too. I'm due at the store in 20 minutes. Yeah, well, that done. Now, my boss is out of town, so I can be a little late. I'll, tell you, I'll circle around in the car and drop you off. Uh, look, Mom, I- if you want to have your old love here... Go ahead. I never said he was my old love. Well, I I didn't mean it the way that sounded. I just meant your old high school sweetheart or whatever he was. Sure, I'd like to get a look at the guy myself. What he could have that Big Jim didn't, I'd like to see. Why do you think I married Jim, you lunkhead? (laughs) (laughs) Just so you could have Precious here for me to marry. I told you, if you ever called me that name, I'd leave you. Okay, Gertrude. (laughs) Bye, Mom. Oh, you crumb. Bye, Mom. Just call me by my own name. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Pesh. Sounds like a breakfast cereal. (laughs) But it's good for you. (sighs) Do I really want to see him again? I've lived my life, and it's stopped with Jim. Five years now. But I'm not all that old. Dear Harry... What a surprise to hear from you again after all these years. You didn't mention any children. I have one. A girl married to a lovely boy practicing law. I mean, he's already a lawyer, but just beginning. If you are coming so near the old town, why don't you stop by for dinner? Or if you like, we have a guest room. Well, it's like in the rumpus room, but the bed is really comfortable and the kids love to have guests. Please consider yourself one and this is an invitation. Let me know. I'd love to see you again and renew old acquaintance for old Lang Syne, Jesse. For old Lang Syne. You hadn't turned me down, Jesse. I'd never married Flo. And if I hadn't married that drunken... Well, I might just take you up on that invitation, Jesse. Maybe we could wipe the board clean. Hi, Jess. Where's my frau? In the kitchen. Oh, Long day. How was yours? <laughs> How different can they be, Don? Tuesdays and Thursdays, the hospital service, Friday bingo, Sunday after service, the women's auxiliary group, coffee and cookies, courtesy of the membership. Mm. The other days passed by without much interruption. Except. Yes? That's Harry Taylor. You know, my old boyfriend? Oh, yeah. I wrote him and said I'd be glad to see him and. I even said he could stay overnight in the rumpus room if he needed a place. I hope you don't mind. Don't mind? Why would I mind, Jess? This is your house. Oh, don't be silly. Sure, it's in my name because that's the way Jim left it. But you know everything I've got is yours and Pesha's. I'm just living out my three score and ten. And trying to keep out of your way. Hey, that you, muscle man? Here I come, isolating my stomach muscles. Well, you better start <laughs> isolating them. You're getting a touch flabby. Ah, don't feed me so good. <laughs> mm. Hey, I hear we may have a visitor. Who? Hey, your mom's old boyfriend. Well, why not? Do you mind? Well, not me. I just wonder what kind of old fogey he is. Well, whatever he is, how much can he mean in our lives? If mom wants a nice sentimental moment of nostalgia... Yeah, she is entitled. I just hope he won't be a bomb. Please define that. <laughs> I mean a splat. A and a, spl- yeah, a nothing. A big bore. <laughs> uh, what did you have in mind? Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a female animal with funny vibes. I just have a silly hunch it would have been better if he'd never raised his head out of the past. But, like you say, it's mom's house. 
And she's entitled to her own guests, no matter how far they climb out of the past. Oh, I just hope he won't be a specter at the feast. If Pesh Craig could have heard that earlier muttered remark by Harry, maybe we can wipe the board clean. Or if she had known that he was a man who spent nearly half his life in jail for killing a woman, she might have paid more attention to those vibes of hers. But she didn't really take them seriously, nor did her husband Don until later. Or perhaps too late. I'll return in a moment with Act Two. We've all been guilty of such phrases as, I could have killed that wife of mine, or I could have cut his throat for doing that. Typical overstatements, which of course we don't really mean. That is, most of us, some of us must, because people do kill other people in the heat of anger and sometimes even in cold blood. Once Harry Taylor told Jesse Dingman he was ready to kill her for jilting him. But does a man hold that thought, nourish such a grudge for nearly three decades? How can one really be sure? Particularly since he spent all that time behind bars for the murder of another woman. Harry Taylor arrived on a Saturday, so we were all three at home to meet him. His arrival was quite something, I might add. Don had offered to drive Mother down to pick him up at Cincinnati Airport. But that's quite a haul from our little town, and he'd called up and said he wouldn't hear of it. He'd rent a car. But, brother, we didn't know he meant a limousine with a chauffeur who ran around to open the car door for him. Old Mrs. Johnstone across the street pretty near put her sharp old nose right through the window. Particularly when the chauffeur followed him with a box of flowers big as a coffin almost and a straw basket full of champagne bottles. Holy cow, you look at that coat with a fur collar. Probably lined with mink. Mom? Yes, dear? Daddy Warbucks is here. Who? Uh, your old flame, I guess. Isn't that Harry Taylor coming up the walk? I don't know. Well, he's not like the Harry I remembered. Come away from the window. Don't let him see where you're staring. See? You don't suppose this is a case of mistaken identity, do you? Well, we'll soon find out. <laughs> you want me to open the door, Mom? No, no. Let me. Hello, Jesse. Harry. Harry. It is you. I guess I didn't age as well as you. I'd have known you anywhere. <laughs> It wasn't that. It's just that you were always in jeans and a windbreaker, and, and I never saw you in a hat. <laughs> I'm sorry. Come in. Come in, Harry. It's good to see you. I've been looking forward to this for a long time, Jesse. Just kind of took me a while to make up my mind. Well, I'm glad you did. Oh, won't you ask your friend in? Oh, that's my chauffeur. Hey, uh, uh, Brody, I'll take the flowers. Uh, Jesse, would you show Brody where the kitchen is? I guess that champagne ought to go in the icebox or something. Champagne? Well, sure. <laughs> you know, like the old song or whatever, eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> For tomorrow we die. Kind of by reflex action, my mind completed the old quotation as Jess brought Harry Taylor in to meet us, while Pesh took the chauffeur out to the kitchen to put the champagne away. And just for a moment, while we were being introduced, looking at the guy, I got some strange vibes myself. I mean, it was his skin tone. He looked sort of dead and white, like you think of a corpse. But... There was nothing dead about his handshake. That was firm. Matter of fact, since I wasn't expecting it, he almost cracked my knuckles. I'm pleased to meet you, son. You sure got good taste in mother-in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. I, I feel the same way myself. Oh, now, don't call me, sir. Make it Harry. Hmm? Would you like Don to go out and get your bag from the car? Hmm? 
Uncle, aren't you going to stay with us? Oh, well, no, I would want to put you out like that, Jess. I, I've got some rooms at the hotel. Oh, but we made plans, and we expected you for dinner. Oh, that, that part's all right. That's why I brought the champagne. And then tomorrow I thought you and me could take a ride in the car or maybe walk down memory lane, have lunch out at the carriage house. Oh, oh but that's so expensive now. <laughs> it always was. Never could have bought it before, and that's why I checked to make sure it was still in business. I have a reservation. Oh, my. I, I don't think I have anything to wear. Well, if you haven't, we'll go out in the morning and buy you something. The champagne's all put away, <laughs> Mr. Taylor. Mr. Brody wanted to know if you needed him for anything else. Oh, no, he, he can go. Uh, what time do you think I ought to have him come back and pick me up? Hmm? I, I, I don't know. You sure you don't want to stay? I don't want to be any trouble, Jesse. Just give me an but idea. Look, uh, Mom, I can drive Mr. Taylor. Uh, uh, Harry, oh, please. Yeah. Uh, Harry, Harry, back to the hotel. It's, it's only a few blocks. Well, I'll settle for that. We'll give Brody a night on the town. Hmm? <laughs> Although, <laughs> what he's going to do with it in Dayville, I don't know. If uh, you'll excuse me, I'll uh, just make sure he's got enough money to let him go. Oh, that good Lord bless us. If I didn't know that was Harry Taylor to look at, I I wouldn't believe it. He is a bit overwhelming. I mean, well, I guess it comes from being rich. And he's real nice, don't you think, Don? Uh, yeah, yeah. He sure is trying to stir things up around here. I, I don't know if it's good or bad. Well, what do you mean? No, that's sort of up to Jess. You may have a kind of... Hot potato to handle, Mom. <laughs> Maybe you better watch your step. With Harry Taylor? Oh, don't be silly. Anytime I can't handle Harry Taylor. Oh, you... You young sex maniac. <laughs> don't feed me any of your 1970s flack. Harry Taylor is nothing but an old friend. It was a lovely evening. I cooked the dinner, but Don and Pesh served it. And by the time dessert came along, lemon meringue pie that I remember was Harry's favorite. It was almost like Jim was alive again. The room was full of fun and love. Oh, that pie, Jess. Just like old, old times. <laughs> Say, uh, what firm are you with, Mr. Uh, uh, Harry? A firm? Yeah, aren't you a broker? I, I mean, on Wall Street? Oh, I was, but I sold out. Well, kind of a bad time. Well, not if you know the tricks of the trade. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you were smart enough to anticipate the bull market and sell short. Uh, yeah, that's the notion, but, uh... <laughs> if you don't mind, I don't want to talk business, I... I've got to admit I'm a little tired after the trip from New York. I think maybe I should get back to the hotel early and plan to be rested for a big day tomorrow. I thought maybe after I take your mother to lunch, you you could all be my guests at the hotel for dinner. Oh, I don't see why we should party. Oh, it might be nice for you to have a night out, Pesh. They do have dancing. Oh, well, yes, that that would be nice if we don't make it too late. with you, Don. You got some kind of chip on your shoulder. Yeah, I can't put my finger on it all the way. It's just a lot of little things. Like what? Well, I mean, three dozen American beauty roses to a small dinner in the suburbs? But I thought he was real cute about that. I mean, one for every year we haven't seen each other and one extra to grow on? Mm, four bottles of champagne for a meatloaf dinner? Mom made the meatloaf especially for him. It, when it, she wrote and invited him, she said she would. It isn't that, Pesh. It's just... Well, everything's out of whack. Now, he says he's a stockbroker. Right. Does he talk like one? Well, I don't know. I never went to one. How does a stockbroker talk? In his hands. You get a good look at him? I suppose so. But what if it's... Those aren't the hands of a guy who sits behind a desk all day. Those are working man's hands. I mean, they're rough and calloused. Baby, your nice old Harry Taylor is a phony. But he... he can't be. He, he couldn't fool Mom about who he is. She remembers no, no, him. No, I don't mean about who he is. I mean about what he does. 
or has been doing. He's not a stockbroker. How could you tell? Because you don't sell short in a bull market. I don't even know what that means.、Mm. The important thing is neither does Mr. Harry Taylor. That was obvious when I asked him that question at dinner. Don, maybe he wasn't paying any attention. He only had eyes for Mom. I don't think he heard half the things we said, and that's why I don't think we should go out to dinner with them tomorrow night. Look, I asked him a couple of other questions while I was driving him to the hotel. Honey, I've got this gut feeling he's up to something, and I don't want to take any chances on anything happening to Jess. Oh, Don, now what are you talking about? I think he's putting on some kind of an act. Oh, honey, yeah, now, look, the limousine, the roses, champagne, money splattered around like it was going out of style. He... You know, your dad left your mom pretty comfortably off, and if this should be some kind of sharper who's looking for a lonely widow to keep him comfort for the rest of his <laughs> Robert, life, Robert, you've been spending too much time around the courthouse. Well, at least I'm glad you didn't come out with what I thought you were going to say. What? Well, the way you're acting, you're just kinky enough to come up with some crazy notion. That he's fattening the victim for the kill. Now, what are you talking about? I mean, what Mom said about thirty-five years ago when she picked Dad instead of Harry Taylor. The first off, he was going to kill Dad, and then he said it would be Mother.、Mm. Now that's really way out. People don't hold grudges for thirty-five years. Well, that's what I say. In any way, you know, he never meant it. It's just talk, kind of thing. Will you leave Mom and Harry alone, honey? I'm only trying to protect her. Well, then butt out, Sir Galahad. Mom doesn't need you. Oh, honey, did you look at her face tonight when Harry and she were talking old times? Oh, it was lit up like with a hundred candles. <laughs> Look at the menu, Jesse. I don't know what I want. You order, Harry. Well,、uh, my、uh, my eyes are not so good anymore, Jess. Just、uh, just pick the most expensive and order that. The most expensive everything. Oh, it won't be too hard. Everything costs an arm and a leg, Harry. I don't want you wasting all your money on me. Oh, now there's plenty more where that came from. I got enough to last more than the rest of my life. Nothing to do with it, but spend it on you. Oh, Harry, that was sweet. But money doesn't mean all that much to me. Spend it while you got it is the way I figure. You,、uh, you ain't gonna have a chance to all that long, Jesse. I guess you got to leave pretty soon, hmm? Well, kind of depends on.、Uh, On the way things work out. Come on, let's order that lunch. Like I keep saying, eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you could die. <laughs> And still, the ambivalence remains. Is Harry Taylor the friendly man he seems to be, renewing a fond and old acquaintance? A wealthy and lonely man who recently struck it rich, or are Don's suspicions warranted? I'll be back shortly with Act Three. One thing you may have noticed about Harry is that he tends to harp on the subject of death. Eat, drink, and be merry. That first time he did not complete the saying. The second time. In completing it to Jesse, he said, "For tomorrow, you die." Was that just a misquote, a misuse of the pronoun? A few nights later, Harry is bringing her back from the local movie in his limousine. I'm sorry you have to go back to New York, Harry. In more ways than one. Like how? Well, I've been wined and dined and entertained and fussed over and. Spoiled, I guess, more than in my whole life. But it isn't the money. It's been good to see you again. I'm glad you had business out this way. Sort of unfinished business.、Uh, I could maybe stay a little longer. Oh, but 
I wouldn't want to put you out. I'll miss you, of course, but... You really mean that? Well, I have my life here, my little activities, and someday I guess the kids will get old-fashioned enough to provide me with a little grandson or a granddaughter, but it's been nice to have a beau again. I do get lonely. <laughs> All of us do at our age, I guess. Look, Jesse, I've got an idea. I do have to get back on to New York for, uh, well, for a reason, but uh, I've got a great idea. Why don't you come with me? What? Oh, no, no, no. You, you know what I mean. I, I don't mean anything wrong. We'll get you a room of your own at the hotel, but New York's where it's at. I mean, we've done Dayville. I, I took you near everywhere in Cincinnati. But in New York, we got the nightclubs, the musicals, the, 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 the places to eat, and everything like that. Why don't you come back with me, Jesse? Oh, I've never been to New York. I've never been much of anywhere, I guess, but... Imagine Park Avenue, Fifth Avenue... With all the big stores. And Rockefeller Center, and, and all the museums, and, and Lincoln Center. And the Statue of Liberty, and <laughs> Staten Island Ferry. Come on, Jesse. <laughs> Say you'll go, huh? Oh, you are tempting me, Harry Taylor. You are tempting me. But, but if I did, it would only be on one condition... What's that? That I pay my own way. Ah, oh, no. Come on, I Jessie. can afford it. Please say yes. Well, I'll talk it over with Pesh first, but... Oh, it would be fun to have one fling. Since it probably will be my last one. <laughs> Indecent well, about it. I mean, you know, at their age, I mean, it isn't exactly oh, like that. Brother, they're... listen to the voice of the establishment talking. Is that what I married? No, no it, it, it isn't even that. Oh, it's... honey, I wouldn't worry. My mom may be right with it, but well, she isn't that far out. And even if she now, is. Look, look, look. You know what's worrying me? This guy. <sighs> I'd like to check him out first. How? Don't tell me private citizens have now got a pipeline to the FBI and the CIA. Oh, stop being such a poop. And if my mother wants to kick up her heels a little, you just get your nose out of the way. Yes, Miss Bunny. Uh, fine, I'll take it right now. Uh, he hello, Waldorf Plaza Towers. Uh, this is Mr. Don Craig. I'm a lawyer calling from Dayville, Ohio. What? No, no, no. no. I, I don't want a reservation. I wanted to talk to one of your permanent guests, Mr. Harry Taylor. Big pardon? Oh, I see. Well, he might possibly have checked out about a week ago. W would it be possible... E yes, 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 I understand, but... Uh... As I said, I'm a lawyer. This is a rather important pending case. I uh, wouldn't want to have to drag the towers into it. Of course. Yes, I'll be at this number all day. Please call me at the first opportunity. Pesh! Pesh! You here? Uh, Mom! Jess? For heaven's sakes, wild man, what is it? Where's Mom? Uh, uh, Jess, she, she didn't leave yet? Uh, yes, they took an earlier plane. I tried to reach you at the office, but you were on the phone. You mean they've left for New York? Well, they should be there by this time. But that's... Okay. Okay, Miss Wise Guy. What is it? Now, let me tell you something. I got a complete checkout from the Waldorf Plaza Towers, and nobody named Harry Taylor ever lived there. Oh, no. There must be some mistake. Not the way I see it. Pesh, I'm scared. Uh, uh, look, was, was Harry here before they left? Yes, he he, uh, he brought some champagne and we all had a glass and wished you were here. Yeah. Did you wash those glasses yet? No. You remember which one was Harry's? Uh, yeah. Um, the one, uh, right there on the uh, secretary. He said he was the only one who finished his. Mom and I were too excited to take more than a sip. Yeah, yeah, fine. At least we have one lead. Now, what are you doing? Wrapping this carefully in my handkerchief, taking him down to police headquarters. Police headquarters? That's right. I've got friends down there. We can lift the prints off this glass, check them out. What? I've got a real sick feeling in the pit of my stomach. 
I just woke up to why Harry looked as if he might have been sick. What do you mean? That, that white fish belly color is what you get in a security prison. Oh. I get some awful feeling that Harry Taylor is an ex-con. What? Yeah. And a long-termer at that. Don Craig here. Uh, Mr. Craig, this is Pete Lasher down at headquarters. Oh, hi, Lieutenant. Good to hear from you. Sorry, it took a little time to get back to you. Uh huh. You find anything? Yeah. We got a make for you on those prints you had in us. Right out of Central File. Harold Alpha Leslie Taylor. Book for murder of his wife, April 45. Tried and sentenced of first degree murder of his wife, Florence Taylor, nay Hayward. Sentence life and committed to security prisons till the year 1971. Released on parole September of that year. No further violations. Good Lord. Uh, how did he murder her? Drowned her in the bathtub. And the motive? According to the transcript for her money, the dame was loaded. Of course, he never got any of it. That's all I got. Any help to you? Yeah, thanks, Pete. I don't know how much help it is, but it sure lights a fire under my tail. I'm leaving for New York on the next plane. Oh, yes. You are the one who called me from some little town in Ohio. Yeah, that's right. Now I'm following up in person. Are you sure you never had a Harry L. Taylor registered here in your tower apartments? Good grief. We've been through all of that. Or anywhere in the hotel. No. Or a Mrs. Jessie Lipscomb. Really, Mr. Craig. You're causing a disturbance, and we just don't tolerate that at the wall. Any trouble, Miss Grambling? Well, this man is rather abusive. I have told him and told him we have no record of a Harry L. Taylor at this hotel. Guest? Well, of course. Yeah. Now, wait a, wait a minute. I, I took it for granted. He must be, but you... Uh, uh, look, I'm a county assistant DA from Ohio, officer. Uh, do you have any knowledge of a Harry L. Taylor that's connected with this hotel? Let me see your ID. Yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. Harry the horse. The the what? Let's uh, go over in the corner, Mr. Uh... Mr. Drake. Um, now, this is important. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll uh, tell you what I know. He was an ex-con. Quiet fella. Never bothered anybody. Night porter on the 60th Street side. All he cared about was keeping his nose clean and handicapping the ponies. He's still here? No, no. <laughs> he wouldn't believe it, but about three weeks ago, he hit the biggest super exacta since the OTB began. He was up to his ears in dough. Well, he treated everybody around here and then he took off. I ain't seen him since. So, that's where the money came from. Uh, you wouldn't know where he lived, would you? No, I, uh... Yeah, wait, wait, wait a minute. That night he was buying everybody drinks. He gave me his address. Who is it? Th this is Don. Kessie. Uh, is that you? Don? What are you doing in New York? Wait a minute, I'll buzz the door for you. Come on up. Jesse, are, are you all right? Shh, just come in quietly. Oh, you, you don't know what passion me have been through. It works at both ends. Just relax, there's nothing wrong. The doctor's with Harry. Doctor? Come in the living room with me a moment and I'll try to explain. That's why I came hightailing to New York. Oh, you're a sweet boy and I love you. But just let me tell you, it's all right, everything you learned. And I can't prove anything except I... I believe what Harry finally told me. By the time we got here to New York, he was nearly blind. And his sense of balance was gone. Well, that hasn't anything to do with the past. Flo, his first wife, committed suicide or, or drowned while she was drunk. She was an alcoholic. So the family didn't want Harry to get her money, and they had a lot of pull, so they pushed homicide against Harry. The poor guy had no one to protect him. 
So he was put away all those years. But the law, you... you... Oh, the law is a wonderful thing if you can get it on your side. Harry, poor dear Harry, is one of life's losers. He just can't win anything. He lost me, for what that's worth, and he lost his freedom for 25 years. And a short while after he came out, he lost his health. How do you mean? This is my son, Dr. Hirschfeld. I should say my, my son-in-law. Could you explain to him about Harry? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, Mr. Taylor has one of the rarest diseases in the world. Actually, there are only half a dozen recorded cases. The Kreutzfeldt-Jacob disease. It's a sudden and virulent disintegration of the nerve elements. It's irreversible, and it is implacably lethal in an incredibly short time. Three months is the best prognosis. It can start with blindness. Mr. Taylor is almost blind now. It's just a matter of time. And that time is already well extended. Mrs. Lipscomb has offered to attend him with whatever other help is needed. The wonderful woman. And that's all I can tell you. Let's excuse me now. Unfortunately, life goes on. Or doesn't. There are other patients waiting for me. Thanks, doctor. I'll be here when you need me. <laughs> I wish there were more like you. Bye. I can take care of myself, Don. Yes. Yes, I should have realized that. No. Oh, no, I'm glad you're here. And you can go back and reassure Pesh. And as long as Harry lasts, I can do the same for him. Incidentally, I... I should tell you that I married him. You... You did? At his request. Oh, and it did give him a little lift. Maybe just an extra lease on life after losing so much of it. And he's still quite active and full of fun. So maybe we still have a little chance to eat, drink, and be merry. And not to finish that quote till it finishes itself. Oh, you're a good boy, Don. I'm glad you married my daughter. As it happened, Harry lived quite a bit longer than expected. And Pesh, joining them in New York, was able to appreciate not only the excitement of the big city, but the gentle appreciation of a new father. Harry died quietly in his sleep, not troubling anyone. But at the last, his life was not in vain, because he borrowed his own immortality in the memory of three people who loved him. Jesse, Pesh, and in the end, the doubting Thomas, Don. I'll be back shortly. There isn't much to say about a story like this, except whatever doubts we may have about human nature are fortunately balanced, at times even to our shame, by its resilience and its essential morality. If you don't believe such a statement, heaven help you. And if you do, then there is no question that he will. Our cast included Beatrice Strait, Ralph Bell, E.V. Juster, Russell Horton, and Nat Poland. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come 
in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Mr. Victor Hugo said, Where the telescope ends, the microscope begins. Which of the two has the grander view? Which indeed? For the longest time, we had been urged to think big. Now there are those who say that perhaps we could more readily solve our problems if we were to think small. Big? Small? How do we really know which is which? Our mystery drama, Heads You Love, Tales You Die, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Marion Seldes and Court Benson. When you meet the Countess Elena Moreni, your immediate reaction is, of course, this lady must be the genuine article. She's tall, slender. Her features can only be described as exquisite. Her costume, though basically simple, is the height of stylish elegance. Were this the Europe of a hundred years ago, she would have been the brightest jewel in the palace of a king. Ah, but if we're to discuss the beautiful Countess Elena, we should hear from her uncle, Count Stepan Moreni. He knows more about her than any person living. Or dead. Yes, at one time the Moreni family had extensive holdings in what was called Transylvania. But everything's gone. All that I have left in my old age is my niece, Countess Elena. And the truth is, strictly speaking, she's neither my niece nor a countess. Nor is she even a Moreni. Years ago, her name was Gertrude Schmidt. And she was a scrawny, timid teenage girl who helped out in her father's delicatessen on the northeast side. And I remember that certain day when everything ended and everything began. Uh, good evening to you, Herr Schmidt. <laughs> Count, you have not forgotten us. <laughs> Why should I ever forget you, Herr Schmidt? Oh, I thought that uh, since you had come into your fortune... No, Herr Schmidt, I have not come into my fortune. The fortune I have come into could have been anyone's fortune. <laughs> I've merely won the lottery. Ah, but this may be the way that Providence has of... Um... Correcting a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> My good Herr Schmidt, Providence will never admit that he or she or it has ever made a mistake. You can say what you want, Count. I believe it was ordained. <laughs> Why are you surprised to see me? Uh, I, I thought that now you are rich. You would buy at the more exclusive places. My good friend, you are the only shop in town where one may purchase paprika that is worthy of the name. A true paprika. I have put some aside for you, Count. Gertrude, here is Count Moreni, who has come all this way to buy from us. Uh, well, say hello. A good evening to you, Fräulein Gertrude. Trude, where are your manners? Oh, she is so shy. <laughs> Look at her. When you stand erect, child, you have the carriage of a queen. But why is she so timid? Frightened of her own shadow. Wait, my good friend, wait. One day she will discover the power within her, the irresistible forces of fire and ice in those brilliant, beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> I tell you, she was born to break hearts and rule men. <laughs> if only I could just get her to say hello to people. All in good time. Some blossoms bloom early, others late. But the magnificent flower... Stick them up! Oh, I... You, now, you heard me. There's a gun, my friend. Be careful. Just, 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 just stick up your hands. And there's no need for this young man. If you're hungry, you can have food. If you want money... Shut up! You, you can have anything, but put away that gun. Just, eh? just, just, uh, um, 
Oh, open the register. Schmidt. Schmidt, do, do exactly what he tells you. Good. Now, just just stand back. Oh, oh, it, 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 it went off. I, I, I didn't mean to. It just went off. Yes, it just went off. And Joseph Schmidt fell down dead. I was standing next to him. A little more to the left, and it could have been me. As it was, I was blinded momentarily by the flesh. I could feel the sting of the exploding powder. The gunman, of course, ran away. The police never found him. Some weeks later, I decided to return to the shop. Perhaps I could do something for the young girl. Yes? How can I help you to... Oh, it's the Count. Good morning. <laughs> that bandage on your eye is something wrong. Oh, uh, it was from the... Oh, well, n n n never mind. You needn't be afraid to say it. I heard you were blinded from the powder from that shot. You're better, aren't you? Yes. Then it's just a temporary thing. Yeah, we hope. Uh, my dear, you look tired. Oh, yes. I understand you're keeping up the shop all by yourself. I'm trying. And you're finding it difficult? I'll manage. Of course you will, of course. However, the price may be too high. What do you mean, Camarini? Come with me, my dear. Where? Just over here, to the mirror on the wall. Now, look at yourself. What do you see? Well, I... Shall I tell you what you do not see? Lines, shadows, brought on by work and worry. The struggle to make ends meet. Well, I suppose it cannot be helped. Oh, but it can. How? Gertrude Schmidt, who must labor for her daily bread behind a delicatessen counter, will fade early, wither away. But the Countess Elena Moreni... Ah, she is something else. Who? Who is she? The only child of my late brother, Zoltan. And I am an old bachelor, therefore she is the last of the Morenis, and she will inherit my fortune. But why must she wait till I'm dead and she is old? I shall endow her with it now. <laughs> look at me, child, look at me. Countess Elena Moreni. Countess Elena Moreni? Elena, for the only woman I ever loved and lost. <laughs> she was so much like you. You shall keep her memory ever green. But what, what, what are you saying? You will become my niece, the Countess Elena Moreni. Me? You shall become the most beautiful, the most famous and sought-after woman in all the civilized world. Please, Count, I... We I, have nothing to say about it, you or I. But Count, I, I have everything to say about whether or not I'm going to it allow... It was almost the very last word your father said. What word? Providence. We were talking about my coming into a fortune, and he said it was ordained. What? What was ordained? My dear, your father at that moment was only a minute away from his death, a single footstep from eternity. Did he already sense the meaning, the design? Was it even then being slowly revealed to him that I would use the money for you? Oh, but please, no, I... I'm frightened. Frightened? Oh, 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 no, 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 child. Be rather joyful, be jubilant, that he has been able to sense your glorious future. I can see you now, the Countess Moreni. No. No? I... I can't. Why not? Because I... I, I just can't, that's all. Tell me why, child. Because... The man who killed Papa, he must pay for it. I must make him pay. You? Who else? Well, the police. Ah, the police have already forgotten him. Well, I shall make this killer pay the price. How? I'll wait for him. 
Where? Here. Look inside this drawer. You see? Oh, that's that's a revolver. And I know how to use it. <sighs> Revenge. Surely a Moreni cannot argue against it. He will come back here one day. Why do you say that? He will come back. I know it. My dear, your grief has made you angry and frustrated. My father was murdered. And you cannot tear yourself away from the place where he fell, as if somehow that would keep him by your side. But ask yourself, what would make him happier? If you wasted away as a drudge in a shop, or if you blossomed into the magnificent Countess Moreni? <laughs> She didn't need very much persuasion. But while your average countess is born, your true noblewoman must be made. And she was given all that was required to make her a great lady. And I must say she was an apt pupil. She learned French, the language of civilization. To pass, to cast, to glass. Italian, the language of art. De quoi, de la, de jouy, de la slice. Spanish, the language of passion. La vida es sueño, y los sueños, sueños son. And there were the piano lessons, and the painting lessons, and tennis, and golf, and shooting, and sailing, and travel. And soon people were beginning to notice this fabulously beautiful and unbelievably talented Countess Moreni, who came from one of the oldest families in Central Europe. And there was the celebrated love affair with the scion of one of America's wealthiest clans who, who shot himself when she left him. She was constantly sought after for interviews, and so was I. Most of them was the usual light-headed fan magazine type. But one journalist proved to be remarkably perceptive. Count, when you see her, she seems to glitter and sparkle like some priceless gem. Of course. But I think I sense a dark quality. I beg your pardon? Almost a shade of sadness. Yes? As if there has been some tragedy in her life. Has there been a tragedy? Why don't you ask her? I did. And what did she say? She said no. Well, then, that should be the answer. But I don't believe her. Uncle Stefan? Oh, my darling, come in, come in. You're not having your nap. That's disobeying the doctor. Uh, and you're reading a book. <laughs> you make it sound like a crime. It is. He said your eyesight was just too weak. Well, he said my eyesight was failing. And so it might just as well fail in the line of duty. <laughs> oh, well. I'm afraid we have something to talk about. Oh? Uh, this is rather awkward. You see, my dear, it seems I, I've run out of money. My dear uncle, I have been expecting this announcement. You have? Yes, the wonder is that your money lasted as long as it did. And so, as I saw this day approach, I said to myself, I must go to work. I have become an interior decorator. Oh? Well, why not? All one needs is taste. So, I've opened an office. I look at you. I, I, I simply cannot believe that you started this life as Gertrude Schmidt. <laughs> and I can never forget it. I know. And it shows. Well, to you, naturally. Yes, and also to an extremely perceptive reporter, our Miss Rivers. I've never forgotten my father. And that day... And I've made a vow that that murderer will be brought to justice. Sometimes, my dear, we must remove vengeance from our hearts, or it shall destroy us. No. Something inside me says, follow your destiny. That man who murdered your father is part of it. You will meet him again. Oh, dear Uncle Stefan, I feel I shall meet him again. And soon... atmosphere of her present environment, among the rich, the great, 
the famous? The fact is, she's become a part of this world. Well, did she meet him again? What happened to that nervous young killer? You know you're going to find out in Act Two. Most popular of all stories is Rags to Riches. But the problem with most of them is the fact that the transition is never really smooth or easy. And no matter how high one becomes, or how many riches one acquires, it's impossible to leave all the rags behind. There are always loose ends to be tied. Usually ghosts that must be laid to rest. Here again is Uncle Stefan. Till now, she had just been a beautiful playgirl of the international set. But soon her entire image had changed. She had become a professional working woman. You would see her designs in the leading decorating magazines. She was being consulted and quoted. She had acquired stature and authority. <laughs> My little Gertrude Schmidt, whom I had transformed into the magnificent Countess Moreni. There was only one small cloud. The usual one that never could disappear. May I have another cup of coffee, my dear? No, oh, you really shouldn't. Yeah, it's your fault for brewing it exactly the way I like it. Well, it's the way Papa taught me. <laughs> and every time I smell it, I think of him. Isn't that why I do it? Deliberately? To keep him fresh in my memory? Certainly. <laughs> You realize that's a question Freud would ponder over for pages and volumes. <laughs> and you so casually dismiss it in one word. <laughs> well, naturally. <laughs> You're in a good temper this morning. And you've mentioned Freud. Mm -hmm. Does this mean what I think it does? And what is that? Are you thinking it's time you fell in love? No, oh, it's always time to fall in love. All one needs is to find the man. <laughs> Yes, that's the way it goes. She was unaware of it, but this was the day that she was destined to meet a man who... Ah, but I mustn't get ahead of myself. I can only say that that day there was another conversation at another breakfast table. Harry? Yes, my dear? I waited for Margaret to finish serving breakfast. Oh, does that mean we're going to have a scene? You didn't keep your appointment yesterday? What appointment? With Countess Moreni. Oh, Ma, why do I have to be involved in this thing? It's your house. You live here, too? Well, let her decorate the place any way she sees fit. She can't do it unless she knows She is being paid and quite well to do it. A house must be an extension of the people who live in it. Mm, it's a good sales talk, but she doesn't have to persist in that nonsense. She already has the job. Let her do it. Take the money and run. That is not how the Countess Moreni has become the foremost interior decorator in this country. Alma... I am too busy. You promised I could have the Countess do the house. I wrote out a check. What more do you want? Unless she has an opportunity to meet you, she'll resign the account. Well, that's just too bad. Terry, I am trying to hold on to my temper. Alma, I'm very busy. I don't want to become angry. Don't force me to make an issue out of this because I will. All right. All right. This afternoon at 2.30, be there. Who? Oh, yes. Ask him to come in, please. Finally. <laughs> Mr. Harry Collins. Ah, oh, the elusive Mr. Collins. Elusive no longer. So... There is a Countess Moreni. She's not merely a picture in the magazines, a story in the papers. Have a chair, Mr. Collins. Had I but known. Had you but known what? Well, that words fail to express. Pictures even fail to communicate the essence of the most... <laughs> oh, why wouldn't I say it? The most magnificent woman I've ever met. <laughs> you realize, of course, that this is a business meeting. The business of which is to get to know me better. 
Or is that merely sales rhetoric? Are you always so verbally extravagant? Well, I'm not sure. I wonder if you bring it out in me. Mm, is that a business-like question? Shouldn't it suggest uh, an extravagant color for my study? How about a bright yellow, strong red? No, you couldn't live with them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I hardly spend any time there anyhow. Why? That is a long story. Why don't I tell you about it over lunch? No, I've just come back from lunch. Or dinner, then. Don't you have dinner with your wife? I can't when I'm having a business meeting. Ah, but your wife is my client. Why don't we talk about it over cocktails? Why don't we talk about it here? Well, the fact is, an office always seems to inhibit me. Mr. Collins. Uh, 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 uh. Harry. <laughs> Mr. Collins, I don't think anything could ever inhibit you. No, you must try some more of Ilona's soup. I think she surpassed herself this evening. Uh, thank you, my dear. Oh, uh, oh I'm sorry. I, I didn't it's see It's all right. That. It's all right, darling. Uh, the doctor said it would come to this. No, no, no. You mustn't talk about it. Well, I've seen what's worth seeing. Transylvania, the most beautiful country in the world. And you... The world's most beautiful woman. As for the rest... <laughs> I... I met a most amusing man this afternoon. Ah, that means he's married. How did you know? Well, if he was single, he'd be interesting. But since he belongs to someone else, he can only be amusing or diverting. Well, he may not belong to someone else forever. Oh, have we reached that stage so soon? No, we are at no definite stage. <laughs> uh, what is the gentleman's name? Uh, Mr. Harry Collins, and I've asked him here for cocktails tomorrow afternoon. And you must promise to ask for no more than one martini. And may I present my uncle, the Count Moreni? How do you do, sir? Countess Elaine has told me a great deal about you. Uh, but she's told me almost nothing about you. Uh, there isn't very much to tell, I'm afraid. Oh. I must disagree. Everyone's life is a book which consists of many volumes. I think that I will do Mr. Collins' study in gray and white. I have the feeling that he is, underneath it all, an extremely serious-minded person. You've discovered my secret. At that moment, at that precise moment, did I also discover a secret? Why? Why suddenly... Did I hear a shot? No, it was only in my mind. The two of them kept chatting as if nothing had happened. That shot, why did I hear that shot? And now I was listening to his voice. When I can no longer get out of going to my office, I'm involved in real estate dealings. Oh, you are that, Collins. <laughs> Guilty as charged. The voice... It was older, smoother, more cultured, but it was still basically the same. As he spoke, I could hear him say... Stick him up! Open the register! Was it possible? Of course not. How? And then I said to myself, Stefan, it's the voice. You know it's the voice. I peered at him... My eyesight was almost gone. If only I could see. If only... You're not very hungry this morning, Uncle. Oh, I... I'd like to say a penny for your thoughts, but in these inflationary times... <laughs> Tell me, what did you think of Mr. Collins? Um, as, as a client? I was thinking of him in another category. Definitely? Possibly. My dear, this Mr. Collins, does he seem familiar? In what way? Oh, in any way. Hmm. Well, I don't think so. You don't feel perhaps that you might have met him somewhere, sometime? No. Does he seem familiar to you? I... I'm not sure. Why do you ask me that question? 
Does Mr. Collins seem familiar? We, it was just an idle question. But you never, never ask an idle question. <laughs> I'm getting older. And wiser? No, unfortunately. Well, to lay that particular question to rest, I've never met Mr. Collins before. <sighs> well, that should end it, then. I couldn't even imagine where or, or under what circumstances. <laughs> Good afternoon, Miss Rivers. How good of you to come. What reporter in her right mind would refuse an invitation from the celebrated Count Moreni? Well, you mean the uncle of the celebrated Countess Moreni. Well, the tea tray is laid out, as you can see. Well, I wonder if you'd be good enough to pour. Of course. Cream, sugar, lemon. Well, just, just tea for me, thank you. And now, sir... May I ask why you have invited me here? I want information. We reverse roles. Hmm. <laughs> I'm the one who usually makes that request. What do you know about a Mr. Harry Collins? May I ask why? Uh, let me say this. I if you keep this matter confidential... It's not my business to keep matters confidential. Quite the other way around. I will promise you, if anything comes of it that should be of interest to the media, I promise you will be given, what do you people call it, a, a scoop? <laughs> we say beat. Uh, <laughs> Why do you want this information? That must be part of our bargain. Agreed? I'll call you tomorrow. This is Count Stefan Moreni. Now, how may I help you? I'm afraid I can't be of much help to you. Oh, this is Miss Rivers. Well, then again, it all depends on the kind of help you need. Uh, concerning Mr. Collins. He was a very poor boy from the northeast side. Ah, the northeast side. Mm -hmm. The kind of kid who'd get himself into all kinds of scrapes. Ah, uh -huh. serious ones? He was suspected of a few burglaries here and there. Nothing that could be proved. Uh, has he no police record? No. Well, he met a girl, got married, got a job, went to night school. The girl evidently reformed him. She's his present wife. I uh, see. He went to work for a real estate firm. In ten years, he owned it. It's been growing ever since. And that is all we know about Mr. Collins? That hmm? is all we know. The conviction, it kept growing stronger. Harry Collins, this self-made millionaire, he was the killer. How could that be possible? But wasn't anything possible? Didn't scrawny Gertrude Schmidt become the radiant Countess Moreni? I was positive... But what could I do about it? How could I hope to prove it? What can he do? And how can he hope to prove it? And after so many years, isn't the trail ice cold? And after all, Elena was there too. If Harry Collins is our killer, why didn't she recognize his face or his voice? Well, that's why we have a third act. You can say what you like about facts and figures and statistical data. The truth seems to be, or at least experience tells us, that most of our great decisions are based on hunches. After all, the last time you fell in love, what did you go by? A rational analysis or what you are pleased to describe as the dictates of your heart? Another name for a hunch. What's true of love is also true of murder. Sometimes a hunch is your best line to a killer. Good morning, my dear. Ilona made the coffee this morning. Darling, someone has to, since you refuse. Well, the doctor says you're... N what is the use? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's relax and enjoy it. <laughs> she makes it just the way you do. <laughs> you mean the way Papa did. 
How is your friend, Mr. Collins? You mean my client, Mr. Collins? Oh, we're still at that stage, hmm? Have some coffee. Yes, I will. Oh. What is it, my dear? I don't know. I... Is something wrong? Oh, Papa. What about Papa? I thought I'd blotted that picture from my mind forever. Oh? That terrible day, that terrible shot. No, 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 no. Don't think about it. Can't help it. But why? Why does it suddenly appear before you now? I don't know. Possibly the coffee. Possibly the coffee. Combined with the mention of Harry Collins' name... Perhaps there was some kind of subconscious linkage. Oh, don't ask me what. I usually laugh at people who talk this way. But she would have to decide for herself if Harry Collins was the same who killed her father. She would have to recognize him. No one else could make that judgment. Of course, I could be of assistance. And so I summoned my housekeeper. Yes, Count. Uh, sit down, sit down, please, Ilona. Uh, tell me, do you remember many years ago Schmidt's delicatessen on the northeast side? <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> what a delightful place it was. Mm. Do you remember all those delicious smells? Oh, Stefan, if you want to talk about the old times, please, I'm busy. Later. No, no, pay attention, woman. I have an important job for you. What were those smells? You are not serious. Answer the question. Mm, he always had coffee ready to serve. Ah, yes, yes. And why was it so distinctive? The little bit of chicory. Ah. What <laughs> were the other smells? Those delicious meats and sausages, eh? The salads? <laughs> You're making me hungry. And the doctor says I must diet. <laughs> you must duplicate those heavenly aromas now. In this room. I do not understand. The thing is crystal clear. I want this room to smell as if one had just entered Herr Schmidt's delicatessen. But can't. What is the problem? There was no problem. My Ilona was a servant of the old school. She fussed and complained. But there was a twinkle in her eye. And now to set the appointment. Elena, my dear. Yes, Uncle. I am quite taken with this Mr. Harry Collins. Oh? Do you suppose we could have Mr. Collins over for cocktails? When? Whenever it's convenient. Mm, this afternoon? Why not? Oh. Uncle Stephen, I don't know. There's something about him. Yes? It attracts me or... Frightens me. What does that mean? I have no idea. I'm I'm disturbed. Well, how? Are, are you in love with this man? Love? I don't know. I've never been in love, but I, I have this feeling. Yes. It's as if some force has been generated inside me. It's a force that's going to be released, whether I want it or not. Uncle. Is that what love is? It's love or it's the other side of the coin. Hate. Soon we shall know. Soon she would know. She would find out for herself. And if he were not the killer, she would find out without even knowing what it was she'd found out. That afternoon, she arrived first. Huh. I'm early. Harry said he'd try to be here before six. Uncle Stephen. What is it, child? The room. Uh, what about it, dear? It's like... <sighs> it smells like Papa's store. That's right. <laughs> somewhat. No, no, no. More than somewhat. Well, I've asked Ilona to prepare some food. Well, she must have outdone herself. I'm, I'm carried back to... All those years to Papa's shop. Mm. The coffee with a pinch of chicory, the baked meats, the potato salad, the sauerkraut. Hello. I was able to get here early after all. No, no, no. Papa, Papa. Uh, oh, 
Oh. Catch her. She's going to faint. Uh, uh, put her on the couch. Oh, uh, what happened? Uh, should we call for a no, doctor? No, 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 no. She should she, she, be all right. Well, shouldn't we do something? Ilona will take care of her, Mr. Collins. I wonder if you would be good enough to excuse us. Well, uh, sure. Funny. What's funny? I... I, I don't know. I, I have this feeling. Uh, yes? I, I don't know what it is. Uh, Can you describe it? Mm, no, I, I, I can't. Um, I, I think I'd better go. All right, Elena. Yes? No, 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 no. Don't try to get up. Lie quiet for a bit. He's the one... Harry is the one. Yes. And you knew it. Yes, my dear. Why didn't you tell me? What was there to tell? A suspicion? It could have clouded the rest of your life. You had to make the discovery for yourself. And I made it. Yes. Now what? Now, I'm going to kill him. Is it wise? your own words a Moreni cannot argue against revenge when he has been injured he does not run whining about it to the law that was a philosophy for another place another time there's a practicality here think of what you have to lose the world will discover that the Countess Moreni is really Gertrude Schmidt well the world will survive that discovery but will you there's nothing shameful about being Gertrude Schmidt but there's something awfully wasteful about spending the rest of your life in prison I, I know that but I have no choice you don't uncle are you saying that he's to get away with murder he has to pay for it now, please, Uncle Stefan, I must get up. Where are you going, my going dear? Going to my room. I have a twenty-two caliber automatic. And then I shall visit Mr. Harry Collins. Alma, are you busy? I, I want to talk to you. I hope this won't take long, Harry. I'll have to go upstairs soon, dress for dinner. You will, too. We're dining with the Alcott. Alma, please, listen. I... I want a divorce. Alma? No. I won't let you go. What good am I to you? I own you. And don't you ever forget it. If I should go to the police Alma, and... please, please, try to understand. I... I'm in love. Oh, of course you are, darling. You're in love with me. Can't you try to understand? I saved your life that night when the police came looking for you. And every day that I remain silent, I keep saving your life. Oh, the door. Do you suppose it's the police? Alma. There's no statute of limitations on murder, you know. Suppose they think they found a clue. <laughs> Oh, don't worry, darling. I'll swear again you were with me all night. Oh, no, Of please. course, that didn't do my reputation any good. Things were different in those days, but I didn't care. I loved you. I'd give up anything for you. Now, let me open the door. And don't you say a word. Why, Countess... What a delightful surprise. Good evening, Mrs. Collins. Uh, uh, won't you come in? May I fix you a drink? No, thank you. I can only stay a moment. Oh, that that's a pity. I just stopped by to shoot your husband. Oh, does he make you want to do that, too? There are times when I feel that Elena. I... Elena. Elena? Yes. Elena. I'm in love with her. She's the one, Alma. Oh, really? Oh, you have exquisite taste, Harry, darling. So, the two of you did not confine your discussions exclusively to interior decorating. Countess, do you have serious intentions concerning my husband? Yes, I have. Well, then I'm sorry. He is a most attractive man. That is why I intend to hold on to him. I know you're a woman of the world. You'll get over him. 
And he'll get over you after a while, just as he's gotten over all the others. No. No, not this time. Harry will will not have a scene. Elena, she's asked you to decorate the house. Show it for what it is. A place of hate and bitterness. Oh, do it in stone and bars because it's a prison. She is blackmailing me. I was a stupid kid. I got into trouble. I... I, I killed a man. I, I didn't mean to. It just happened. She... She gave me an alibi. I gave you more than an alibi. I made you go straight. I worked so you could go to night college and become somebody. Whatever you are today, you owe to me. All right, but how long do I have to keep paying you back? When are we going to be even? Never. Alma, I'm not asking for myself. It's also for you. Let go of me. It can't go on forever. Tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, I am going to kill you. Oh, myself. Oh, both of us. We will always be together, Harry. Excuse me, I seem to have interrupted a family argument. I must be going. Oh, surely, Countess. You did have a reason for stopping by. Yes, I told you I came here to shoot your husband. But I see now it won't be necessary. Things will take care of themselves. Elena, what are you saying? As a matter of fact, I brought this. Oh, that's a pistol. Well, of course. Why don't I just leave it here? I'm sure one of you will find a use for it. Sooner or later. You... You actually did come here to shoot me. Yes. But as it turns out, I don't have to. You are already dead. There is certainly a new style in things. We hear all kinds of sentiments concerning revenge, such as living well is the best revenge, success is the best revenge, survival is the best revenge. Who knows? I can only say that if revenge is being put on a more positive and less violent basis, I am certainly in favor. I shall return shortly. An eye for an eye is so clearly stated in the book, and for years we have tried to probe beyond its literal meaning to the spirit, and perhaps what was really meant in that ancient language was picked up later by a poet named Sir William Gilbert. Make sure the punishment fits the crime. And once we start to really analyze crimes and their punishments, we cannot help but find new insights into old problems. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Court Benson, E.V. Juster, and Russell Horton. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant of this far-flung flock that assembles regularly at this time and in this place to indulge in our mysterious devotions. While might may not make right, it can and often does make just about everything else. In a very real sense, the story of our alleged civilization is a story that has been created by armed men. 
Although the eminent Mr. Bulwer-Lytton may have said that the pen is mightier than the sword, it should be noted that he used a knife to sharpen his quill. And after all, when you come to think of it, our country, and practically every other country in the world, still spends more money for guns than for almost everything else put together. Any special orders today, Frank? Nothing. It's quiet. This should be one of them nice, peaceful days of policemen's delight. Yeah. I hope so, Frank. Anything wrong, Eddie? Well, is it possible to know when the last day of your life has arrived? No, it isn't possible. I got this funny feeling. Yeah? Right now, if I close my eyes, I see myself walking the beach. A guy with a gun is running out of a store. I yell, halt. He turns, he shoots at him. You want to go on sick call? No. I get this feeling every day. Eddie, you're the most sensible guy in the precinct. Just a crazy feeling. And it always passes. Except today. Except today what? Nothing. Nothing. I'll be okay. I know. I know I'll be okay. <laughs> Our mystery drama, Just One More Day, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Theodore Bickell. His name is Edward Mason, and this is the early morning of a very special day in his life. To each of us, there comes a final day. From time to time. A last day. A day which marks a divide. And today is one of those special days for Eddie. Because it is the last day that Eddie will spend as a police officer. This is the 9,855th day that Eddie has spent on the force. And it marks a total of 27 years. Every routine act that Eddie performs today is something that he will do for the last time. Checking in. Standing muster. Walking his beat, making his reports, and checking out. But today, there may be one act that Eddie will be called upon to perform for the very first time in 9,855 days. For the first time in 27 years. Morning, darling. What are you doing so early? Oh, I heard you stirring around. Sorry I woke you. So I figured I'd come out to the kitchen and put up the coffee. Yeah... Well, what's the matter, Eddie? Oh, nothing. Same dream, huh? Yeah, same dream. Mm. I've been dreaming that dream now for, I guess, for the last six, eight months. It's never been so real. <laughs> you know what you ought to do with that vivid imagination of yours, Eddie? I'm sitting in Mom's candy store, eating a dish of ice cream, vanilla, with strawberry syrup. You should become a writer, Eddie. I'm aware of how creamy white that ice cream is. And the strawberry syrup is red, like blood. Maybe go back to school. Take a writing course. Usually you don't dream in such sharp detail, you know. And then there's this kid. He's maybe 17, 18. One of the local punks. His name is Tommy. Comes running in. Oh, Eddie. Eddie, it's only a dream. He yells as a guy next door in D'Angelo's. He's got a gun. And I rush out of the candy store and I hit the street. There's this guy with a gun in his hand and I yell, Halt! But he doesn't. He spins around and he fires. And what happens? Well, the shot. It's the loudest shot I ever heard in my whole life. Always wakes me up. Eddie, call in sick. Nope. Not on my last day. But you got the time off coming. Myra, honey, I'm going to put in my 27 years fair and square. Hey, turn on the radio. Let's hear the news. Oh, uh the radio? Yeah, the radio. Oh, I I can't. Why? What's the matter? It's uh, broken. It is? Mm hmm When I was getting up just before, I thought I heard it. Well, you did. But it, it, it just quit all of a sudden. Well, let me see if I can fix it. Take my word for it, Eddie. Come on, Myra. What is it you don't want me to hear? No, Eddie. I'll know about it sooner or later. Well, I was hoping it would be later. 
Tell me what it was. Well, a cop was shot early this morning. A holdup in an all-night cafeteria. Who? Kohler. George Kohler. Did you know him? You know him, too. His father was the first partner I had on the force, Henry Kohler. Oh. He handed me the phone book. Oh, okay. I think the kid was with the Southwest Precinct. Now, Eddie, I, I want you to listen to me. Hey, Southwest, here it is. Oh, Eddie, please, don't go in today. Eddie? Eddie, I'm afraid. Mara, take it easy. <sighs> Sergeant Rowland, I'm Patrolman Edward Mason with the 25th Precinct. About Georgie Kohler, I, I, uh, I called to see if he needs blood. Oh. Yeah, sure. Kid died an hour ago. Eddie. I think I better leave now. But you, you haven't even had your breakfast. Well, it's been the last day and all. I want to get in early. Eddie. Watch yourself. You know, that's what you always say, and that's what I always do. You know, Eddie, I thought sure the captain was going to make a little speech this morning. About what? Oh, about this being your last day and all. Yeah, well, I asked him not to. I'll miss you, Eddie. I'll tell you. I think you're the best cop I ever knew. How come you wind up after 27 years just pounding the beat? I like the beat, Frank. You get to know the people, you get to be involved. That's where I disagree, Eddie. It's a job. All I want to do is put in my eight hours and get home. Especially now I'm getting married. Congratulations, Frank. Look at what she gives me for a wedding present. She says to me, honey, I want you well taken care of. <laughs> well, I must say... It's an unusual gift, a revolver. How can you just call this a revolver? It's it, it, it's like calling the Mona Lisa a picture. It's a custom-made 38 special. That butt isn't mother of pearl. It's pure ivory. The engraving. It's a work of art. Feel the balance. Here, here, here trigger it. What do you say? All I can say is I wish we didn't have to carry guns. Are you nuts? How can you be a cop and not carry a gun? Cops don't carry guns in England. You're kidding. The cops there don't carry guns. So most of your criminals don't carry guns either. Look, Eddie, the very fact that you've got that revolver riding on your hip, don't it give you a, a, a sense of security? No. Oh, come on. All the times in the past 27 years that you had to go to the holster, where would you be if there was no gun there? But I've never gone to the holster, Frank. Never. What? That's right, Frank. Never. Are you telling me you've been a cop 27 years and not once in all that time did you ever have to draw your gun? In 27 years, I never have been forced to fire a single shot. I can't believe it. You... You got an arrest record as good as any man in the precinct. Some of your colors have been real rough characters. And you say you never went for the gun? I never once went for the gun. Why do you bag half of these guys? <laughs> lucky, I guess. That has got to be the most single sensational streak of luck. And I only hope it'll go on for one more day. That's what I'm praying for, Frank. Just one more day. <laughs> Hello, Tommy. What do you want, copper? What do you want, Tommy? Well, it's a public street, ain't it? No, not exactly public. It's an alleyway used as a loading dock for this warehouse. You got any business here? Well, I'm just uh, passing through. You wouldn't by any chance be casing the joint. Me? Figuring on maybe a little break and entry tonight. Would you stop me like this if I was a rich old guy? Hey, you see, it's the poor and the downtrodden that get pushed around by the law. Against the wall here, Tommy. What do you want to frisk me for? I'm clean. Not quite, Tommy. How about the ship? Well, I got to protect myself, don't I? The law will protect you, Tommy. Well, I'll just hold on to this and you won't be tempted to get into trouble. Is that all, Santa Claus? Why don't you go back to school? Get yourself an education. Are you for real? It's the only way, Tommy. You're breaking my heart. Don't you want to get anywhere? 
No, sir, not me. Why not? Well, I guess I'm like you, Eddie. Where did you ever get? You put in 27 years and you're still a uniform cop. Now, I can understand it if you were making money down here. But you're too dumb to even shake down the, the storekeepers. Okay, punk, beat it. I understand you're retiring tomorrow, Eddie, and all you got is your pension. And you're telling me to be smart? I said beat it. Well, good morning, Eddie. Good morning, Mom. Eddie, maybe you better come into the store for a minute. What is it, Mom? I don't know. I got a funny feeling. You too? What do you mean, me too? What? Nothing. I was opening up the store this morning. You know, Benny's got the sciatica. Hey, did he go see the doctor I told you about? Did he ever go see a doctor in his life? So I just put out the papers on the stand and this man, a youngish man, oh, maybe 30 years old, he picks up a paper, throws down some money, walks away. What about him, Mom? I don't know. His face was familiar. In what way? Well, you know me. I'm always looking at the papers. I recognized him. Some gangster, you know? Gangster? Yeah, crook. A hold-up man. I seen that face in the papers. But I can't remember the name. Wait, wait. In what connection would you have seen him in the paper? Well... Like, uh, maybe, uh, a man, uh, that escaped from jail. Try and think, Mom. I'll try. But it ain't no good. You know me, Eddie. Let something once fly out of my head and wild horses couldn't drag it back. Benny, he says the same thing. But you know who could tell you? Who? This kid, Tommy. He eats breakfast with me here every morning. What can I do? The father's a drunk and the mother, ugh. Tommy's seen him, too. So I says to Tommy, I says, Tommy, do you know who that is? And he says, no, I don't. But I could tell by the way he said, no, I don't. The answer was, yes, I do. Tommy, huh? Mm Mm-hmm. Maybe I can get it out of him. Ah, Eddie, don't bother with it. What do you mean, don't bother with it? Well, in the first place, he ain't gonna tell you. And in the second place, it's your last day. On your last day. Please, don't look for trouble. Come on in. Lucas, I heard you busted out of the slam. How's you wake it? Let's get down to business, Chesco. That's what I like about you, Lucas. You're sociable. I called you because I need a wheelman and you're the best of us. I used to be modest, but <laughs> why fight it? You like 20... Maybe 30 minutes. Tops. You get 25%. Of what? Come over by the window. Across the street. On the corner, you got a candy store. Next to it. See the sign? D'Angelo's Jewelry. That's it. You mean you want to knock off a jewelry store, a little neighborhood ice parlor? <laughs> Well, it's been great talking to you, Lucas. See you around, if the fuds don't bag you. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? What do you think he's got in there, the Kohinoor diamond for crying out loud? All right, say you can empty him out. What do you get? A bag full of cheap rings and watches, and you got a fence every penny, and pennies is all a fence will give you. I don't want what's on a counter or on the shelves. Oh, what do you want? What's in a safe. He's holding half a million bucks worth of uncut diamonds. How do you know? He's holding them for some guys that smuggle them out of South Africa. Where'd you get the tip? The guy's in jail with me. Done him a good turn, so he gave it to me. And I know where I can get a quarter of a million for the ice. You're cut 50 grand. You want me to keep talking? I'm all ears, Lucas. What time you got on your watch? Uh, 845. Right now. The cop on the beat's gonna walk out of the candy store. Watch. See? Yeah. There he goes. He's going to go in the jewelry store. See? And he'll be there exactly two and a half minutes. How do you know? I've been watching this cop eight hours a day for more than a week. I know every move he makes. I know where he's going to be every minute. Now, that's good. 
biggest problem you got on any job is a cop who comes blundering along out of nowhere. Don't you worry about this cop. He just ain't going to be no problem at all. After 9,855 days on the job, will Patrolman Eddie Mason finally have to draw his service revolver in the line of duty? The two gentlemen whose conversation we have just overheard would seem to be the type who could very well make him do it. I shall return shortly with Act Two. master of my fate, says the poet. Not quite, answers the realist. And he would seem to have the best of the argument. The fact is, so much of our fate lies in the hands of others. Much of life is spent adjusting to or countering moves by other people. People who may neither know of nor care about our existence. Some of these may be good moves. Some are not such good moves. Particularly the ones being pondered at present by two young men who are peering out the window of a flat in a dingy tenement building. I have to hit the joint at exactly ten minutes to four. Why so late? At eleven minutes of, the cop goes into the candy store next door and he has a plate of ice cream. I can even tell you what kind. Vanilla with strawberry syrup. Oh, you got to be out of this world, Lucas. Who could believe you? For the next 11 minutes, he's going to sit there, fanning the breeze with the old lady who runs the joint. Then, four on the head, he hits the street and waits for his relief. You got this all clocked, huh? It's the only time of the day I got 11 clean minutes. 11 minutes to walk in there, show the old geezer the gun, get him to open a safe, hand me the bundle, you're parked outside, and we're off. How do you like it? I'd like it fine without the gun. What's the matter with the gun? I hate guns. Once they go off, you could never tell who gets hit. Without a gun, if you get caught, a good mouthpiece can reduce any robbery rap to maybe three to five. But get collared with the iron on you, you're looking at seven to ten. Kill somebody, you're buried for twenty or thirty. All I want the gun for is to scare him with. Okay. You see that fire plug 20 feet down a block? That's where I'll be parked so I can count on an open space. I'll come barreling out of there. Have that engine running. Nobody ever complained about my work yet. Look, you're getting 50 grand for this. And I'm worth every penny. So I'll be waiting for you any time between 3.50 and 4 p.m. See ya. Hey, where you going? Well, I gotta steal a car. Nice little sedan. Okay, we got a deal. Yeah, we got a deal. As long as I don't hear no shooting, I am very nervous. I have been known to panic at the sound of gunfire. I forget why I'm there. I just hit that gas pedal and I fly. I said there won't be no shooting. How many times do I have to tell you? If you mean it, you only have to tell me once. Yeah, you okay, Eddie? Sure. 9.30 9.30 check-in. You sure you're okay? Yeah, yeah. And I'll mark it. Frank, listen. Mom Feldman. Where's the candy store? Yeah, what about her? She's not sure. She thinks she spotted somebody this morning. Who? Oh. She's not sure. Look, why don't you get hold of the latest wanted circulars and bring them down here? How about this one, Mom? Nah. Him, I'm sure it ain't. This one? Mm-mm. What about him? Hey, wait. Wait a minute. He's the person. Mom, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. In the picture, he got short hair. Now, and now, it's down over his ears. But I'd know him anywhere, any time, by his mouth. Tight. Pulled up. Like uh, something's always bothering him. Jack Lucas. Yeah. Busted out of the state pen six weeks ago. Armed and very dangerous, Eddie. Be careful. <laughs> I'm always careful, Frank. He always carries a big gun. Likes to use it. We better ask to have an extra car patrol the area. I'll tell you one thing, Eddie. You spot him, you want to shoot first and shoot fast. Now remember. I remember. 
You see anything the least bit out of the way, call in. Okay, Frank. Thanks, Mom. My pleasure. Eddie, it's your last day. Why did you have... I have a job to do, ma'am. I remember reading the name. Jack Lucas. Mad Dog Jackie. And he's here, in the neighborhood. Uh, who says he has to be here? Maybe... Maybe what? Oh, maybe he was just passing by. He could be miles away from here by now. Mom, he's here. Ah, oh, Eddie, makes sense. Why would he be here? What's here? He's here, Mom. Why do you think I am wrong, Eddie? <laughs> if I tell you, you'll, you'll say I'm crazy. <laughs> Eddie, you crazy? <laughs> it's impossible. Today is, uh, well, the only thing I can think of to call it is, uh, today is the day of the gun. The day of the gun? Ah, now what is this, Eddie? The law of averages, Mom. The law of averages suddenly realizes that me, Edward Mason, has been breaking it far too long. Ah, now that sounds crazy. I know. So today we have to have the day of the gun to make up for all the days we didn't have one. I wouldn't want to talk this way to anybody but you, Mom. Uh, Eddie, what is this about a gun? Wherever I turn today, I'm looking down the barrel of a gun. Last night, I dreamed about a gun. This morning, a cop I knew since he was a kid is gunned to death. Yeah, I heard it on the radio. I come to work, and Frank makes a big deal out of his brand-new custom-made service revolver. A gift from his fiancée, no less. <laughs> what kind of gift? All right, each his own. And now we have mad dog Jackie Lucas, who I think was weaned on a gun. Yeah, but what does he want here? I think he wants me. Oh, what kind of talk is this? Does he know you? No, Mom. And I don't know him either. Ah, uh, then what are you saying? I'm saying I got this feeling. I can't shake it. Just one more day. That's all I want. Just one more day. And I know. I just know. I can't have it. Listen. You say you saw this guy. Well, I... I could have been mistaken. Ah, uh, that doesn't help. If he's in the neighborhood, I have to know. Could Tommy have seen where he went? Could Tommy have seen? Yeah, sure. And I'll tell you why. Because when I asked Tommy if he knew the fella, Tommy went to the door and he looked. So, wherever he went, Tommy would have seen him. Yeah, thanks, Mom. For what? I upset your whole day. <laughs> How do you know it's Eddie? Oh, I was just sitting here wishing and hoping and praying you'd call. I guess it's what they call ESP. I just want to let you know, it's 12 noon and all's well. How do you feel? Just great. Oh, it's so hard to believe. You only have four more hours to be a police officer. we got to eat out tonight and celebrate. Mm-mm. We've been invited out. Yeah? By who? Oh, some old friends. Eddie? What is it? Um, I was going to suggest something, but I know you won't do it. Honey, you know I'd do anything for you. Well, I wish that you'd call in sick and come home right now. Ask me something else. <sighs> Eddie, watch yourself. That's what you always say, and that's what I always do. <laughs> Well, look who's here. Mr. Junior Gangster himself. Uh, give me a chocolate morph, huh? I, uh, owe you a buck and a half for breakfast, so, uh, just take it out of this. Where'd you get ten dollars? I lifted the guy's wallet. I almost believe you. When are you gonna get a job? Well, I may pull one tonight. Oh, uh, where's it gonna end with you, Tommy? You need a cop wants to see you. Oh, yeah? Listen, Tommy. You remember that person we saw by a paper this morning? I didn't see no person. Do you know who he is? I don't know nothing. He is the one they call Jackie Mad Dog Lucas. I never heard of him. An escaped convict. A murderer. I can't prove nothing but me. Tommy, if 
if a person like this is in the neighborhood, Eddie should know about it. A lot of things Eddie should know, but he's a chump. Eddie's a good cop. There ain't no such animal as a good cop. Don't you talk that way about Eddie. Was there ever a hungry person on this block? Eddie'd buy him groceries. And your own father. How many times does Eddie carry him upstairs when he's dead drunk? Why don't Eddie mind his own business and leave the old bum in a gutter? Tommy, you can't say that about your own father. Even if it's true? Believe me, Eddie's on your side. Hello, Tommy. Well, look who's here. Old Santa Claus in a blue coat. Yeah, what happened to your whiskers? I want you to look at the picture on this circular. Oh, glad to oblige. Glad, you know, support the local fuzz all the way. That's my style. Look familiar? Of course. That's the person you and I saw this morning, Tommy. I never seen him before in all my life. Okay, you walked over to the door to get a better look. Who did? You did. Well, I... May have walked to the door because a good-looking dame was walking past. Which way did he go? Uh, which way did who go? The guy on the circular. The guy I'm looking for, Jack Lucas. How can I tell you which way he went when i never seen him? Okay, Tommy, have it your way. What do you mean, have it my way? What do you want from me? What am I, a cop? Am I supposed to go around looking for escape cons? I don't get paid to wear a badge. Why do I have to do your work? Maybe if you spent more time being a cop and less time hustling drunks out of the gutter and helping a bunch of deadbeats pay the rent and quit being big daddy, a good old Uncle Eddie. Maybe if you spent more time being a cop, a real cop, you'd find him yourself. Now I'm getting out of here. What's a real cop? Tommy's uh, what they call a Mr. Boy, Eddie. He doesn't respect me, Mom. Uh, don't say that. It's the truth. You are the best cop on the whole force. No, I'd be the best cop if I opened somebody's skull with a billy club or gunned down some crook. That's what he's been taught to respect. Eddie, he really looks on you as a father. That's no compliment. Well, just think. Tomorrow, you'll be a retired man. Yeah. But that's tomorrow. Meanwhile, I still got today. Just one more day. Long ago, a poet wrote, Be the day short or ever so long, It creepeth at last to even song. And the longest day for Patrolman Edward Mason also creeps reluctantly to its close. But before it ends, finally, a certain event is scheduled to take place. And looking at it analytically, there are three possibilities. A, it will be canceled. B, it will be postponed. C, it will happen. I shall return shortly with Act Three. A dream is about to come true for Patrolman Edward Mason. The trouble is, he doesn't know which dream. He has two of them. The first is that he'll be able to complete 27 years as a police officer without firing a shot in the line of duty. And the second dream is that he won't. It is now 2 o'clock in the afternoon of his last day on the force, and he has two hours to go. All 27 years are now compressed into two hours. 120 minutes. 7,200 seconds. And Eddie can feel the beat of each of them. Ah, Eddie. Mom says you wanted to see me, Jimmy. Eddie. Uh, look at you. I don't know. Should I laugh? Should I cry? <laughs> well, do both, Jimmy. See what you like better. Yeah. Uh, I cry because uh, 27 years, Eddie. Where did it go? Search me. But I laugh <laughs> because tomorrow you are a retired man, a free man. Uh, and then I cry because I lose an old friend. How can you lose old friends? Eddie, we're going to have a wonderful dinner tonight. Tonight? 
No, <laughs> no. I think my wife said we were invited to... Sure, sure. We fixed it with Myra. There's going to be a big dinner in Clancy's restaurant for you. For me? Everybody's coming. Mama Feldman and Schmidt, the butcher, and Pedro and Jerry, the plumber, the whole neighborhood. Oh. It's supposed to be a surprise. Oh, I shouldn't have told you. Don't ask me why I told you. Okay, Jimmy, I won't ask you. I don't know why I told you. I don't know what got into me. I just want to make sure you knew how, how, how everybody here feels about you. Huh? It's just... Look, you're a cop. You understand. Any minute, some bomb, some, some gavone. You know how it is. I just felt I had to tell you. I understand. Uh, let me tell you the rest. You've got to promise to act surprised. When you get it, huh? When I get what? Yeah, I, I got it here in the drawer. Uh, it's a watch. Oh, hey, that's... Uh... See, see what I engraved on the back, huh? It's my finest work... To Edward Francis Mason, Eddie, a man of the law. <laughs> I'll put it back until tonight. Jimmy, what, uh, what do you got in that drawer? A revolver, Jimmy, what? Hey, I got a license for it. Why? Eddie, times have changed. I know, but you can't change it back with a gun. Nobody gonna come into my jewelry shop and hold me up. You wanna get killed? Jimmy, what's gotten into you? That gun, he won't settle anything. He'll maybe settle a few crooks. You show the gun, you force him to kill you. These animals today, they kill you anyhow. Believe me, Eddie, you're getting out just in time. You're not a cop for today. Promise me you won't do anything foolish. Uh, how can any human being make such a promise, huh? What's up, Frank? Nothing. Rose in the neighborhood. So is Rogers. Anyone spot anything? Now the smell. If Lucas is here, he's sacked up tight. I'll keep looking. Just think, Eddie. Forty more minutes, you're out of it forever. Why? Is it twenty after three already? As if you ain't clocking every second. I would say you're over the hump. Twenty after three. One more turn around the beat, and then I hand it over to Smitty. Between you and me, Eddie, I don't think Mom actually seen this mad dog, Lucas. Though she did, he was just passing through. Yeah, see you back at the station house. Okay. And Eddie, keep your eyes open, huh? Uh, give me a pack of cigarettes, huh? Uh, Tommy, hmm? you want to come to the dinner tonight? Me? Pay five bucks to eat with a cop? I'll pay for you. Why don't you get off my back? Uh, who's bothering with you? And don't ask me if I've seen this guy. Who's asking? Because the answer is no. You got a phone booth? Uh, right in the back. Thanks. Chesco, I'm in a candy store. You set? You look out of the window with the black two-door hardtop near the fire plug, you'll see I'm set. Listen, I want to ask you something. Is there a chance somebody could have fingered you? What do you mean? Well, I mean, your picture's been in the paper. You could have been spotted. No way. And what was the prowl guard doing outside? When? Two minutes ago. The cop in the car was talking to the cop on the beat. But they've been talking about you? No way. You didn't say nothing about pro cars. I thought you had it locked. I do. That was the 320 checkoff. What 320 checkoff? 20 minutes after every hour, a car comes down the street. I told you. I know every move these clowns make. All right, I'm just checking. You make sure that motor's running and ready. And you make sure I don't hear no shooting. Uh, hot day, huh? Yeah. It's like yesterday it was winter, and today it's summer. <laughs> what happened to spring? Don't ask me. What do you get for an ice cream soda? Forty cents. <laughs> I can remember when they cost a quarter. I can remember when I sold them for a dime. Forty cents, huh? But 
You get two scoops. Uh, give me a black and white. Think of the crime, the way prices are sky high today. Yeah, where will it end? Face me. Uh, Tommy. Hmm? I already paid the five dollars for Benny. I said I ain't going. I just talked to Benny on the telephone. He can't even get out of bed. Why should the money go to waste? I'd starve to death first. I'll see you, Mom. Young people today. Yeah, no manners. Mm. We got a cop on the beat. Ah, such a wonderful man. I couldn't begin to tell you. We're giving him a retirement dinner tonight. And that one don't want to go. No respect. Hey, is that the right time in your clock? Absolutely. We said it by the radio. It can't be 347. My watch... My watch stopped. How do you like that? Never stopped before. I'll take it next door. We got a jeweler, Mr. D'Angelo. Uh, the man's a genius. Ah, oh, You're two minutes early. That your car parked outside? Yeah, it is, officer. You're kind of close to the fire plug. Got to be 12 feet away. Okay, officer, I'll take care of it. Thanks for telling me. Uh, you can finish your soda. It's okay. I'm on a diet anyhow. Uh, what a nice young fellow. The usual? Yeah. Might as well. Go easy on the syrup, though. Eddie, I can't tell you how glad I am the day is over. Yeah, it's just about over. And I made it. And I am so happy for you. I made it, Mom. But I cheated. What are you talking about? It's like a pitcher in baseball who's trying for a no-hitter. You know what I mean? From baseball, I know nothing. Well, the first couple of innings, he doesn't realize it. But as the game goes on, he becomes aware of it. I still don't understand. The gun thing, I mean. It's become bigger than anything else. It would make me different. Give me something to brag about. Uh, Eddie, don't be so tough with yourself. This uh, escaped gunman, Jack Lucas, I haven't really been looking for him. Well, you don't even know if he's around here. We know he's here, Mom. But you see, my record is more important to me than my duty as a cop. I don't want to find him. I don't believe you. I've been going through the motions. I haven't really been looking. You know why? Because if I find him, I know I'll have to shoot. So I'm sweating out 4 o'clock, and 4 o'clock is uh, 8 minutes away. <laughs> Eddie, you want to finish your career without using your gun. Not just for pride. I know myself, Mom. I know you better than you know yourself. You want to prove that a cop don't have to be a, a man as violent as the criminal's. Except he wears a badge, and he's got the right to smash heads. Mm. How white the ice cream is, and the syrup is blood red. Just like in a dream. What you're trying to tell everybody is, look, a cop can be kind and, and understanding, and a human being. I don't think I can eat it, Mom. Eddie, something the matter? Hey, Eddie! Yeah, what is it? Uh, you, you, you gotta... What do you want, punk? Uh, n n not nothing. You're gonna like the cop who's gonna walk this beat tomorrow. He's your kind of cop. Eddie! What is he? Don't say I told you. D don't ever say I ratted, but... But what? Next door. Next door in D'Angelo's. It's a stick-up. He, he's got a gun. Phone the station house, Mom. Help! 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 Or I'll fire! Eddie? Yeah? It uh, was on the news. I heard Frank called me and, and the sergeant and Mom. <laughs> D'Angelo. He's dead. Oh, no. You see, he was willing to give up the diamonds, but... But what, Eddie? He wouldn't let the hood take the watch. Oh. This watch. Read what it says. I know what it says. I killed the guy. I know. He fired first. That's what everyone says. He's 32 years old. Spent 12 years in jail. He had to end like this one day. 
He was searching for this day. He was waiting for it. That's right, Eddie. Listen, uh, I told the commissioner that since uh, I'm still under 50, I can put in 30 years instead of 27. All right, Eddie. They need me on that beach. You don't mind, Myra? I don't mind. They need you, Eddie. See what it says? To Edward Francis Mason. Eddie, a man of the law. Guys like you are few, far between. Nah, there's lots of guys like me. Guys who pray for just one more day. Well, just because I didn't get it, don't mean I have to walk out. I'll just start all over again. Just one more day. A modest enough request. There are so many days, so many uneventful days, so many dull days in which nothing happens. And yet, when Eddie Mason prayed for just one more of them, suddenly... It became too precious a gift. I'll be back shortly. Because they come and go without effort, without notice, because one follows another swiftly and regularly, do not take your days for granted. Each is special. Each has its own meaning and its own place in the scheme of your life. Each one added to the other shapes the meaning of your existence. And hopefully, you will always be able to ask for and receive just one more day of whatever it takes to make you happy. Our cast included Theodore Bickell, E.V. Jester, Jackson Beck, Ken Harvey, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. Know what a petard is? I always knew it was something you got hoisted by, you know, hoist by his own petard. But I never knew what it was. So I looked it up. It was an explosive device used centuries ago by warring armies to blow things up. A device which sometimes blew up unexpectedly. Thus, hoisting the user into the air, to say the least. I mention all this because that's exactly what seems to have happened to a certain middle-aged lady known as Madame Zora. Our mystery drama, Medium Rare, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Joan Lovejoy and Robert Dryden. We're told that there are people who have the power to communicate with the souls of those who have died and passed on into another world. They are known as psychics, sensitives, mediums. 
Unhappily, there are also people who pretend to have this uncanny ability, fake mediums, who prey upon the credulous, the gullible. One of these, I regret to say, was an otherwise rather decent woman who dubbed herself Madame Zora and who, with the assistance of her husband Artie, well, listen. I'm sick of the racket, I'm sick of myself, and if you want the truth, Artie, I am sick of you. Ah, oh, come on, Gladys, what I do? Nothing. That's just the trouble. You never do anything. Y you don't even bother to look for a job anymore. What's the sense of looking for what isn't there? Actors are out of work in droves. The trouble is you are always out of work in droves. Okay, so I haven't made it yet. But someday, you mark my word, someday I'll be a star. Oh, yeah, that'll be the day. Right now, it is today, and Mrs. Norris will be here any minute. Now, Artie, somehow, some way, we've got to keep her coming back for more seances. Well, not a chance, you ask me. Unless the late lamented Mr. Norris tells her where he stashed that million in cold cash and tells her today... She's going to split. We've got to give her an answer. Otherwise, well, I, I just don't know where the next sucker is coming from. Oh, she's here. Into the bedroom, quick. On my way. Uh, you tested the microphone setup. Natch. Well, here goes nothing. Uh, Mrs. Norris, how nice to see you. Come in, come in. Hello. I'm, uh, I'm all ready for you, and... Mrs. Norris, believe me, I have a feeling that today your dear departed husband is going to tell you what you want to know. He'd better. Or it's the last fifty dollars you'll ever get from me, Madame Zora. I have done all in my power to help you. Well, in that case, perhaps I'd better find a medium with more power. Hmm? Shall we get on with it? Uh, yes. Y yes, of course. If you'll just be seated at the seance table. And now, let me turn down the lights. So. And now I will seat myself. And go into trance. Ah. He is here. He is with us. You are there, are you not, Mr. Norris? I am here, Madame Zora. Your wife has joined me once again so she can talk to you. Will you talk with her? Hello, Marie. Herkimer, is that you? Really, you. Would I lie to you, Marie? No, you wouldn't dare. But Madame Zora might. Marie, believe me, you may put your trust in Madame Zora. Herkimer, where is that money? Marie, you know I've been trying to remember where I put that million... For weeks, I've been trying to remember, but... Oh, that does it. I've had enough. You can come out of your trance, Madame Zora, if you are in one, and never again will call I come it, into the... Doll, what? Call it, Who? What? I said call it. Knock what? it off. Who are... Who are you? What? Handsome Harry Harrigan, they used to call me, sweetheart. Uh, but never mind that. You want to know where hubby cribbed the cabbage, right? Crib the cabbage. Hid the dough. Okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you because I'm sick of hearing you ask. Also, I've got some business with Madame Zora, and you're chewing too much beef. Uh, oh. You got something to write with, pencil, paper? Yes, I've got... All right, write this down. Geneva Bank, Switzerland. Got that? Yes. Number 753... 8492W. Got that? Yes, but. That's but what? the number of the safety deposit box in the Geneva Bank where your hubby hid the long green. Okay. You got what you want? Pay Madame Zora her 50 clams and split. Yes. Yeah, oh, yes, I would. 
I don't know what to say ex- Well, thank you, Madam Zora. Thank you. Uh, uh, not, not at all, not at all. And thank you, Harry. Thank you. Yeah, 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 sure. Now fade, will you? Fade? Scram. Beat it. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm going. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Hardy, you can come out of the bedroom now. What? What's happening? Who, who are you? Where are you? I'm here, but you can't see me. I haven't learned how to, what they call, materialize yet. Materialize? Are you... Are you telling us that you're a... a real ghost? I'm not whistling Dixie, doll. Artie, I think I'm going to faint. Uh, later. Right now I need you. I need a job done. And I've picked you to do it. What, what, what kind of a job? You'll find out. First, let me give you a little scam about me. Put you in a picture like they say. Before I kicked off a couple of years ago, I was one of the best card shops in the business. Handsome Harry, they called me. Handsome Harry Harrigan, because... <laughs> I do say so myself, I was a pretty cool-looking cat. Not like this creep you married. What do you mean, creep? Go take a look at yourself in a mirror and you'll see what I mean. You want to be an actor, you got to act the part. Look like an actor, talk like an actor, dress like an actor... You look at, talk, and dress like a bum. Oh, I've been telling him that for years, but would he listen to me? Oh, no, not him. He's Some just other a... time, Gladys, huh? Right now, I gotta fill you in on why I'm here. Oh, I'm sorry, Harry. Uh, I may call you Harry. Uh, handsome. I was always called handsome. <sighs> now, over here, in this other world, I'm doing a stretch in what they call limbo. It's kind of like being in a can in prison, you know what I mean? That's because I got hate in my soul and I got to get rid of it. Hate in your soul? You got hate? For a gunsel named Tex Morgan, who three years ago took me to the cleaners with a pair of loaded dice and took my mouse along with everything else. But what were you doing with a mouse? A dame, a skirt. Girlfriend. Oh! oh. Dory. That was her name. A looker, a bombshell. Tex, he cops my dough and her. I'm looking for them a whole year to put the blast on them, to get revenge. When my ticker goes bluey and, well, that's the end of that. So now I'm over here in this limbo place. And I can't get out till I, what they call, purge myself of this hate I got for Tex and Dory. What do you want with us? How are we going to help you get rid of your hate feelings? I'll explain all that when we get to Vegas. Vegas? Las Vegas? There's another Vegas? Yeah, Las Vegas. That's where they are right now, Tex and Dory. He's a blackjack dealer at the Pan of Gold. Suppose we don't go. Don't go? Well, you haven't told us what's in it for us yet. What do we get out of all this if, if we help you? It's what you'll get out of it if you don't help me. Like what? Artie! What? The table, my expensive hey. seance table. Huh. I, I've got six payments to go yet. It's buzzing up and down on the floor. It's... Look! Look, it's flying in the air. And... Man, it... look out! Oh. Oh. oh, he's broken my seance table and splinters. Harry, you've wrecked my table with six payments. Are you and Meathead here going to Vegas? Or not going to Vegas? Artie, start packing. <laughs> Dory? Yes, Tex? Clean shirt? Bureau, top drawer. I'll get it. Oh, no, you don't. You just stay right there on the couch. Remember, you're resting for two now. Oh, darling. Having a baby isn't really the big deal you're making out of it. Maybe not, but you are, to me. <laughs> the biggest deal I ever made, honey. Oh, Tex. Oh, baby. Hey. 
Come on, you got 15 minutes to get over to the Patagon. I'll make it, I'll make it. I wouldn't be late today for anything. Do you really think Roscoe will? Look, would he have called me into his private office yesterday, talk to me like a loving father, if he if he didn't mean that I'm going to get the nod? Supervisor, head dealer, oh, Tex, you'll be in charge of the whole section. Yeah, bring it home, a lot more bacon, that's what counts. Especially right now, kid on the way. And the house, the little house. But can we afford it, really, Tex, can we? You want it, don't you? You know I do. And you're going to get it. Oh. You're the one that convinced me to go straight, and Dory, I bless you for it. Hauling down a straight salary, working a blackjack table on the up and up. I'm clean. I am Tex Morgan Citizen. And Dory, it feels good. Solid. Then, no regrets. Regrets? Well, being married, kid on the way and all. You shouldn't even ask. <laughs> Wild, man. Wild. You sound like you've never been in a casino before, Artie. Me? <laughs> I never been west of Hoboken, New Jersey. Gladys, look at this place with you. Roulette wheels, slot machines, craft tables. I don't know what all. Blackjack tables. Like that one over there. With Tex Morgan dealing. That's him? The, the slim one with the glasses? That's him. My first mark, my first step to, like they say in limbo, purging my soul of hate. <laughs> you ready to go to work, Gladys? Well, what, what do you want me to do? Take a hand at Morgan's table. Play blackjack? I don't know how. I've never played. Artie has, though. How much dough you got on you, Gladys? Would you believe seven dollars? Gladys, by the time you leave that table, Tex Morgan's table, you won't have just seven skins or seventy or seven hundred or seven thousand. You're going to leave that table with seventeen thousand iron men. Seventeen grand? For openers. We'll really start putting the hooks to Tex Morgan tomorrow. Look, I don't get this. I, I don't know the first thing about playing blackjack. But I know everything. Also, I'm a ghost. Oh, what's that got to do with it? I can see through anything, including cards. My revenge on Tex and Dory begins. And baby, let handsome Harry tell you... Revenge is sweet. Handsome Harry Harrigan is taking the wrong route to purging his soul. Madame Zora, fake medium, was, as I said at the outset, hoist by her own petard. And uh, quite honestly, I look forward to Handsome Harry unhappy though he may be in limbo, being hoist by his. We'll see when I return shortly with Act Two. <laughs> Madame Zora, fake medium, finds herself in real and anything but medium trouble completely under the domination of the ghost of Handsome Harry Harrigan. It seems that when Handsome Harry's uh, ticker went bluey, he found himself in limbo, to move on from which point he must purge his soul of the hate he feels for Tex Morgan and his former girlfriend, Dory. And so, in the gambling casino of the Pan of Gold in Las Vegas... Hit me. Twenty. Eighteen. You win again. Joey, get a rascal quick. Gladys, lay a thousand on the next hand. Okay, Harry. Ma'am? Uh, what? Did you say something? Oh, no, no, no. Nothing. A uh, thousand on the next hand. As it is. Again? Yeah, hit me. Stand pat, Gladys. With fifteen? He's got 13. Top card's an ace. 
He'll take it and go over. Ma'am. Um, I'll, uh, I'll sit with these. Suit yourself. One more to the house. Hmm. 23. <laughs> Baby. You wanted me, Tex? Uh, yeah, Roscoe. Excuse me, ma'am. I'll be back in a second. Roscoe, this is me. How come she's breaking the house? I don't know. You know. Of course I don't, Roscoe. You don't know this thing? No. You never see her before? No. She's in a house, what? How much? 14 grand. Close the table. Okay. Hey, Hardy. Table's closed, ma'am. What do you mean, closed? He means closed. Well, now, wait just a minute. Hold I... on. You collect your winnings, then toss Tex a $100 chip. Well, okay. Just give me my winnings. And, uh, um, here's a hundred for you, dealer. Say, go buy yourself a piece of luck. Uh, go buy yourself a piece of luck. Oh, my God. Is, is something wrong? You, you've gone white as a ghost. Where'd you get that line, lady? What line? Handing the dealer a hundred skins and saying, go buy yourself a piece of luck. Why? What's it to you? Nothing, only... It was a trademark of a gambler, a big-time swinger, who died more than two years ago. And then, Dory, then she says, go buy yourself a piece of luck, just the way handsome used to. But what of it? It's something almost anyone might say. It was Handsome's trademark. And another thing, all through the place, she kept rubbing the right side of her nose with her index finger, just the way Handsome used to. Oh, honestly, Tex, I don't know what you're getting at. I am saying, I'm saying that Handsome Harry Harrigan was at that table, my table. Tex, Handsome's been dead for more than two years. He's come back to get me. Tex! He swore he would with his dying breath, he swore it. Face it, Dory. I cheated him out of a fortune with loaded dice. But that was before you went straight. I wouldn't cut any ice with Handsome, dead or alive. What about you? You left him for me. You deserted him, he said. But he knew better than that. He knew the hell he'd put me through. How many times did he beat me up? How many threats did he make to disfigure me with acid if I ever even looked cross-eyed at another man? I was scared to death of him, Tex. Petrified. Until I fell in love with you and... And I just knew I couldn't go on with him anymore. No matter what he did. Dory, I tell you, he's come back. I know he's come back. Well, I don't believe in ghosts, and I never will. But if they do exist, if Handsome has come back, I'm not afraid of him or what he'll try to do. There's no reason to be afraid of him. Not anymore. How do you figure that? Because we love each other, Tex. We love each other deeply and devotedly. Maybe it sounds corny, but from where I sit, love is stronger than hate any day. Artie? <laughs> Artie? What have you done to yourself? What I wanted to do for years, as soon as I got some dough, go out and buy me some new threads. Handsome wasn't telling me nothing I didn't know when he said, I want to be an actor, I got to dress the part. Oh, well, I never believed clothes make the man, but they sure make you. I'm more than just a clothes horse doll. What, what in the world? Artie, you sounded just like Handsome Harry. I am handsome, Harry, sweetheart. What? Just using stupid's body for a while. You... You are using Artie's body? Until I learn how to materialize, if I ever do. They tell me on the other side, in that limbo joint, it takes a lot of patience and practice. Yeah, what do they know? They even told me I'm getting this hate out of my soul the wrong way. Well, I haven't wanted to say anything. All right, so uh... don't. They say taking out my hate on Tex and Dory 
It'll only make my hate grow bigger. Said I gotta find forgiveness in my heart. I told him to take a powder. I know what I'm doing. I hope so. Hey, what's eating you all of a sudden? You won a fortune the past week beating Tex at Blackjack. She came to see me, Dory. Oh? She said Tex was scared. That nose rubbing bit, you know. That he thought I was you returned from the dead. He's right. You are. Same difference, anyhow. Well, I told her I didn't know what she was talking about. So she said, well, anyhow, to please lay off Tex that he was in hot water at the casino because of the losses at his table and... Well, look, handsome. She seemed like an awfully nice kid and a decent kid to me. And it, it comes to that I've grown to like Tex Morgan, too. Oh, stop. You're breaking my heart. Handsome, the way I feel now... Rise I... up. What I feel is all that matters. And don't forget, if I can take possession of Artie's body, I can do the same with yours. So don't get any fancy ideas about running out on me. You got that? Yeah. Then hang on to it, doll. Hang on real tight. Yeah. Send him in. Sit down, Tex. A Tex. I'm sorry about this, real sorry. I guess you know I was going to make you a head dealer of the blackjack section. You're not? Worse. You're fired. Oh, come on, We can Roscoe. put up with a lot from our dealers, Tex, but one thing we won't put up with is a crooked dealer. I told you when you took me on two years ago that I was playing straight from then on, and I have. Maybe. There's no maybe about it, Roscoe. I'm married to one of the finest women in the world. I've got a kid on the way. We're planning to buy a house here in Vegas. And you're saying that I'd risk all that by going crooked again. I'm talking facts. Sorry, pal. I get my orders from upstairs. You're out of the pan of gold in every other casino in town. He said he'd get me, and he's done it. You should have bought more luggage after buying all those new suits. How are we going to pack them up for the trip back east? You taking a powder, doll? But... Oh. It's you, Handsome. You've taken possession of Artie's body again. Yeah. Handsome Harry in the flesh. Artie's flesh. <laughs> What's all this with a packing? We're going back to New York. Who says? I do. I don't. And I give the orders, sweetheart. You and Artie are staying right here in Vegas. But what for? The job you wanted done? It's done. Hasn't even started. Now, what do you mean? Getting Tex fired was just the first step. I swore I'd make him regret the day he was born, and that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> he thought he was all set, married to my doll, a kid on the way. Could have been my kid. Handsome, listen to me. What for? All you're going to do is run off at the mouth about forgive and forget. No more arguments, Gladys. I'm following through with every single step in my plan, following through to the hilt. Well, how many steps are there? Three. You took care of the first. Artie will take care of the second. And the third? <laughs> That'll take care of itself. All right, I come here to get step number two set up with Artie. I got to talk to him. Where is he? You're in him. Oh, hey, I forgot. Well, I can't talk to myself, can I? Okay, Artie, take over. Um, uh, you, you say something about buying more luggage, Gladys? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did, Artie, but skip it for now, sweetheart. Sweetheart? Um, Handsome's here. He wants to uh, talk to you. About what? I got a job for you, punk. What kind of a job, handsome? Acting. You're going to be an actor. An actor? Oh, honey, don't listen to him. He's putting you on. What 
part do I play? A murderer. A murderer? I... I kill somebody? Not just somebody, Artie. You kill a very special person. You kill the girl who used to be my girlfriend. You killed Dory Morgan. A short act, but a sweet one, Handsome Harry said, believing, as perhaps all too many do, that revenge is sweet. But chemistry teaches the immutable, perhaps divine law that the sweeter a thing, the more sour it can become, given certain conditions. Personally, I have the feeling that Handsome's sweet revenge is going to turn very sour indeed. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Helpless in the grip of a ghost, the ghost of gambler handsome Harry Harrigan, fake medium Madame Zora, real name Gladys, and her would-be actor husband Artie find that they must do whatever Handsome tells them to do. Now, to the horrified astonishment of both, Handsome has told Artie that he is going to murder Dory Morgan. Murder Dory Morgan? Kill that nice sweet kid? Don't hand me that nice sweet kid, Jazz. She's a two-time and tramp. No, she is a decent girl. And she's carrying a baby. Tex Morgan's baby. I don't care whose baby it is. Kill her and it's double murder. And I'm not letting Artie do one. Stupid here will do what I tell him and there's nothing you can do to stop it. But why? What are you going to get out of killing Dory? Not what I'm going to get, sweetheart. What Tex is going to get. The misery that'll make him wish he'd never been born. He'll live with that misery inside him. Burning in him. In his gut. For the rest of his life. First, he loves her. And he does, I know that. Second, he'll know he killed her. Not me, him. Every day of his life, he'll think, a thousand times a day, he'll think, if I hadn't stolen her from Handsome, she wouldn't be dead. He didn't steal her. She loved him. Love? You know something? I'm sick of that word. That's all I talk about over here, love. Love? And that's all you talk about lately. You, a two-bit phony medium that sucked in any mark you could find, sucked them dry, even when they didn't have a pot to put a penny in. And you talk to me of love? Okay. I guess I have no right. I... I've got to admit, I don't know much about it. It's new to me, love. What? <laughs> You, you mean... You mean me, Gladys? Yes, Artie. I love you. Well, how about that? You hear that, handsome? How about that? So, don't get all flaked out. I know, dames, and this one you're married to is no exception. Love you. She needs you is all. There ain't a dame in the world. There isn't a person in the world. Wouldn't sell his mother down the drain. You're judging others by what you were, are. Can't you get it through your head? Can't they on the other side somehow beat it into you that there are good people in the world? Honest, generous, decent people? Show me one. What? Show me one. Just one. And maybe then I'll believe. Well, go on, doll. Show me one. Name me one. Dory. Dory? I can prove it to you. Yeah? How? If I do, will you let her off the hook? Will you let her live her life with Tex? Sure. It's a deal, handsome? It's a deal, baby. It's a deal. <laughs> It isn't the end of the world. 
It's the end of our plans, our future. It's sure the end of the house. <laughs> I can't afford a mortgage now. So? We live in an apartment. Yeah, and how long will I be able to afford the rent? Tex, I can always get a job to help out. With a baby? Well, there's sitters, people who stay with kids while the... No! Tex! I said no, and I mean it. And it'd be like the, like the way I was brought up, dragged up. My father couldn't make it either, so my mother went to work, and my grandmother, she took care of me. Then she died, and I went on the streets. It changed my life, Dory. It taught me to cheat and lie and sucker anybody I could until... Until? Until I met you and fell in love with you. <laughs> Oh, uh, you. Uh, may I come in? Well, yes. I, uh, I don't blame you for hesitating, Mrs. Morgan. I, I guess I've kind of put a crimp in your life. Oh, what? Uh, not at all. You don't have to con me. I know the score. Your husband's in trouble, Mrs. Morgan. Bad trouble. Is he? You know it. I don't know anything of the sort. Well, never mind that. What is it you want? I've come here to uh, make you an offer. Offer? In the past week, I won $130,000 from your husband. Well, the, the casino, actually. But he was the dealer, and he lost his job because of it. True. The deal I've come here to make, and no questions now, I'll give you that hundred and thirty grand if... If you leave him. You will give me everything you won from Tex if I leave him? What you mean is desert him? Yes. In other words, sell him out for $130,000? Well, that's one way of putting it. Tell me another. Harry was evil. And the man I'm married to is good. As for you, I don't know what you are. I don't think you know what you are. But you'd be smart if you found out. Found out? I didn't know who I was with Harry. But I did. And I do. With Tex. You think you can buy that? With $130,000? You think you can buy it with $130 billion zillion dollars? I said I'd give you one answer. Here it is. You can't. <laughs> I was sure I couldn't. Then why did you come here? To prove my point uh, to somebody else. But we had a deal, you, you Welsher. I said I'd prove there are good people in this world, decent people capable of love, and I did. She turned down your offer flat. You go and you buy a gun and you kill her, that's all. I'm not buying any gun and I'm not killing anybody, especially a fine human being like Dory Morgan. All right. Now let me tell you two something. Thanks to me... You're worth 130 grand. You're on Easy Street. I can see to it you wind up right back where you started in that crummy New York apartment scrounging for nickels and dimes. Now, what's it to be? As far as I'm concerned, you can take your 130,000 and stuff it. Tex and Dory, two people you never met till now, and you'd give up a fortune for them? And for what they stand for. For what they are. She loves him, he loves her. And Love, a stacked deck, a con game. Call it what you want. I'm not killing Dory Morgan. And you neither, huh, stupid? Well, uh, I don't know. Ari! Gladys, baby, I'm sorry, but I've been thinking. I don't want to go back to that lousy New York dump and start living from hand to mouth again. You'll do it? Ari, you'll do it? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll do it. Oh, Artie, Artie, Artie. 
Yes? Uh, uh, Mrs. Morgan? Yes? Uh, I, I'm I'm a friend of Texas. Is he home? Well, no, he just left. But you must have just passed him on your way in. Oh, it's too bad. Uh, I, I, I got a job for him. A job? Oh, well. Won't you come in? Uh, th thanks. Sit down. Sit down. Um, wh what kind of a job is it? What is this? A gun. Now listen, I, I, I don't like to do this, but I, I gotta... Gotta what? Kill you. Kill me? Yeah, I, I, I gotta do it. I got no choice, you see. It, 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 it won't hurt. I, I'll, I'll make it quick so it don't hurt, and, and I'm... And, I can't do it, Harry. I can't do it. I can. I can easy. You... Your voice... It's... It's changed. It's, you sound like... Like... Handsome Harry Harrigan, Dory. Oh! You're all flame. Handsome Harry. But you... You're... Dead? Only my body, doll. The spirit... It don't die. It goes on living till it gets itself purged or something... That's why I'm here. Inside this creep's body. My spirit using his body to kill you, you two diamonds. Harry, and Harry. I won't make it quick. I'm going to make it slow. And very painful, doll. Very. Oh, Harry. Harry, no. I, I, I don't care about me, but the baby. I'm carrying a baby. His baby. It doesn't matter whose. It's a Baby, it's a new life. Oh, Harry, no! I'm telling you, stand Harry, still. Harry, listen to me, please listen. I fell in love with Tex. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't stand it anymore with you. The beatings and the threats. If I'd loved you, you Harry, you did. No, you loved me. Never. I wanted to. I, oh, I wanted to, but you never gave me the chance. Why? I gave you everything you've asked for. Clothes, furs, jewels, no, everything. Everything but love, because you you never had any of that in you to give. What? A lot you know. A hell of a lot you know. You beat me. You threatened me. Because I loved you. Because I was scared of losing you. I seen you flirting with another guy. Never, I then never. Then it would send me up the wall. I'd make love to you, and you were like ice, like ice, and it would drive me bananas. I wanted you. I needed you. I never once, never once, did I ever have you. Harry, I'm sorry I beat you. I'm sorry I threatened you, but I couldn't help myself because. The thought of losing you. I knew I'd die if it happened. And I did. Oh, Harry. So, so you owe me, doll. For what you did to me, you owe me. And you're paying. You're paying in full. You're paying... Now! No! Harry? You dropped the gun. I can't kill you. I. I still love you. And, and, and maybe. Maybe I. Love you a little now. What is it, Harry? They're, they're crawling to me. They're, they're guys and dolls in limbo. Huh? What? Hey, <laughs> that's out of sight. I may say that. That's really something else. What? Harry, what is it? Dory. 
story, believe it or not, I'm purged. Love, hate. Two sides of the same coin, they say. If that is so, perhaps I can be forgiven for saying that Handsome Harry really flipped. Anyhow, he's purged. I'll be back shortly. You'll be interested to learn that Tex found another job and he and Dory are deliriously happy with their baby boy, Harry. Gladys and Artie live in the country. They bought a house and barn in which Artie stages and stars in his own plays. As for handsome Harry, he went on finally to a higher plane, wherever that is. Our cast included Joan Lovejoy, Robert Dryden, Mason Adams, and George Petrie. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. to guide you through the realm of the macabre. Things macabre, according to Webster, tend to produce horror in the beholder. Of mystery, the same source says, whatever attracts curiosity and speculation, but resists or defies explanation. Stay with us and hear those two definitions borne out. mystery drama, Pool of Fear, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Field and Farrington, and stars Morgan Fairchild and William Redfield. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Murder is one of the most prevalent One of the most heinous and certainly the most final of all criminal acts. Killing in a moment of blinding passion is dreadful enough, but far worse is the murder done with cold calculation, carefully planned and maliciously carried out when it succeeds. Murder in the first degree. Baby, I hope you like this nice, dark back road for the same reason I like it. Don't get ambitious, Matt. You can pull over anywhere along here. A pleasure. I need the freedom to talk without being overheard. Well, we could have talked back in the restaurant if that was all you wanted. What I have to say is better not said in a crowded restaurant. Okay. Talking is all you want, so talk. First, Matt, I want to tell you that I know all about your past... My past? One suspended sentence, one two-year term, both for armed robbery. How'd you find out? That's not important. 
So how come you're willing to go out with me, a fancy rich girl like you and uh, an ex-con? Oh, let's say I was attracted to you because of your record, not in spite of it. Have you ever killed anybody, Matt? You don't have to worry about telling me. I won't repeat it. No, I never did. Why are you so interested, Beth? How would you like to make $10,000? <laughs> you know the answer to that. I'm just about flat broke. I'm going out to Bromley to visit my father and stepmother over the weekend. I'll pay you $10,000 to come out with me and pretend to be my fiancé. Well, that's pretty pleasant duty. What's the catch? Well, there is one little thing. Sometime during the weekend, I want you to kill my stepmother. Oh, Millie, I meant to ask you. Are you planning to be at home tomorrow afternoon? I can be, surely. What's happening tomorrow afternoon? Well, I arranged to have Kent Bennett bring his boy over around two and clean out the pool. You know how Beth loves to swim, and I thought I'd like to have the pool in tip-top shape. No trouble. I'll be here. You're very pleased Beth's coming for the weekend, aren't you, Lee? Yes, I am. This is only the second time she's been out since she took the apartment in New York. I expect she'd come more often except for me. Now, don't start out with that attitude, Millie. Please. I want you and Beth to be friends. I'm afraid that's a tall order. Not if you try. Well, I'll do my best. But I'm afraid it's a lost cause. Now, if you start out thinking that way, of course it isn't going to work. I think she resents me because I'm trying to take her mother's place. I suppose that enters into it. But she'll get used to the idea in time. Darling, she's had almost three years now. Was she and her mother so very close? Very close, yes. Beth just about idolized Natalie. Would it all a likely... In some ways, Natalie had that same drive Beth has. She was more tolerant than Beth, though. Of other people, I mean. They didn't look at all alike. You know, I've never even seen a picture of Natalie. I got rid of them all shortly after she died. I didn't like the way Beth mooned over her mother's pictures. It was getting morbid. Well, I'll do my best to make Beth like me. Or at least tolerate me. I have a feeling it's going to be better this time. You know, she called and asked if she could come out. All on her own. She's never done that before. I just have a feeling it's going to work out well. I hope so. Just promise me you'll do your part. That's all I ask. Of course I will. But... I don't know. Sometimes that girl almost frightens me, Lee. <laughs> You wanted to take the train instead of driving, Beth. I just didn't feel like driving. You nervous, Matt? Yeah, a little. Feeling kind of out of my depth. Never took on a job like this before. It'll be all right. How come? Not to like her, okay, but to hate her enough to want her dead? You'd have had to know my mother. Nobody can ever take my mother's place, and Millie's trying to. But if your own mother's dead... My father never should have married again. I told him that, but he wouldn't listen to me. Hmm. I guess you must have really liked your mother. She was the finest woman that ever lived. Oh, everyone loved her. She was always doing things for people, never got tired. Well, still, I can't see that that's any And that reason. other woman has no business trying to take her place. Using her things, married to her husband. I just won't have it anymore. I can't bear to think of another woman in my mother's home with my father. Okay, whatever you say. She's tried to turn my father against me. Oh, she's all sweetness and light when I'm around. But she's done her best to take my father away from me. I know she's done that. All right, okay. How are we going to do it? Well, you're going to do it. Haven't you even thought about it? Well, not with a gun. That's no good. I mean, it's got to look like an accident. Of course not with a gun. I thought maybe, you know, uh, hold a pillow over her face. That wouldn't leave any marks. They might think it was a heart attack or something. She sleeps with my father. What's he going to be doing while you smother his wife? Well, she must take afternoon naps sometimes, doesn't she? Not with me there, she won't. Just catch her giving my father and me that much time alone together. Oh, I see. All right, all right. I'll think of something. 
If a good chance doesn't turn up this time, I could come back and try it another time. No, no, I've waited long enough. It's got to be this weekend. Okay, okay. We have a pool back of the house. Lots of people drown accidentally. Oh. Maybe you could work something out. Maybe. I don't know. A swimming pool sounds pretty much out in the open, though. The shrubbery screens the pool off from the neighbors. I think I like that idea. She can't swim very well. Yes. I wouldn't be surprised if my stepmother had a fatal swimming accident this weekend. I'm surprised she didn't take an earlier train, Lynn. She's missed practically a whole Saturday. Beth never was an early riser. I suggested an early start when I talked to her last night, but the idea didn't seem to appeal to her. Well, you'll have this evening and all day tomorrow with her at least. I do hope it's nice tomorrow. I feel very optimistic about this visit, Millie. wonder why she came by train instead of driving. That's such a nice car. She said she didn't feel like driving. I don't know why. I hope she didn't miss the train. No need to be. There. Isn't that Beth getting off? That looks like her. Who's that with her? She's got someone with her. Doesn't look like anybody I know. Are you sure he's with Beth? Yeah, he helped her off the train. Well, she might have brought a friend. Wouldn't be unlike her just to forget to mention it. Ah, oh, they're together, all right. Over here, Beth. Thanks for meeting us. I forgot to ask you to. How are you, Daddy? Ah. Mm. Oh, let me present my fiancé, Matt Brewster. How do you do? Did I forget to tell you I was bringing him with me? Your fiancé? Well, we thought we'd surprise you. Matt, this is my father. And this is my stepmother. How do you do? Hello, Beth. Well, I'm very pleased to meet you both. Uh, Beth has told me so much about you. I almost feel as if I know, know both of you already. I'm glad to meet you, son. A little surprised, I confess. Should I have told you in advance about Matt and me, Daddy? I thought it would be more fun to surprise you. Beth, you're looking very well. Thank you. <clears throat> well, come along, everybody. The car's in the parking lot just over here. It's very nice to see you again, Beth. Oh, yes. It's going to be a very special weekend. Well, we uh, met at this cocktail party given by a friend of mine who's in the theater business, uh, Beth knew his wife. Then I asked Beth to have dinner with me, and uh, well, that's the way it started. Not very original, of course. How long ago was that? About, uh, well, how long has it been, Beth? Oh, around three weeks, give or take a few days. You didn't waste any time, did you? Well, why should we? Daddy, I'm going to show Matt around outside. The pool and all the rest. You've got a beautiful place here, Mr. Stilwell. I am really impressed. Glad you like it. Dinner will be around 7.30, so if you want to drink first, better not stay out too long. Okay, okay, I'll watch the time. Oh, I wish she'd stop being so damn nice to me. Now, don't start thinking that way. Okay, I'll do it. Don't worry. It'd be easier, though, if I felt the same way about her you do, or if I didn't know her at all. This way, I'm, uh... Not very comfortable about it. Matt, we made an agreement. I said not to worry. I'll do it. All I'm saying is I don't think I'm going to enjoy it much. Ah, there's the pool. Well, your folks have got themselves some kind of a place here. Hmm. I used to love it. When my mother was alive. Yeah. I could learn to snuggle up to a place like this pretty good. Well, don't get used to it. Have you thought any more about how you're going to do it? Well, let's have a look around. Yeah, it does look pretty isolated back here at that. The house stands on an acre and a half, and it's all screened, especially around the pool here. Now, there's no way a neighbor can see what's going on. It was built that way on purpose. I used to sunbathe out here without even a bikini. Oh, that must have been pretty spectacular. Just keep your mind on the job. No way I'm likely to forget that. Make a nice-looking couple, at least. I just wish I knew him better. That's the only thing. I wish she knew him better. It isn't long enough for anyone to judge just three weeks. I'm sure she can take care of herself. Do you think you and she are hitting it off any better than in the past? Maybe. See, what would her mother have thought of him? Natalie? Uh -huh. Hard to say. 
She'd have been a lot better at sizing him up than I am. She was a strong woman. Whenever Beth's here, I find myself thinking about Natalie. I can't get my mind off her. That's Beth's fault, I guess. I'm afraid she's never fully accepted the fact of her mother's death. Do you think... I guess that's just silly. Do I think what? Well, do you think that Natalie could actually somehow be here right now? Millie, Natalie died over five years ago. I know, I know. Well, then she couldn't very well be here now, could she? How do you know? How can you be so sure about such things? I have a feeling, a very strong feeling, that she is here with us right now. Is it possible that, given great strength of character in life, a person might find a way to exert at least his or her influence after death? There is, of course, no pure answer to that question. It is one of those mysteries which attract speculation but defy explanation. We can, however, continue our speculation when I return shortly with Act Two. feeling of foreboding in the Stillwell home. Sunday morning has dawned bright and sunny enough, but somehow not cheerful in spite of this. Not for Millie, certainly, and not even for Lee, if we read his mood properly. Beth and Matt are still asleep. Beth in her old room and Matt in the guest room. Lee and Millie are having an early breakfast, which neither of them seems to be enjoying. Would you rather have waited, Lee, and had breakfast later with Beth and Matt when they come down? No, no, doesn't matter. It's kind of gloomy morning, isn't it? The sun's shining. No, but all the same, I'm feeling, I don't know, a little depressed, I guess. You think you're going to like Matt? I haven't really had enough time with him to make up my mind. I can't say honestly that I'm particularly fond of him. Oh? Well, there's something... I can't exactly put my finger on it. I, I get the feeling that nothing he says is quite as sincere as it might be. Seems pleasant enough. Oh, it's pleasant, all right. It's almost too pleasant. Trying too hard to please his prospective in-laws, maybe. Just gives me this creep somehow. I've been thinking about what you said yesterday evening, you remember? What? That you felt Natalie's presence. Oh, that's silly of me, I suppose. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Tell you the truth, I seem to be feeling the same thing this morning. You do? I started to heat milk for your coffee this morning. Darling, I drink my coffee black. Natalie always had hot milk with her breakfast coffee, half and half. Oh? I can't explain it. But I have this very strong feeling that she's right here with us. Right now. you like your breakfast now, Matt? There's no telling when Beth will be down. Well, I think just coffee's all I'm going to want, Mrs. Stillwell. Maybe you can eat something later with Beth when she's ready? Yeah, maybe. Aren't you feeling well this morning? <laughs> Not very. I, I I didn't sleep much, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Nervous bridegroom. Oh, don't make him a bridegroom quite yet. We haven't even set the date. Good morning, Beth. I hope you slept better than Matt says he did. Well, I always sleep well. Clear conscience. What would you like for breakfast? I can't sell Matt anything but a cup of coffee. Oh, that'll do for me, too. I'm not much of a breakfast person. But we'll have a big lunch. There's plenty of freshly perked coffee in the kitchen. Shall I bring it to you in here? I'll get it. We'll take it outside if that's all right with you, Matt. Oh, then sure, sure. Fine. And if you change your mind and decide to have something more substantial, just let me know. You look awful, Matt. Didn't you sleep? Yeah, I had a bad night. Didn't get to sleep until after 4 o'clock. Let's go outside where we can talk. Okay. Well, you're not getting cold feet, are you? The coldest. Listen, I don't know, Beth. I don't know if I can go through with it. I am spooked. Now, you listen to me. We made a bargain, and you will go through with it. I don't know. 
And it's got to be this afternoon. Now, I'm not going to let you chicken out. Oh, you you want to sit here? Is this okay? Anywhere. What happened to you? You were all right yesterday. Uh, did you ever get the feeling that somebody's watching you? Just all the time watching you? Not unless somebody was, no. Well, that's the way I felt all night. I just couldn't get away from it. Like somebody was staring at me the whole night. That's just nerves. It doesn't change anything. Maybe I was wrong when I told you I could kill somebody if I had to. Maybe I can at all. Nobody could possibly have been watching you last night. <sighs> now, you listen to me. You're going to have a talk with my father. He insists on it. Then we're all going to have lunch. And after that, you're going to do what you agreed to do. Mm-hmm. And how do you want me to handle the talk with your old man? Well, make it sound real. I know it'll be pretty corny, but you can handle it. I can handle that okay, sure. I'm not worried about that. You can do everything you have to do. Well, young man, if Beth can spare you for a few minutes, maybe we can have that little talk. Yes, sir. Oh, I can spare him. Matt, you look as if you're being dragged into a torture chamber. Just into the study. Come along. Don't take too long, and maybe Matt and Beth can get a swim in the pool before lunch. It's a good sunny day today. I'll try to keep the torture down to a bare minimum. I think I'll go upstairs and change into a swimsuit. Uh, Beth, could you wait just a few minutes? I'd like to talk to you. What do we have to talk about? Your father. What about him? Between the two of us, as I'm sure you realize, we're making him pretty unhappy. My father unhappy? About what? About us? I don't say you should suddenly turn into a loving stepdaughter. I'm sure you couldn't do that. What I'm suggesting is a truce for your father's sake. A truce for at least the rest of today. You didn't know my mother, did you? No? If you'd known my mother, you'd understand why I'm against you. Why I don't want you living in my mother's house, married to her husband. Beth, your mother died five years ago. It isn't healthy You are to simply keep on. not good enough, not woman enough to take my mother's place. I'm sure she was a fine woman. Anyway, it won't be necessary. What won't be necessary? Your little charade for Daddy's benefit. It won't be necessary. I don't understand. You don't have to. Relax, Matt. I'm not really an ogre. Ah, uh, no, sir, no. I know you're not. I'm I'm just kind of uh jumpy today. But it is an ordeal, I guess, meeting your future in laws for the first time. But I assure you we don't bite, either of us. <laughs> no, sir. Well now. What do you do for a living, Matt? I don't even know that. Well, I'm, um, uh, right now I'm the assistant manager of a theater, of, uh, I mean, a, a, a movie house. Right now? I expect to do better. Uh-huh. Does that, uh, being an assistant manager, does it bring in enough to support a wife? Uh, not the way you live, no, and not the way Beth has always lived, I guess. Well, you're aware that someday Beth will inherit a good deal of money. Well, I guess so. Yes, sir. I, uh, I don't know anything about it, but I assumed she would. Mm -hmm. And does that influence your affection for her in any way? No, sir, it does not. It must be a factor, though. Even if you try not to make it one. I suppose it will make a difference, but it's not why I want to marry Beth. All I can do is tell you that. I can't force you to believe it. You say it very convincingly. I think I will believe it. <laughs> hey, you swim like a pro. Well, I got my lifesaver certification when I was 18. I worked at it, too. At Jones Beach one season. Was that before or after your armed robbery career? <laughs> before. A lifesaver doesn't get much work during the winter in this part of the country. I was broke. Did you ever save anyone while you were working at Jones Beach? Huh? Yeah. A couple of guys. Well, then. You see, you've paid in advance for what you're going to do this afternoon. Oh, you are so damn cold about it. Anyway, I'm not a bit sure I'm going to do it. Now, Matt, we've been through that once. I haven't decided. Listen, do you feel like somebody's watching you right now? Of 
course not. Well, I do. And if somebody can watch me here in the pool now, why can't he do it later on this afternoon? Look, you're just imagining it, Matt. Nobody's watching you. I got this very creepy feeling. I... I wish... What? You wish what? Oh, I... I just wish it didn't have to be this way. It does, Nat. We made a deal. You know, when I was in there with your father earlier, it's a funny thing. I got kind of carried away. Carried away? Sort of forgot about the whole thing being a hoax, you know? I would have told him anything. I was the president of a bank or a rich kid or anything, but instead I kept telling him the truth. Maybe I exaggerated some about my prospects, but that's just what a guy would do if it was for real. Your prospects aren't bad. You're about to inherit $10,000. And what I'm about to do, if I do it, is earn $10,000 the hard way. Well, I'm not going to let you chicken out, Matt. You know, I couldn't help wishing it was true when I was in the study there with your father. That we were going to be married? For real? Yeah. Stupid of me. Yes, Matt. Very stupid. Did you have your talk with Beth? A very short talk. How'd it go? Poorly. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm just not good enough to take her mother's place. That's the whole trouble. And it isn't just me. It would be the same with anybody you'd married. Well, maybe it's a good thing she's getting married. Take her mind off this preoccupation with her mother. It just might be the best thing that's happened to Beth in a long time. How did you talk with Matt, though? Oh, I asked him all the old-fashioned questions, and he gave me all the old-fashioned answers. You know, there's still something about him. I just don't know, Lee. There's, there's some kind of off-center. Does that make any sense? Not very much. No, I suppose not. Natalie doesn't like him. Natalie doesn't like him? Don't you still feel that she's here with us? I have a peculiar feeling, yes. Uh Uh-huh. But she doesn't like Matt? She doesn't. Are you going to tell me that you've been in touch with her? No. No, not exactly. But uh, but I, I know how she feels. How could you, Millie? I just... Somehow, I do know. And she feels much more strongly about him than I do, Lee. I believe she knows something about him that I don't know. Perhaps in times of extreme stress... A rapport is possible between the living and the dead. Fantastic? Well, there is no very boldly drawn line between fact and fancy that I know of. Maybe a bit of what we think of as the supernatural has found its way into the usually quite commonplace atmosphere of the Stillwell home. We'll consider this possibility further when I return shortly with Act Three. man's natural element. He has for centuries taken more pleasure in swimming than perhaps any other sport. Is it the element of danger involved that so spices the pastime? There's always the threat of drowning, but it keeps few people out of deep water. Millie Stillwell, however, would be specially well advised to stay out of the Stillwell pool this afternoon. For the threat to her has become very real. Okay, now here's the way we'll do it. After lunch, I'll tell my father I want to talk to him about, uh... Oh, I don't know, I think it's something. The financial arrangements after we're married. You know, something like that. I told him I wasn't marrying you for your money. Well, he's always given me an allowance. Anyway, the study is the best place for him while you're dealing with my stepmother. The pool can't be seen from there. The windows all face the other direction. Beth, it's no use making a lot of plans because I'm not going to be able to go... You'll suggest a dip in the pool to Millie. You don't like to swim alone. Look, she wouldn't go in the pool with me. Of course she will. She's trying to be a good hostess. 
And if you don't like to swim alone, she'll go in with you. Now, once you've got her in the pool, you simply hold her under until she drowns. She won't be able to scream or do a thing to stop you. Man, it's perfect. Wait a minute. I got this feeling right now that somebody's watching me. Oh, shut me. up, will you? It's nothing but nerves. Now, when you're sure Millie's dead, you drag her out of the pool and shout to Daddy and me. We come running out and find you giving her mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Oh, it's too late, of course. But there you'll be, doing everything you possibly can to save her life. It's foolproof, Matt. I'm not going to do it, Beth. Oh, yes, you are. Look, I'd like to keep my promise to you. Lord knows I could use $10,000, but there's no use in thinking about it anymore. I can't do it. What if we up the price a little, Matt? No good. I couldn't kill her at any price. You told me that when you were talking to Daddy earlier, you wished it could all be real. That we actually were planning to get married. And you called me stupid. Well, what if I said now that it... It could be real. That I'd marry you if you went through with our plan. You really would? Yes. Yes, and eventually it would be worth a lot more than $10,000 to you, Matt. What I told your father was true. I wouldn't be marrying you just for your money. Well, what, for whatever reason, will you do it, Matt? You wouldn't be marrying me because you love me, of course. I'd be a good wife all the same. What to keep you from saying now that you'll marry me and then refusing to do it after I've... after it's all over with? Your stepmother, I mean. Because I keep my promises, Matt. I learned that from my mother. She never lied and she never broke a promise. I won't break my promise to you. All right. You won't back down at the last minute. Not if it means marrying you. No. I'll do it. I can't get over this feeling that something dreadful is going to happen, Lee. Is that kind of day? I guess. I'm feeling pretty spooked myself. And you were looking forward to such a nice weekend with Beth. It hasn't turned out quite that well, has it? You still have the feeling that Natalie's with us. It's fantastic. A while ago, I looked out toward the pool, and I could have sworn that Natalie was sitting in one of the chairs. Oh, no. Just for a second. The chair was in the shade of the old oak, and of course it was just a trick of the shadows, along with my mind. But for a couple of seconds, I could have sworn that Natalie was sitting there. Ah. Isn't it about time for lunch? Yes, it is. I think I'll serve it out by the pool. That way, Beth and Matt won't have to change. Beth? Matt? Lunch is ready. Be right there. He swims like a fish, doesn't he? Oh, what's for lunch? I'm starved all of a sudden. Just cold cuts, nothing very fancy. I hope it's going to be enough. Oh, we're pretty wet. Should we change? No. That's why I brought lunch out here, so you wouldn't have to. Daddy, hmm? after lunch, can we have a good old-fashioned father-to-daughter talk? Sure thing. What about? In the study, like old times, okay? Fine. And I'll tell you what about when the time comes. Oh, looks as if we're going to be left on our own, Mrs. Stilwell. Like to come for a swim with me? Oh, no, I don't think so, thanks. I'm not much of a swimmer, actually. I almost never go into the pool. Well, Matt hates to swim alone. Don't you, Matt? Yes, I don't know exactly why. It just doesn't seem to be as much fun alone. So couldn't you go in with him just to uh, keep him company? Well, <laughs> I suppose I could, sure. Just to be there. But don't expect me to do any fancy swimming. Oh, well, maybe Matt could give you a lesson. He used to be a lifesaver, you know. He's very good. Well, if he wants to try, I guess. But I'm warning you right now. I'm hopeless. Well, let Matt give you a lesson. He'll surprise you. Sit down, Beth. It's been a long time since you and I had one of our heart-to-heart talks here in the study. Yes, I guess Mother must have still been alive the last time we had one. Oh, surely not. She's been gone over five years now, Beth. In some ways it seems like forever. 
in some ways, I guess it's, uh, it's just like yesterday. Oh, Daddy, I remember her so well. Every little thing about her. And now you can overdo that sort of thing, you know. Remembering Mother? I don't see how. Drilling on it so much. Your mother was a wonderful woman. Nobody knows that better than I do. But she's gone now, Beth. You and I have to go on living. You with Millie. Oh, I wish you could be a little more tolerant of Millie, Beth. She's trying to take my mother's place. Well, that's what she's supposed to do. With me. And with you, if you'd let her. Well, I won't. You can do as you please, I suppose. But I will never accept Millie. Never. Sorry, I took so long changing that I couldn't find a bathing cap. Oh, it's all right. I took a dozen laps at the pool. I'm not in as good shape as I should be. A dozen laps? I call that pretty good. Well, come on in. Well, you better stand back. I splash. <laughs> you splash, all right. I told you not to expect anything fancy. Okay. Let me see you swim across the pool once. Well, once is about all I can handle. Okay? Here goes. All right. Ah, you see? You see? You're lifting your arms too high. Try to sort of just snake them up. Easy. Oh, I'm terrible. <laughs> I splashed the pool and see if I spent much time in it. Well, come on down to the deep end. It's uh, much easier to swim in deep no, water. No, you know. not me. Not me. I stay where I can put my feet on the bottom any time I want to. Beth, I'm sure you didn't suggest this little talk just for old time's sake. Now, what's on your mind? How do you like Matt, Daddy? He seems like a nice fellow. You've only known him for three weeks. Oh, you're being old-fashioned. Is that old-fashioned? Still seems pretty sound to me. Three weeks is a very short time, old or new fashioned. Well, it isn't as if we were going to be married in three weeks. I mean, we've just agreed to marry. We haven't even set a date yet. That's true, of course. Uh, where do you plan to live when you finally do marry? Oh, for the time being, I guess we'll just stay in my place. I've never even seen his apartment, but I, uh, I get the feeling it's pretty ratty. This sounds all right. You've got plenty of room. Daddy. Yes? I just... I just wonder what Mother would have thought of him. I... I've been wondering about that, too. Although, actually, if Mother were still alive, I wouldn't be marrying him in the first place. I really don't want a lesson, Matt. It's not worth it. I don't enjoy swimming that much. Well, everyone ought to be able to swim, though. I'd hold you up. There wouldn't be any danger. No, oh, really. I'd rather not. Well, okay. I wonder what Leah and Beth are talking about all this time. Oh, it hasn't been long. It's Twenty minutes or better. Uh huh. Well, I guess I'd better do what I have to do. Would Matt object to my continuing your allowance? I don't see any reason why you should have to do without things just because you didn't marry a rich man. We haven't talked about it, but I don't think he'd object. He was pretty firm about the fact that he wasn't marrying you for money. He isn't, but that doesn't mean that he... That sounded like Millie. She wasn't supposed to... Let's get out there. Millie! 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 Help me! I can't get him out of the water. Help me, Millie! What happened? Matt was just sort of playing around, and he was trying... He was trying to duck something for something, and all of a sudden he just collapsed. Yeah, let me get hold of him. You better call an ambulance, Beth. Yes. Yes, I, I don't understand it all. I've got him, Millie. Are you all right? I'm okay, I'm yeah, okay. Uh, uh, help me stretch him out here. All right. I don't, I don't like the way he looks. Oh, God, just that awful expression on his face. He looks terrified. Can't you do something for well, him? I'll try, I'll try, but I'm, I'm afraid he's dead. Around back by the pool. Uh, show me, please. He was in the pool, Doctor. I, I, I think he must have had a, a cramp or something. All right, all right. Just uh, let me have a look at him. Will he be all right? It doesn't look good to me, Beth. I'm afraid. I don't understand it. What went wrong? Just what I told you, Beth. He he was just playing, you know, the, the way people do in the water. I think he was going to duck me, and then all of a sudden he got this 
awful look on his face. And he just went under. Like he had a stroke or something. He bungled it. What? He didn't struggle or anything like that. I think he was unconscious already. I tried to hold his head out of the water, but he was so heavy. He'd have known he couldn't do it. Do what, Beth? Uh, I, I don't know what I'm saying. Oh, Beth. Beth, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm afraid there's nothing I can do. This this man is dead. Oh. He, he didn't drown. At least I don't think he did. Uh, we'll have to examine him, of course. Well, what did happen? A heart seizure, I suspect. It's just a guess. You know, if it weren't so completely unscientific, I think I'd say he died of fear. Where's Beth Lee? She's up in her room, resting, I guess. Well, shouldn't someone be with her? She said she wanted to be alone. She doesn't seem to be taking it too badly. I don't really understand the way she's taking it. She seems more angry than anything else. Lee... Was Natalie tall, black hair, very beautiful, but with a, a small scar just at the corner of her left eye? Oh, yes. How could you know that? I saw her. You saw her? I couldn't tell the doctor. How can you tell a doctor a thing like that? You saw Natalie? Matt was trying to duck me, as I told you, and he looked over my shoulder and he got this terrified look on his face. And I turned to see what had frightened him so. She was standing there. Natalie? Yes, Lee. It was Natalie who frightened Matt to death. And there you have it. A situation which attracts curiosity and speculation, but resists or defies explanation. A mystery. You may settle for whatever explanation you find acceptable, but we do not rule out the occult simply because it is occult. If Millie says she saw Natalie, who are we to say she didn't? I'll be back in a few minutes. justice does sometimes happen. And although Beth seems to have gone unpunished for the crime of plotting murder, has she really? She'll have to live the rest of her life with the knowledge of her guilt. And conscience can be the hardest of all judges. I feel sure Beth will never conspire against her stepmother again. And while she and Millie will never be friends, they will never again be such total enemies. Our cast included Morgan Fairchild, William Redfield, Ann Shepard, and Nat Pullen. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. 
What is about to unfold is the occult experience of a frustrated man, James Archer, and of what happened to him when he stepped beyond reality as we know it. I think I can safely say that each of us has had an experience so frustrating that we'd have given anything in the world to have had the power to overcome it. James Archer was given that power. Our mystery drama, Strange Passenger, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Nat Poland and Bob Caliban. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and the moon hanging there and just wondered? Man is finite. He can comprehend anything with definable limits. But beyond such limits is an incomprehensible universe. We increase our knowledge about outer space each year, but what we know is very small. The mystery of life is a secret that still has to be revealed. But one corner of it was lifted for James Archer. Aren't you Archer, Jim Archer? Who are you? A recruiter. I was in court yesterday when you demolished a client of ours as... Oh, now, what did you label me? Oh, oh yes, an obscene slumlord. Uh, it was yesterday. I just wanted to tell you how much I admired your plea for the plaintiffs. Thank you. Uh, sit down, if you'd like. You're not expecting anyone? No. Oh. <laughs> Just sitting here wondering what to do next. Are you a lawyer? Oh, an obscure one in a big firm. Ah, thanks for coming over. I've been uh, feeling sorry for myself. You must know what happened today. Yes, the case was settled out of court. Yeah, as known as compromise. I call it dishonesty. Well, the slumlord is a rich man. He's agreed to make some restitution for his neglect. Yeah, that's a nice way of saying he paid off someone and the case was settled. He should have gone to jail. Ideally, yes. When I found out that my firm had worked out a settlement without first telling me, I resigned. Oh, I see. Our clients, the plaintiffs, got promises. A few months rent-free. Charges will be dropped for willful destruction they done in the building. He should have been forced to repair the heating system, exterminate the rats, install sanitary plumbing, make the building fireproof, and pay a stiff fine. Even go to jail, as an example to others like him. You really are a crusader, aren't you? Injustice makes me sick. So sick, it's put you out of work. That's right. I don't mind. I guess it's unfair to my wife and little girl. Well, I'm sorry. It's after six. I'd better telephone home and tell my wife the happy news. Uh, one moment, Mr. Archer. Hmm? What would you be willing to do for security, authority, and the opportunity to practice those ideals which you hold so precious? That's not amusing, Mr. Recruiter. No, 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 no. I mean it. I mean it. What would you do? I'd do anything. Ah. Then I think I can arrange just such a life for you and for your family. <laughs> Come with me. Oh, recruiter. So you have found a man of integrity. Ah, yes, Cosmo. This is James Archer, a gifted lawyer who believes that law and justice should never be compromised. Is that correct, Mr. Archer? Yes. May I ask where I am? Where we are is unimportant. You came here of your own free will. You are under no obligation to stay. If you say so, we will transport you back to the city. No, no, thank you. At least, not until I've heard what this is all about. How can you guarantee me an honest, uncompromising life? Because I represent, in fact, I embody a viewpoint that is both utopian and attainable. <laughs> and what is that? The bloodless establishment on your earth of a society in which each man is equal, in which each earthling will lead a happy life. A society 
in which certain outstanding men such as you can become, will re-establish moral values and strive to relate to life beyond Earth. Well, that's mumbo-jumbo, but it sounds good. It's not mumbo-jumbo. You say that because you cannot see above the daily scratching and clawing for survival. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cosmo. What do I have to do in order to attain this utopia of yours? Who pays my salary? What about insurance, pension? Ah, oh, details. You will never need to worry about any of them. And while you are away, before you begin your mission, your wife and child will be provided for. My mission? Yes. Soon after it begins, you will rise swiftly. You will become a man of importance locally, then statewide, and then perhaps in your nation. You will proclaim what you honestly think. No more compromise, no watering down of the law or of justice. Mr. Recruiter? Uh, yes? Are you sure I'm not still in that bar trying to forget my worries? Oh, I am very sure. The opportunity that has come to you has come to only a few others on Earth. Just who are the two of you? There's something very weird about all this. It seems so because you are earthbound, Mr. Archer. Are you saying... No, no, that's nonsense. I know that a lot of people report flying objects. There have been drawings of funny little men with pointed antennae for ears and all sorts of things. <laughs> no rational person gives them a second thought. You don't have to believe, Mr. Archer. You are free to leave. When you arrive home, you will appear to have overstayed your time at that restaurant, and you won't remember a word of what followed after. I can, in fact, right now, blank out the names of your wife and child. <laughs> you mean... Now, wait a minute. Their names are... You... you can do that. <laughs> Very easily. Ready to quit... Mr. Archer, uh, no. No? I think I'll see this through. Ah, that is an incredible honor, Mr. Archer. Recruiter, bring in the ship and we will be on our way. Your father tells me a strange story, Mrs. Archer. Oh, it's worse than strange. It's bizarre. It's over three months now since my husband just... He just vanished. But on the first of each month... I covered that, Nan. That money deposited in the bank the first of each month is what led me to see Major Wayne. What do you make of it, Major? First, uh, Mrs. Archer, tell me again everything you remember from the night your husband didn't come home. Well, he'd resigned from his job. He... He went to a bar near his office and sat down to think over what he'd done. Some acquaintance joined him and then they left. Well, next, the Missing Persons Bureau called to... to have... to have me identify a body they'd found in the river. It was dressed in Jim's clothes and I... I guess it was Jim. You thought so too, Dad? Yes, I did. But... Both of us had misgivings because... Because it, it just made no sense. Jim was as straight as an arrow. He... Well, unless he'd been murdered, we somehow just couldn't believe that the body was his. No other uh, person in his life? Absolutely not. No, Major. Jim Archer lived for his work and for his family. He was a thoroughly honest man. And the body found in the river had died from a violent stroke as if it had been electrocuted? Anything else, Mrs. Archer? I know about the insurance and the mysterious deposits of money. Uh, tell him, Nan. Well, there is something else, Major Wayne, but... Oh, it's, it's so far out. I, I just haven't told anyone except my dad. Well, tell me. The night Jim disappeared... Penny and I were watching the news. Uh, Penny's seven, old enough to read. And all of a sudden, words began to run across the bottom of the screen like, you know, when a, when a bulletin is superimposed over the picture? Yes. Well, the words were, don't worry, Nan, I'm all right. Don't worry. Love, Jim. 
And those sentences ran across the bottom of the screen. Yes, time after time, half the evening long. I telephoned the TV station, but they thought I was some kind of a nut. Did your daughter see the sentences? No. And uh, she was watching with you and she can read? Yes. I know it sounds incredible, Major Wayne. I have no reason to disbelieve you, Mrs. Archer. Well, what the devil do you make of it? I don't know quite what to say. I don't want to give you hope, but I think that James Archer, voluntarily or by force, has been transported from the Earth to some planet beyond sight and comprehension. Oh, what? come now, Major. You, you mean by, by one of those unidentified flying objects? Yes, that's just what I mean. Why? Well, that's yeah. absurd. You, do you mean to tell me our intelligence gives even the slightest credence to that Buck Rogers kind of thing? Mr. Weber, let me give you some facts. As long ago as 1959 in Boinani, New Guinea, the Reverend William B. Gill, his assistants, and the entire student body of his missionary school, about 27 persons, observed a strange object hanging in the sky a few hundred yards away. It was oval-shaped and had a deck on its top, like an observation deck. Gill saw what looked like men and waved to them, and they waved back. Then the object raised up and flew straight off into the sky. Good glory. There were many remarkable sightings in Michigan in 1966. The UFO craft looked like a huge pie, well lighted with red, blue, and white lights spinning all around it. There had been sightings in Delaware, Illinois, Tennessee, South Dakota, Mississippi. In fact, almost everywhere. And you think that, that there really is such a thing as an unidentified flying object? There's no question about it. You terrify me, Major Wayne. Yes, it terrifies me too. And you, you think that maybe one of them carried Jim off? I don't know. It's a possibility. Well, but why Jim? I can't answer that. What? What do we do? We have agents in many parts of the country. I'll alert them to Mr. Archer's disappearance. And uh, Mr. Weber. Yeah, yes, Major. I'll need your cooperation. I want to know when those deposits are made and who makes them. If it's a human, I'll want to ask some questions. Well, Mr. Archer, what do you think? It's magnificent. Beautiful green fields, homes, even light. Incredible. And the people? Well, to be honest, they're strange looking to me. But I'm only used to human beings. These people are shorter, round, flat-faced, with quite sharp ears. Disease-free, untroubled, and super-intelligent. You will soon be free to visit with them. I'm ready now. Soon. Mm, the surgery, I have been told, was perfect. You now possess a brain as extraordinary as ours. And your face has been altered very skillfully. All that is left of you is a name. Stuart Murdoch. Where did you come from, and what is your mission on the planet Earth? I have no remembrance of where I came from or who I was. My mission on Earth is to become a leader of my people and to prepare them for your bloodless conquest of my country. You have been away from Earth for six months. He is ready, recruiter. Oh, yes. Take him among our people for a week, then fly him back. Drop him outside Fargo, North Dakota, supply him with money, and return. Yes. I and let nothing interfere with those regular deposits of money. It will have to compensate. He now belongs to us. Pure fantasy? Unidentified flying objects? One researcher wrote that he thought the phenomenon was so far outside the laws of present scientific knowledge that UFOs could be considered ridiculous. But once he was exposed to the hard facts, he concluded that the existence of this unexplainable phenomenon is, and I use his exact word, overwhelming. The strange story of James Archer the recreated man will continue in a few moments.
And who is to say that what has happened to James Archer is impossible? Dr. Faustus sold his soul to the devil in exchange for 24 years of every pleasure and all knowledge at his command. And James Archer's state of mind has led him in the same direction. It is, remember, six months since Archer vanished, literally, into thin air. Excuse me, Mr. Weber. Major Wayne. Uh, it's Thompson here, sir, field agent. Anything? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, an unidentified flying object was seen hovering in this Fargo area late this afternoon. I see, and? Well, I'm at the Nygaard farm about 30 miles northwest of Fargo in a small community named Shoshone Creek. It's uh, pretty desolate. Apple and I put down our two-seater in one of Nygaard's fields and taxied it to the side of a big barn. Good. See if the UFO lands and if anyone leaves it. If so, follow the man. Don't pick him up, but don't lose him. I want to learn where he goes. Yes, sir. Well, this is fantastic, Major. If I mentioned any part of this... This weird conversation to my friends, they'd think I was ready for a mental hospital. Well, you're not, Mr. Weber. It's real enough. Oh, and, uh, let me give you a warning. Yes? Let's say that James Archer is returning by a UFO to Earth from wherever he's been. He'll be returning for a purpose, and to achieve that purpose, he won't be the same man. I don't quite understand. If, as I suspect, he was chosen by some power from another planet because he had soured on his life and our civilization, and if that power has some objective on our planet Earth, you can be sure that Archer's been brainwashed and indoctrinated deeply. So, uh, even though he might look the same... He probably won't. We had uh, one experience in which a man who had vanished was brought back into custody... He was not the same man he had been. He'd become a robot. We had to institutionalize him. An exceptionally intelligent man, but dangerous to us. Later, he was found in his room dead. Somehow, he'd been electrocuted. Well, that's why you thought the, the body in the river... Yes, it got me thinking. Now, uh, tell me about those deposits, Mr. Weber. Promptly, the first of the month, a cash deposit of $5,000 is made to the account of my daughter. We alerted our bank security guards, and when the last deposit was made through the night deposit slot, one of the guards spotted the man who dropped it. I have a description of him here. Good. I'll have one of my agents try to spot him and follow him. Then we'll pick him up for questioning. It might be ticklish. We have nothing against the man... I, uh, I may need your daughter's cooperation. Major, I, I don't want to expose her to danger. I don't think there'll be any, but uh, we'll be careful. I'm very aware that you've already lost a son-in-law. Jim Archer was a fine young man. Hello? Hmm? Who is it? Oh, hello. Don't be afraid. Come up to the front of the church. I'm Reverend David Hode, the minister. Well, I, uh, I apologize for entering. Never apologize for entering a house of God. Who, who are you, young man? Stuart Murdoch. Not from around here, are you? No. Can I do something for you? Well, I didn't enter to, uh, to do any damage, Mr. Hode. I should hope not. We don't have vandals out here on the prairie. Are uh, you lost? Am I near Fargo? About 30 miles by the state highway. Do you have a car? No, but if you'll point me in the right direction. Glad to, but uh, you won't find much traffic at this time of night. Uh, I take it you're hitchhiking. Unless there's someone around here who drive me to the airport. I have money. There's something on your mind, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, anything I can do to help? Oh, no, I'm fine. Have you, uh, have you been in the church for... No, 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 you just walked in, am I right? Yes, a minute ago. And before that, you were outside? Yes, yes. 
Now, if you'll show me the way to... Of course, of course. All in good time, Mr. Murdoch. Uh, m- may I ask you a question? Did you see what I saw, and is that why you've come here? What did you see? A saucer-shaped thing hovering in the sky and then coming close to the ground, not far from old Nils Nygaard Farm, half a mile from here. What do they call um, an unidentified flying object? And you think you saw such a thing? I know I saw it. I'll be going along. Others saw it, too. I came to my church to pray to God to protect all of us. From what? Satan. Reverend Hode, there is no such thing as Satan. It is in a man's self that he is good or evil. Young man, I believe in God, and he sustains me. And in believing in him, I accept Satan as a fact. A fact of what? He was cast out of heaven and is the chief monarch of hell. Of hell, which is? Many things, Mr. Murdoch. Satan corrupts mankind. The struggle to possess a soul for good or for evil goes on in a man forever. The presence of God within you cannot be extirpated. Then I don't have anything to worry about. Well, the day will come, I assure you, when you will feel his presence, and he will help you to decide what is right. Okay, if you say so. You have been infected, haven't you? Odd you didn't see that unidentified flying object. Oh, I saw it. The fact is, I had a ride in it. You know something? (laughs) You just may have it that. Well, thank you, Reverend Holt. He's the man we want. Well, tell me about him, Mr. Thompson. Uh, you are an intelligence agent? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Here's my identification. Oh, uh, who is this Mr. Murdoch? Uh, he's a New York lawyer named Archer who vanished six months ago. Uh, you may not believe in such things as UFO, oh, but... Oh, but I do, yes. I saw the thing laying less than a mile away. Uh, what's this uh, Murdoch up to? We don't know, Reverend, but Major Wayne thinks Murdoch sold himself to some power in outer space and has been returned to Earth to carry out some mission. To what end, Mr. Thompson? Oh, we don't know that. I, I just saw him go into your church, and my orders were just to follow him. He's headed for Fargo in New York. All right, then, Appleton and I will fly to the airport there and wait for Murdoch to board a plane. We'll board the same one for New York. I wish you well. Murdoch is a personable young man. If some force about which we are ignorant has possessed him, don't despair. The God-given moral force within each of us will be stronger than the power of Satan. Given time, Mr. Murdoch will reject having sold his soul. And then what? Heaven alone knows. <laughs> He comes in here almost every day after work. Oh, I'm terribly nervous, Major. Not uh, Major, Mrs. Archer. I'm just plain Bill Wayne, your accountant, and you're Nancy. Have you got that straight? Yes, of course, uh, Bill. It's a quarter to six. He ought to be along any... Uh-oh, that's the man. Oh, yes. He's taking a seat in that booth. You know what to do. Yes. Wish me luck. I, uh... I beg your pardon? Oh, yes. Uh, My name is Mrs. James Archer. Uh, May I uh, speak with you for just a minute? All right. right. Please sit down. Oh, thank you. Uh, Who are you motioning to? Uh, Bill Wayne, my uh, my accountant. Uh, Join me, Bill? Uh, My name's Bill Wayne. Oh, how do you do? (laughs) You uh, followed me here? Oh, no, no. I come in here almost every day. Uh, Mrs. Archer came into the city today, and I invited her to have a cocktail with me. Are you, uh... Well, are Mrs. Archer and her accountant supposed to mean something to me? Well, you see, you've been identified as the man who deposits $5,000 in my account every month. I, uh... I just wanted to meet you and uh, to thank you. 
I really don't know what you're talking about. Mrs. Uh, uh, Archer, was it? Yes. Uh, well, if uh, Mrs. Archer has made a mistake, we apologize for it. Uh, are you mistaken, Nancy? Well, I don't think so. I, um... Uh... I have a picture with me. You see? had someone take my picture? Well, you see, my father's president of the bank, and he wanted it done. Does he make a practice of taking pictures of his depositors? Well, you, you see, my husband vanished six months ago, and he still keeps supplying me with this very generous amount of money each month. You must admit it's strange. You say he vanished? Yes. Oh, yes, I vaguely remember the name now. Uh, Archer, wasn't he... Wasn't his body found in the Hudson River? Well, uh, a body was found. And identified. Well, uh, yes. Then what you've told me is impossible. I agree with you. A dead man could not make monthly deposits to his widow. That's what's been troubling Nancy. She thought that if she could meet the man who made the deposits, she might get an explanation. And be given some, uh, hope. Hope? That, that Archer is still alive? Well, that also sounds impossible. Well, if we've made a mistake... Uh, well, this is the picture of you, though, isn't it? Mr... I don't know your name. Uh, recruiter. Yes, that does look like me. But, uh, you're not the person who makes the deposits? May I ask what? difference it makes who provides you with money, Mrs. Archer? Oh, it doesn't really. I'm I'm grateful. But I keep thinking that if Jim is still able to provide for me, he he just might be alive somewhere. Just as a matter of business, Mr. Recruiter, we have to find out where the money comes from. It's, uh, it's source. Oh, I'm afraid I can't help you. The money comes to me and I'm just instructed to make the monthly deposits. Who? I mean, uh, where do the instructions come from? Can you tell me that? Anonymous. Somehow it doesn't seem right. If uh, Mr. Archer did someone an enormous favor... Uh, well, uh, did he? Do you know if he did? Uh, I never met the man. Now, you'll excuse me. Oh, goodbye, Mrs. Archer, and enjoy the money. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Wayne. I wouldn't worry about the money. He knows... Consider the name. Ever heard of anyone named Recruiter? He's one of them, whoever they are. We are eavesdropping on a grotesque subject, UFOs, about which there isn't much doubt. But those who fly them who are they from what place in outer space do they come what are they and are they friends or enemies from what we have heard James Archer's mission is to become a preeminent person in our society he is to prepare us for a bloodless overthrow of the several ways of life represented on our planet why I'll be back with Act Three shortly. In any contest, it is wise never to underestimate the strength of the enemy. But what do we do when confronted by an incomprehensible force, one beyond finite understanding? Major Wayne of Intelligence knows what has been going on, but what can he do about it? We have never captured an unidentified flying object, and we only have reports that they have been seen at a distance. Six months have now elapsed, and it is a year since James Archer disappeared. The deposit was made as usual. Well, why can't Major Wayne force that Mr. Recruiter to tell him where the money comes from. There's no law on hand to prevent a man from dropping money for you in the night slot at the bank. He's not committing a crime. One of these days, Recruiter will be seen with Jim, and then Wayne moves in. All about the only person Recruiter sees is that man who's become assistant to the special prosecutor. What's his name? Uh, uh, Murdoch? Yes. Stuart Murdoch. Yes. A remarkable young man. Brilliant lawyer and... 
great presence. He'll go far. He's a leader, and we haven't got many of them around these days. If I live long enough, I think I'll see Murdoch governor. He's an unusual man. So was Jim. Yes, I agree, Nancy. I was proud to have him as my son-in-law. You know, if you think about it soberly, Dad, both of us are not all there in the sink department. Who could believe that Jim might be alive in outer space? A year ago, I would have laughed at the idea. Now, I don't know. We have to rely on Major Wayne. Well, I'm not going to much longer. Well, just what do you mean by that? I'm moving into the city. What? Sell your home? Take Penny out of school? Oh, let's face it. I'm still young and alive. I want to be with people among them. I'll find a job and... Penny can go to private school. Jim is dead. Penny and I are alive. And we need to rip this... this shroud off from over us. Happy to meet you, Reverend Hode. Uh, you remember Thompson? I uh, sure do. It's uh, nice of you to have invited me to New York, my first visit. Uh, it's an impressive sight. Well, how are you, Mr. Thompson? Oh, just fine, sir, thank you. You're still keeping an eye on our visitor from space? You, uh, you think that, Reverend Hode? Well, I suspect it. Uh, let me put it that way. That, uh, that was an unusual experience for me. That young man just appearing in my church, uh, Stuart Murdoch. Yes, I've been following his career. He's what you uh, brought me here to talk about, isn't it, Major? Yes, uh... You've met him, and uh, you've talked with him. And I'm sorry for him. He's getting what he set out to achieve, but Stuart Murdoch, whether or not he was put down from a spaceship as a soul possessed. Well, uh, tell me, what, what do you want me to do? Well, I want you to give a small party. Thompson, arrange it with the hotel. All right, Major. Do you want me to invite the guests? No, I... You invite Mrs. Archer. She's a little uh, cool toward me these days, and uh, I'll invite her father. No, no, no. You invite both of them. Just tell them that, uh, that you want them to meet a friend of yours from North Dakota who may have something to say that will be of interest to them. Mrs. Archer. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. We think there's a chance that Stuart Murdoch is the former James Archer. Nancy Archer is the presumed widow. The other person you'll meet will be Hugo Weber, her father. And I'll be there as Bill Wayne, Mrs. Archer's accountant. So, uh, there'll be five of us. I should be most happy to help you if I can. Well, recruiter. I, uh, I'm troubled, Cosmo. Why? Uh, Mr. Murdoch is everything we expected him to be. Oh, that's true. He's risen rapidly and he has already become a public figure. But I'm troubled about him. When I dropped him in North Dakota, it seems that he wandered into a church and he met the minister there, a Reverend David Hold, who filled him with talk about Satan, soul, God, and conscience. Murdoch couldn't have been affected by that nonsense. No, but Murdoch remembers Hold and often brings up his name. The man made an impression on Murdoch. And you find that to be a distraction? When Murdoch was transformed and brainwashed, was all of his conscience removed? I assume so. That is what the report indicated. Do you suspect that he has some vestige of conscience left? I don't know. But the thought troubles me. <laughs> Uh, right on time, Reverend. Old five o'clock. Let's hope it all goes well. Now, Mrs. Arch and the others should be right along. Hello, Mr. Hode. I'm so glad you could stop in to see me, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you. Uh, meet Joe Thompson, a member of my church back home. Uh, Joe, is this uh, Stuart Murdoch? Uh, I do. How do, you do? Uh, sit down, Mr. Murdoch. We have a uh, tea or whatever else you'd like. Tea, please. Oh, good. I. I don't try to impose my tastes on others. <laughs> I thought that was your job, Reverend. 
Shoving your convictions down the throats of others? No, no, not not shoving, young man. I I expose my convictions to them, and uh, then it's up to the individual to accept or to reject the truth. The truth, as you see it. It's the word of God, which is a truth. I'm, I'm just one of his messengers. Uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to see you while I was in New York. You're my messenger from God? Yes, I do believe I am. I... I knew that when you wandered into my church in Shoshone that... Uh, well, remember when we talked? You, you remember, of course. Every word of your mumbo-jumbo, Reverend. You said that the presence of God within each person cannot be extirpated. Uh, here's your tea, Mr. Murdoch. Thank you. Hmm. Well, I'm afraid you were wrong, Reverend. I'm unchanged. I haven't had to whistle for God's help. I've helped myself. And as you may know, I've been very successful. But, uh, you're here, Mr. Murdoch. You, you didn't forget me? Of course not. I liked you when we met, and I'm happy to see you again. Oh, that should be the others, Reverend Hood. How will them in? Uh, friends of neighbors back in Shoshone. You don't mind, do you? No, no, certainly not. Mr. Weber, Mrs. Archer, I'm so glad you could stop in. Uh, this is a Stuart Murdoch, the man I was telling you about. Uh, hello, Mr. Murdoch. I'm happy to meet you. My father, Mr. Weber. How do you do? And, uh, Bill Wayne, uh, a friend. Hello, hello gentlemen. Hello. Uh, Joe, uh, yes, T fall. Um, it's a Murdoch. real honor meeting you, Mr. Murdoch. Well, thank you. We've been following your career, Nancy and me, and, uh, I must say we like the way you've ripped into corruption and graft. The public is entitled to honesty in government. Well, that's what they all say, but, uh... You seem to mean it. And my actions, I hope, prove it. My, uh, my late husband felt that way, too. I mean, about honesty. Yes, Jim Archer was an honest man. All that got him was his resignation from his job. He couldn't stand hypocrisy. He wouldn't compromise. I can't either. But I've learned that, that one has to prepare others slowly for the truth. Not your version of truth, Reverend. Truth is invisible, young man. The truth I preach is God's word. Truth is an ideal, and it is divine. Well, I think that's foolish. Truth, like any other commodity, has to be sold. If you'll excuse me, I do have to be going. I'm happy to have met all of you. And Reverend Hode, do pay New York another visit. I can find my way out, Mr. Thompson. Well, Mrs. Archer? No, Major. Stuart Murdoch isn't Jim Archer transformed in space and returned to Earth. Why, the, the very idea is absurd. Astonishing. An obscure minister from North Dakota has created wonder in your mind. He insinuates the thought of God and conscience into your mind, even though you know, as we know, that both are fiction. You still are earthbound. Well, Mr. Murdoch, we seem to have failed. It has happened before, but not often. I can offer you a choice. A return to our planet for a short time, and then resume your mission on Earth, or remain here now. I... I don't know what to do. Why can't we go on as we have been? I'll carry out the mission. I'm afraid that's no good, Mr. Murdoch. The very fact that you wonder if you've been infected with Satan's moral virus, whatever that might be, creates a doubt about your reliability. Order the ship. Are you, uh, taking me back into space, Cosmo? No. You will remain here. You will be returned to what you would have become after you resigned from your job and before you accepted recruiter's offer. <laughs> and what would that be? Still an unemployed lawyer? That will be for others to discover. Open the door, Thompson. Follow me. Have your gun ready. Yes, sir. The house feels empty. 
There's a light at the end of the... Huh. Look over there, sir. In that chair. Good Lord. Why, that's... That's James Archer. I know from pictures of him, it's... it's asleep. Yeah, or drugged. His hair has turned gray, and, uh... Look at his face. Worn and haggard. He... He looks like a drunk sleeping it off. Archer. Art... What is it, Major? His... His hand is cold as ice. He's... Dead. So, as Cosmo said, James Archer was returned as what he would have become after he lost his job and tried to sell his soul to a force from outer space. Had Cosmo read the future? It would appear so. It is very possible that James Archer was so depressed with his future that he allowed himself to deteriorate into the condition in which he was found. I will return shortly. Frustration leads some of us in dangerous directions. For most of us, however, hope extends a hand to lift us up from despair. James Archer never grasped that hope. He angrily preferred the path that led him to become the instrument of a force from another planet whose goal is the bloodless conquest of Earth, not by invasion, but by indoctrination. He saved his soul, even though it cost him his life. Our cast included Nat Polin, Bob Caliban, Evie Jester, Ian Martin, and Frank Behrens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Next tale. You're all ready to put up your hands. What for, ready? Why? What happened? I cut a corner too sharp. I caught a bumper on a taxi. He had a small scratch. I had a small dent. Both of us figured it would be better to keep it quiet. Don't you ever do that again. Do what again? Put another mark on that bus. Eddie, tell me something. What's this concern uh, you and that bus? And another thing, you are riding the clutch. And you jackrabbit a lot when you start. Oh, come on. I can hear it. I can detect signs of it. Uh, Eddie, you talk like this here. You, you can scare a guy. I, I mean, you I bet... hope I'm scaring you, Jerry. Scaring you into treating this bus decently because... Yeah? Because if you don't, I'm going to kill you. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What do a ladder leaning against a building, a black cat, spilt salt, or knocking on wood have in common? That's right. They're all superstitions. 
But since superstitions are only the children of ignorance, in this world of expanding knowledge, nobody really believes in them anymore. Or do they? And if anyone does, surely the calm, clear logic of 20th century science could illuminate, banish, and defeat the dark clouds of superstition. Or could it? Our mystery drama, Taboo Means Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Russell Horton. story is out of today's headlines. Some of it you may remember. It shouldn't be too difficult to tempt you to listen to it, since in order to do so, you must travel with me the South Pacific to the island paradise of Western Samoa, Upolo. The capital of Western Samoa is Apia, a sleepy little port town whose main claim to fame is a hotel named Aggie Gray's. It is one of those special spots for travelers which dot the world. Their claim to fame? Haunt them, and sooner or later you will meet anyone or everyone you knew. Mac! Oh, ho, ho! Mac Calder! Huh? Who, who? Digger! Digger <laughs> Brown! Hey, right. man, what brings you to Samoa? This is my territory, Yank. What brings you here? Um, this and that. Business? Uh, not exactly. Oh, I read you loud and clear. I won't pry. How do you like the fear fear? The what? The entertainment you're watching. Oh, oh, it's uh, it's great, super. I uh, I was just trying to figure out what kind of short long johns the guys wear under their skirts. Skirts? Oh, I see. I've got to educate you, Yank. First of all, the skirts are called lava lava. Uh -huh. Everyone wears the men and women. Now, the long johns are something else again. Only uh, the sons of the chief wear them. Mm, they look like Spider-Man. Well, what is it? Some sort of woven material? Well, it's a garment none of them ever can take off. A tattoo needled right onto the skin. Well, from above the waist to below the knee? That's right. Oh, man, I bet that hurts. Oh, no, too right. Well, why? Do, do they really believe that stuff in this day and age? You better believe it. If you want to hang around the islands. Yeah, I, I don't. I want to get out of here as fast as I can. That's why I'm here. Oh, that's a bit contradictory. Uh, you want to shed some light? Mm, only to someone I can trust. Hmm. Think I've changed that much in such a short time? Nah, no. Nah, only I, I don't see how you can help. Well, want to give it a whirl? Mm. At least you're someone I can talk to. Eh, uh, fire away. Uh, not here. Is there uh, somewhere else? Uh, sure, sure. I uh, have a room in the quiet sector of Aggies uh, over the garden where all you can hear are the birds sing and the mangoes drop. Well, after I graduated from UCLA, I came on home and had this chance to go into training and get checked out on multi-engines. So, here I am, a lowly lieutenant co-pilot flying for NZ Airlines. How about you? Well, my dad died suddenly. I sort of took over the business. Oh, no more flying? Oh, sure. Dad and me have a, a, had a private plane. And then there's the company jet I get a shot at handling now and again. <laughs> when I can find time. Oh, big wheel in the business world, eh? Mm, somebody had to take over, Digger. Oh, uh, I'm sorry about your father, Mac. Well, so, what brings you down here to Samoa? A girl. Ooh, she must be some Sheila to bring you 8,000 miles. Now she is. Well, you know her, Digger. I do? Yeah, yeah. You remember Noah Lani? Noah Lani Matoma? Ooh, 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 she'd be hard to forget, especially here on your polo. Hey, is that what brought you to our side of the globe? The big fear fear? Ooh, I don't know what you mean. Noah Lani's wedding. She's got to be married next week. So that's why she stopped. Digger, you've got to help me. I, uh, I never knew, Mac, that Nonny and you, well, I mean, you dated around and all that, but 
But I, I never reckoned it anything serious. Why not, Digger? Oh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, sure, we all went to the university together, but Nonny... Well, I mean... I mean, Noah Lonny was special. Because she was Samoan? Because she was a princess. Royalty. <laughs> well, m maybe in your frame of reference that doesn't mean so much. It doesn't mean a damn. She's the girl I love and I want to marry. It looks a bit... Well, a bit late for that, Mac. Why? She can't marry anyone but me, Digger. Her, her letters were full of plans for our marriage and until they stopped coming. Well, maybe the lady changed her mind. Oh, no, no, I'll never believe that. Somebody, her parents, must have stopped her from writing or, or else they kept my letters from her. Digger, that wedding has got to be stopped. You've got to help me. Mac, old bloke, this isn't America. You mess around with island people with an ancient way of life and customs neither me nor you could understand and you're asking to get your, your head handed to you in a basket. I'll take my chances. Oh, no, no, count me out. I don't want anyone laying any curse on me or worse. Oh, come off it, Digger. I've never seen you run scared. Well, you're seeing it now. Well, anyway, I won't be around. I've got to pull out of here tomorrow for Fiji with my crew to pick up a flight down from Mandy to Auckland. You know, I am a working stiff, you know. Okay. Do one thing for me, Digger, huh? I want. Well, you know the ropes here. I, I can't even locate Nani. No one will tell me where she is. Will you, will you find her for me? Well, yes, at least I can do that, chum. Maybe I can even arrange for you to uh, have a talk somewhere. Waiting for you? <sighs> Darling, I... No. I... No, uh, please. It is over between us. Are you kidding? How can you... I am begging you. Try to understand. Understand what? About us. Well, I, th I thought I did. I, I thought we knew just where we were going. So did I. But it has been a long time. You know why? I wrote you. My, my father died, and there were things I had to do. Yes. And my father died. And I found out there were things I had to do. What does that mean? Oh, I could never explain. It is why I, I didn't write. Well, now I'm here in the flesh. Can't you tell me? It is very hard. Yeah, I could guess it might be. You're going to be married as I get it. So there's, uh, another guy. Yes. You know, you might have told me. Saved me a trip halfway around the world. Oh, please. It isn't like that. Isn't like what? I shouldn't have said anything. Forgive me. I am not in a forgiving frame of mind, and you'd better say something. Oh, please. It won't help anything. Or change anything. Maybe not, but don't you think I'm due some kind of explanation? Oh, yes. Otherwise... I would never have let Digger set up this meeting. So? Walk with me along the beach, Mac. No, don't hold my hand. Don't touch me. What is this? We're under surveillance? Well, who is it? The FBI? CIA? Just believe that we are not alone. That we are watched. That they can see but not hear. So, let me talk. Be my guest. California was one thing. A never, never land. I was just nanny. And life was very wonderful. Very simple. It was our life. And we promised each other it would be forever. I know. What I dreamed of. But you see, I had forgotten I had another life. What? I am a princess. Isn't that a little out of date? When I came home to Samoa, I found out it wasn't. Nani, you're a graduate of UCLA in liberal arts. You can't suddenly come back to a scattering of tin-pot little islands and bury yourself in the Middle Ages. Oh, I wish I could be as sure of that as you are. What do you mean? Huh? Wash out a thousand things. Old ties, family history, my personal duty, which I could never explain. Cut it all down to... Tapui. Tapui? What you would call taboo. 
Are you trying to tell me I'm taboo for you? Yes. Is that the way you feel? It isn't my decision, Mac. Can't you understand? It is a whole way of life. Look, this is the 20th century. It doesn't matter. I can't marry you. Why not? It is not my decision. Well, whose decision is it? Because I am a princess. The village council. Well, now, who in heck are they to interfere? To keep the bloodlines clear. It is their right. What bloodlines? I am Samoan. Nani, I am getting you out of all this. Let's go, right now. I can't, Mac. Of course you can. You don't understand. The marriage has been arranged. I am a princess in a family of royalty. I can't let them die. Sure you can. Just let me show you. You can't make it that simple. Oh, can't I? No. Because you don't know what is involved. You've already told me. But I can't explain all the centuries of custom and everything behind it. A whole other world. So? You step out of it. I can't. Why? It is why I agreed to see you today. Because I am under a curse. A... Uh, what? If I should marry you or go with you, we would go only to death. Who says? The dilator has spoken. He has pointed the bone. If we try to be together, we cannot fight the gods. We are condemned. Oh, honey, you believe that nonsense? It is hard for me, back now in this strange world, to know what I believe in. Can't you just believe in me? It is all I ever want to. But... What is it? I don't want to bring you disaster. And without my mother's agreement to us, I would be so afraid. So? Let's talk to your mother. Talofa. Uh, Talofa. Welcome to my home. Uh, thank you. Um, I... I don't know how to call you. I am the mother of Noalani. Uh, uh, that doesn't help me know the form of address. Uh, Does it matter? We have little to say to each other. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I I want to marry Noalani. She has been promised to another. Well, doesn't she have any choice? No. I'd challenge that. If you want. It is a gamble. What do you mean? How strong is the desire? How does it meet the wheeling of the stars? Is it accepted by fate? And are you brave enough to face death? Oh, I'm sorry, but you speak in riddles. Noelani is the last of her line. Tueto, to whom she has been promised, is also purebred. They are chosen by the stars, selected by Tane, the great god. If the promise were to be broken, Tane would send Tairoa, god of the winds, and Para the goddess of fire to haunt you. <laughs> Are you ready to challenge all our gods? For Noelani? Yes. For Noelani? Or for yourself? No, for her. We love each other, Your Majesty. Nani's happiness lies with me. You are not of our blood. Majesty, princess, mother, whatever I should call you, what are all these ancient prejudices... It's a new world. And, and blood crosses blood and makes the ties that bind everyone together stronger. We're one world today. I cannot cross my gods. I cannot protect you. Most of all, I cannot protect my daughter. The Tylatus has pointed the bone. If you and Noelani should try to find life together, you are doomed. The gods have spoken. Your gods, maybe. Not mine. It looks as though we'll just have to find out which is stronger. The battle lines are drawn in an age-old conflict. The ways of yesterday against today's. It can happen in any society. 
And we have our ethnic divisions in every major city and half the towns across the continent. But there is one element here that makes it all a little different. A curse, an ancient civilization, and the threat of strange gods beyond our Western comprehension. I shall return shortly with Act Two. It was Alfred Lord Tennyson who wrote, "'Tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. But to be in love and have the reason for losing so antiquated and unreasonable as Mac Calder faces is a very special agony, a determination that under no circumstances will he lose. First, convince Noelani of that, and then find the way. We've got to talk, Noelani. Not here. Now watch. What did my mother say? Well, she's not against us exactly, but uh, look, wh where can we talk? When? Well, the sooner the better. T uh, tonight? Not at night. That is impossible. This afternoon, I must go to Market and Apia. Can you find me there? Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, what about the big clock steeple? I could meet you there before sundown. But why, darling? Because by then I'll have a plan for us. A plan? Yeah, to get away. Shake off the past. Find our own future. Isn't that what you want? I want it. But how can it work for us? Now, I could have a cab waiting, and we could duck out and head for the airport, catch the next plane out wherever it was headed. You think my family, my brothers, would allow me to do that? Or anyone else? Well, you have your passport. It's still valid, isn't it? True, anywhere, yes. Well, then? First of all, I have to get away from some more, if I want to. <laughs> that is not so easy. Oh, because you don't want to. I don't know what I want. Oh, to be with you, yes. But not to destroy you. Honey, let me worry about that. It isn't that simple. I'll make it that way. Can you... Meet me just before sunrise at Palaga Airport. Uh, you know, right by the golf course, east of Apia. I know, I know, but why? Well, I'll charter a private plane. There'll be no one to stop us there. We'll fly to New Zealand to be married. And take it the way it comes from then on. You would risk that for me. I'm not worried about your brothers or the family. They'll come around once it's happened. Oh, it isn't just the family. You mean all that uh, mumbo-jumbo about the gods? Oh, darling, forget them. Their day has been and gone. They can't touch us. How I want to believe that. You better believe. And promise to meet me at Falaga. May all the gods help us. But yes, I promise. <laughs> Nani, darling? Oh, Ma, uh, I'm here. Oh, I'd just about given up. I thought you weren't coming. I just about did give up. The weather. It is not a good omen. Ah, uh, it's nothing. Just some rain and a light cloud cover. We'll be out of it 5,000 feet, and it's a cinch the rest of the way in. You have a plane? Yeah, a Cessna 172 high wing. There she is, all set and ready to go. That little thing, it can make it all the way to... Where are we going? Auckland, New Zealand. We'll be married there right after we land. And then we'll grab a 747 or DC-10 for the little old USA. I still don't see how a little plane like that... I have extra wing tanks just in case, but it'll be no sweat. Trust me? Oh, if I didn't, would I be here? I promise you, Nani. You're never going to regret this. As God is my witness. I want to feel the same way. I just hope my gods will smile on us, too. Hey, don't pay attention to the sound effects. We're going to leave all that behind. And head right into the eye of the storm. Nani, forget it. We're walking out tall. You can count on it. You all right, Nani? <laughs> Just hitting a few air pockets. When we get enough altitude, it'll be smooth sailing. 
soon. Honey, we're 7,000 now. We should break this at 8. Oh, will it be much longer? Yeah, it takes time to climb. There's nothing else wrong, is there? Oh, don't worry about me, Mac. I started out a little sick at heart. But what upsets me now is my stomach. Well, you're not sorry you came. I would have to be a whole lot sicker than this before that would even occur to me. But I am scared. Of the storm? No. Of what we've done. The best decision we ever made in our lives. Only the brave deserve the fair. Who said that? Mm, I don't know. Me, maybe. <laughs> What's the difference? Isn't it the truth? Ah, oh, Nanny, we got away with no. it. No, no, don't say that. Don't wish us bad luck. Luck? What does that signify? We're out front now, and no one from your slow old world can catch us now. Hey, we've got it made. Hello, Stuart. Got all your passengers sorted out? We're flying light if we fly. Do we? So what does that mean? The weather. Oh, no sweat. We'll get above it most of the way into Auckland. I uh, Still, uh, better keep your passengers belted in. You know, it could be a bit choppy. Well, you better get on up to the flight deck. Your pilot's with you. That you, Digger? Lieutenant Brown, model co-pilot, reporting to the flight deck, Captain Jameson. Yes, I can do without the commandant. Everything ship shape back there? Uh, sure, sure, sure. We're flying pretty light. You know, you could shoot possums back there without ever getting near a passenger. <laughs> if we're flying. Uh, what's that mean? Well, did you get clearance from the tower yet? Not yet, but we will. Weather looks a bit rough. Yeah, we'll be out of this by 10,000 and have it clear all the way into Auckland. Well, we still might get a lot of chop on an electrical winger like this. Yeah, uh, we'll leave the seatbelt sign on. Uh, 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 there it is. We're cleared. Uh, Good old DC tabs. <laughs> they can fly through anything. Too right. But I pity any light craft that had to climb over this. It'd take a real beating on the way up. Here, here we go. What's your ETA? Corrected for New Zealand time. Unless we run into a wind change, we should hit Auckland about uh, 1630 hours. About uh, 1,600 hours. What is that in ordinary time? Oh, yeah. four in the afternoon. Oh, it seems so long. What's the matter, Nani? Don't you feel better? Oh, yes. It's nice and smooth now. But it seems sort of endless. Just clouds and swirls of air. As if we weren't moving at all. You know what I mean? Oh, sort of, perhaps. It's also mysterious, changing. Where you're going? Oh, I got the trusty old ADF. ADF? Automatic direction finder. Oh. And without that, we could really be in the soup. Well, which, which is it, Matt? It's the, that dial there. See? Oh, yes. Tells our heading exactly. As soon as we get close enough to New Zealand, we can lock on by radio and ride the needle straight in like getting tucked into bed. <laughs> as simple as that. As yeah, simple as that. <laughs> Unless anything went wrong. And then? Oh, we don't think of that. Why should it go wrong? think of so many reasons. Hey, 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 forget it. We're out of your old world of vengeful gods, princess Noelani. This is the 20th century. They don't exist. All we need is a simple little old computer and we're home free. What's that? Oh, it's a little early, but I'm just trying to pick up Auckland Radio Center, get a fix of just where we are. Mm. That, that's funny. I, I should be within their range by now. Mm. There's something wrong, isn't there? What could be wrong? We're lost, Mac. Tell me the truth. Are we? Of course not. I, I uh, must have the wrong frequency. Hold it, Nanny, till I can make contact. Two more years of this, Digger. And I'm up for pension. Hmm? Where are you? On autopilot, too? Oh, oh, and I'm sorry. I was thinking about that chum of mine in Samoa. Yeah, the one with the royal princess? Uh, <laughs> the one without her. 
Well, he's better off. He was flirting with trouble. Now, uh, what were you saying? No, nothing much. I was just thinking two more years I can duck out of the old NZ Airlines and take it easy. Oh, <laughs> not you, Barry. You dry up on the beach. Oh, I don't know. I've got my sailboat. Between my pension and a part-time job, I could get down below there and sail this bloody ocean instead of overflying it. A lot more fun. A lot more fun than flying. These big crates, flying boxcars all done by computer, cut and dried, hiking a DC-10. Not much thrill to it. This is Auckland Radio Center to TE-7701. Do you read me? TE-770Y, I read you. What is your position? Uh, what ocean ship we just passed, Digger? Number three, the Frampton. Fifty miles south of Ocean Ship 3. What goes? Easy as you go. Right on the button. But we have a spot of trouble. Name it. We have a lost aircraft, light plane, Cessna 172, two hours overdue. He might be having trouble with his ATF. Why? Did he report it? No, but unless he's down someplace, why wouldn't he check in? Yeah, you've got me. What can I do to help? Uh, would you like to uh, try him on emergency and see if you can raise him? Will do. I'll try and have something nice. Some silly joker in a paper dart got himself lost. Now we have to try to raise him. Ah, put up your feet, old timer. Get your rest. I'll handle it. Now, uh, what's the emergency frequency? Uh, 2505. This is TE770Y calling in Cessna 172. Do you read me? Hey, this is TE770Y calling in Cessna 172. Do you read? Yeah, looks like the cupboard is bare, my brother. Well, if he's in our area, any chance of a visual? Mm. No joy from me. You see anything? No, negative. Now, we're at 33,000. He must be under 10. Who could see it? Two hours overdue and he isn't hollering Mayday on the emergency radio. Doesn't look good. That front that went barreling through below us, yeah, he could have gotten caught up in that. Yeah, and ditched. It was a rum go for a while. Better stay on the pipe for a while. Take a chance we can raise him, but... Uh... Two hours overdue, all in all. I'd say the poor guy might have bought it. A small plane with limited fuel adrift on the vast expanse of the South Pacific. That ocean with a deceptive name, where storms and tornadoes and cyclones and wild disturbances sweep the blue waters and mount in weather towers to shock the air above, is an ancient curse to wreak its revenge on two young people. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Pacific Ocean, the largest body of water in our world, some 63,801,500 square miles. The proverbial needle in the haystack would loom as large as the Empire State Building compared to a small plane lost in its vastness. And even Mac is having to admit at last that's what he is, lost. We might as well face it, Mac. We're lost. No. Oh, darling, we have been. Ever since I decided to challenge the Tapui. Nani, let's cut out that nonsense. It isn't nonsense. I'm just so sorry I did this to you. Look, there's no real sweat yet. I still have a couple of hours gas in the tank. And sooner or later, I'll, I'll raise someone on the radio and get a fix. Mac, level with me? Sure, how? If the direction finder, or whatever it is, is out of whack, we don't know where we are. We're hours overdue. We could be heading for the South Pole, for all we know. We can't be that far off. I, I mean, I would have... You mean you don't want me to know the real truth? But darling, I do. It's all right. What does that mean? I never wanted anyone in my life but you. I'm 
glad I defied those old gods who came with you. Hey, Nani, don't cash us in yet. All of them. They made me feel the gods had set their faces against us. Oh, I know it isn't right. But it's how they made me feel. It's a kind of brainwashing. I wasn't strong enough to stand against it oh, alone. It's, it's over. You can forget it. I thought I had. Until what has happened has proved them right. No, Alani. Darling. Now listen to me. Do you believe in those gods more than you do in me? Oh, Mac. What can I say? Would you be here with me now if you did? No, I suppose. I guess not. Then you believe in my God and us. Promise me. What can he do to save us? I don't know. Only that he will, that he'll shatter the old taboo and splinter all those old bigotries and superstitions and bring us home safe. Just, just believe, darling. That's all I ask. All right, Mac. I believe. I really do. What's that? It's the radio. Uh, oh. Maybe we've made a contact. Cessna 172, acknowledge. Who are you? New Zealand, a flight from Auckland, DC-10. Are you lost? Yes, I think there's something wrong with my ADF. Do you know your position? Negative. How much fuel do you have left? Maybe two hours. Where are you? I could give you coordinates, but I don't think it matters. Uh, do you have us in view? Negative. Hey, uh, you sound kind of familiar. Who, who are you? Uh, Lieutenant Digger Brown, co-pilot DC-10 TE-770Y. Digger! Uh, this is Mac. Mac Calder. M Mac! What the you silly son of a sea cook? What are you doing starting up an air sea search? Well, you remember the friend of yours who had a Cessna? I borrowed it to sneak Noalani out of the islands. And you got yourself lost, huh? Eh, Nani blames it on Tarofa and all his other old gods. I kept telling you we had a few guys on our side, too. Now you came through. Okay, for our side. Now, next thing, now how do we boot you home? Never sell a New Zealander short. I know you'll figure out some way, copper. <laughs> Auckland Radio Center. Captain Mary Jameson, DE-770Y. We found your lost duckling, love. The Cessna 172. Right. Where? Ah, that's the question. Well, do you have him in view? Now, Joy, we're going to try to box him in. Will you stand by to help us and open all channels? You have us all the way, but we have no other contact with him but you. Uh, how is he for fuel? Thumbs up so far, but it could get sticky. We'll stand by you all the way. Over and out. Mac, you were talking to someone you knew. Sure, Digger, Digger Brown. Well, how could he reach us? Do you really want to know why, Noah Lani? Yes. Because there is a good God in heaven. And because these ancient bloody gods and curses are nonsense, and there is a way out of this mess. Okay, Hotshot, I bow to youth. How are we going to locate this fly speck? Well, uh, we can guess by his fuel consumption he can't be too far south of us. Hmm, but we don't know what heading he's been flying on. So we've got to find out if he's right or left of us. How can we mark his longitude? By the sun. Oh. Uh, permission to take over, Captain? Uh, be my guest. My problem was I didn't retire soon enough. <laughs> Loud and clear. Okay, now, put your arm in front of you and measure how many fingers the sun is from the horizon. Roger, can do. Great. Now, I'm doing the same here. What do you read? Uh, two and a half, uh, three fingers. Oh, beautiful. 
500. We're at 33. Uh, can you make us? Uh, no, I, uh, no, nothing. Uh, we'll try to blow a con trail. Keep looking, and we're coming down to your level. Be right back to you. What's happening, Mac? Dicker's bringing his big baby on down. They're gonna throw a con trail we can see. What's a con? Trail. Oh, it's a kind of vapor a plane makes going through the atmosphere. Sometimes it crystallizes and makes a smoke trail. Not always? No. And if we can't see that? Yeah, maybe we can see the plane itself. Can't they see us? Honey, a little plane like this one, there's a grain of sand on a beach. If the light hit us right, maybe, but uh, 95 chances out of 100, forget it. And how can they find us? Yeah, just trust in God and the good people. Most of the time, we managed to squeak through. What's our altitude? 12,000 and dropping. Mm. So there's the sun. Yeah. It's going to be dark pretty soon. You'd better contact your boy again and tell him how tight it is. Uh, will do. Mac. Mac, this is Digger again. We know you're in our area, but can't sight you. Uh, how's your fuel? I suppose you can't see us. No way. There's just uh, me, Nani, this plane, and 80 million miles of empty sea and sky. Uh, it is getting dark, chum. Yeah, you're telling me. Now, we have got to make contact. Now, listen. We're going to dump some fuel. You and Nani keep your eyes peeled for the trail. Now, we've already come on down to about your altitude, 10,000. Watch for the fuel dump. If you don't see it in the air, you'll see it on the ocean. Roger? Roger. Over and out for now. He didn't sight the fuel dump? No. It's too late to try again. The sun's gone. Very. Right, Dig. We can't leave him to ditch. Another hour or so on whatever heading he's on and he'll run out of fuel and end up in the drink. Yes, I know. There's, uh, there's just one more chance. Right. Yeah. Let me talk to him again. Ah, uh, Digger here. Do you read me? I read you. Now, I can't dump any more fuel. It's too dark for you to pick up our trail. Now, there's just one more chance. Hey, I'll grab whatever you've got. It's just a hutch. But I have a feeling we're not that far apart. Now, I'm coming down out of the cloud cover. You go down, too. It's almost dark now. As soon as it is, I'm turning up every damn light on this plane till we're glowing like a Christmas tree. Cabin, landing lights, strobes, emergency, everything. So you better be like any one of the three wise men and follow yonder star. Merry Christmas, bloke. I don't see anything. It's so dark. Do you, Mac? No. Oh, don't we have any light? I, um, I don't want to turn them on. I, no. I want all the visibility I can get. Mac? What? I'm sorry. I should never have let you get into this. I should have listened to the taboo. Oh, forget it, Nani. If you're concerned with fate, just figure uh, this is where you and I were meant to be. Sink or swim. I love you. And I love you. In sickness or in health. Till death do us. Join. Luck, 
we just plain gotta have. Honey, God's been on our side all the way. I said in the beginning that most of this was a true story. The small plane landed with bone-dry tanks. Five minutes more, and the engine would have failed. Of course, the pilot was alone, and the rest of the story was imaginary. But wasn't it much more fun to imagine that this was the way it really happened? I'll be back shortly. story was an interesting experiment in the telling of tales. So often from the headlines, I read a fascinating story that should make an evening on mystery theater, except that life or truth, though it can be stranger than fiction, doesn't quite fill out an evening with incident enough to keep you listening. So if we borrow a little fiction sometimes to pique your interest, do you mind? Our cast included Russell Horton, E.V. Juster, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Marshall. Murder, we are told, will out. As will, I believe, truth. Which is to say that most murderers, though not all, are eventually exposed and made to pay for what is considered certainly the most heinous crimes of all. The taking of another's life. Such was the case for the charming, debonair, and totally amoral Greg Manchester, who felt sure he had committed the perfect murder, only to discover... You're arresting me for murder? Lieutenant, you can't be serious. I'm very serious, Mr. Manchester. But uh, on what grounds? Yes, I shot and killed my wife, but it was an accident. No accident, Mr. Manchester. Cold-blooded murder. And we can prove it. How can you prove murder when there was no murder? It was an accident, I tell you. I only wish to heaven there'd been a witness to prove what I say. There was a witness, Greg. A witness who can prove it was murder. Who, Sandy? Tell me who. The corpse, Greg. The corpse. <laughs> mystery drama, The Eye of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Joan Hackett. When it comes to murder, it sometimes seems to me that the cleverer a murderer, the more certain he is to be caught. For as the annals of crime reveal, he tends to outsmart himself. Dr. Crippen, Landrew, George Joseph Smith, to mention but a few, all without exception flattered themselves on having committed perfect crimes, when in truth they had trapped themselves by overlooking one single minor little detail. 
As did a certain gentleman named Gregory Manchester. Listen. Murder? You are accusing me, Sandy, of planning to murder your mother? Is that what you say? Don't twist my words, Greg. I said it wouldn't surprise me if she had a fatal accident and died suddenly. Oh, Sandy, don't even speak of such things. Just the thought makes my heart skip a beat. I'm sorry, Rose. How is your heart? Oh, same. Mother thinks I ought to see another doctor. Sandy, I'm sorry you feel about me as you do. I hope when I married your mother that you'd become as much my friend as your sister has. Why, if you could have heard me talking about you at my club, how proud I was going to be to have the famous photographer, Sandy Oaks, for a stepdaughter. Can't we be friends, Sandy? Friends? <laughs> Sorry, Greg, but your charm is wasted on me. You charmed my mother into marrying you, charmed her into turning over all of her money to you, charmed her into taking out a $100,000 life policy with you as a beneficiary, well, but... Well, now, my dear, why not? After all, Sandy, I am her husband. And a fast worker. Married less than a month. You certainly haven't wasted any time getting this marriage to pay off for you. Oh, now you're accusing me of marrying your mother for her money. Is that it, my dear? You can believe it. Oh, now, Sandy. Rose, it's true, and I'm telling you straight out. This clothes horse with his blonde hair and his Sir Walter Raleigh Manis is nothing more than a shop operator. A con artist. And that's what I've come here to tell my mother, and I will tell her if she ever gets out of that bath and comes down here. Sandy, you're all upset. Upset? I'm steaming, and I've been steaming ever since I heard about this new life insurance policy. When Mother phoned and said that she'd just taken out a $100,000 policy with dear Greggy as a beneficiary, I could have... Oh, what is that? What? Oh, it's a stain on the ceiling. It's a water stain. The bathroom is just above us oh, here. Oh, now, don't tell me the tub's overflowed. What? If your mother's had another of her fainting spells in the bath. Oh. You better get up there. Come on. What fainting spells? Mother's never had a fainting spell in her life. Oh, no, life. you're wrong there, Sandy. She never told you, but she's had a number of them. Sudden blackout oh. since your father died. The shock of his death, I, I don't know. And she's had two since we married a month ago. God grant she hasn't had another. I'm going to take you... Oh, here we are. Oh, no. killed her, Joe. He killed her. Now, sweetheart... Joe, he you... did. He drowned her in that tub. All of that talk about sudden fainting spells blackouts. No way, Joe. No way. Now, look, my dear lovable bride-to-be, I don't like Gregory Manchester any more than you do. And I couldn't agree more that he's the phony you claim he is. But uh, you're no fool, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> a camera nut, maybe, with that camera of yours always slung around your neck. But you... Joe, photography is my business. And I don't... I don't know how many pictures I'd have missed if I didn't keep this high-powered instrument ready at all times. And really, I don't know why it bothers you. Well, it's nothing. Oh, excuse me. Yes. Yes, yes. Have them come right in. Manchester and your sister. I'm going to try to get Rose to move in with me now that Mother's gone. You come in, Rose. Mr. Manchester. Thank you. Hello, Sandy. Hello. How are you feeling, Rose? Oh, all right. I want to talk with you privately after the reading of Mother's Will. What about, Sandy? Later, dear. Uh, well, we're all here, so I'll get started. Uh, I, Geraldine Oaks, Manchester, a resident of the city Wait of... Wait a minute, Gerald. Yes? Geraldine Oaks, Manchester? Your mother made a new will after she married Mr. Manchester, didn't she tell you? No. But she told me she was going to. She didn't. I'm sure I know why. Another slap at me, Sandy. Are you implying I changed her mind about telling you? If the shoe fits, Greg. Now, now, hold it, please. We're here for the reading of a will, and I suggest we get on with it. I, Geraldine Oaks, Manchester, a resident of this city... I hereby revoke all former wills and codicils to wills heretofore by me made. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and seal this tenth day of October, signed Geraldine Oaks Manchester, and witnessed, etc., etc., etc. Well, Mr. Manchester, you've inherited quite a fortune. Plus a hundred thousand dollars in insurance. While Rose gets nothing, nor do I. Well, as your mother stated in her will, Sandy, she trusted me. 
implicitly trusted me to see that Rose was well cared for. And you? I don't need Mother's money, but Rose... Oh, Sandy, you can trust Greg. Mother did. I do. I know you do, Rose. You trust everyone. You always have. Possibly because she hasn't let the world make her as cynical as it has made you. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Manchester. I can take care of myself, Joe. More important, I can take care of Rose, and I mean to. But, Sandy, I'm going to be all right. Greg will leave you to starve if I know Greg, but he isn't going to because I'm not going to let him. I'm going to break this will. Sandy, I you... mean it, Joe. He conned Mother and he fleeced her. Well, you're not going to get away with it, Greg. I'll break this will if it's the last thing that I do. And uh, may I ask exactly how, my dear? By proving you murdered my mother and meant to murder her from the start. Have some more Champ Creole, Florence? Oh, Greg, darling, I couldn't. I simply couldn't. You know I'm on a diet. Oh, nonsense. This is no time to stay on a diet. In the <laughs> first place, it's Mardi Gras week. Oh, in the second, I've brought you to the oh, finest yeah. restaurant in New Orleans. Oh, you dear, delightful man. And in the third place, why anyone with your figure feels the need to diet that baffles me utterly. <laughs> oh, you are a dear and delightful man. Greg Manchester, you are almost a... No, I'll say it. You are as dear and delightful as my late husband. Oh, Greg, I'm so glad we met. So glad. Well, so am I, Florence. You know, only a week ago, I was the loneliest man on earth. Oh. Lonely in the way only the bereaved can be lonely. Even though it's months since Geraldine passed on, I thought I would never get over her loss. And then... Well, then, my dearest... You don't mind if I call you my dearest? Of course not. Well, I met you, and life became worth living again. Oh, Greg, do you know that's exactly the way I felt? Feel? Ah, I thought as much. Oh. We've known each other only a week, my dear, but what a week it has been. Oh, yes. And for my part, Florence, I... You won't be offended. No, no. Well, for my part, you're the woman I've been looking for since my own dear Geraldine passed on. Oh, the woman I felt sure I would never, never find. Oh, Greg. Greg, you dear man. Then you're not offended. Offended? It wouldn't be if I... Well, if I... If you what, darling? If I asked you to become my wife. Oh. Oh, dear, I have offended you. No. No. Oh, oh you've made me so happy, <laughs> I think I'm going to cry. In fact, I know I am. Uh, Greg, Greg, what? Is, is something wrong? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, but uh, excuse me a moment, Florence. I'll be right back. Well, Sandy Oaks, girl photographer, camera and all. Greg Manchester, con artist and murderer. Next victim and all. What are you doing in New Orleans? Mardi Gras week. I'm covering it. For Cosmopolite. You're lying. You found out I was living in New Orleans. You followed me here. Uh, care to see my press credentials? If Cosmopolite sent you, you asked for the assignment. <laughs> How right you are. Now you listen to me. Any more trouble from you and I'll make you know what trouble really is. Trouble? What makes you think I'm out to give you trouble, Greg? Because you followed me here, because I suddenly spotted you snapping a picture of me and Mrs. Chapman. I took more than one before you noticed me, Greg. They may come in handy. I don't see how. <clears throat> well, then, look over there, Greg. See that sign? The one that reads Mardi Gras Week? Exactly. From that angle, I caught not only you and Mrs. Chapman, but that sign hanging behind you on the wall. So what? The time element, Greg. And the place. I can hear a district attorney saying to you at your trial for murder, quote, you did know the widow, Mrs. Florence Chapman, as early as Mardi Gras week, didn't you? In New Orleans, wasn't it? Unquote. My murder trial. You are going to kill her, aren't you? For her money? After you marry her? Tell me, does she have any children you can leave penniless as you did my sister Rose? She went to live with you. You're very successful, plenty of dough. You take care of her. I am. I'm also going to take care of you. Now, Sandy, I warn you. Cool it. 
con man. I am not my mother that you're talking to now, nor my sister Rose, or that lovely victim of yours over there. A photographer gets around. You think you're the cleverest thing that ever happened. You are. But, Buster, it's your cleverness that's going to put you behind bars, because somewhere, somehow, you're going to think you're so clever that you'll make one little mistake, one fatal little mistake, and when you do, I'm going to be there. Be smart, eh? Get out of my life and stay out of my... Excuse me, I don't mean to interrupt, but, Greg, dear, won't you introduce me to that very attractive friend here? Well, dearest... Yes, of course, uh, Sandy Oaks, my stepdaughter. Oh, oh, you're not the daughter of that poor woman who, who drowned accidentally. Yes, Mrs. Chapman, I am. You know my... Oh, Greg told you. No, I've been watching you and Mr. Manchester ever since he met you a week ago. Watching? Greg, darling, what does she mean? Oh, never mind, Florence. She's a troublemaker. She tried to stop me from marrying her mother. I tried to stop you from murdering my mother. Oh, gracious, such talk. You're in a restaurant. Mrs. Chapman, uh, let me give you a tip. A tip that will save your life. Say goodbye right now to this charming, well-dressed murderer. Say goodbye and go on living. Well, Greg. Uh, Greg, I believe you're right. This girl, well, I don't know what she is, but she is. I'm sorry I came over. I'll wait for you at our table. Yes, sir. yes, yes, of course, Florence. Well, you see? Mm. She's as naive and as trusting as my mother and my sister. Or others you've murdered. Oh, so it's others now. Look, Sandy, you said I'm clever. Well, I am clever. A hell of a lot cleverer than you are, doll. I guess the only way to get you off my neck is to prove it. And just how will you do that? The only way I know. Murder. Don't get me all choked up. I know you. I'm ready for anything you try. Murder me? You don't have much of a chance, Mr. Manchester. Oh, murder you. No, 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 not you. Who then? Your sister Rose, whom you love so much. Who else? Inevitably, it had to come to this. The challenge. The squaring off. The gauntlet flung down between a cold-blooded murderer and a self-sufficient girl like Sandy Oaks, who's been around. Is she right? Will Greg Manchester make that one fatal mistake she says he will? Perhaps we'll find out when I return for Act Two. has been written on the psychology of murder and murderers. And although experts disagree, when have experts ever done anything else, there seems little question that the common motive for murder is personal gain. In any case, assuredly, that's what it is with Greg Manchester, who, you might say, marries for murder. But now Sandy Oakes, veteran freelance photographer, has set out to prove that Manchester murdered her mother, even as Manchester threatens that if she doesn't leave him alone, he will kill her invalid sister, Rose. Sandy, your mother drowned in her bath after suffering a blackout. My mother never had a blackout, a fainting spell in her life. Manchester spread that story to cover himself. Yeah, but you can't prove it. And until you can, I'm warning you. Drop it. I'm not afraid of a suit for libel or slander, if that's what you mean. What I mean is, I'm afraid for your life, if what you say is true. It's Rose's life I'm worried about. If anything happened to me, she'd be alone and penniless. You don't ever have to worry about Rose while I'm around. You know that. Of course not. But, good Lord, I didn't realize it was this late. I've got to rush. What? Just when I was about to invite you to lunch? I'm sorry, darling, but I'm due at the Metropolitan Photographic Exhibit in half an hour. I promised to advise the committee on how to hang the prize exhibits. Oh, including one of yours. Uh, which reminds me, I owe you an apology. Uh, an apology because I won a prize? 
Well, I'm always kidding you about carrying that fancy camera of yours, but if you hadn't had it with you and shot from the hip that day, <laughs> you'd never have caught that picture of an old man being mugged. And the muggers. Oh, the cops nail them because of what I photographed. Which reminds me, I've got to see Lieutenant McCoy at headquarters after the photo exhibit. What for? The information I dug up in New Orleans about Greg Manchester. Now, it may not mean anything to you, darling, but I'm hoping it will mean plenty to Lieutenant McCoy. <laughs> It means nothing to me, Sandy, nothing at all. But, Mac... Sandy, I checked it out. Yeah, sure, Manchester was married before he met your mother. And sure, his wife died of an overdose of sleeping pills, but the coroner's verdict was death by accident. Oh, Mac, you put me away. You really do. I don't get you. His wife dies of an overdose of sleeping pills, and he inherits over $50,000. He marries my mother. She dies by drowning. He inherits every cent she has plus an insurance of $100,000, taken out less than a month before. Two deaths, two so-called accidents, and Greg Manchester hits the financial jackpot. That doesn't strike you as fishy? Oh, yes, but I... Now he's going to marry this other wealthy widow, Florence Chapman, less than three months after my mother dies. Sandy... Oh, and he, he threatens to kill my sister Rose if I don't lay off. And you sit there and you tell me that you don't think that Manchester is a cold-blooded murderer. No, I didn't say that. I said he's clean, Sandy. As a cop, i got to play it by the book, The Rules of Evidence. Maybe Manchester did kill your mother and his previous wife, but I haven't got a shred of evidence to prove he did. And neither of you. Well, have you? No. No, but I'm going to get it. Sooner or later, Manchester is going to make one slip. One little slip, and I'm going to be there when he does. <laughs> Taking pictures of him as he does, I'll bet. It isn't funny, Mac. No, I'm just cracking wise about you and your trusty companion, that camera. Laugh. But it caught you a couple of muggers. And, Mac, it may catch me a murderer. <laughs> There's a bench, Rose. Want to sit for a while? Oh, no, Sandy, no. I, I'm too excited to sit still. You're too excited, period. Oh, I'll be all right. Oh, it's such a thrill for me just to get out of that apartment. But on top of that, these wonderful pictures. Holzman, Eisenstadt, Kepler, and you... That's what I call really sisterly love. Putting me in that class. Oh, you won a first prize. Yes, but in photojournalism, and there's nothing arty about my stuff. A first prize is a first prize, and I'm not going to argue. Oh, oh. Rose? Oh. Sandy, maybe I'd better sit down for a minute or two. Yes, it's right there. How, now, how bad is it? Uh, it's, it's not bad. Sandy, would you open my bag and take out the bottle of... Nitro pills. Yeah, just a sec. Here, wait a little moment now. Here oh. we are. Here, stay here. I'll get you a cup of water. Yes. Excuse me, please. Excuse me. Oh, yes. I I just want to get through to the water cooler. We're oh, here. Let me help you. Thank you. You. Yes, me. What are you doing here, Greg? Mrs. Manchester wanted to see the exhibits. She married you then. And I wanted to see you. Figured you'd be here, so I. Uh... I've got. No time for you now. I've got to get a cup of water for my sister. Well, here's the cup. There's the water. I, uh, want a word with you, Sandy, about... Would you uh... get out of my way? Excuse me, please. Excuse me. Rose. Rose, dear. Here you are. Oh, thank you, Sandy. Thank you. you are you better? Yes. Much. I think it would better go. Sandy, I haven't seen everything yet. Your heart. Oh, drat my heart. My first day out of the apartment in weeks. I'm going to make the most of it. I'm going to see everything there is to see. Oh, look who's here. Hello, Rose. How are you, Greg? Never better. You? Pretty well. Thank you. I meant to call on you when I got back from New Orleans, but I felt your sister wouldn't approve. You're right, Greg. Her sister oh, wouldn't. Oh, now you too. Oh, it's all right, Rose. It's all right. Sandy and I aren't going to have a scene. I only want to say hello. So, if you'll excuse me, I'll rejoin my wife. Goodbye, Rose. Goodbye, Sandy. Oh, um, give my regards to Lieutenant McCoy next time you see him, will you? Lieutenant McCoy? The police lieutenant you went to see this morning. About a certain little matter. 
how do you know that I want to see McCoy? And what I want to see him about? Oh, does it matter? I know. And I think it was very foolish of you, Sandy. Do you? Oh, yes, very. In fact, as I intimated to you in New Orleans, it could even be dangerous. Deadly dangerous. Not for you. Not immediately for you. Well, goodbye for now. Sandy, what was that all about? Nothing, Rose. Nothing. What did Greg mean? It could be deadly dangerous. It's, uh... It's nothing for you to worry about, Rose. Well, all right, if you say so. Funny, though. What? I'm worried somehow. Suddenly, I'm... I'm very worried. Oh, nice to see you. Come in. How are you, Rose? Oh, I'm fine. Fine. Now, now, no fibs to your brother-in-law to be. What? I talked to Sandy on the phone. She oh. said your heart gave you a little trouble at the photography exhibition this afternoon. Oh, nothing my nitro pills couldn't handle and did. Oh, good, good. Where's Sandy? <laughs> Three guesses. The dark room. Give the man a cigar. Oh, would you rather have a drink? A drink, and I'll make it. I'll make it. <laughs> Uh, Sandy said you ran into Greg Manchester at the exhibition. Yes. I'm worried, Joe. About what? Greg said a funny thing to Sandy. It seems he heard somehow she'd gone to see police lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant McCloy. Uh, McCoy. Uh, McCoy, uh, about something. He didn't say what. And Sandy wouldn't tell me, but anyhow, he said he thought she was very foolish to do anything like that. And that it could be deadly dangerous. Those were the words he used. Deadly dangerous. I see. Sandy didn't tell you? No, she didn't. But not for her. That was the funny part of what he said. Not deadly dangerous for her. Not immediately. <gasps> Rose. Rose, what is it? Uh, our things just... Your nitroglycerin pills. They... they, they... Sandy... Oh. Sandy! Oh, oh, what is it? Oh, no. Where are pills? Uh, 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 bedroom. I'll, I'll get them. Uh, Rose, uh, Rose, now, let me get you to the couch. Uh, uh, lay you down here. Uh, ah, there. Uh, there could uh, mind you, Ed. Sandy, hurry up! Oh, yes, yes, here. Here, Rose. Uh, uh, open your mouth. That's uh, it. Uh, uh, water, Joe? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, hi, Joe. Yeah, here you are. Uh, Oh, oh, all right now, honey. Swallow the pill. Swallow it, dear. That's it. Right. Okay. All right. Sure to be all right in a moment or two. Rose. Rose, dear. Is it having any effect? Oh, Rose. Is the pain letting up? Rose. Rose. Joe. Joe. Here, let me. Joe. She, she's gone, Sandy. Oh, no. No. I'm afraid so, sweetheart. He's done it. He threatened he wouldn't, he has. Greg Manchester? He said he'd kill her if I didn't lay off, and I didn't, and he has. Thank you, Mac. Goodbye. What'd he say, McCoy? The toxicology lab tested the pills Rose took. That I gave her. Oh, Sandy. All right, come on now, honey. The pills. They found that they were triple strength. Triple the amount of nitroglycerin prescribed for Rose. That's impossible. No pharmacist would make a mistake like that. The pharmacist didn't. They got him out of bed and they met him at his place and checked his records. He made no mistake. Well, then how... Sandy, how... Greg! Sandy. Don't ask me how he did it. He got into the apartment, maybe, while we were out. Rose and I... I didn't change the bottles. I don't know. It doesn't matter. All that matters to me is that he did it. And I know in my bones I know that he did it. 
He murdered the woman he was married to before he married my mother. He killed my mother. He killed Rose. He'll kill Florence Chapman. He'll kill me. Unless I stop him. He's got to be stopped, Joe. Stopped and put behind bars like any other animal. And that's where I'm going to put him. With God's help, Joe, that's where I'll put him for the rest of his life. Brave words. Words spoken under the pressure of emotion. Well, I think I can tell you at this point that Sandy did put Greg Manchester behind bars for the rest of his life when he made that one fatal slip. He, well, I was about to say that he overlooked something. But the fact is, he never saw it. But Sandy did. Or, to be more precise, her camera did. I'll return in a moment for Act Three. recall my saying earlier that the cleverer the murderer, the more likely he is to make one fatal slip. Something so minor, he never thought of it, never noticed it. What slip will Greg Manchester make? So far, he's got away with his killings. Sandy Oaks doesn't know where Greg Manchester will make that fatal slip, or when. Or more particularly, how. But make it, she knows he will. And as I've told you, make it he did. The question is, what insignificant but very final mistake did he make? You dare, you dare show your face here. I came here to this funeral home to see Rose for the last time. I am her stepfather, Sandy, and have the right... Murderer. Sandy. Get him out of here, Joe. Sonny, Joe, I'm going. May I have a word with you outside? Of course. Sandy, pull yourself together. Well? Joe, you're a lawyer. Would you give me some advice? What am I to do with her? She hates me. Has hated me from the moment we met. I don't know why. Chemistry, I suppose. Not much I can say to that, Greg, except you're a liar. I beg your pardon? You're a liar. It isn't chemistry between you and Sandy. It's Sandy's awareness, her awareness from the first, her trained awareness, because she's photographed so many people, that you're a phony. I agreed with her about that after only short acquaintance with you, Greg, but I didn't agree with her that you're a murderer. I agree now. You can't mean... You think I murdered Geraldine? I think you murdered Geraldine and Rose. I think you murdered another woman. In fact, probably other women. You can stand there and to my face say... Say it because it's obvious. There's such a thing as coincidence, Greg. But your history, your married history, goes beyond coincidence. Then you are calling me a murderer. I thought I'd made that plain. You're skating on thin ice now, and you're going to go through it. And when you do, you're going to find the water bitter cold, Greg. Bitter cold. Won't you sit down, Miss Oakes? Thank you, Mrs. Manchester. Let me say, I only agreed to see you when you phoned and said you wanted to talk with me alone. I only agreed because you are his stepdaughter. Mrs. Manchester, I wanted to see you because someone should warn you. Greg Manchester is a murderer. What are you saying? He murdered my mother. He murdered my sister, Rose. He murdered the woman he was married to before he met my mother. He's going to murder you. My dear, do you realize the gravity of this accusation? The important thing is that you realize... What well, I realize is that you are a bitter and malicious young woman who, for some reason, I am totally unable to understand, wants to malign a man who has never done anything but good for you. Good? What 
do you mean? Your mother left him all her money, didn't she? Yes, he was also the beneficiary of her life insurance, wasn't he? Yes, and all of this. The fortune he might have had, he turned over to you and your sister. Is that not so? It certainly is not so. Greg told me. Then he lied. He tricked my mother into giving him control of her money, power of attorney and all of that, and then taking out a $100,000 life insurance policy, and then he killed her. Can you prove that? N no. I can't, not yet. But whether I can or not, I think what you should keep in mind is that at least two previous wives have died suddenly and mysteriously after giving him control of their money. Have you? Why, why, yes, I have. Oh, but I can't believe this. I won't believe it. My husband is one of the most dear and delightful men I've ever met. Thank you, my dear. Thank you for your trust in me. Greg, we didn't hear you come in. Well, I'm glad you didn't. Otherwise, I'd not have overheard my stepdaughter's accusations. Sandy, I must ask you to leave. And please, don't come back. Goodbye, Mrs. Manchester. And good luck. Well, I hope that's the last we see of her. I'm sure you didn't believe the lies she must have told about me. Why, no, of course not, Greg. You don't sound altogether sure, Florence. Why, y yes, I, I am. Only, Greg, you told me you had handed all your former wife's fortune over to her daughters. No, 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 what? no. What? Well, you misunderstood me. I... I said that I intended to do it. But I haven't had time to get around to it yet. It's quite involved, you know. Certain legalities which take time and... You don't believe me, do you? No, 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 no. I, I do. I do. Only I'm... I'm certain you said you had already given them the money. No, you're mistaken, my dear. Greg. Yes? Uh, that power of attorney I signed the other day... Uh... Yes? Don't be offended, dear, but just as a matter of interest, does it give you uh, control o over my money? Now, that's an odd question, Florence. Does it, Greg? Well, the power of attorney is just that. It empowers me to act in your behalf. In, in other words, you can sign checks, withdraw money from my account, that, that, that sort of thing? Yes, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I see. No, 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 no. I don't think you do. For instance, you don't see that you have just signed your death warrant. Death warrant? I want you to go into your bedroom. Start packing. Packing? You're going to visit your sister in New Orleans. <laughs> Midnight. Make the call, Florence. Make it or I'll shoot you right now. Hello? Miss Oakes, this is Mrs. Manchester. Yes? I've, I, I've got to see you right away. Could you come here to my apartment? It's urgent, Miss Oakes. Dreadfully urgent. Please, please come. Of course, all right. We'll be there as soon as we can. Oh, make thank it. you. Goodbye. She's coming right over? Yes. Greg, please don't kill me. I'm sorry, Florence. I'll give you my money. I've already got it. Then why kill me? Pleasure, my dear. Simple pleasure. I find a certain thrill in murdering someone, especially silly women like you. When Sandy pushes that door buzzer, listen to it carefully, Florence. It'll be the last sound you hear in this life. Greg! All right. I must uh, snap off the lights here in the bedroom. Oh, good. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, help me. Help me. Help me. We heard a shot. What? In the bedroom. I just shot a prowler. It's dark. 
dark in here. The light switch. Oh, yeah, here. Oh, good Lord. Florence Manchester. What? What? Oh, no. Oh, no. Sandy, for the love of... This is no time for snapping pictures. Uh, I wasn't even aware I was... Uh... Get to the phone. Call the police. And put that damn camera away. Yes, yes, okay. Oh, I thought Florence was a prowler. I lost my head. I, I fired into the dark room. Headquarters? Uh, uh, give me a uh, Lieutenant McCoy. Is he there? Yeah, uh, yeah, hurry. Sandy, Sandy, please. Look at it, uh, Joe. Look at it and tell me, what do you see? Uh, I see the body of Florence Manchester lying on her bedroom floor. I have seen the body of Florence Manchester lying on her bedroom floor for over a month now, in blow-up after blow-up after blow-up of the pictures you snapped that night. This blow-up, good Lord, Sandy, it's the biggest yet. Why? Because these pictures prove Greg murdered Florence, that's why. You keep saying that, but you don't tell me what proof. Because... I don't know. Because it's staring at me in the face and I can't see it. Joe, look at it. Please, just look at it. Look. No. Joe, just look. I've had it, Sandy. All right. Maybe like you say, Greg's story of what happened was so much eyewash. Maybe Florence didn't leave to visit her sister in New Orleans. Maybe she didn't come back unexpectedly while he was asleep in his bedroom. Maybe he didn't hear a noise in her bedroom, think it was a prowler, panic and shoot into the darkened bedroom. Eyewash. All eyewash. But don't... What is it? Eyewash. Eyewash. Give me that blow-up. Ooh, with pleasure. That's it, Joe. That's it. What's what? The proof that he murdered her. The proof I've been looking for but couldn't see. Joe Florence Manchester's eyes. Look at her eyes. Manchester, you've been booked on a charge of murder. The murder of your wife, Florence. Now look here, Take Lieutenant. it easy. Thanks to your stepdaughter, Sandy Oaks, here, we have positive proof that you deliberately and with malice of forethought Shot Florence Manchester to death. What proof? What proof? I told you she packed her bag. You saw it in the bedroom and left to visit her sister in New Orleans. But had come back unexpectedly according to your story. And I fired a shot into her pitch black bedroom thinking she was a prowler. That's what happened. That's the truth. You know, no, it's a lie. This photograph of your wife's body... Sandy took it within a minute or two after the shot was fired. So? Look at it, Manchester. Look especially at the eyes. The eyes that are open and staring at the ceiling. What do you see? Her eyes. What else am I supposed to see? The size of her pupils. Look at the pupils of her eyes. Tell me what you see. I see the pupils of her eyes. Contracted. Contracted to the size of a pinhead. I... The human eye is like a camera, like that Instamax Sandy always carries. The darker an object or a place, the wider the pupil of the eye expands. The brighter an object or a place, such as your wife's bedroom, the narrower the pupil becomes, contracts. What's more, Manchester, when a person is killed instantly, as your wife was... The pupil remains unchanged for two to three minutes. You're saying... You're saying it. The photo says it. Not me. You stated that you fired that shot into a dark bedroom, killing your wife by accident. Her eyes, contracted to pinhead size, prove that she died in a lighted room. A brightly lighted room. I... If you have anything to say, make it in the form of a confession, won't you? Uh, on second thought, I'm not sure we need bother. It's all on film, Manchester. A picture, they say, is worth a thousand words. And so it would seem that Lieutenant McCoy is right. No words of Manchester's in his defense could possibly disprove the truth of his wife's dead, accusing eyes. I'll be back shortly.
Gregory Manchester is no longer a name, but a number at State's Prison. Sandy's name has changed, too. From Miss Sandy Oakes to Mrs. Joseph Norman. Hasn't changed her habit of carrying that camera wherever she goes, however. But she seems to use it more and more these days, snapping pictures of a baby named Joe Jr. Our cast included Joan Hackett, Ralph Bell, Robert Dryden, and Joan Shea. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... a famous, if ancient, phrase written by the Latin poet Virgil, Timeo Danaos Dona Ferentes. Translation, Beware the Greeks bearing gifts. This would seem to contradict another, perhaps older saw, never look a gift horse in the mouth. The story I bring you relates to both of these, but in the end, you will have to decide which is closer to the truth. mystery drama, The Gift House, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Joyce Gordon and Paul Hecht. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Until six months ago, she was one of the lucky ones. Her name was Nancy Ryan. She had come from the Midwest to conquer the theater and miraculously landed in the chorus of a top hit as a dancer. She thought then she was pretty lucky. Then she met Ted Pryor, a reporter for the New York World Sun, and having married him, knew she was the luckiest girl in the world. Three months after they were married and her pregnancy was confirmed, she had no doubt that the whole world was her oyster. Then... Life decided to redress the balance. Oh, what? Oh, where, where are we? Oh, uh, turn it off, Ted. What? The alarm, honey. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Mm. I love you. Good morning. I love you, too, but... Oh, dear. What is it? Oh, same old morning problem. Comes with being pregnant. I'll see you later. Oh, Nancy, what have I done to you? And what are you going to do when you hear the bad news? Feel better, honey? Mm, no problems. It's the way girls are built. The baby's great. Well, that's good. Come here. Mm. Ah, that's nice. Oh, let's snooze a little, huh? Oh, Ted, we can't. You'll be late at the paper. Oh, uh, that's all right. They're, uh, they're not expecting me this morning. What? Uh, what? Who? Oh, uh, where? Who's it? <laughs> it's not the alarm this time, darling. It's the phone, dummy. Here. I'll get it. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay, I have it. Hello? Good morning. I trust I didn't disturb you. No, 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 that's that's all right. Um, uh, who, who is this? Oh, my name is G. Wellington Montgomery. I am a solicitor. Would I be talking to Mr. Edward Pryor? Um, yeah, yeah, this is Ted Pryor. Well, happy to make your acquaintance. But actually, I, I think it's your wife I wish to speak with. Was she the former Nancy Ryan? 
Uh, yeah, 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 I guess so. From Ponca City, Oklahoma? Uh, that's right, yeah. Nancy Evans, right? Uh, no, no, wait, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, w w what is all this about? Well, I think perhaps it would be better if I talked to your wife directly. I may have some information for her that would be greatly to her benefit. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Montgomery, I understand. Oh, I certainly will. Just let me talk it over with my husband. Oh, of course. I'll get back to you as soon as I can and let you know our plans. Thank you. Well, can I know just what this is all about? Well, but didn't you hear? Well, yes, some uncle of yours or relative or whatever he was died and uh, left you something. That's around. right. Oh, I forgot he was even around. He was a cousin or something of my mother's. I never even met him. But, honey, he's left me everything as his sole heir. What's everything? Well, just an old house, I guess. Mr. Montgomery said there was only a couple of hundred dollars in cash. Well, where is the house? Cookuntuck. How's that again? Cookuntuck. It's an Indian name. Oh. It's not that far away. It's right out on Long Island near Bontor. Is that where this Montgomery lawyer is at? Yes. Uh, I mean, he lives in Montauk. Oh. So, uh, what happens now? Well, there are papers to sign giving us title to the house and all that. And once that's all cleared away, it's ours to do whatever we want with. Uh, yeah. Uh, yours. Well, what, what do you mean mine? Everything we have, we share. Yeah. Well, uh, that's the trouble. What do you mean, Ted? I, um, I haven't anything to share as of now. Oh, honey, I still don't understand. No, of course you don't. You see, um, uh, you see, darling, I, um, I don't have a job. I, I, I mean, I haven't had one for almost two weeks. <gasps> Paper fired you? Well, it's just that circulation's fallen off. <laughs> Last in, first out. That was me. I mean, how do we swing this apartment with no one working, afford a baby, and come up roses? I think we better do what the lawyer suggested. Like what? Like, rather than try to do all this by mail, we drive out to Kukantuk and take a look at the house I inherited. Sure. Great. What are we driving? Well, a rental car. Okay, honey. Pack your fancy duds. We're on our way. Hey, this is the life, eh? Oh, Ted, it's beautiful. Uh, too bad it isn't real summer. Well, it's Indian summer. That's even better. Just look at all the trees. Mm. They're a riot of color. Uh-oh. What is it? Looks like your color is going to be blotted out. Patches of fog ahead. Oh, dear. I hope it doesn't get any thicker. Where are we now? Well, we just went through Amagansett. We should be there in half an hour. Oh. What's wrong, honey? Oh, I don't know. You cold? You want me to uh, roll up the window? No. No, I I'm not cold. It it's just... Just what? Oh. My mother used to call it a... Ghost walking over your grave. Oh, Ted, I, I, I just had this nutty premonition we shouldn't go any further. And we should turn back and run. Without even seeing the house? Well, I, I told you it was nutty. You should just have to excuse a pregnant old lady. Certainly, I'm grateful the fog lifted. Now you can see the house Chris left you. Oh, well, I'm grateful, too, Mr. Montgomery. Um, what do you think, Ted? Well, it's bigger than I thought. <laughs> sure is a screwball joint, though. Oh, but, honey, it has a quaint and, I don't know, individual charm. <laughs> you could say that, all right, Mrs. Pryor. Individual. Why, Chris built this house up from the ground with his own hands. Excepting for the help he got from Pete Prouty and old Amos Covey, rest his soul. Uh, are they dead, too? Like my uncle? Oh, Ed Scobie died 30 years ago, maybe. But Pete Prouty's still spry. 
Wasn't my Uncle Chris ever married? Oh, 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 oh. he was married, all right. Sourest apple ever came out of the barrel. Never would live in this house with him, hold up in a little apartment she had in Montauk. Made him stay there with her. You mean he never used the house? Oh, he used it, all right. Excuse to get away from her. I'd say Chris Evans spent the better part of 40 years building this house just so he could be with his cronies and a jug of wine to keep from remembering he was married to the sorriest excuse for a woman the good Lord ever devised. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm sorry, my dear. I, I'm afraid I'm not giving your house a very good name. Oh, I don't know. I think my uncle had good reason to love it. There must be a magnificent view from the cliff here when it's not foggy. All the way to Portugal, Europe. It's like another world. Hey, look down there, Nancy. There's a nice little sandy beach. Mm. It's good for swimming because it's sheltered from the big Atlantic seas. And a fine natural harbor. Chris used to move a catboat down there. And he... Uh-oh. There's something wrong, Mr. Montgomery? Yes, wind shifted. It'll bring the fog back. Besides, it's after sunset and the light goes fast these four days. If you want to see anything in this house of yours, we'd better get on with it. Hey, is that a, is that a car in the garage there? Yeah, that's Sir uh, Chris's old Packard station wagon. Runs like a dream. <laughs> or at least it did up to the day he died. But is that part of my inheritance? Sure is. Now, uh, we'll have to go around the side of the house. The front door's on the lee side. Okay. Hey, isn't that a kitchen door right next to the garage? That's what it is. But uh, we can't get in that way. <laughs> it looks as though you have enough keys there to open everything. <laughs> I surely do. But there's only one that's important. This fella. <laughs> what a funny, fat little key. What's it for? Burglar alarm. Burglar alarm? Do you have many robberies around here? Oh, not so you'd notice. Nobody's got that much to spiegel. <laughs> but Chris, he's... He's not only got one system, but two. A backup in case the first one fails. Well, what was he afraid someone might be after? And if you ask me, I think he put him in to keep his wife out. <laughs> I don't think he ever used them after she up and died. Well, here we are. That's the alarm. And now for the door. I was the one who put the alarms back on while the house was standing empty, just in case. <laughs> now, now, watch your step. Mm -hmm. It's kind of dark here in the hall. Uh, living room's to the left. Uh, I'll get some light. <laughs> oh, shakes love. Oh. What's happened? The whole room is torn apart. Somebody was sure looking for something. Well, it looks as if a hurricane went through here. Well, what about the rest of the house? We'd better have a look. at all the damage. Fortunately, there is some insurance. I'll get busy on that first thing in the morning. Yeah, what I'd like to know is that what whoever it was was looking for must have been something pretty valuable. Oh, couldn't have been anything like that. I've handled Chris Evans' affairs all my life. And I tell you, he was a man who lived up to every penny he made. And to that, he never made much more than pennies. Well, then why would anyone have done all this damage? That's what I said from the first. I don't know what young people are coming to these days. Vandalism. Sheer vandalism. But uh, that's beside the point for the moment. First things first. Now, uh, obviously, you can't stay here tonight as well, you planned. Of course so... we can stay here. The place is a shambles, Nan. Well, darling, the big bedroom with the foam mattress, that's not damaged too badly. And there are plenty of sheets, I saw. We have all the food we brought along in the cooler, and there's even some instant coffee in the kitchen. We'll make out. Well, now, if you're sure... Oh, of course I am. Uh, Mr. Pryor? Whatever Nancy wants, Nancy gets. Well, then, that fog's getting pretty thick. Might be a good idea for you to stay put. <laughs> well, I'll be in my office all tomorrow morning. I'll wait for you to get in touch with me. Goodbye, now. Nancy, are you awake? Yes. What is it? I thought I heard something. Listen. Holy cow, it's the alarms. Well, well, where are you going? I'm going to turn off that racket. Oh, no, you're not. Are you crazy? You've got nothing to defend yourself with. Those alarms didn't go off by themselves, Ted. There's someone else in the house. Oh, 
Which one of us has not wakened at some time in the middle of the night to that gagging feeling of the heart in the throat and the spine-chilling belief that an intruder was violating the privacy of our home? It never turns out to be true, of course, or seldom, but just suppose one time it did. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Whatever present or imagined terror might be stalking the house, there was a point at which even Nancy had to agree with Ted that the awful jangle and scream of the burglar alarms simply had to be stilled. Once Ted armed himself with a heavy wrought iron doorstop, Nancy was persuaded to allow him to go downstairs and turn them off. It just doesn't figure, Nancy. What, Ted? The two of us have checked every window, every door, every contact in the house, and everything is sewed up tight. What could have set off the alarm? Well, couldn't it have, you know, short-circuited? Well, possibly. Except after I turned it off, I, I flicked it back on, and, and it was operating fine. Well, what does that mean? Well, I don't know. Maybe a speck of dust, a, a leak, a bird flew against the window too hard. I don't know. I... I don't want to speculate on anything else. Oh, Ted, you mean like someone really tried to break in? Well, if he did, he didn't make it. We've searched this house from top to bottom. We know there's only the two of us. Well, now what do we do? We have no phone to call for help, but uh, we do have a nice stout bolt on the inside of our bedroom door. <laughs> hey, let's go crawl back into bed. Hmm? Lock the door, pull the covers over our head, and cross our fingers we can get what's left of a good night's sleep. How's the coffee, Ted? Uh, the coffee will do. How about us? Well... I'm still trying to think it through. What's wrong with this house? Uh, you got me. But something's off the beam. You know, I think we should bail out, get back to New York, put it up for sale. Oh, in this condition, who would buy it? But it isn't only that. Just think what we could make of this place, honey. Given a little time. You'd want to live here? Well, just till the baby comes and I can get back to work. It would solve our financial bind. What's that? Hey, relax, honey. This time it's someone who's asking to come in. It's, it's the front doorbell. Oh. No, stay where you are. I'll get it. Morning. Name's Prouty. Peter Prouty. I'm the nearest neighbor right down the hill. Oh, good morning, Mr. Prouty. I'm, uh, I'm Ted Pryor. I saw you drive up last evening with that lawyer fellow from Montauk. Uh, Montgomery? You fixing to buy this place? Um, well, well, no, not not exactly. My, um, my wife inherited it. From Chris Evans? Yeah, I didn't know he had any relatives. You, you knew Mr. Evans? All my life. Me and him is just like that. Uh, so, no wonder the place was not for sale. You, uh, thinking of selling? Why, well, uh... I don't know. We, we just got here. I got some worried last night when I heard the alarms go off. I got my shotgun, came up the hill, but then the noise stopped. And then I just checked you out this morning. All right? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I don't know what happened to the alarm system. Maybe some animals set it off. It was kind of weird. Uh, a lot of weird things been happening up here since Chris passed on. I don't understand. Well, anyway, would you uh, would you care to come in and uh, meet my wife? Perhaps join us in a cup of coffee. There, there are some questions you might be able to answer for us. And in spite of all the damage, you don't believe that someone broke in here? No, no, I I don't. Well, now how can you say that when you see the mess? What I think is maybe someone tried to get out. Get out? Who? Uh, ghost. Ghost, maybe. <laughs> That's all we need now to find out that this place is haunted. Oh, I don't believe in ghosts. There's no matter believing or not, little lady. This one just is. 
Maybe old Chris himself, too. What do you mean, just is? Martha, his wife. She come a-whiffling and a-snuffling around here three years back. The anniversary of her death, it was. In the fog. We had a real pea super that weekend. All you could do was see the nose in front of your face. Like last night. <laughs> Bless you. It was just a whisk. The real ones wrap around you like a blanket. Uh, maybe a shroud. Anyways, that Saturday night, Chris and me was sitting right here at this kitchen table playing casino when... <laughs> Oh, what was that? You didn't think you'd get away from me. You didn't think you'd get away. That's Martha. Oh, oh, can't be Martha. She's dead. But not peaceful in the grave. Uh, Where where is she? I I can't see her. Is is she a, a ghost? Why not? She she haunted me all her life. Why shouldn't she now? She's she's dead. I'll haunt you till you're buried. You and your cheap women. You stole my pride. You stole my life. But I will have my revenge. Stop her, please. Hold her back. I can't. I, I don't see her. Where? There. With, with the knife in her hand. Look out. Die. Tried to kill me. Oh, don't talk nonsense. There was no one here but us. Huh? If there wasn't, what's that? Driven into the wall. Halfway up to the haft. It was the big kitchen knife from Martha's old apartment in Montauk. Still vibrating from the force that drove it deep into the paneling. You didn't actually see this ghost. No, not that time. But other times I saw her floating in the mist, her hair hanging down her back. And nights when the fog would blow in, I'd hear her voice on the wind and see the lights dimly flashing from room to room till Chris would come up pelting down the hill to my place to hide. He put in the alarms to try to shut her out. But it didn't do any good. How did Martha... uh, Mrs. Evans die? In her bed. Of what? Uh, Heart congestion, they called it. She was all alone. Yeah. Where was Uncle Chris? Uh, Lucky thing for him, the fog was so heavy that night, he stayed over with me. Else he might have been accused of helping her along. Although... No one would have blamed him if he had. But he was with you all that night. That's what I told the police. And Chris, my uncle, how did he die? He cut his throat. Or had it cut for him. Oh, good heavens. What a lot of bosh. Peter Prouty is the town drunk. And he's a bigger gossip than most women. Well, then how did Uncle Chris die? Well, now, I'm afraid there's some truth to the bloody details. I I must confess to you that Chris was always eccentric. But during his last years, he had crossed the border into senility. The uh, drinking didn't help. He and Pete were always a few sheets to the wind. The Lord knows what wild fancies they hallucinated between them. But you still haven't told me how he died. Well, I'm, uh, I'm afraid he cut his wrist, my dear. Oh. So no one could have been responsible for his death except himself. That's right. And his wife? Oh, she outlived all our expectations. She had a very bad heart for years. Well, that's a relief. And you say, Mr. Montgomery, you checked with the insurance and the damage is all covered? Absolutely. The adjuster is coming by tomorrow to estimate costs. But I can handle that for you. Why? Well, uh, aren't you going back to the city? Oh, Ted is. I'm not. What? 
Well, you know we have to get the rental car back. You know, why don't you come back with me, darling? Because I'm going to be a very busy girl. I want to see the adjuster, and Mr. Montgomery's going to help me to have Uncle Chris's car put in condition. I'm going to drive it in tomorrow so we can pack up and get out of that apartment before we get socked any more rent. Now, Nancy, you're in no condition. I feel fine. And the sooner I get settled in my own house, I can really enjoy having this baby. Darling, now's the time. We need a roof over our heads. Yeah, besides, if there is anyone around here looking for something spelled M-O-N-E-Y, maybe we ought to be finders keepers. Oh, if there was, it would be peanuts. Oh, Chris used to make some two-dollar bets on the horses. And if he won, he had the habit of folding a ten or a five into old newspapers in the cellars and forgetting all about it. I helped him find many a one. Uh, you think that's why the house was broken into? Huh? Well, now, I was mulling it over in my mind, and I thought that could be the reason. You know how stories grow, particularly with a solitary person like Chris. But if money is the motive, which is tying you to the house... I beg you to forget it. You'd only be disappointed. I still don't feel right about it, Nancy. Oh, don't be silly, darling. I'll be safe as a church with my double burglar alarm. Oh. Anyway, if anyone is looking for anything, it's not for me. Well, that's where you're wrong. I am. Oh, hey, that's my line. I'm going to find what I'm looking for when I drive to New York tomorrow afternoon. Now, I'll see you at the apartment, and if there's any hang-up, I'll phone you. You don't have a phone. Well, not tonight, but Mr. Montgomery's arranged for them to connect it in the morning. Now, come on. It's beginning to get dark. Goodbye, Don. Goodbye. Go to bed. Get a good rest. I'll do that, little thing. Drive carefully. Well, not to worry. I wish I was as brave as I'm pretending to be. Hello, Miss Pyle. <gasps> oh! Oh, you... You gave me a start, Mr. Prouty. Where, where did you drop in from? Well, I was out for a walk, and I... thought I saw you preparing to leave. Uh, no, only my husband. You uh, planning to stay a while? Uh, more or less permanently. Uh-huh. In spite of what I told you? Pete, you are a big teller of tall tales. I think you get carried away by your own imagination. Oh, it could be. Still and all, I wouldn't like to see you in any danger. Me? What danger could I be in? Are you trying to chase me away from here? Oh, perish the thought. I was just concerned about you. A little woman all alone with no one to protect her. I can manage by myself, thank you. Uh, of course you can. But you batten down all the hatches and hold snug. Looks like we're in for a real northeaster. Oh, listen to that wind. And you can't steal my birthright. totally disengaged and say, how does the heroine of such tales allow herself to become so involved? But since we have followed her this far and permitted her to be involved, the question is, how does she escape? We won't know that, of course, until I return with the conclusion in Act Three. Nancy 
Murphy is alone, just waken from the depths of sleep. The wind roars around the exposed house on the heights above the raging waters, and everything is filtered through the miasma of the drifting fog. Through its half-light, a menacing figure, long hair streaming, looms the reincarnation of Chris Evans' long-dead wife. A kitchen knife held high to strike down at Nancy. And as the voice cries out... Darling, there's, it's all right. It's all right. There's, there, there's nobody here but us. It, it must have been a nightmare. Are, 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 are you okay for a minute? Yeah, where are you going? I'm just going to turn off the alarms. Uh, it's all right. I, I, I'm right here. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we are now. Let's go into the kitchen and sit down a minute, all right? Oh, Ted. What are you doing back here? Well, I drove as far as I could, man, but the, the fog was impossible. I, I decided I'd better feel my way back here, but what, what, what's been happening? Oh, everything was... everything was all right when I went to bed. But that little screwball, Pete Prouty, came by just after you left, and he went on and on about ghosts and blood, and... Oh, I, I, I didn't pay any attention at the time, but... I suppose he fixed all that nonsense in my mind. I'll wring his neck when I see him again. Well, maybe you ought to wring mine for being a prize goose. I, I went to sleep. But then I woke up and I... I heard all these voices and... I was sure someone was in the house. Well, there couldn't have been. I set off the alarm when I came in. I know, but... I can't tell you how real it was. Ted, I... I, I saw... I, I saw... Saw what? There was a, a figure. A woman with long hair and a knife in her hand. And, and she... She said she was going to kill okay, me. Okay, okay. Right, look, take it easy, will you? Oh, I feel like such a fool. It's not like me to imagine things. Now, look, it's it's this house and, 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 and your condition. Look, we've got to get out of here, no, Nancy. No, no. I didn't imagine it, Ted. I'm not that much of a ninny. Something funny is going on here. But it's not supernatural. Do you know what I think? Someone's trying to run us out of this house before we find out what its secret is. <laughs> I, I'm downstairs, darling. I um, I didn't know you were up. Oh, well, what are you doing? Well, I I woke up this morning. I couldn't get back uh, couldn't get back to sleep. I I didn't want to wake you, so I thought I'd sort of scout around. Well, scout around for what? What I finally found. What? Come on, come on. Let me show you a couple of things. All right. And uh, for openers, uh, let's take a look at this on the hall linoleum. Oh, it's a footprint. Yep, somebody's shoe. But see, see all those squiggly marks inside the outline? Oh, neither of us have anything like that. Right, go to the head of the class. That's the kind of print a storm or a, or a Wellington boot might make. Now, uh, look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing shows up on the rug, but right here, mm -hmm. beside this back hall closet, there's a heel mark with the same pattern. Someone was hiding in the closet. No, because there was no dampness or trace of mud on the rug. Well, then it all doesn't add up. Well, it didn't until I turned back the rug and looked underneath. Like this. <gasps> a trap door. Mm -hmm. Well, where does it go to? Let's yeah, open yeah, it. No, no, no. I've already checked it out. It leads to a short staircase down to a long, twisting tunnel that descends into a cave that lets out onto the beach. So that's how they were able to get into the house... Without tripping the burglar alarm. They or he? You mean Pete Prouty? Or Mr. Montgomery or persons unknown. Anyone who didn't want us to settle in this house. Why? Because of whatever they were looking for. But but what? Uh, 
Now, who is it? Oh, I I think that's Mr. Montgomery with the insurance man. Well, now I I feel the insurance company offered a very fair settlement. As your lawyer, I'd advise you to agree to it. Well, we think it was fair, Mr. Montgomery. And I think the house can be put back together very nicely with the money they'll pay. Well, certainly in shape to sell, which, uh, if you'll forgive me, is what I urge you to do. Uh, Mr. Montgomery, I'm going to be very frank with you. There's, um, there's something in this house someone wants. <laughs> I hope you're not suggesting it could be me. Oh, I give you my word, I had no idea there was any other access to this house than through the keys that were left in Chris Evans' effects. <laughs> And I can't imagine what he could have had that was of any value beyond the house itself. Even knowing about the secret passage? Now, what was it for? Oh, my guess is it was built in the 30s when everyone was doing a little mild rum running during Prohibition. (laughs) But I don't imagine there was a fortune in that. Then you don't think Uncle Chris could have amassed any money? My dear, I knew Chris Evans as well as my own brother. And I assure you, there's no way he could have amassed any secret amounts of money. (laughs) Unless he'd won the Irish sweepstake. And you can't exactly keep that a secret. Oh, hello, Pete. Uh, Good morning, Miss Pryor. I come up a little earlier to see how you were, but... And I saw you had business, so I backed off. Oh, that was Mr. Montgomery and the insurance man. For the damage. Are you going to take care of it? Oh, yes. Well, I, uh... I just want to check up on you. Having to spend the night alone in the house. Um, as it happened, she didn't. Uh, I came back. Well, now, that's a surprise. Is it? Don't know what you mean. You have a pair of storm boots? Wellington style? I've got several. You see some pretty rough winters. Uh, why? Did you know there was a secret passage from the back hall closet all the way down to the beach? Why, Dad, I most forgot that. It's been sealed up for most 20, 25 years. How did you and my uncle meet? Oh, that was a long time ago. My family were fishermen... I thought I ought to give show business a whirl. That's how I met Chris. He was the electrician in the first theater I got a job in. You were an actor? <laughs> kind of. I had an act in vaudeville. Well, I, I was the one coaxed him out here to Montauk. I helped him build this house. I always felt it was kind of... Part mine. Is that why you use the old passage from the beach to break in and tear it apart? He should have left the house to me. It was half mine. I'm even willing to buy it from you. If you give me a decent price. Why, Pete? What are you looking for here? Oh, uh, nothing. Just my due. Oh? And what's your due? The money. If there was any. But now I've looked for it everywhere, I... I know there isn't any. It was probably just another Chris's big lies. So I'll, uh, see you around. Well, I guess that's that. Mm. Disappointed? No. All I ever wanted was the house free and clear. <laughs> Seems to be that way. Now, all we have to do is to figure out how we can keep it that way. Well, I refuse to worry about that now. Oh, it's such a lovely day. Oh, but... who's this? Well, it can't be the contractor this fast. <laughs> Mrs. Nancy Evans Pryor? Uh, yes? A.Q. Sprit. IRS. Internal Revenue Service. Oh. Oh, well, how do you do, Mr. Sprit? Um, this is my husband, Ted Pryor. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Taking a little time to catch up with you, Mrs. Pryor. Are you the sole heir of Christopher Xavier Evans? Oh, I never knew Uncle Chris's middle name. Well, now you do. I checked already with Montgomery, not your lawyer. Now, let me see. Uh, on the 14th of April this year, Mr. Evans laid off a three-way parlay at Battleground Racetrack on the dogs. 
the dogs. Yes. Grayson type. Like horses. Oh. Said Polly paid off on a ten dollar bet at twenty five hundred to one, making a return of two hundred fifty thousand fully taxable by the federal income tax. My uncle won all that money on a dog race? It happens, ma'am. Not very often, but it happens. You got to be lucky. And you didn't collect the tax on it. That was a slip up in our Florida office. Happens too. But we catch up. So, I'm here to collect it. Well, well uh, how much? With penalties and interest, figure about 125. Thousand? That's how we like to round it off. Oh, we haven't any money like that. Oh, my uncle left was his house. So I gather from your lawyer. So if there isn't any money, I guess we'll just have to possess the house. I'm sorry. That's the law. We all packed, Nancy? It didn't take long. We scarcely moved in. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm the one who should be sorry. At least if I had an inheritance, it shouldn't have been a minus. <laughs> a quarter of a million dollars. No wonder Pete was ready to tear the house apart to find it. Well, he didn't. I hate to leave it. Damaged goods as it is, it's a house. And I'm going to have a baby. And I'd like to have started him off at least in a real home. I know, man. Just don't push it. I can't help it, Ted. I... I know. Somehow I... I just know Uncle Chris wanted someone to be happy here. Only something went wrong. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, his will was made long before he took his life. That was an impulse. I think he would have wanted us to know what he did with the money, but he just forgot at the last moment. Yeah, if he hadn't already spent it. You know what I feel terrible about? Know what? That I couldn't just have put things in shape while I was here. Well, that's the little homemaker in you. At least taken down these sleazy, dirt-stiff old drapes and washed them. Gosh, they feel as if they'd been starched. They're so fi... Star starched. What is it? Ted. Yeah? Get me a kitchen knife. Quick. Okay. What for? Uh, Mr. Montgomery said that Uncle Chris had a habit of stashing away his racing winnings between newspaper pages. Well, how about sewing them in between a curtain drape and the lining? Oh, here's the knife. Oh, good. Uh, just let me cut this runny facing stitch. There. Well? Ted. What? A $100 bill. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> ah, three stuck together. <laughs> oh, Ted, darling. We're not only going to make Uncle Sam rich, but we're going to be the same. And hang on to the house, too. So, at the end of this tale, we can return happily to the positive proverb, never look a gift horse in the mouth. For a while, it seemed as if Nancy Pryor had stumbled into misfortune. But instead, she came out with the luck of the Irish. I'll return shortly. brings many changes. Peter Prouty died, unlamented, of acute alcoholism. Christopher Evans has a namesake in a fine baby boy born to Nancy and Ted. Ted has a job with a county newspaper, and the family has settled down to enjoy the local society, into whose circle they have been welcomed after being sponsored by Mr. Montgomery. Nancy Pryor would be the last person to subscribe to Virgil's warning, Beware the Greeks bearing gifts. May everyone be so lucky. Our cast included Joyce Gordon, Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Place not your trust in princes. The great and good book tells us, and sound advice, indeed. It would appear to be, especially since we are also told, uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Royalty, nobility in general, isn't as popular as it used to be. But at one time, almost every little girl wanted to marry a prince, or a duke, or an earl. And if her rich American daddy had the money, he could always buy her one. Our mystery drama, The Kingdom Below, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Phyllis Newman and Fred Gwynn. They transform the face of the nation. History refers to them as robber barons. Most of them were born poor and died rich. They devoted their lives to amassing money. And then, when they had more than they could ever spend, they realized they had missed out on something very important. Something which could be described as culture. And so they pursued culture as avidly as they once had chased after money. And where was culture? Why, it was in Europe. And what was culture? It was immortal paintings for the mansion, masterpieces of sculpture for the grounds, and a titled foreigner for a son-in-law. From the diary of Miss Mayetta Stebbins. Rome, July the 3rd, 1887. I do believe that music will drive me out of my wits. Not that I had too great a supply to begin with. We are living in a palazzo. (laughs) And didn't Mama give it to me for calling it a palazzo? Palazzo! darling palazzo but i want to go home anyhow i shouldn't complain about mama poor papa he's the one that really catches it every morning it's the same old thing ah uh, prego annunziata the uh uh, uh udi. you know the eggs I ain't had a decent egg since we left the States. Now, you said ain't at the opera last night. I thought I would die of shame. Who was there to hear me? Nobody but a bunch of foreigners. How many times must I tell you, Benjamin, in this country, we are the foreigners? Yeah, that's why I can't hardly wait to get back the good old USA. Benjamin, I don't think you're taking this trip seriously. Now, you just look here. I got writer's cramp from signed checks. You wanted that painting of that... A uh, fat lady? Oh, Benjamin Franklin Stebbins, you are talking about a genuine Caravaggio. Yeah, and you are talking about 50,000 simoleons. <laughs> 50,000 of Uncle Sam's finest. 50,000 of those long green men. But, did I blink an eye? <laughs> no, no, wrap her up, I says. I'll write you my check. $50,000 for a Caravaggio? You stole that painting. I stole it? <laughs> you want pictures of naked fat ladies? Well, I can take you into places back home where... Benjamin, your daughter is sitting at the table. Oh, Mama, I know about those places. Oh, my sakes alive. Well, what do you know about those places? I know well-brought-up young ladies ain't supposed to talk about them. It ain't. Ain't. There it is again. Benjamin, you've corrupted this child. Okay, Mayetta. Don't say ain't in front of your mama. It discombobulates her something fierce. Now, we have to have a serious discussion. Does that mean I have to leave the room? No, it concerns you. Uh, Benjamin, I, you give generously of your money. I have no complaints. Thank you kindly, ma'am. But you're not putting your heart into this thing. Which thing? The thing we really came for. Okay, you tell me. What did we come here for? To find a husband for Mayetta. Why can't Mayetta find her own husband? Benjamin! Did anybody have to find you a husband? No, you found one yourself. And look at me. Yeah, look at you. Twenty-nine years ago, you were filling up beer mugs in your old man's saloon. Benjamin! (laughs) Is that true, Mama? How can you say such things in front of the child? I'm not a child, Mama. It was the worst dive on the San Francisco waterfront. Where was the saloon? (laughs) There was no saloon. No? 
What was it then? Why are we getting off the subject? Uh, which is? Finding a husband for Mayetta. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nobody found your husband, and you wind up being married to one of the 50 richest men in America. Now, Benjamin... You don't believe it? Read the papers. Money isn't everything. It ain't? Oh, that word again. There's a world of people who don't say ain't. Yeah? It's a world of breeding, refinement, and culture. Is that a fact? And from that world, I want a husband for your daughter. That's a funny way to put it. <laughs> you want a husband for our daughter. Uh, well, what does you, our daughter have to say about it? Oh, she's too young to know her own mind. So... What have you got on your mind? Now, Prudence Folsom, she came back to America last year with a count. <laughs> Skinny beanpole of a fella with a pot belly, a mustache, and a monocle. Looks like a dude to me. Now, you have twice as much money as George Folsom. So your daughter should do twice as well as his. Mayetta should get herself a prince, or at least a duke. Find her one. Well, what do you, uh say to all this Mayetta. What do I say to all this? I don't know. Most of the time I don't listen. I've never been in love. Maybe I'll never fall in love. Maybe I can't or or maybe I'm so much in love I don't realize it. Could I be in love with someone I've never met? <sighs> Sounds silly. I could never talk about it to anyone. Yet the, the truth is I don't know if I really feel this way or if I read about it somewhere in some novel long ago. <sighs> well, the next morning it began over again. You girls know what day this is? It's the 4th of July. Oh, how I wish I was back home. Benjamin, we are not returning until Mayetta gets... I can see him now, stepping down Fifth Avenue, the Grand Army of the Republic. Benjamin! Be the first year I ain't marching with him. Ain't again. What do I have to do to get back to the land of the free and the home of the brave? Well, first, you must stop saying ain't. Done. You ain't never going to hear that word pass my lips again. Second, you must find a titled foreigner for your daughter. And what if she turns him down? How can she turn him down? She ain't met him yet. Every time you get really excited, you sound like the red-haired girl I first met in your old man's saloon. What are you talking about? Let it pass. <laughs> now, look, we we've been here a month. She hasn't met anyone yet. She's met hundreds of people. She met all kinds of nobles, fellas with titles. Toss a coin. Put the names in the hat. Pull her one out. Well, not one of them is good enough for her. Ah, uh, now we're on to something else. They're fortune hunters. Yeah. Dried up, wizened, elderly men. Uh-huh. And the young ones. Oh, too slick by half for my taste. I wouldn't trust any of them. Benjamin, we are not meeting the right people. We're meeting everybody there is. The word is out. The rich American heiress is in Rome to find a husband. We're getting them from all over Italy. They're coming from France and Spain. Uh, <clears throat> I understand tonight we're going to meet a couple from Austria and uh, Russia. You see, Benjamin, we were wrong. We? Uh, <clears throat> what did I do? Well... We let it be known that the fabulously wealthy Americans were here with a marriageable daughter. We thought we'd be swamped. And we were. But a man of true aristocratic breeding would be repelled. He would have contempt for us. He would label us as nouveau riche, as parvenu, as arriviste. I'll tell you something, Mama. I happen to know what every one of them words mean. And you want to know the truth? That's exactly how we're behaving. Well, I want a prince for my daughter. I want a man of background and breeding. A man who can trace his family down through the centuries. But, Mama... And let that family become even richer and greater and finer because of what my daughter will bring to it. Okay, Mama. Sure. That's what I want. Do you know why? It don't matter, Mama. As long as you want it. The old man here will see you get it. Uh, somehow. Well, now, you talk about the saloon my father owned on the waterfront. Look, I won't bring that up no more. My father didn't own that saloon. What? What are you saying? I, I, I happen to know Patty Morgan was the one and the only sole proprietor. That's true. But Patty Morgan wasn't my father. What? And Katie Morgan wasn't my mother. 
They adopted me. They took me in. I, I was one of those kids you read about. A newborn baby that's found on the doorstep. Mary. Mary, you... Now, who was my mother? My father. I, I'll never know. Who am I? Where do I come from? I, I'll never find out. Well, now, is it so important? Yes. All right. Well, find me a prince. A real prince for my daughter. You can do it. Sure. I mean it. You can do anything. What were you? A stevedore, a roustabout. But today you're one of the 50 richest men in America. You performed a miracle. Now make another one. Find her a prince. I wasn't supposed to hear that conversation. But one thing about Mama and Papa. They spoke loudly. There were no secrets. I didn't want to say anything to Mama or Papa. But I wouldn't marry anyone they found for me. Unless, of course, it was the person I was in love with already. But how would they know who he was? I didn't even know myself. Papa disappeared right after breakfast. I found out later he'd gone to the American Embassy. My name is Thurman Trueblood. What can I do for you, Mr. Stebbins? Who are you? I'm the third assistant secretary. Yeah. Well, young fella, I didn't ask to see the third assistant secretary, or the second, or even the first. I asked to see the ambassador. The ambassador is out. Uh, not to me, he ain't. Uh, my name's Benjamin Franklin Stebbins. Uh, I know that, sir. I'm a personal friend of President Grover Cleveland. I'm aware of that. So, you march right back in there and tell the ambassador Ben Stebbins wants him. Uh, sir, I can't do that. Uh, they've all gone home to America to celebrate the 4th of July, and they won't return for uh, another two weeks. There's no one here, only me. Yeah. Well... Then I guess you'll have to do. Well, yes, sir. What's to be done? Uh, I want my daughter, Mayetta, to find a fine, handsome, young Italian prince from uh, a noble family that goes back to, uh, oh, uh, maybe old Julius Caesar or any of that crowd. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, I'm not sure that lies within the province of uh, the embassy's activities. Uh, son, what's the purpose of your job here? It's to foster closer relations between the Americans and the Italian people. Well, now, ain't that exactly what I'm asking you to do? Yes, but... Uh, uh, never mind, but. It's, son, it's a losing battle. <laughs> uh, who's the most blue-blooded prince they got? What's his name? He's the uh, Prince de Porto Corvo. Trot him around. Oh, you don't understand. He, he never goes to see anyone. Well, then we'll go see him. But the prince never sees anyone. Is that a fact? Now, just who does he think he is? Well, there are those who say... Yes? Who say what? Well, it, no, it's, it's all old wives' tales of superstitious peasants. Uh, but there are those who say he's the devil himself. friends, there you are. We made you wait for the very last two words of Act One before we said something that puts everybody on notice. A rich, young, handsome prince, and there's suspicion around that he may be the devil. Well, the devil is a prince. He's called the Prince of Darkness. We shall shed more light in just a little while when I return with Act Two. say money talks. Well, that isn't quite accurate. Money does more than merely talk. It commands. And what money wants, money usually gets. The moneyed Mr. Benjamin Franklin Stebbins, one of the 50 richest men in America, has come to Rome in the year 1887 to buy some culture, paintings, sculpture, and a titled foreign nobleman for his daughter. Now, Mr. Thurman Trueblood, let's get down to the facts at hand. This Prince de Portocovo, why do folks say he's the devil? Well, this is all local superstition. Isn't there even the tiniest little bit of fire and all the smoke? I couldn't say. I really don't know anything about the Prince de Portocovo. Why not? Why not? Ain't he one of the natural resources of the country? Uh, I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, which is why you're only third assistant secretary. 
But never mind. I'll take you in hand, boy. I'll educate you. Uh, sir, uh, uh, what's been attracting most of the foreign capital lately? The native nobility. That's what. Look at how many American millionaires have been investing in princes and dukes and counts and uh, no accounts <laughs> and uh, whatnot. Well, that may be, sir, but... Now, uh... I'm coming here as a legitimate American businessman. I'm here to buy a prince for my daughter. So when I make an investment in a foreign country, which this is, I have the right to ask investment advice from the American embassy. I'm not sure there's a precedent. Well, if there ain't, we're going to set one. Now, you say this Portocovo is the goods. I said uh, only that he comes from the oldest, most aristocratic family. Then we'll settle for him. But I know nothing about him except his name. Uh, just rumor uh, and hearsay. Why don't you invite him to a party at the embassy? Send me the bill. Oh, but nobody invites the prince to Portocovo to a party. Uh, he does not accept invitations. Uh, I, I don't even know him. Then we'll go see him. You just don't go calling on the prince to Portocovo. Why not? Well, it, it just is not done. That's why we're going to do it, boy. We're going to go out there for a drive this very afternoon. Oh, no, I couldn't leave my post here at the embassy. Embassy's closed for the holiday. It's the 4th of July. <laughs> Where does this prince live? Well, I understand, uh, I think, uh, they say he has a villa some ten miles north of the city. We'll pick you up at noon and get to the prince's palace in time to be invited for lunch. Oh, but Mr. Stebbins... Stick uh... with me, son. I'll see you get made an ambassador yet. <laughs> Mama didn't know whether to faint with joy or dance with happiness. I think she did a little of each. She couldn't stop kissing Papa. She screamed in positive raptures of delight. Oh, Benji, Benji, you can. You will work miracles. Nothing to it. And this, this young man from the embassy arranged the whole thing. Like shooting fish in a barrel. Oh. Hey, uh, Mr. Stubbins, he said, you want to meet a genuine Italian prince? Let me give you a knockdown to my pal, the Prince de Portocovo. Oh, Portocovo. Oh, that name. That name alone sends romantic visions through me. <laughs> Let's drive out this very day, he says, and have lunch. Oh, Benjamin, you are the most wonderful man. Maybe I knew what I was doing when I come out for Grover Cleveland. Oh, yes, indeed you did. <laughs> Next time, don't tell me who's going to win the election. Women ain't, uh, uh, I mean, aren't. Qualified to. Oh, you can say ain't, Benjamin. Go ahead, say ain't as much as you want. Mayetta, dear, have you heard? We're to have lunch with the Prince of Porto Carvo. I heard. And the moment I heard that name, I... I had a sudden feeling of... Of what? I felt dizzy. But it wasn't an alarming dizziness. It was more of a delicious, out-of-this-world feeling. I seemed to be lighter than air. I seemed to float in space. Everything was so, so wonderful. I remember we got into the carriage. We stopped at the embassy where a very tall, serious young man joined us. Uh, Mayetta, honey, this is Mr. Thurman Trueblood, Assistant Secretary at the Embassy. Uh, actually, Miss Stebbins, I'm only the third Assistant Secretary. Uh, son, when you blow your horn, sound it loud and clear and strong in a major key and uh, leave out all the minor notes. I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance, Miss Stebbins. But I hadn't the eyes to see him with, or the ears to hear him, nor the voice to answer. It was only one thought that filled my entire being. The prince. The prince of Porto Corvo. And the name. I began to remember the name, Porto Corvo, but... But from where? Why? For some reason, this was not the first time I had heard it. Porto Corvo. Oh, prince of Porto Corvo, I love you. I love you. I have always loved you. We drove through the beautiful countryside and soon we came upon a villa. It was small, but perfect. A small, flawless diamond. It was neither big nor ostentatious. It was the kind of home I had always dreamed of, set in the middle of what appeared to be a park. There were streams and gardens. It was altogether a place of rare delight. I had read that phrase somewhere. But that's what this palazzo was. 
We drove in through the gate. A footman held the horses. A butler ushered us into the house. What a charming, charming palazzo. Oh, Mayetta, darling, come here. Look at this painting. How did you work it, sir? Uh, how did I work what? How did you wangle this invitation from the prince? How, how did I? Son, I was about to ask you. You mean you didn't? Now, uh, Thurman, uh, what are you trying to tell me? That you didn't arrange no, it? No, sir, I did not. Well, then why did the dude in the short pants and the velvet coat with a silver button say the prince was expecting us? Oh, Mr. Stebbins, I, you're having a little joke, aren't you? Oh, darling, this cup, it must be a... It is. It's a Cellini. Now, uh, son, I'll be hanged for a horse thief if I can tell you what's going on here. Mr. Stebbins, sir, um, what the local people say about the prince being the devil? Uh, now, uh, son, remember, uh, you're an American. Uh, hold the line. Uh, but to know we were coming, he had no way. Suppose he is the devil. What if he is? He don't scare me. I've already been to hell. <laughs> 25 years ago, son. Yes, sir, I was with General George Henry Thomas, the Rock of Chickamauga. There was hell for you. Sir, I'm not sure that I did the wise thing. Ah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this humble dwelling, but it is all I have to offer. Consider it yours. Mr. Stebbins, the celebrated Mr. Stebbins, so kind of you to come. I am your obedient servant, the Prince de Porto Corvo. How do, Prince? Uh, shake hands with Mrs. here. Honey, this is the Prince. Oh, your, your Royal Highness. And our uh, little girl here, Mayetta, uh, named for her two grandmothers. How do you do? Is this how it happens? You look into his eyes and you see? What do you see? I don't know. You, you're lost. You're lost in space and lost in time. Nothing matters and no one else exists in the whole world. You know your fate is sealed. Luncheon is served. May I offer you my arm, Miss Stebbins? Uh, well, uh... Yes, of, of, of course. This way, please. Uh, Mr. Stebbins, Mrs. Stebbins, Mr. Trueblood. I know you will enjoy our little repast. Mr. Stebbins, how did he know my name? You didn't introduce me. He knows you from the embassy. How does he know I'm from the embassy? Well, ain't there the seal of the United States of America on the carriage? We're not using the embassy carriage. We're using yours. Yeah, well, well, son, don't sweat about it. There's an explanation for everything. So explain this. Yeah. I said there was an explanation. That don't necessarily mean I can tell you what it is. Dear diary, luncheon was a dream. The food, oh, the food was, how can I describe it? It was everybody's favorite. Was there ever such a host as the Prince of Porto Corvo? No. Now this is steak. Steak? Well, I'm having shad. And I have scrapple. Strawberries and cream. I have to tell you, Prince, this steak could only come from Kansas City. And shad like this must be from the Hudson River. Nobody outside of Philadelphia knows how to make scrapple. Well, strawberries aren't in season, are they? My good friends, a host must live for his guests. Please enjoy your lunch. Yes, but how did you know how partial I am to shad? <laughs> I guessed it. Oh, you did nothing of the sort. Benjamin must have told you. Didn't you, Benji? Who, me? Oh, confess it. I did not know the sort. Oh, you men, you must have your little mysteries. Shall we begin? Uh, is it customary to say grace in this country? Uh, of course. For what we are about to receive, good Lord, we give thanks. Mm. Benji, this is really shad. Uh, wait a minute, Mama. Hmm? What is it, Benjamin? Mayetta. Put down your spoon. Benjamin! I have to uh, talk with the prince here. My dear Mr. Stebbins, is something wrong? I'm not sure. Papa! I want you to tell me. Tell you what? What's going on here? Papa, are you feeling well? I don't know. But when I was a little kid at school, I remember reading a story about all them... Uh, Heathen gods and goddesses. Oh, really, Papa, is this the time to start? Now, the devil. Okay, he wasn't exactly the devil, but he was the prince of the underworld. So I guess that's just about the same thing, huh? Oh, you, you must permit me to apologize for my husband, Your Highness. 
He does choose the oddest moments to tell his long-winded stories. Now, Benjamin... As I recall, this prince of the underworld kidnapped the daughter of one of the goddesses. And he took her down to hell with him. Don't anybody else remember that story? Everyone remembers, Benjamin. But I'm sure no one is really interested. So the kid remembered that she shouldn't eat. Because if she ate as much as one bite, or took as much as one swallow, she'd be stuck there forever. And uh, <clears throat> so, Prince, if you'll excuse us, we're going to skip lunch. How dare you insult this man in his own home? This generous gentleman of the highest... Oh, please, Your Highness, you must find it in your heart to forgive him. Uh, Mrs. Stebbins, sometimes the heat in my country is upsetting to those who are accustomed to a more uh, moderate climate. Uh, may I suggest... Prince, I want to thank you for your hospitality. But we really have to be leaving. Mama, Mayetta... I shall do nothing of the sort. I intend to have my lunch. Mm, the shad. How tender. Mm, what a heavenly taste. Mama! All right. What do you suppose this is? Here you have Ben Stebbins, one of the most hard-headed practical men in the world, and he starts raving about something deep down, way past, in ancient Greek mythology. He looks at a handsome, sophisticated gentleman and sees the king of the underworld. Don't sell Benjamin Franklin Stebbins short. After all, he was smart enough to become one of the 50 richest men in America. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Perception. It literally means to see through. One man can look at a desolate, barren piece of land and see buildings and factories and stores, a great city. This is how men become rich. They see through, right through to the heart of the matter. They are not distracted by the cover or the color or the shape or the form. They see through to the essence, to the money. This is the kind of man we have in Benjamin Stebbins, and he accepts what he sees, no matter how fantastic or far-fetched or impossible. Dear Diary, that was quite a lunch. <laughs> Poor Papa. Why was he having such a hard time at the table? Mama was so embarrassed I thought she'd die. And that milk and water Mr. Trueblood wished the floor could open up and swallow him. After all, he had to uphold the dignity of the United States government. Well, both of them began to eat. Papa refused to touch a bite on his plate. And I know how he loved his steak. I ate my strawberries. Papa yelled at me. Don't, Mayetta. Don't. It's all right, Papa. Young lady, you come along with me. Benjamin, we have all been embarrassed enough. I want to talk to my daughter alone for a minute. Now, you listen to me and step this way, Mayetta. Uh, Your Highness... I must keep apologizing for my husband. Mayetta, don't you get up from your chair. My dear Mrs. Stebbins, surely a girl must listen when her father commands. Is it not written, honor thy father? Come in here for a minute, Mayetta. Mayetta, honey, you you got to believe me. You've just got to. I believe you, Papa. Then we're getting out of here right this minute. No, Papa, I want to stay. But you said you believe me. I do. There's... There's something about it. I don't care. You didn't listen to what I was saying. It doesn't matter. Mayetta, I'm taking you home. I'm home now, Papa. No. Come on now. What can you be telling me? I love the prince. You must listen to me. Did you... Did you ever hear of a more practical, down-to-earth fella than your old man? Papa, I know what you're going to say. Put your money on the table. Show me the figures. Let me examine the merchandise. That's always been me, honey. No fancy notions, no crazy ideas. So when a fellow like me starts talking about, uh, about devils and, uh, and the underworld, you have to listen. Now, this prince, he... Uh, well, how else can I put it? He ain't human. And what if he isn't, Papa? What do you mean, what if he isn't? I love him. I've been in love with him all my life. But how could you? You... You, you only met him an hour ago. How do I know that? Oh, my poor little girl. No, Papa. 
I'm not your poor little girl. Not any longer. You always did want to marry a prince, didn't you? Every little girl does. You sure you didn't read that story I tried to tell everybody just before? Sure I read it. Back in school. You didn't see yourself as the heroine. Being carried away by the great god of the underworld. Becoming the queen. Oh, it's so hard for you to realize I'm in love. And when you're in love, it doesn't matter who he is. But it does, Mayetta. It does. We love each other. When was this decided? It was meant to be. And now, Papa, we mustn't keep the others waiting. Dear diary, Papa walked out on the terrace and I returned to the dining salon. The prince, my prince, was so charming that soon everyone was smiling and having a wonderful time. When lunch was over, the prince took my arm and we went for a stroll. Who are you? You know. I know? Your father has told you. Well... <laughs> you don't believe him? Yes. You believe him. And it is true. Yes. I have always loved you. Why? Oh, because you are so light, so filled with beauty. For a girl who's supposed to be so beautiful, I've... I've had remarkably few bows. And considering that my father is so rich... Yes, I know. You see, I did not want anyone to fall in love with you. What does that mean? More important, I did not want you to fall in love with anyone else. And so I did not permit a thing like that to happen. How could you stop it? You see, my sister is... <laughs> it will be very difficult for you to believe this. I know I must believe anything you choose to tell me. My sister is Venus. No one in the world may fall in love without her permission. I... I see. I've waited for you, just as you have waited for me. I love you. I love you. We shall be married. Oh, oh that'll make Mama so happy. You don't know how she always wanted me to marry a prince. I know. Oh, and not just getting married, but, but the idea of the wedding. It will be a beautiful wedding. Oh, how Mama's going to enjoy every single detail of the planning. Oh, my dearest, I am afraid your mother will not be allowed to come. She... she what? The wedding will be held in Olympus. Where's that? It's where my father lives. Why can't my mother come? My dearest one, your mother will not be permitted to leave the underworld. I, I, I don't understand. Your mother and this gentleman, Mr. Trueblood, they must depart shortly for the underworld. Why? You know why, my dearest. They dined at my table. Do you mean they'll be dead? <sighs> dead is a word that is only used in this world. But, but, but will they be dead? They will lead another existence elsewhere. Will they be dead? Yes. It is the law. What law? All who partake of my hospitality must remain forever my guests. Papa. Papa didn't touch a bite. He will leave. I shall not see him for a long time. Papa won't let you take Mama away. Darling, darling, you must not allow yourself to become sad. Remember, we love each other. Yes, but... And love is all. Love is is enough. But Mama won't be able to come to my wedding. Mama will never forgive me. Mama will not know about your wedding. Why won't she know? Because Mama has already sipped from the cup of forgetfulness. What's that? It is to prepare one for the next world. Mama is waiting for the journey to the underworld. She and Mr. Trueblood are waiting for the boat. No. No, I want to see Mama. No, my darling, you do not. I do. I, I want Mama. I tried to spare you this. Oh, Mama. Oh, Mama, you, you, you're not going anywhere. Tell me you're not going anywhere. Child, are you speaking to me? Mama, don't look at me as if you don't know me. Who are you, child? Who am I? Don't you know me? Don't you know your own daughter, Mayetta? Mayetta. What a lovely name for a beautiful girl. Mayetta. For Grandma May and Grandma Etta. Uh, goodbye, child. I wish we had more time to chat, but I must leave. Don't go. Come back. Come back. She must go, my darling. 
I want to go home. Soon, my beloved. I will take you home. No. No, home on, on Fifth Avenue in New York City. I want to go home. You will come with me. We have always loved each other. We are to be married. No. Papa. Please, Papa. Papa, save me. Help me, Papa. Now, what's all this holler and mayetta? You ain't a little girl no more. You've got to behave like a marriageable young lady. I don't want to get married. Not to him. I told you not to touch a bite of food. Oh, please, Papa, don't scold me. Just help me. And help Mama. They're taking Mama away. Honey, what can I do? I'm just a living, breathing, mortal man. He's one of them gods. What can I do? Oh, Papa, did you ever in all your life ask, what can I do? Never. Whatever it was, you just went out and did it. Please, please, Papa, save Mama and save me. I don't want to marry him. But you're in love with him. No, Papa, I'm not. I was in love with the idea of him, of, of a prince. Oh, Papa, please. All right. Just sit there quiet for a bit. <clears throat> uh, Your Highness. Yes? My uh, little girl wants to break her engagement. <laughs> I am afraid that is impossible. I love your daughter. Do you? With all my heart. Well, then, if uh, you're a man of honor, you will ask for her father's permission. You have already permitted it. You brought her to my house for this purpose. Oh, but that was before I knew who you were. You knew who I was. You always knew it. I didn't know for a fact. I may have suspected <laughs> we quibble over words. All right, then let's argue facts. You say you love my daughter. You say you love her with all your heart. What are your plans for her? To make her my queen. And uh, just where are you going to live? In my palace. Which is where? <laughs> you know where. Down there? <laughs> way down there? Down there in hell? In the dark? In the damp? Where there ain't never a ray of sunlight? Not one blade of grass? Not one flower? Not one bird? Why do you want to bring her there? To brighten my life. I know that, but uh, who's going to brighten hers? Can she live in the dark? No, she needs fresh air, the blue sky. I will make her happy. How will you make her happy? She'll wither away. She'll die. No. They all die. All your wives. What happened to your first one, the one we all read about? How many have you had since? Uh, how many will you have after Mayetta? Mr. Stebbins. You bring them to your palace for their youth, their beauty, and their freshness. But all of that disappears very quickly in the poisoned air of your kingdom. They fade ever so quickly. They die ever so soon. It isn't love on your part. You need them. But you never love any of them. I love your daughter. Prove it. How? Give her up. What? Save her life. Let her live. I love her the way I have never loved any of the others. Then don't treat her the way you did the others. Let her live. Let her have her life. The beauty and the loveliness of the world above. I, I... How long can she live with you? A few months? A year? <laughs> then she'll be old. No, no. You know I'm right. man who loves is a man who must be willing to give. But give her up. I love you, Mayetta. I love you. You will never know how much I loved you. Dear Diary, I'll say one thing about this country. It may be the food or the air, but the fantastic dreams you have in this place ever told anybody what I'm writing on this page, who would ever believe it? We were supposed to visit this prince and, and poor Papa. Did he ever catch it from Mama? It seems we got to the place where he was supposed to live, and what do you think? This can't be the place. It's a heap of ruins. Well, nobody's lived here for hundreds of years. Everybody says it's where he's supposed to live, right, Mr. Trueblood? Yes, sir, as far as I know. Yes, but you said we were invited for lunch. Somebody must have played a practical joke. Oh, I dare say. I was told a titled foreigner lived here, Mrs. Stebbins. In a godforsaken place like this, only the devil would live here. Well, ma'am, the devil's a titled foreigner. He's the prince of darkness. 
July 5th, 1887. Dear Diary, I've come to a certain conclusion about princes. More than ever, I intend to marry one, but I have an idea that the best possible prince is the one you make for yourself. Now, Papa was just a day laborer until Mama took him in hand and made a millionaire out of him. That's because she saw the possibilities. Now, I look at Mr. Thurman Trueblood and I... I wonder what I can do with him. Well, it'll be fun to try. She did, and it was. Well, now, little girls dream of princess. What do little boys dream of? This whole business of dreams now, it can get us into more trouble than it's worth. Dreams. Some of them are so real. How do we know they're only dreams? Do you ever get the feeling that one day you'll wake up and find yourself... where? Asleep or awake, I shall return shortly. happily ever after. At the risk of being an old curmudgeon, I must ask, who lived happily ever after? The data tells otherwise. Most girls who marry princes have a relatively bad time of it, especially if you read the papers. The truth is that princes, as a rule, make great lovers but bad husbands. And for the long haul, what the girls like is for things to be the other way around. Our cast included Phyllis Newman, Fred Gwynn, Paul Hecht, Bryna Rayburn, and Roger Barron. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This week starts the second year of Mystery Theater, and it will be a week to remember, a week devoted to the world's master of mystery, horror, and the bizarre, Edgar Allan Poe. Each night this week, it will be my pleasure and honor to bring you one of Poe's masterpieces, our respectful tribute to the creative genius of a truly great author whose stories will live for all time. Help us celebrate the start of our second year of Mystery Theater by joining us every night this week in our salute to the world's acknowledged master of the macabre. Of all the fears that have plagued mankind, probably the most terrible was the possibility of being buried alive. Oh, don't shrink away. You have nothing to fear, modern medical science being what it is. But not so many years ago, the thought of waking up in one's closed coffin beneath six feet of earth, that was a horrible thought indeed. And an ever-present danger, which led, in at least one case, to a remarkably strange experiment.
mystery drama, The Premature Burial, was adapted from the Edgar Allan Poe classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by George Lothar, and stars Keir DeLay. I'll be back shortly with Act One. As you know, I'm an inveterate and incurable reader of diaries. The Paston letters. John Evelyn. Pepys. Boswell. Young Pastor Kilbert. I've read them all and many more besides. The daily journals, that is, of lesser-known folk. In so doing, I've happened upon some curious tales. But none, I assure you, that can match in sheer terror the one I bring you now. I happened upon it years ago in a small, out-of-the-way bookshop in London, England. It's the journal of a young doctor, Dr. Gordon Rainey, and it recounts certain events that took place in the year 1810. Now, let me see where to begin. Ah, here. I arrived at the Bull and Bear Inn in Salisbury, the doctor writes one of the worst of storms, and having stabled my horse and seen to its proper care, soon found myself in the rooms my friend Guy Peterson had engaged for himself. In all the years I'd known him, since undergraduate days at Cambridge, I'd never known this closest of my friends to be in such a state of overwrought nerves. Thank God you come, Gordon. Thank God you're here at last, my friend. I came as soon as I could after getting your message, but, but what is it? I, I've never seen you in such a state of nerves. <laughs> My God, you're actually trembling. He's dead. Dead, you see him. And they buried him last week, but I, I must see her once again. Gaze on her face. And... Now look at me. What? Look at me. Look full into my eyes. What? Gordon, what, what are you doing? I'm merely calming you down through the use of mesmerism. Mesmerism? What, what in heaven's name is that? I... And why do you stare at me? As if... As if I... That's right, old friend. That's right. Calm down. Quiet yourself. Relax. Just loosen up. Let yourself go. That's it. That's it. There now. Feel better? Why... Well, yes, but how did you do it? What is this mesmerism, did you say? Yes, a means of controlling another person by, well, to put it simplistically, dominating him with one's own will, the force of one's own willpower. But, but that's miraculous, and, and yet you, you did it. I feel ever so much calmer now because you made me. Good. And now, Guy, calmly tell me why you sent that urgent message to meet you here in Salisbury. Victorine. Victorine is dead. Ah, well, I, I know how you must feel, and of course I sympathize deeply, but her death, isn't it a blessing? A blessing? She's dead. Victorine is dead. And at last free of the hellish life Sir Giles Buckingham led her. Come now, Guy. Is that not something to thank God for? Well, I suppose so. I suppose so. Oh, my dear good friend. I know how much you loved her. Loved her? She was my heart, my soul, my very life. A life that ended for me when her family forced her to marry Sir Charles. We talked of it again and again, but now that she is dead, perhaps you can try to take up your life again. I must see her, Gordon. See her? That's why I'm here. Why I asked you here. I must see her, Gordon. Gaze upon her lovely face once more. But, but she's buried, buried a week ago, you said. In the family vault on the Buckingham Estate. I want to go there tonight. Force entry into the vault. Open her coffin. And look at her once more. Just once more. I need you because I... I fear to go alone. There is more to fear than that, Guy. What do you mean? A, a body, dead and buried for a week in a damp and virtually airless vault. Guy, you will not see Victorine as she was in life. I shall see her. Guy, this is mad. I beg you to... I her. must! I don't care what she has become. I must see her once more. Uh, must I do it alone? 
will you help me? If it is your wish, you wish it so strongly, then... Yes, I'll help you. We must be... Be careful not to be discovered, Gordon. This moonlight makes everything as clear as day. Uh, there'll be no one about unless the estate is guarded at night against poachers. Let's hope not. Uh, wind creaking up. That should help a little. Cover any sound we make. Yes. Uh, here's the gate to the estate. Uh, is it locked? Let's uh, so find out. Uh, no. Come. Uh, there. Not so much for that. Now, the, the location of the vault. Do you, do you know where it is? Yes. That line of copper beaches on the hill. Do you see them? Yes. The vault lies just beyond. Come. Wait. That barking dog. If the place is guarded by a dog or even dogs. Now, don't let your nerves get the best of you. Bad enough to face trouble when it comes, not before. That dog. It's here on the ground. And closer. Gordon. Steady, man. Steady. Yes, it's on the grounds, all right. And coming this way. Come. Let's step out into the open. Into the open? If the dog is coming this way, I want to meet it in full moonlight. Why, Gordon? Why? Because my only chance of subduing the beast, if it can be done, will be with my eyes. My voice, too, yes, but, but the eyes. There, there, I see it. Coming over the hill against the moonlight. Good Lord. Oh, my wonderful animal, Gordon. It's a massive and a big one. And he's caught our scent. Come on, step, step out into the moonlight. Quickly, or all is lost. Yes, yes. Gordon, Gordon, I'm scared. Stand still. Make no move. Leave this to me. All right, boy. Quiet down. Quiet down now. That's a good dog. That's it. We're not here to do you any harm, boy. We're friends. Your friends. Yes, that's right, boy. There's a good dog. A fine dog. Unbelievable. You stopped him with your eyes. Held him to the one spot just by looking at him, and with your voice you soothed him. You calmed him. Took all the fight out of him. Yes. And now, let's get on to the vault. Here, here we are. The vault. Locked? I'm afraid so. I'll have to use the pry bar I brought. I'll be as quiet as you can. Yes. There. Uh, gate's open. We can go in. Uh, light the lantern, Gordon. Guy. Guy, once more, I urge you not to go through with this. I must. You know I must. Now listen to me. Light the lantern. I'm lighting the lantern, but... Listen to me. You remember Victorine as she was. The lovely, innocent, gentle girl who was forced to marry Sir Giles seven years ago... The torments he put her through, the daily torture of living with such a beast, these alone would have changed her face. But she's dead as well, and buried here a whole week. Guy, I beg you once again, remember her as she was, not as she must now be. Shine the lantern about. Very well. Oh, dear heaven, there are at least a dozen coffins piled one on another. How can we tell which is Victorian? Uh, hers would be one of the topmost. Yes, and the velvet covering would be the newest. The brass studs still bright. Ah, that one up there, I think. Let's get it down and see. Just let me put the lantern over there. So, now then, I'll take the head of the coffin, you the other end. Uh, can you reach it? Just All right, pull then. Pull it to the edge. And when we get it to the edge, we can put our hands under it and let it down very gently. Yes, yes. Gordon. I heard it. What was it? It couldn't be... Can't be what, what I thought. Shh. A voice. And it comes from inside the coffin. Oh, dear. And above it, this is Victorine's... Gordon. She's alive. Alive. 
Let's put it on the ground. On the ground. Easy now. Easy. Let's pry bar now. Pry off the lid. Yes. Yes. Well, hurry, man. My nerves. Hands trembling. No strings. Give it to me. Now then. Hurry. Hurry. I'm working as fast as I can. There. The lantern. Quickly, the lantern. Yes, yes. Shine it into the coffin. There. Oh, look. Victorine alive. Alive. God, God, it's you, it's you. Oh, God, thank you, thank you. Horrors, I've been through. All right, gently now, my dear, gently. God, you, God. Yes, yes, my dear. Come on, Guy, lend a hand. Help me lift her out. Oh, I can't believe that. Oh, he's alive. Oh, my dear, it's going to be horrible for you. I don't want to think about it. I can't, I can't tell you. To wake up, and at first not knowing where you are, and everything black, pitch black, suffocating, scarce of air to breathe. Well, best not and to then, think about. And then you move, and you, you feel the sides of the coffin narrow, so narrow. And you reach up, and you touch the lid, but the lid's only an inch or two from your face. Suddenly, you know. Oh, heaven help me, you know. You scream with the terror of it. You scream and scream and scream. Stop it. Stop it at once. At once. Yes. Yes, Gordon. You're alive, and that's all that matters. Yes. And thanks to what I called a a mad Uh, impulse, you're safe. Oh, yes. Oh, my darling, God, my dearest, Sweetheart, my dearest. sweetheart. Now, listen oh, to me, darling. you two. Listen, we face a problem. What problem? Well, how are you going to take her back to Sir Giles? How explain all this? Sir Giles will have you, have us, arrested for breaking and entering. She's not going back to Sir Giles. She's coming with me, away from this hellish place. Oh, my darling. You can't do that. Oh, she is his wife. I'll die before I let Sir Giles get his hand on that. Oh. A promise you may very well keep, my dear sir. What? How, how did you... The barking of my dog aroused me. I, in turn, roused my keepers who were out and about scouring the woods. As it happens, I came this way, saw the light of your lantern flickering in the vault, and prepared to surprise what I thought to be grave robbers. Well, as it happens, I am the one surprised. Indeed, I'm shocked. I scarcely expected to find Victorine alive. Yes, she's alive. And from here on, Sir Giles will live, I pray, a far happier life with me than ever she did with you. Move aside, sir. I think not. If you're going anywhere, my friend, you and your accomplice, it's to jail. As for my wife, since she is returned to life, she will also return to me. Oh, no! You don't move, sir, I warn you. For if you do, it will give me extreme pleasure to blow your head off with this gun. Extreme pleasure. I confess that at this point in Dr. Gordon Rainey's journal, I thought the tale over and done with. I was wrong. For really, it was only the beginning. I'll return shortly with Act Two. As I said, I thought that Dr. Gordon Rainey's story had come to an end. He had gone with his friend, Guy Peterson, to the vault where the woman he loved lay dead in her coffin, only to find her alive. And then, as he planned to run away with her to save her from further torments at the hands of her husband, he was stopped by the appearance of that same husband, gun in hand, promising to have him and Dr. Rainey jailed. Giles, I entreat you. Let them go. They've done no harm. On the contrary, if it hadn't been for Guy and Dr. Rainey, I'd even now be lying in my coffin, alive. Would that you were. Damn you, woman, would that you were. Your unexpected return from the grave will lose me a fortune. But how can my being alive cost you anything? Lady Hastings is a widow. Lady Hastings has an income of 30000 a year. I proposed marriage to her on Tuesday, and she accepted me. You... you proposed marriage to another woman three days after your wife died? Why not? 
I'm alive, very much alive. And to live, one needs money. Why the look, Dr. Rainey? You have more sense, it seems, than sensitivity, Sir Giles. <laughs> Insulting me will only worsen matters for you, Doctor, if that's possible. You can't be as unaware as you would like to seem that your career is ruined. A doctor, a physician, arrested for breaking and entering, breaking and entering a mortuary, a sacred repository of the dead. Sir Giles, you mustn't do this to Dr. Rainey. He helped me because he's my friend, a good and true friend. He was against it from the very start and would never have agreed to assist me had it not been for his deep and abiding sense of loyalty. Oh, do stop, do, or you shall have me in tears. Tears from a stone? <laughs> a miracle? Stone, oh. am I? Oh. Very well, then. Stone, stone that will crush you, dear wife. Crush you until the death you've escaped will seem a paradise to you. Put down that gun and I... Ah, but I've no intention of putting down the gun. Certainly not until the bailiff arrives and takes you into custody, to jail, where I shall see to it you rot, the two of you. What do you mean, rot? I mean, quite simply, that once you're put in jail, you will never leave it. You will rot there, Doctor. You make no sense, Sir Giles. The penalty for breaking and entering... Penalties? Who speaks of penalty? I do. There are laws. Laws in this nation. But only one law here, me. I am the law in the village of Buckingham. I am Buckingham. Oh, and he is. No, Sir Giles. You will not imprison this man for the rest of his life. Nor will you imprison me. Oh? And may I ask why not? Because I say so. Because I tell you so. No, don't look away. Look at me. Look into my eyes. Have the courage to look into them and tell me then. Will you imprison us? Mesmerism. Why, uh, why, such is my intention, yes? Is your intention, Sir Giles, or was? Well, uh, well, it uh, certainly was. I... I mean to say, well, the way you put it, most eloquently... Good Lord. It's working. He's doing it again. Doing what? And you, being a man of sensitivity, my eloquence, the, the validity of what I say, has touched you. Is that not so? It is so, isn't it? Oh, I, uh... uh yeah, yes, uh, uh, seen uh, in a different light, so to speak. Yes, it uh, it would serve no purpose, no purpose to put you in jail. Uh, none, none really. And so you let us go. You will let us go. Yes, yes, go. Get out of my sight, the two of you, and never come back. Let us leave, Guy. Victorine. Under the law, there's nothing we can do. She is his wife. I can't leave her. You must. The bailiff will be here any moment. And I can't dominate Sir Giles' will with mine much longer. Victorine. Go, my darling. What? To leave you with him? No, whatever happens to me will be harder to bear if you are in prison. Go, I entreat you. Go. Um, second thought. He's coming out of it. Guy, my friend, I've done all I can for you and I'll not see my career ruined because you... Because you're right. Goodbye, my darling. My, my dearest. Goodbye. Mesmerize me, Gordon. Do something. Do anything to relieve me of the torment. You must control yourself. I think of her, dream of her. She is never out of my thought, and, and always I am stricken with the thought that my very imaginings are as nothing to what he is really doing to her. The beatings, the starving of her, her very loneliness, the vile subjection to his passions. Oh, merciful heaven, I shall go out of my mind. Yes, Guy, you shall. Unless you pull yourself together. Now, if you don't stop thinking of her, if you don't stop letting your fancy invent miseries, she is very likely not suffering. You will go insane. You will. Someone at the door. Who? Were you expecting someone? No, who? no, no one. Whom would I want to see? I'll answer. 
Victorine. Save me, Gordon, save me. Good heavens. Come in, my dear. Guy, Guy, look, it's Victorine. Victorine? Oh, it is. It is. My dearest, I what... could bear it no more. Oh, yes. Oh, hold me in your arms. Hold me. Oh, Victorine. He may kill me, but I'll never go back. Never. He never loved me. And now he hates me because I keep him from marrying Lady Hastings and her fortune. And makes me pay. Oh, save me from him. Never. Let him take me back. Gordon, she's fainting. Here, Victorine, uh, some brandy. Oh. Uh, uh, lie down uh, on the couch. Yeah. There, my love. Lie back. Relax. Uh, let me take over, Guy. Uh, go and bar the door. And bar it solidly. Bar the... He must know she has fled and to where she has fled. And he cannot risk her out of his sight because... Because what? Damn it, what? Say it! Let me say it for him. Because uh, once again I am near death. No! Yes. Unless I can find rest. Unless I can feel myself safe from him. I shall die. You will not. I want to die. Now stop talking, man. For once, act. Uh, now bar that door. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, too oh. late, too late. No, I, I threw the bolt. Uh, not enough. Open up. Open up, I say. I'll have the door broken down. Gordon, what's going on? Well, unless you want a smashed door with nothing gained, open it. Open to here. Open. He'll take her back to Buckingham. Yes, he will. She's his wife. There's nothing you can do. Now, damn you all. At it again, are you? Stealing my wife. Taking what belongs to me. You men. Take her. No. Over my no. dead body. I Take her. Back. No. Enough. Oh, enough. Stand back or I'll brain you with this candlestick. All right, then. Now, you'll be next, my friend. If you don't... Very well. Move back. You, uh... You're quite a hand with a candlestick, Dr. Rainey. Yes. You've laid my man out. I trust you know what this means for you. Perhaps you should consider what it means... For you, Sir Giles. Me, sir? Yes, you're not in Buckingham now. You're in London. Seeking a wife who's run from her husband to her lover. No, sir. A woman who has come to her doctor. What? What do you say? Your... Your wife is dangerously ill. You have only to use your eyes to see that. I, being her friend, I am sure she sought me at my residence. And, not finding me there, came here. Adroit... Most adroit, Dr. Rainey. Uh, may I ask, then, uh, if you prescribed for her illness? Uh, not as yet, Sir Giles. Ah, but you will. Yes. Not good enough, Dr. Rainey. As her husband, or lawful husband, I intend to take her back with me to Buckingham. Uh, Victorine, my darling, come with me. No. Oh, really, now, you've no choice. No. Take your hands off her. No. You guy, if you have no recourse... In the eyes of the law, she is his wife. He wants her, and you cannot keep her from him. Sensibly said, Doctor. Here, dear wife, good wife, faithful and loyal wife, take my hand and let me help you from off that couch. Take my hand. Vile. You are vile. Filthy. Foul. I shall never touch you again. I'd rather burn off my hands than touch you, you evil man. I'll die rather than go back with you. Die. Damn you, come. No. 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 Gordon. She is dead. Oh, no. Are you sure, Doctor? She was pronounced dead once before, you know. There is no pulse. I can detect no vital signs. To all intents and purposes, she is dead. <laughs> ah, you modern-day doctors, always escaping in words and phrases, to all intents and purposes, uh, which is to say, you're not sure. Who is sure of anything, Sir Giles? However, considering what has gone before, we will keep her here under observation for a few days. You'll do nothing of the sort. 
You men, pick her up and bear her to my carriage. No! Wait, what are you doing? Possessing myself of my property, sir. Whether it be alive or dead. But you can't do this. You Take can't her do... to my carriage. Gordon! Uh, there is nothing either of us can do. And Guy, she is dead. I'm virtually sure of that. But if she is not... Don't trouble yourself. Your own friend, the man you trust, Dr. Gordon Rainey, has pronounced her death. All I intend to do is see that she is properly buried. This time, to stay properly buried. Is she dead? You must understand, in those days, more than half a century ago, one was never sure... I'll return shortly for Act Three. Think for a moment how you would feel if you thought someone you loved might conceivably have been buried alive. And you will understand the feelings of young Guy Peterson. Think again how you would feel... If you were a close friend of Guy's, a physician who risks his career every time he consents to help Guy spirit his beloved from her tomb. And you will then understand why Dr. Gordon Rainey wrote in his journal, I feel if Guy is not mad, he is close to it. He has never been a robust man, but on the contrary, something of a neurotic. So it was that I refused, and again refused when he begged... Help me. I beg you, Gordon, help me. That is what I am trying to do, by refusing what you ask. We were caught in the act of entering the Buckingham Vault the first time. We would surely be caught a second. There could be no doubt that Sir Giles is having the place guarded. If there's a guard, we'll get past him somehow, or knock him unconscious, or... Oh, yes, you you could mesmerize him as you did that dog and, and Sir Giles. Guy, my dear, good friend, listen to me. First... Victorine is dead. How can you say that? She suffers, she must suffer from some sort of malady that makes her only appear to be dead. There are such maladies. Yes, everything you say is true, but... You admit she could yet be alive. Buried alive in that tomb even now. Now Stop that. Stop it. The second thing I was going to point out is that mesmerism doesn't always work. Some people, the kind of peasant type who'd likely be guarding the vault, cannot be brought under the hypnotic influence. Yes, but... And the third thing is this. I am a doctor. If I get caught again, Sir Giles could end my career. And all I have tried to be, all the good I can accomplish in this world, would be set at naught. I'm sorry, Guy. I cannot risk it again. Then I must do it alone. You will not do it alone. You cannot stop me. No one, nothing can stop me from rescuing Victorine from that vault. Guy, you are mad. You are thinking irrationally, acting senseless. That's my concern. And certainly no longer yours. Oh, Guy, Guy. Leave me, Gordon. I must prepare for the journey to Salisbury. Well, leave, I said. Oh, no. I'll go with you. You've changed your mind? I have not. But this is a mad business, and I'm a fool to help you, but I am also your friend. Gordon? Yes. The vault is guarded. Yes. I see the man. (laughs) A big brute he is. Do you think you can mesmerize him? Bring him under? Uh, What did you call it? Hypnotic influence? I doubt it. He's the type I told you about. All muscle and little brain. It's a dark night to make things worse. You wouldn't be able to see my eyes clearly. Do... Do you dare try? Well, I have no choice. But keep this in mind, Guy. Yes? If I fail, as I most certainly shall, run for it. Do you understand? Don't try to fight him. Run. Yes. Whatever you say. All right. Now then, let's step out of these bushes... And walk toward him. Say and do nothing. Leave things to me. Come. Who's there? Oh, uh, uh, don't shoot, friends. And stand where you be. Uh, let me have a look at you. Of course. We mean no harm, friend. We are simply two gentlemen who got lost in these woods. 
And so... But how come you're lost? This here is Buckingham Manor. And it's surrounded all of it with an iron fence. Yes. How come um, you got in? Well, uh, we really don't know. It's a dark night, uh, and our eyes, our eyes couldn't see much. <laughs> a likely story. You must believe me. My sight is very poor, as it is. Very poor. Uh, look for yourself. Look into my eyes and see for yourself. Yeah, now, what is this? Look into your eyes. It's up to the manor house with you two. Well, your answer to Sir Giles for trespassing on his... Guy, that takes care of him. You, you, you stabbed him. You couldn't control him. I said to run if I couldn't, but... Oh, Guy, I think you've killed him. Quickly, into the vault. Wait. What's happened to you? Don't, don't you realize that you've just murdered a man and it's... Oh, you've gone mad. You have gone mad. I am as sane as you. But mad or sane, I must get Victorine out of that vault. Now, come. All right, all right, but heaven help me. What have I got myself into now? Oh, pry bar, pry bar, pry bar. Where is it? I Where? Well, you had it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I must hurry. Hurry, she's alive in there. Her cough on alive. I must... There. Come along, Lord. Come along. All right, all right. Uh, there. there. There's a coffin. Yes. Look fast. Get the lid off. Insane. It's gone insane. Victorine? Can you hear me? Are you alive, my dearest? Perhaps fainted. Oh, huh, Gordon? That's possible, isn't it? Alive, but in a faint? Oh, Guy, my poor dear friend. There. Lid's off, and she... She... Dead. As I told you, dead. Well, we can't be sure. You know we can't be sure. Guy, in the name of reason... Help me! Help me get her out of the coffin. To what purpose? We'll take her back with us to London and... Take her back where? To my place. The first place Sir Giles will come to. Then to yours. Mine. Do you realize what you're asking of me? If you're the friend you claim to be... But, but... what you ask is impossible. You've already made me your unwitting accomplice to murder and now... Guy, you are out of your mind. And you, Gordon, are no friend. Guy. Guy, I beg you, leave her where she is. She's dead. Leave her at peace. She is not dead. And I am taking her back to London. If whoever may read these pages of my journal thinks me a fool, I could not agree more. But Guy was my closest friend and, what's more, was clearly deranged by the love he bore Victorine and his horror of letting her be buried alive. So we took her body to my rooms in London. Three days, she lay on the couch in my sitting room, Guy never leaving her side night or day. But on the third day, I knew something must be done to end this madness of his. Look at her. There's no sign, not one of decomposition. Yes, because it is the middle of winter and we've kept the windows open and no fire in the fireplace. The sitting room of mine is a virtual ice house. No, I know. Now listen to me. What you persist in doing is not only lunacy, it is sacrilege. The dead deserve decent burial. If you love Victorine, as you say you do, let us bury her, Guy. Bury her tonight. Where? Then you will. Yes. Where can we take her? Well, I thought of that and prepared for it. A grave awaits her body in St. Pancras Cemetery. All is arranged. We can take her now under cover of night. <sighs> then... Let us do it. Good, good. Now, I've kept my carriage waiting below. Uh, do you want to carry her, or shall I? Let me. It will be the last time I hold it in my arms. All right. Pick her up, Guy. Yes. Yes. Gordon? Oh. Gordon, what was that? It's nothing. Come on, let's go downstairs. But, but she gave a sigh when I picked her up. Guy. You heard? Gordon, you heard. Good Lord, I did. Here, move aside. She's alive. I I knew it. I, alive. Quiet, man. In heaven's name, be quiet. Uh, Victorine. Victorine, do you hear me? Yeah. I have taken your hand in mine. Do you feel it? No. Can you open your eyes? If you can, open them. She has. Gordon, 
She's gazing at me. Victorine, do you see Guy? Farewell. Farewell. I am near death. No. Only a spark of life remains. No. Oh. No, she must not die. Gordon, stop her. What are you saying? Mesmerism. The hypnotic influence. Use it. Are you mad? Use it? How? Command her not to die. Command her to live. Command her to live? Command what to live? When there was scarce a breath of life in her, her, her mind, her spirit, what? But I did it. May God, in his infinite mercy, forgive me. I did it. Using the powers of mesmerism, I held her eyes with mine and commanded her, forced her to live. Even though, over and over, she cried out... I am dead! Let me go! I'm dead! But I did not let her go, could not let her go, because... Yes, I confess it. Because the experiment fascinated me. I, Dr. Gordon Rainey, committed for over five long weeks, committed the sin, the crime, the sacrilege of holding the spirit within a dead body to this earth, even though it pleaded, entreated, begged... Release me! Oh, release me! In a short time. Yes. But tell me first. What are you? Spirit? Soul? Mind? What? I am dead. 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 What's that? Someone at the door. I'll answer. You! Found you at last, eh, you damn grave robber? Sir Giles. Yes, and you, Dr. Rainey, who so helped me, will no longer be called doctor when I'm through with you. No, Giles, no. Oh, what's this? She lives? No, Sir Giles, But she... she speaks. I heard her speak. Here. Let me see for myself. Stay away from her. Don't you touch her. Get out of my way, you... Don't touch her, I said. Don't touch her. Oh. You shot him. You killed Guy. Before he stabbed me to death, as he stabbed my servant. Self-defense, sir. And now enough of this. I came for my wife's body, but it appears I shall be taking a wife back to Buckingham Manor with me. Rouse her. Rouse her at once. I cannot, Sir Giles. She is dead. Has been dead for more than six weeks. Well, I heard her speak. Yes. But it was her soul. Her spirit, I don't know what, but not her body. Her body is dead. Yes, dead. I beg you, don't hold me any longer. Guy is here, let me go to him. I say to you that I am dead. Let me go. She comes with me. No. She goes where she should have gone long since now, had it not been for me. Victorine, I release you. Go. And in the sanctity of death, join the lover you never had in life. <laughs> What's happening? Her body. Her body is disintegrating before my eyes. Rotting. Moldering. Horrible. indeed it was. For using Edgar Allan Poe's own words, upon the couch there now lay not the body of Victorine, but a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, detestable putrescence. Mr. Poe's words, mind, when he set out to horrify you, he horrified you. I'll be back shortly. Premature Burial is only one of a number of stories by the master Edgar Allan Poe I've had the pleasure of bringing you. We now owe, and generations to come will owe, so much to his imagination, his vibrant fancy, 
that it might be nice to think of him now and then. Let his name pass through your thoughts as it does through mine. And to wish him well, wherever he may be. Our cast included Keir DeLay, Paul Hecht, Guy Sorrell, and Marion Selvers. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. What is her condition? Well, it's not fatal, thank God. Not even very serious. Badly bruised, uh, cut over her right eye, but she's going to be all right. The monster failed to make good his threat to kill her. We may indeed, thank God for that. Well, at least we know more than we did before, Monsieur Dupin. We know that the murderer is a big man, a huge man of unbelievable strength, and that he has black hair. We know a great deal more than that, Pierre. We do? Well, I do, and so do you. Only, as I've said before, you don't know you know. Oh, monsieur, monsieur, I do not have your brilliant brain. Well, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that you can solve this awful mystery, that you can save Yvette. The murderer failed this time, but he'll try again. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. is Edgar Allan Poe Week continues the first anniversary celebration of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater on KRNT Des Moines Standing in the doorway of the diabolic, the dangerous, the deadly. And in a minute or so, you will hear one of the strangest tales we've ever told. A story unlike any we have ever poured into your willing ears. Because this is a story about a man you knew only too well. A man who personified the diabolic, the dangerous, the deadly... To an entire generation, a man the world will never forget or forgive. Our mystery drama, The Rise and Fall of the Fourth Reich, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Robert Dryden and Paul Hecht. is Mexico City, a noisy, bustling city, full of people and automobile traffic. Right now, we're standing at the intersection of the Paseo de la Reforma and the Avenida de los Insurgentes. We're watching a black thunderbird make its way down the avenue and then turn into the narrow, crazy quilt streets of the makeshift neighborhood they call the Ciudadas Perdidas, one of the lost cities built by the squatters. There are two men in that automobile. One of them is a man of 71 years, and his name is Dr. Hans Bundeschaff. The other is a man who has many names, so we'll let him introduce himself. You can call me Gunther. When I lived in London, I used the name George Brighton. When I lived in New York, I called myself... <sighs> What's the difference? Now I'm in Mexico. And my name is Gunther Binder. And that's good enough. Gunther, is that the building? Yes, yes, looks like it. Do you have the photograph with you? Yeah, right here in the envelope. Hmm? Ah, 
Yes, 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 that's the building, Doctor, but... But it looks empty, even abandoned. If our information is correct, and if God is with us, there is still one occupant. As we mounted the stairs of the ancient building, it was hard to believe that the information was correct, or that God was even aware of this dingy hovel on the edge of nowhere. But then we were at the door of the third floor back apartment... And it was obvious that no lock was necessary because no thief could be interested in what might lie behind that door. But we were very interested. We had spent a lifetime seeking it. Or rather, seeking him. Gunther. Gunther, look. Dear Lord. He doesn't look alive. Yes, yes, but he's breathing. You can see him breathe. Doctor, how can we be sure? He doesn't look like... There's barely any resemblance. He's 86 years old, Gunther. What did you expect? But... But we are sure it's him? There's no question of verification. It's him. The one we have sought for so long. I must try to speak to him. He's unconscious. He won't hear you. I must try. My Führer, my Führer, can you hear me? My Führer, we have come to take you home. But our work was just beginning. First, we emptied the trunk of our rented automobile and I brought the heavy black suitcase containing Dr. Bundeschaff's apparatus up the three flights of rickety stairs. Fortunately, the man we had found in the third floor back apartment was the building's only occupant, so our thumping and bumping didn't disturb anyone, not even the man himself, who remained comatose throughout, his breathing growing more labored all the time. We'll have to use the oxygen soon. I think he's suffering from cardiac insufficiency. Are we too late, Doctor? No, no, he's lasted this long. He'll last until we're ready. We'll have to... Clean up this place, too. It's it's filthy. Our informant said there was an old lady who took care of him. Yeah, I've seen her. She came around while we were bringing the trunks upstairs. She, she asked me about El Ciego. El Ciego? That means the blind one. I, is he blind? Mm. Cataracts. Thick as bottles over both eyes. But don't worry, Gunther. We'll take care of that, too. Our Fuhrer will see again. Our Fuhrer will see the coming glory. Uh, what did you tell the old woman? <laughs> Something that didn't surprise her. I told her, El este muerto. He is dead. El este muerto. Yes. Of course, the old lady believed it, and so did the rest of the world. Because our Führer had arranged it that way, in one of the most subtly conceived and well-executed deceptions in history, a plan formulated long before the first excavation of the Führer bunker below the Chancellery. I remember that day in Berlin, when the operative we called Leopard came up with the exciting news. I'm telling you, it's true. I got the information straight from the engineer in charge of the construction. But what happened? How did they find the tunnel? They were making a foundation for a new apartment building in the Hansa Quarter. And the whole thing collapsed. That's how they uncovered it. Six miles long, Gunther. Leading straight from the chancellery to what must have been a secret airfield. That's just speculation. Hear the rest of it. There's a barn at the site. Or what's left of a barn. But there isn't any loft or stables or anything you might expect to find in a barn. You mean it was used as a hangar? Nobody wants to believe it. Not officially. Or they'll claim that Hitler never carried out his escape plan. Mm, but you think otherwise. What I believe is the Fuhrer confided his true intentions only to Bormann and Goebbels. All the others in the bunker were kept in the dark so they could testify to the authorities about his so-called suicide and Viking funeral. Good Lord. But but the body in the blanket, the body that Heinz Linger burned. It was a corpse that he burned. But not the corpse of Adolf Hitler. I simply can't believe it. You remember Bormann's statement that the face had to be covered because it was disfigured? Yes. Gunther, 
the face was covered because it was the face of some orderly, not the face of their Führer. And now that face was in front of me, his face. The little square mustache gone, the black hair with its slanted lock across that famous forehead gone. The lips that had once blared out martial music loud enough to stir the world had vanished into a black, toothless hole. The eyes that had given hypnotic guidance to millions looked out blindly through thick, gray windows. I stared at that face, and I turned to Dr. Bundeschaff. Doctor, doctor, is it really possible... Can we make him smile again? It is possible, Gunther. We can make him smile and feel happiness for the future. But first, we must make him understand. Shall I increase the pressure, Doctor? Yes. Yes. Slowly, slowly. He doesn't seem to respond to anything. I'm not a physician. I know my opinion doesn't matter. He's not in coma, Gunther. This condition of his is more resignation. He is... Stop caring about being alive. His skin color is changing. More pressure, Gunther. The needle is near the danger mark. More pressure, I say. We are pumping too fast, Doctor. Look at his skin. He's turning purple. Another minute. We must improve his heart action. You'll kill him this way. He's too old to stand this. Look, look, look. He's trying to speak. What's he saying? Quick, quick, kill the pump. Cansado. Cansado. It's not German. No, Gunther. It isn't German. But don't forget he's lived outside of Germany for 30 years. What does he say? He says that he is tired. Very tired. He wants us to leave him in peace. My Führer. My Führer, listen to me. Do you think he hears you? Look, look, look at his eyes. He's blind. He knows someone is here, Gunther. My Führer. Yes. Yes, my Führer. I know. I know you are tired. But now you can sleep. And when you wake, we will give you the future. It was another 24 hours before Stiller arrived. Stiller was a doctor, too, but he was able to do something that Dr. Bundeschaff could never do. He was an ophthalmologist, and he would apply his surgeon's skill to the cataracts that prevented our Führer from seeing the men who had come to restore him to power. I'll do what I can, Hans. But don't expect me to perform miracles. Well, why not, Stiller? We have performed one. We have found him. It's not enough simply to remove the cataracts. He'll need to be fitted with special glasses. Perhaps not. Not after our endocrine treatment. Hans, you still persist in this dream. I know what I have accomplished before. I know what I can accomplish now. But this challenge is too great. A man of his age, in his condition... I will need your assistance, Schiller. Gunther is a fine young man, but he he lacks professional skill. I'm an eye doctor, Hans. I know nothing about glands and hormones and all your other mysteries. Please, please, Stella, help me. Help me make it worthwhile for those eyes to see again. All right, Hans. If you can believe in miracles, I suppose I can, too. The operation was performed. From Stiller's point of view, it was a success. The gray clouds covering the old man's eyes were lifted. But it was only after new strength was pumped relentlessly into his bloodstream, after stimulants had excited the action of his heart and liver and pancreas and nervous system, did we see any reaction or result. And then, the moment arrived. The moment when Adolf Hitler opened his eyes and spoke to us. Who are you? Did you hear me? Who are you? What do you want of me? We we are your subjects. What? Your subjects, my Führer. You are mad. 
You are all mad. I am no one. Let me alone. Let me die. No, no, my Führer. You will not die. Stop calling me that. My name is Marcus. Please, please listen to me carefully, my Führer. My name is Hans Bundeschaff. I am a doctor, an endocrinologist. I served your cause for many years. I have performed thousands of experiments on behalf of the Reich. Experiments probing into the very core of life itself. Yeah, please. You must stop this. I will not hear more of this talk. These lies. I am nothing but an old man. My Fjord, please uh, hear me out. While you were bringing Germany victories on the battlefield, I was seeking victory in the laboratory. I failed just as we all did. Failed? Failed? We were betrayed. Yes, yes, betrayed, of course. And out of that betrayal, we were defeated. But out of that defeat may now come victory. Victory? What are you saying? He speaks the truth, my fear. Who are you? I, I am Gunther. Gunther Binder, your subject too. This is madness. I know that I was too young to serve your cause when you first brought glory to our nation, but but my father served it and died for it. And now I want to be part of the new glory. New glory? What are you raving about? Lunatics! Tell him, doctor, please. No, Gunther. You tell him. All right, all right, I will. My fear... Uh, we have come to restore you to power. As you can see, we have found ourselves in the middle of a horror story. A nightmare made all the more terrifying because of the reality that inspired it. But can Dr. Hans Bundeschaff make good on his incredible promise? Can a handful of men, even with the decayed body of a former tyrant create a fourth Reich in the world. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Strange things are taking place in a near-abandoned hovel on the edge of Mexico City. The third floor back apartment has been converted into a clean white box of a room filled with gleaming chrome apparatus and the smell of strong chemicals. But there is something more than medical progress being discussed. For the men who have gathered in this room are discussing surgery on the world. Don't misunderstand, my Führer. We are not men of politics. We know there are others who can guide you better than we. Politics? I know nothing of politics. Why should an old man know anything but the water he drinks, the food he puts into his mouth? But you remember this much, my Führer. You remember that politics is power. Nothing more. Power? <laughs> and is that what you offer me? Are you my army? My legions? Is this... My new chancellery? But we speak of a different power now. There is only one power. Strength. And I have none. Yeah, look at me. I am old. Died. But the power we are talking about is strength. Strength. Life. Youth. Youth. Now I know you are mad. You would make me young again? Yes. Yes, my Führer. We can give you back the years that were lost in Germany when you so wisely escaped from Berlin. We don't know how many years we can promise you or how much vitality we can restore. But it will suffice for your return to the fatherland. Hans, look at him. His eyes. Madness. All madness. It is enough for now, Hans. Let him rest. 
You've troubled him enough. We must make him understand it's no good unless he realizes. I don't know. Stella is right. He has stopped listening to us. We will speak to him again. Later. It was later, all right. Almost two weeks later before we heard the voice of Adolf Hitler again. But Bundeshoff was a busy man during that two-week period. I had expected him to begin the restosterone treatments first, but instead he chose to administer massive doses of vitamins. And then he began a series of amphetamine injections whose effects he watched with concern for the stamina of Hitler's heart. But the Führer survived. And then Bundeshoff began the critical phase, the hormonal injections which he had used to restore temporary youth to gray-haired rodent veterans of the laboratory. Stiller and I watched the procedure in awe and skepticism. A man isn't a rat, Hans. It's simply not the same thing. We have had similar results with primate Stiller. Don't tell me now that a man is not an ape. I still cannot believe in this miracle of yours. But he is stronger. You can see that for yourself. He grows stronger every day. Mm. But will he grow younger? We'll soon know. And then, on the night of the tenth day, we were awakened by a horrendous cry. My God! My God, what is it? It's him! The Führer! must not be bound by existing legal regulations. The Führer is leader of the nation, supreme commander of the armed forces, head of government, supreme executive chief, supreme justice, and leader of the party. He's out of the head. Yes, yes, my Führer, my Führer, please, yeah. easy, easy. Lie back, yeah. lie back and relax. Yeah. yeah. I must conserve my strength. Yes, yes, that's right, you must. My strength is the strength of Germany. Seems to have gone back to sleep. Yes. Yes, he sleeps. And this time, his dreams are brighter. Much brighter, Gunther. <laughs> Führer's dreams were brighter, but Dr. Bundeshoff's dream began to fade as the days wore on. Despite daily massive doses of the hormonal formula, there seemed to be little change in the years that lined the face of Adolf Hitler, and Stiller began to question whether the dream would ever be fully realized. Hans, why do you persist? I was never convinced that your primate experiments were valid. Everyone has been skeptical. Most of all, myself. But I know it is true, Stella. You should have conducted other human experiments first. To begin with this there one. There could not be a more important beginning. Or ending. Didn't you have many deaths? Even among your apes? Yes, yes, there were errors. A sudden change in the androgen balance can sometimes be dangerous. And if such a change occurs now, what will you have? A dead old man? No. No, this is one thing we must not have. Merely a dead old man. And so the experiment went on day after day, until finally some improvement began to appear. Blood pressure? Almost in the normal range. Mm. Red blood cell count? Not much improvement yet. Muscle tone? Well, that's hard to say, Doctor. His skin seems firmer to the touch, more elastic. You see, Stiller? One improvement after another. Do you still think we will fail? It's a question of time, Hans. But do you have enough time? Yes, yes, time. Time is the enemy. We're in a race. All right. We will double our efforts by doubling the dosages. But that might kill him. The, the, the shock. We will have to try, Gunther. So we doubled the dosages. The risk was great, but Dr. Bundeshoff was encouraged by Hitler's ability to withstand the initial treatment. 
There was only one problem. The increased dosages seemed to affect his mind. And days of delirium followed. Yeah, fools. All fools. Our enemies are enemies of themselves. What is he saying, Gunther? I can't make it out. Britain. Britain is a dying empire. Dying. America is trying to be its heir. Russia wants the Balkans. Deprive them of the belief that victory is certain. We must show them that they can never reckon on our capitulation. Never. Never. Doctor, yeah. don't you think this is dangerous? No, no, no. Let him carry on. Smash the Americans. Forty-five German divisions. His voice grows stronger. Get me, General Collar. He may be unhinged, Doctor. Then all this would have been for nothing. We must wait and see. There must be no holding back now. No commander must hold back his forces. Disobedience will be punished by death. Kala, Kala, I, I hold you personally responsible. Do you understand? What is he saying? Who are those people? He commands generals who are gone. I say hey. that he's mad. I say this whole experiment is mad. No, no, Kala. The fear only dreams. He must dream of yesterday before he can dream of tomorrow. The second miracle took place that same day. Here, Jeffrey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lift him carefully. Here. So, Here, Doctor. Now, let me help you. Sorry. Are you sure it's all right to do this, Hans? Yes. Yes, I think we can. All the life signs are encouraging. His pulse, his color, his blood pressure. Even his eyes seem to be in better focus, Doctor. I think he's beginning to see us. Ah. His lips are moving. He does. He does see us. My Führer. My yeah. Führer. Can you hear me? Huh? Can you understand what I am saying? My Führer. Who... Are you? I told you my name. It is Bundeschaff. You are German? Yes. Yes. I am German. And I am a physician. Why are you here? What is your purpose here? My purpose is reincarnation, my Führer. There is no such thing. Then I will use the word rejuvenation. You can make people young again. It has been my goal for all the years of my life. And where were you, doctor, during the war? I was assigned by the SS to Dachau to participate in the noble experiments of racial hygiene. But I convinced my superior, Dr. Sigmund Rosser, that I would be better utilized in research, which would uncover the mysteries of the aging process. Uh, I know of no such experiment. It was to be Dr. Rosser's surprise present to you, my Führer, a gift such as no loyal subject had yet given you, the secret of eternal youth itself. And so, what became of this gift? Dr. Rosser abandoned the experiments after our early failures. Like Steinach and Voronov before us, our efforts produced only short-lived improvement in the aged. We were forced to conclude that the testes of man were useful only in the formation of spermatozoa and the secretion of hormone. Yeah, yeah, I understand nothing of this. That even the synthesis of testosterone was of no great consequence, although testosterone was one of the chemicals I still employ in the process. What process? The process I developed in Stockholm where I worked after the war. It is no magic formula, my Führer. It is a synergistic group of chemicals which I believe will eventually lead to an acceptable method of human rejuvenescence. He, is it true? Is what you say really true? It is. It is all true, my dear. You can make me as I was? We can do only so much. But it will be enough for the cause. Enough to make the world tremble at your resurrection from the dead. The world. And when you make your reappearance at the proper time, in the proper place, it will be like a lightning bolt illuminating the planet. That is our hope, my Führer. We wish it to be your hope, too. Hope. But I had abandoned it. 
30 years ago. But we bring you hope again, my Führer. Hope for a new beginning. The beginning of the next thousand years. Tell us. Tell us your thoughts. Tell us what you wish. Very well. I will tell you what I wish. I wish for something to eat. And with those words, we knew that it was going to work. That our Führer was back among us again. That the day of the Fourth Reich had dawned. The Fourth Reich sends shivers up and down your back, doesn't it? But the idea has created ecstasy in that small room in Mexico City as three men watch eagerly as Adolf Hitler dines. His appetite used to be greater. He could swallow whole countries at one sitting. Now he seems to be content with a bowl of soup. But if he has a new chance at power, well, let's wait and see what happens when I return with Act Three. Still exciting events occurring for doctors Bundeschaff and Stiller and the young man who calls himself Gunther. The same excitement parents feel when their child takes his first hesitant step. Because now, Adolf Hitler is taking his. Careful. Carefully now, don't overdo it. My limbs are still so, so weak. Take my arm, my Führer. No, no, no. I can do it alone. I must do it alone. Good, good. Now, uh, only this far, my Führer. Just to the chair. Yes. Yes, I can. I can do it. There. Ah, you did it. I knew you could. And now... I want to see a mirror. A mirror? You heard what I said. I wish to look at myself. It's all right, Gunther. There's a mirror advisor in my bag. Let him look into that. Yes, 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 of course. Ah, here it is. Yeah. Is that me? Yes. Yes, my Fiora, you can see how much you have changed since our arrival. How much firmer your flesh has become. How much improved the color of your skin is. But I am still hairless. Yes, yes. The hormonal treatments cannot restore your hair. If anything, they do the opposite. But there is still something we can do about that. False hair. A week? Like a woman? For the image, my Führer. Only for the sake of your image. Uh. A wig... A moustache, so that all those who see you will know and remember. Yeah. Yeah. That must be done. For the sake of my people, I must return to my people the way they remember me. Within the week, it was accomplished. Stiller found the appropriate adornments, a hairpiece that vaguely resembled Hitler's own. The moustache was easier to find. When we looked at the effect, we all shuddered in ecstasy. And when Hitler himself saw the image, it did as much for him as all of Bundeschaft's formulas and vitamins and injections. Uh, but the Führer became impatient. Now, I tell you, I'm ready now. Your miracle has worked. Dr. Bundeschatz, you have done what you claimed you could do. Now I am ready to return to my people, to my country, to the world. There must be no undue haste, my Führer. The timing of your appearance must be right, tell him, Gunther. It's true, my Führer. The entire movement must be carefully prepared for the putsch that will bring you back to power. Then prepare them. Tell them I am here. 
I know they have been waiting for me as I waited for them for long, empty years after the war. And they well, never dreamed that their talk would be led by their beloved Führer himself. But now they must know. They will, my Führer. In time they will. But the world has changed since you went into exile. Fool! Do you think I managed to live to this age of mine? An outcast? A useless derelict? By feeding on the past? No. No, what sustained me was the future. Always the thought of the future. That was wise. For years after my exile, I considered the means whereby the Reich would rise again. I knew the day of great land armies was over and finished. Of armadas and armor and massive bombing. I knew that victory was now determined by a handful of excited atoms. Yes. Yes, you are quite correct, my Führer. That would be my plan of conquest for the Reich. My warriors would be atomic guerrillas. Please. Don't excite yourself. Then tell them, Bundeshoff. Tell them I am ready. Yes, my Führer. We will communicate with the Fatherland and tell them. Dr. Stiller left us that afternoon. He had a serious operation to perform on the retina of a close friend. It didn't matter, however, his part in the experiment was over. Mine, though, was still important. I left the small room on a series of errands, shopping for the vegetable staples which constituted the diet of Adolf Hitler, buying pharmaceutical supplies and picking up a large, flat box at a tailor shop whose proprietor seemed mystified by what he had just delivered into my hands. Here it is, Doctor. Yes, yes, it's perfect. Exactly what we wanted. And now to find out how well it fits. Twenty minutes later, Adolf Hitler was in full uniform. He stepped out in front of us, a willing model, turning to give his audience the full benefit of the effect. His right hand was on his hip. The left, still useless from the bomb damage that had destroyed his nerves, was held rigidly at his side. An iron cross hung from the breast pocket, and there was a black, white, and red armband circling his left arm, the sign of the broken cross. But there was one other thing in the image before us, the most electrifying sight of all. Adolf Hitler was smiling. They call you Günther. Yes, my Führer. I will call you Günther, too. Thank you, my Führer. You will be rewarded, Günther. You and Dr. Bundeschaff and Dr. Stiller. You will all three be at my side in the coming days of victory. You will be privileged to witness the birth of true peace in this world. True peace, Günther. You know what that is? No, my Führer. Not the peace of blind pacifists. Peace not supported on the palm leaf fans of tearful pacifist mourning women, but founded on the victorious sword of a lordly people that puts the world to work for a higher culture. Do you understand, Günther? Yes. Yes, of course. Why are you sweating? What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing, sir. I, I, I am just overwhelmed. My Führer, please, please, you must not excite yourself. Steiner friends. must counterattack the Russians. The Luftwaffe ground troops must be alert. Please, you must sit again. You stood too long. Ah. Ah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, I must sit down. And you, Gunther, you must come here. Go ahead, Gunther. Gunther, kneel down. Yes, my Führer. I am kneeling. Gunther, you must take this. No, no, my Führer, not the Iron Cross. It is yours. No, no, no. 
I wish you to have it. I wish you to have it from your Führer's own hand. For bravery in battle. For exemplifying the ideals of Aryan manhood. Here, Günther, my son. I give you... Uh, wait. What is that? What, my Führer? This... This chain around your neck. Only a chain, my Führer? But this... This ornament hanging from it... It's not an ornament, my Führer. It is a symbol. It is called the Star of David. What? The Star of David? The Jewish Star of David? It was given to me by my father... No, not... Not from his hand directly. He was... He was dead when I received it. Wunderschaff! Wunderschaff! Do you hear this? You are harboring a traitor! A traitor! The truth is, I took it from his body. I was only five years old at the time, but... I had the sense to take it from him before it was taken... By the guards at Auschwitz. Bundeshaft! Do you hear? Kill him! Kill him! We are betrayed! It's taken me 36 years to get here, my Führer. 36 years after my holiday in Auschwitz. 34 years after Dr. Russia froze my mother and father to death before my eyes. My naked mother and father lying on the ground while the guards poured water over their bodies and grumbled that they had to crack the ice before the water would pour. Wunderschaff! Quickly! He, he means to hurt me! Yes, I hear the sound of the cracking uh, ice always in my ears, and the sound of that water splashing, and the sound of my mother's voice begging for a quicker death, begging for something that you won't be denied! Good Lord. Adolf! Good Lord, stop, that's enough. No, doctor, not enough! Wunderschaff! He has a knife! A scalpel, Adolf. A scalpel for the final incision. Ah! My God. Bondershoff, help me. He he has cut my wrist wide open. I am bleeding. Gudra, Gudra, why? Why did you do this? Save me, Doctor. We have been betrayed once again. Betrayed by... Oh, Gudra, Gudra. Why couldn't you have waited... Why couldn't you let us bring him home and share your vengeance? What are you saying? Bundeshaf, not you too. You are not part of this betrayal. No. No, my fear. Not part of a betrayal. Nearly part of a revenge. But... I thought you were a good German, a loyal German. Yes, yes, I was that, my Führer, until I was brought to your service in Dachau and learned what loyalty meant to those who served depraved animals. I, you, you, the bleeding. Hey, stop, please, the bleeding. No, no, doctor, I, let it happen here and now. Uh, but why? Why did you do this? Why did you give me back my strength, my hope? I was a dying old man. Why did you make me into, into this, only to murder me? You don't know. You don't understand, my Führer. No. Why? Why? Tell him, Gunther. Who cared about destroying a dying old man? What good was our vengeance unless you had strength and hope? Now, do you understand, my Führer? And so, Adolf Hitler dies... Not in the bunker beneath the chancellery in Berlin, but in a dingy, deserted rooming house in Mexico City. There will be no Viking funeral for him this time. No obituaries, no mourners. Just a memory. A very bad memory. But one which no man 
can ever afford to forget. I'll be back shortly. You know, some people might find it hard to believe the story you've just heard, either because they can't accept the idea that Hitler might still be alive, or they can't accept the idea of rejuvenation. Well, I can't prove the first part, but I think I can support the second, because I know a prime example of rejuvenation. It's called radio drama. We hope you agree. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Robert Dryden, Joe Silver, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. G. Marshall. This is going to be a story that's almost unbelievable. Almost. A thing will happen which people, scientists included, will tell you cannot possibly happen. As your parents or grandparents were told that radio could not happen, television, heavier than air flight, and space travel could not happen. The thing is almost impossible. However, Kathy and Doug Sellers live in a middle-class suburb. Their neighbors are people to whom they say good morning, with whom they discuss the weather and the crabgrass. That's about the extent of the neighborliness. So that Doug is surprised this evening when Kathy says... Early dinner tonight. We've been invited next door to spend the evening. Oh, the Carters, they invited us over? No, not the Carters. No, next door the other way, oh. the Joneses. Well... They just moved in yesterday. I know. You wouldn't think they'd be ready for guests so soon. But they're completely settled in. I never saw anything like it. Mm. How come you saw it in the first place? Well, I went over there. She's such a little thing. I just thought I'd go over and see if I could help. That was neighborly of you. Well, but there wasn't anything to help with. Mm. You you like her? Mm, she's nice, yes. Her name's Tootie. Tootie? I said we'd come, okay? Oh, sure, of course. He's kind of funny looking. Well, they're, they're quite small, both of them. Yeah, but he, he's, he's got a big head. <laughs> they, I, I know they can't help it, but somehow small people with big heads put me off. Our mystery drama... Through the Looking Glass was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Fielden Farrington and stars Anne Shepard. There is a certain excitement in meeting new people who may or may not turn out to be friends. Friendship, not to be confused with acquaintanceship, requires so many parallels of taste, viewpoints, needs, backgrounds, and the like, that it's quite remarkable we see as much of it as we do. Kathy and Doug Sellers are calling to spend an evening with two strangers who, obviously, 
would like to become friends. Hello, Kathy. Oh, I'm so glad you could both come. Hi, Tootie. This is my husband, Doug. Oh, how do you do? Uh, how, do you, how do you do? Oh, please come in. I want you to meet Sid. Uh, Sid? Oh, he's upstairs. Sometimes he's so slow getting ready for anything. Well, won't you sit down? You really are settled in, aren't you? Uh, it's very nice, too. Everything looks brand new. Oh, yes, it is. Well, can I get you a cup of coffee or... Oh, dear, I don't think we have anything to drink. I mean, that like... oh, coffee's fine. Hello down there. I'll be right with you. Sid, do we have any... You didn't get any whiskey or anything, did you? No, I'm sorry. I, I am sorry. I should have thought of that. We don't drink at all, you see. And it's just easy to forget. That's no excuse. I should have... Oh, been... that's all right. We don't drink either. Not really. Hardly ever. You see, where we come from, people just don't drink. Ah. You must come from a far distance. I'm trying to think of a place where nobody drinks. Well, things are very different here. We're really very... Oh, what is that word, Sid? Uh, backwoodsy. We're very backwoodsy. Yes. Uh-huh. You're... you're... Putting us on, right? We're what? You're putting us on, kidding us. Oh, well, I mean, this, this furniture looks as if it had been designed for uh, t twenty years from now. You <laughs> backwoodsy? Well, the furniture's all new, you know. And you've got it all arranged so quickly. As I told Doug earlier, it looks as though you've been living here for years. And uh, he's right, you know. It's it's very advanced. Is it? Um. Well, is it? It's all right, Tootie. She's so afraid we're going to seem, you know, uh, different. Doc, did you hear what Tootie just told me? Sid's in the same business you're in. No kidding. Are you an inventor, Doc? Well, no, I'm a... Well, more like a designer, actually. Internal combustion engines. Oh, we're not too far apart. As a matter of fact, I'm working on something right now that may put you out of business. Oh? Uh, what would that be? I've got a motor that's powered by solar energy. Oh, by sunlight? Just sunlight? Yes. Well, not the light itself, of course, by the, uh, the emanations. Does it work? Oh, yes. Would you like to see it? See it? I've got a working model down in the basement. A solar energy motor in the basement? Oh, I, I, I see. It doesn't need the direct light. And, and besides, it stores. Do you want to see it? Uh, <laughs> aren't you afraid I'll steal it? I mean, <laughs> if you've got a solar energy engine that really works... No, you... I'm not afraid. Now, now, please don't be offended. I've had to work out some pretty radical new mathematical concepts that... Well, you wouldn't understand them just looking at the model. Nobody would. Okay. I'd love to see it. Good. Come along. The good thing about it is you don't even need a sunny day. All you need is the sun on your side of the earth. Would you like more coffee? If Doug's anything like Sid, they'll be down there for hours. No, I don't think I could handle any more coffee. Thank you. You're right about Doug, though. Um, Where, where did... Um... Sid worked before you came here. I mean, maybe he worked for somebody Doug knows. Well, he didn't actually work for anyone. He's always been just an inventor. Well, Doug knows so many people in the business. We moved around so much before we went to work for Driscoll Motors. I just thought we might have some mutual friends. No. I mean, it doesn't seem likely. We haven't lived anywhere, but, you know, there and now here. Well, uh, where did you live before? It was just, well, like a different world almost. That's why I'm so pleased about tonight. We're the kind of people who just can't live without friends, you know? Mm. We were afraid there wouldn't be anyone we could, well, be friends with. So that makes tonight so good. Oh, Tootie, you don't have to worry. We have a lot of friends you'll probably meet. Where we used to live, we knew everyone. Just everyone. Oh, that must have been nice wherever it was. Oh, yes. It was all we knew, of course. In many ways, it's better here. Much better. It's 
so quiet. How can a motor with any guts to it be so quiet? Like, <laughs> I've heard cats purr louder. Well, there's nothing to make noise, actually, except the friction. And it's very little of that. It's beautiful. Uh, how big would it have to be to power, say, an automobile? How big? <laughs> this engine itself would pull a freight train. So, 12, maybe 15 cars. That little thing? Energy doesn't come in sizes, Doug. With refinements I'm not tooled for here, a motor like this could supply all the electricity a medium-sized city would need. You're kidding. It has implications, as a matter of fact, that could lead to the obsolescence of electricity itself. <laughs> Man, you, you are talking revolution, you know that? It would be a tremendous step. Yes, it would almost certainly entail some dislocation. Dislocation? It would bomb out just about everything our society is based on. Well, the short-term adjustment would be severe, I don't deny that. Temporary chaos. The gain would be long-range, not immediate. Ooh, scares me. <laughs> no kidding, you, you, you don't know what you've got here. Oh, yes, I know. What I have here is a device, a ridiculously simple little device which would make the air we breathe sweet and pure again. Make the oceans, the lakes, and the rivers habitable for marine creatures. Put an end to nervous breakdowns from the sheer clamor of civilization. As you say, destroy everything today's society is based on. Well, uh, today's society isn't exactly utopia, I, I know that, but, uh, Sid, it's the only society we've got. Would you like to see the design on paper? Talk about the math involved. Well, you said I couldn't understand the math anyway. No, 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 I said you couldn't understand it simply from looking at the motor. Actually, like the motor... The math is quite simple. I can't tell you how glad I am that you could come over and just, you know, visit. I'm afraid I've talked too much shop to Doug, though. Huh? Oh, 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 no, no not at all. I'm sorry. I guess I'm sort of preoccupied. Dinner next time, all right? Okay. I'd love to watch that a gadget of yours turn out a whole dinner. Uh, let's go, Kathy. I mean, I do have to... Get to work early tomorrow. Uh, I'll be in touch, Sid. Okay? Good night. Good night. Good night, and thanks again. Did the prove neighbors? What did you say, Tootie? I say, did the prove... Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. We agreed not to speak that way. Not even when we're alone. Oh, I keep forgetting. Did you approve of the neighbors? Yes. On the whole, yes, I, I think so. What did you think of her? Well, it's hard to get used to these big, clumsy people, you know. But I rather liked her. She's a little inquisitive. But I guess that's natural. <laughs> it's nothing I can't handle. He's a good man. He does have that stupid short-sightedness they all have. But I think he'll do. Well... I don't care what you told them about us hardly drinking. I want a good solid slug of bourbon. Okay. Something happened? What? Did he tell you where they're from? Where they moved here from? Uh, no, I don't think so. Well, she's a pretty close-mouthed one. Aren't you even going to put any water or anything with it? He's quite a guy, that Sid. How do you mean? But when Tootie... Uh, the name is that, anyway. But anyway, when, when she called him an inventor, she sure wasn't kidding. Uh, did she say anything about where they came from? I told you I spent the whole evening trying to find out where they're from. But she's slippery as an eel. I didn't get to first base. People don't give things away. You have to be suspicious when a man wants to give something away. I, and I think he was completely cracked, except that crazy math of his works. So does his engine. I don't have any idea what you're talking about. He wants to give it to me. Now, you can't tell me there isn't a catch in that somewhere. He, he just wants to give it to me. The whole thing, no strings attached. Give you what? But he, he's got this machine, this motor, this engine. Designed it, built it himself, he says. Invented it. Draws its power from sunlight, sun rays. Now, it, it, there's a difference. And it's just going to... It's going to blow the whole world up. That's that's all. A bomb? 
You mean a bomb? Oh, no, no, no. Just the opposite, I guess you could say. Only... Good Lord, the mess it could make. It's it's like we made a wrong turn a hundred years ago or so. All of us, our whole society. And, and what he wants to do is to back up and make the proper turn. But you just can't wipe out. It's a very scary thing. Kathy. Hmm. What am I going to do? Well... I don't really understand the problem yet, Doug. Okay, okay. He's got a machine that takes its power from the sun, okay? Okay. Yeah, and that's about the size of a, a small vacuum cleaner, and it, it could power a city. It could. I, I've seen it. I've seen the blueprints. I've learned the math. Learned it, mind you, in, in half an hour. And all our old math, everything I spent my life learning, it's all just silly kid stuff. He wants... Did you say he wants to give all this to you? Now, now figure what it means. Everything we know is down the drain. Now, just think about oil. You've got 50 billion or so barrels of oil tucked away, and you're using it to make the world market go where you want it to go. All of a sudden, your 50 billion barrels of oil aren't worth the price of half a dozen loaves of yesterday's bread. It's not going to make you happy. It's going to make you feel very... Very restless and insecure, or or you manufacture, or all your money is in something or other power and light company, or you, you work in a gas station, or you're a coal miner, or I don't care, you're anything. Whatever you do for a living, it's dead. And Sid wants to give the damn thing to me. <laughs> Maybe I don't blame him. Wouldn't, wouldn't there be a lot of money in it? Not for us? Millions. <laughs> Hell, more like billions. Take it. I'm not even sure money would have much value anymore. Apart from everything else, I've got this feeling I'm... I'm being used. There's a very good chance that Doug is being used. In a good cause, perhaps, but used all the same. There's a worn-out old cliché that says you can't make an omelet without breaking an egg. All well and good. But what if the egg that's getting broken is the world you've grown up in? The only world you know. It could make you feel pretty uncomfortable. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. Doug Sellers didn't have a very good night's sleep. He and Kathy spent most of what was left of the night talking about their new next-door neighbors, Sid and Tootie Jones. That is an odd name, Tootie, isn't it? At any rate, Doug's mood isn't the best this morning. I'm going to have a talk with old Driscoll today. About Sid's gadget? The solar mm -hmm. thing? About how hard the guy's working trying to give it away. There's something spooky about that. I don't like being spooked. You said Sid's crazy to give the thing away. Aren't you doing the same thing if you tell Mr. Driscoll? If I decide to take that nutty engine from Sid, and, and I haven't made my mind up yet. I, I couldn't possibly handle it on my own. It's going to take a lot of money to get a solar-powered motor in production. I'm not even sure Driscoll Motors is big enough. But won't you have to give some of it to Mr. Driscoll if you bring him into it? Only if I decide to accept from Sid. And if I do... The whole thing was a gift to me in the first place. Well, I just thought... Oh, well. You know best. If you want the truth, I don't know a damn thing. Except that I'm sitting on a cake of very high explosive, and it's making me very uneasy. So, that's it, Mr. Driscoll. The motor works. I saw it work, and it's just... You, you wouldn't believe it without seeing it. I studied the engine, too, and it, it would be simpler to make than most of what we're doing now. Simplest thing you ever saw, really. Except it's, it's based on a completely new concept. Hmm. My first reaction, Doug, is nonsense. <laughs> sure, that'd be anybody's first reaction. But not yours? Well, mine at first, yes. But then I saw the damn thing, Mr. Driscoll. I saw it. No doubt in your mind now? No, not, I'm as skeptical by nature as you are. But the thing works. And it's going to knock everything we know right out the window. Well... <laughs> That won't be permitted, of course. Well, what I'm interested in now is... He offered you all rights? 
Yes. You sign any papers, either of you? No, I, I said I wanted time to think it over. You say this thing works, and I'm prepared to take your word for it. I want 50% of the rights, straight down the middle. You agree to that? Well, sure, I'm but I... call Al Dobson. He can get the ball rolling faster than anybody I know. I'll get Ed Cahill moving on it, too. And, well, when can you get this, uh, what's his name, the inventor in here? Uh, look, uh, Mr. Disco, all I wanted to do was to tell you about this thing and ask your advice. Now, as you've you... told me, and I'm advising you. Now, you pass the ball to me, and I run with it, right? Mr. Driscoll, I don't have a ball to pass. I just... If you don't have a ball, we know where it is. Your inventor has fumbled it, and we'll take it over. He's no businessman, Sid. Would he have offered to give you a thing like solar energy if he were a businessman? Well, the thing oh, is... Oh, maybe we don't actually have the ball yet, but we... Yeah, look, Mr. Driscoll, you said... Well, what was it you said? I told you it was going to knock everything we know right out the window, and you said that wouldn't be permitted. Now you talk as if you want to go ahead with it. It'll be suppressed. Don't you worry about that, Doug boy. They'll buy us out. Oh. You think the oil industry would let a gadget like this go on the market? <laughs> Not in a million years. And the auto manufacturers? Good Lord. Think what it would mean to them, just the retooling alone. Don't you worry about it, Doug. They'll buy us out. I don't think Sid Jones will go along with it. He'll go along. I told you, he's fumbled. When you fumble, you lose the ball. Oh, hello, Kathy. Hi. I washed the breakfast dishes, did two loads of laundry, and vacuumed the living room. I figured it was time to take a break. Do you mind? Oh, mind? No, I'm delighted. Come on in. Mm -hmm. Let's go in the sitting room. Oh, living room. Oh, which do you call it? Living room. It doesn't matter. Well, anyway, come on in and sit down. <sighs> I didn't have anything to do either. I was just... Oh, I forgot to turn off the... Uh, the uh, uh, television. That's a television set? Oh, you know, Sid. It's one of his inventions. He'll drive me crazy with his inventions one of these days. But the screen's the wrong shape. It's so big. It, it looks... What it looks like when you when you turn it off is a full-length mirror. Well, that's the idea, I guess. People would rather have a mirror in their sitting room than a box with that big blank screen staring at them. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't try to keep up with Sid's inventions. Doug says he's very good. Oh, yes. He's good. Doug says he's uh, way ahead of his time. Ahead of his time? Yeah. You know, uh, inventing things the world just isn't ready for yet. Like that solar energy thing. Well, he is very advanced in his thinking. Yes. Sid is very advanced. And he's worried about the... Oh, what do you call it? The, uh... uh the ecology. You know... A uh, tootie. Doug was very upset last night. Oh? Sid wanted to give him that solar energy thing. I mean, you just hand it over to him. Let him take out the patents and take all the credit and make all the money. Oh. Sid didn't tell me he'd gone that far. Why would anybody want to do a thing like that, Tootie? You know, it, it looks funny. Actually... How it looks to Doug is suspicious. Why doesn't Sid apply for the patents himself? That's what anybody else would do. He can't. He can't. We're not... Uh, we aren't American citizens. Well, I, I don't... I can't see what difference that would make, really. There are plenty of American patents held by people who are citizens of other countries. Doesn't Sid know that? Well, we're... Oh, Kathy, I don't know exactly what they'd call us. Unregistered aliens. Something like that. We're actually not in the country legally. We, we don't have any papers or any of that. I see. Tootie, uh, where are you from? I can't tell you. Maybe Sid will want to later on. I, I expect.
Perhaps he will. But I'm afraid I've already told you more than he'd want me to right now. Damn it, Doug. What is this thing you're all rolling? Didn't tell him a damn thing except it was a solar-powered motor. And he had me back on the phone 20 minutes later. 20 minutes. Saying the thing was already out of hand and he had to know more. Out of hand? Uh... They want it. Everybody wants it. Ed Cahill says... Ed, Ed Cahill, the patent lawyer? They called him. The patent office called him. Now, you can believe that or not, but that's what Ed Cahill told me. They've been hearing talk about solar energy down there, they said, and they called him. Well, it looks like... Somebody's the... pushing this thing. That's what it looks like to me. Somebody very big. Well, after all, solar power... I is... want you to see this, uh, whatever his name is, this kook that's trying to give the rights away. I want you to get this paper signed. What is it? Don't waste time reading it. It's a simple release. Later on, there'll be reams of paperwork, but right now, I want that release signed. All right, Mr. Driscoll. And Doug. Yes. If you don't get that release signed, or if this nutty solar thing turns out to be phony, I'm going to bury you so deep they'll never dig you out. I should never have talked to Driscoll about Sid's invention. What happened? Oh, hell broke loose. As nearly as I can figure, Driscoll's committed himself in two or three places without having a damn thing to deliver. Everything's moving so fast, it's... It's a mess, that's all. Dear, I, uh, talked to Tootie this morning, like you said. Mm hmm You find out anything? They're, uh... They're what she called unregistered aliens. She said that herself. They're in the country illegally. Oh, good Lord. Doug, what does it mean? I don't know what it means. Trouble, that's for sure. That was why he wanted to turn the invention over to you, Tootie said. He doesn't have any papers or anything. I mean, you know, no ID, no social security, nothing. And he knew he'd get into trouble, I guess, if he started messing around with patents and all that. Uh, he's in trouble, all right. Why? Uh, you going to do something about it? I'm going to call Driscoll and tell him. Oh, Doug, do you think you ought to? Couldn't you just... Oh, poor Sid. What about him, Doug? I'm afraid that'll just have to be his problem. I've got a couple of my own. Well, but do, do you have to tell Mr. Driscoll? Look, I've been working for Driscoll for over eight years. I'm one of the top men in the company. I met Sid for the first time last night. Now, which one am I supposed to be loyal to? Yes, Driscoll here. Uh, Mr. Driscoll, this is Doug Sellers. Did you get uh, that release signed? Uh, not yet. I, I just found out something I think you ought to know. Uh, the inventor, Sid Jones, uh... The guy's not an American citizen. He's in the country illegally. Say that again. He's in this country illegally. A spy. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm sure it's nothing like that. He's, uh, I, I know him, Mr. Driscoll. I, I don't think he's a spy. I might have known. Solar energy, my foot. He's a lousy spy. That thing of his is probably some kind of bomb or something. He's made you believe oh, that... Oh, come on, Mr. Driscoll. I'm not that stupid. That engine that I saw last night was... All right, I'll fix his wagon. You watch me. Thinks he can make a fool of Thomas P. Driscoll, does he? What are you going to do? Never you mind. Oh, boy. What do you say? He's decided Sid's a spy. I guess he means to blow the whistle on him. You don't think he is, do you? Sid? A spy? No, I... Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. Shouldn't we go over and tell them? I mean, after all, if, if they're in trouble, it's our fault, too, isn't it? Well, at least it's partly our fault. Yes, things seem to be moving along very nicely. Nicely? Sid, he thinks you're a spy. Oh, Tootie, I'm sorry, but... Well, I, I always tell Doug everything, you know. It's all right, Kathy. Oh, please don't feel badly about it, either of you. It's all right. The uh, patent office was interested, you say. That sounds very good. Don't you think you ought to... Look, I, I mean, old Driscoll is going to do something. And that's for sure. And if you're not in this country legally... It's you... all right, Doug. Really, it is. Did you say this Mr. Driscoll gave you a paper he wanted me to sign? Well, yes. Uh, do you have it with you? Yes. Sid, mm -hmm. there is something very odd about all this. I, I mean, you're giving away... A... Sid, do, do you realize what you're giving away? 
Yes. But tell them, Sid. Don't you think they have a right to know after all that's happened? Yes. I want to show you something, Doug. You and Kathy. Oh, the TV. It's another of his inventions, Doug. The television. Did I tell you about that? Mm, I don't think so. I, I don't remember. Actually, it isn't a television set at all, except as you break the word down. Tell her for distant, distant seeing. Even so, it isn't that kind of distance. And I get only one picture on it. Always the same picture. Only one picture? Yes. I'll show you. That's the picture. Oh, it's not very pretty, is it? Looks more like a moonscape than anything else. Except for those mounds or domes or whatever they are scattered around. How come it's black and white? There isn't any color there, Doug. In the scene we're watching, you'd see it if there were. It's just gray. There's no color at all. Is it a, a movie? A science fiction movie or something like that? Oh, no. It's quite real. Well, it can't be the moon unless... Unless the other side has put domes up there and we don't know about it. No, it isn't the moon. Tell them, Sid. It's our home. Tootie's and mine. That's where we came from. That's where we've always lived. An alien world, old enough and weathered enough to look like our moon... Well, we've all heard or read stories about such places. That was fiction, of course. But it hasn't been so very long since it was only in fiction that men put on space suits and blasted off from Earth and later walked on the moon. Today's science fiction has an unsettling way of becoming tomorrow's fact. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Doug and Kathy Sellers are watching spellbound, but more than a little repelled, a television picture. Something like a television picture, at least, on a screen that becomes a full-length mirror when it's turned off. The picture is a dismal one, a bleak landscape, gray, rocky, and barren as the moon's surface except for several dome-like structures placed here and there at apparent random. This, Sid and Tooty Jones claim, is their home. There's no place like that on this planet, Sid. No place that I ever saw or heard of. It's on this Earth. We're not space travelers. Oh, I don't blame you for wanting to leave it wherever it is. Well, if you're not space travelers, then what kind of travelers are you? Uh, let's all sit down. It's a long story. Shall I turn it off, Sid? No, no, no. Leave it on. Uh, somebody might come out of one of the domes. They'd be interested in that. What kind of traveler, Sid? You've already guessed it, I think. Y yes, we're time travelers. Time travelers? Then where... I mean, when is that? That picture you've got on the screen? Uh, two questions there, really. Where and when. To answer the first, it's right here, Doug. Right in this very neighborhood, on this very spot. Well, then... When? Yeah. The year you're looking at is 3987. A little over 2,000 years from now. And that's... That's what this neighborhood looks like? That's what the whole world looks like, Doug. Worse. <laughs> this is a garden spot. Oh, it's some kind of trick, isn't it? I mean... It's just something you invented. More like something you invented. You, all of you, and the next few generations. That's misuse of the Earth's resources. All of your mistakes carried out to their final inevitable conclusion. You're looking at the end product of your era's short-sightedness. I... I just don't believe it. Well, there it is. You can see it. Well, then it wasn't the... Uh, it, it wasn't bombed out? The A-bomb, the H-bomb, all the alphabetical bombs that came after. No, they were never used. Except to waste the Earth's substance and terrify its people. There, on the screen. Somebody's coming out of the B-7 dome. Can you see who it is, Sid? Oh, not to be sure. 
4X most likely. I think it was his turn at B7. What's he wearing that thing for? Looks like a space suit. Well, that's what it is. We call them Atmo suits. There's no atmosphere now. None, at least, that's breathable. Except underground, where we convert it. Good Lord. Yes, we live underground. We come out now only to run tests. The toxicity of what's left of the atmosphere isn't very stable. We have to draw it in and purify it, so we need to keep abreast of what we're up against. And pump the impurities back out? Yes. And that increases the toxicity? Yes. The problem isn't solved. We're living by stopgap measures. We have some time, though. There's a lot of air out there, even though most of it is poison. And there aren't very many people to breathe what we salvage. How many? Well, in B7... Oh, no, uh, you mean worldwide? Yeah, yeah. Oh, around 700,000, between seven and eight. In the whole world? <laughs> Actually, that's a lot. It was down closer to 100,000 when we finally got the underground communities established. We were that close to extinction. We're the only survivors. Everything else is gone. We're here on a mission. You must have realized that. What kind of a mission? A very simple one. We're here to save the world. Sergeant Wilson. Yeah, I want to talk to the chief of police. He's out of town. What, what can I do for you? Listen, I'm Thomas P. Driscoll of Driscoll Motors. I want to report a spy. Report a spy. You'd like to give me the details? I can only give the chief the details. No way, Mr. Driscoll. I offer you a spy, a genuine spy, and you won't put me... A... All right. All right. I'm coming over there. By God, I pay my taxes and I'm entitled. I'll be over there in ten minutes. Did you say save the world? You're here to save that world 2,000 years from now? That world, which of course is simply this one grown old. That's a dead world. It's beyond saving in our time. We have a few hundred thousand people living inside it. Like people on one of your life rafts. If the people on the raft aren't rescued, they'll die. The same with our people. They'll die, or their grandchildren will, or their grandchildren. We few have survived the catastrophe temporarily. And so you've come back here, back to our time with... With the, the only treatment that can possibly save the world. We have a cure for its sickness, and we mean to administer it. Uh, call me... One of the doctors, there are many of us. Many of you? Oh, yes, one man could never do it. Your Mr. Driscoll was very right about that, Doug. We have many people in this time, some of them in very high places where pressure can be applied, where red tape can be bypassed. Uh, speaking of Driscoll, Sid, I, I think you ought to... Don't know. worry about it. It isn't important. Now, will you let me sign that paper he gave you? All right. I've read that the people of your time set great store by pieces of paper with signatures on them. What are these numbers you put under the signature? Oh, that's just to make it thoroughly legal. That's my designation in my own time. 6D48M. We have numbers instead of names, although we still use nicknames. Mine actually is Sid from 6D. My designation is 2T93K. 2D. 2T. <laughs> that's... Kind of a cute name, though, once you get used to it. Well, if you had time travel, I mean, why did you wait until the world got into such a state? A time translation is a relatively recent discovery. But why this particular time? I mean, why not earlier or later? Oh, no, irreversible damage has been done at this time. As a matter of fact, it was at this time and point that the depletion of resources began accelerating so rapidly that it got out of control. Any later would have been too late... Well, much earlier, you wouldn't have had the technology needed to use what we wanted to give you. I hope I haven't spoiled it for you. For all of us. No. If it doesn't work, it's nobody's fault but my own. I made the decisions. It was my assignment. I told you I'd get to the chief, and you said he was out of town. Orders, Mr. Driscoll. I still don't know why he took me off the desk and handed me the job. It's FBI work. Well, don't you worry about that, Wilson. 
you think the two of us will be enough? I mean, if he should decide to shoot his way out or something like that. There are two carloads of good men following us. The house will be surrounded when we go in, and there won't be a chance of his getting away. Yes, there's a car stopping out in front now. Tootie, will you turn the screen off? I already did. Oh, Lord, it's old Thomas P. himself. Mr. Driscoll. And the cop. Odd. I thought it would be your FBI. Oh, Mr. Driscoll looks very determined. Mad as a wet hen, that's how he looks. Well, he shouldn't be angry. He may make a great deal of the money you people prize so highly. Oh, you will too, of course, if things work out. How can things work out if they're coming to pick you up? There are many others, as I told you. My being found out shouldn't affect anything. Uh, maybe you could still get out the back way, Sid. Oh, I... oh I'm sure we're surrounded. Oh, people are very impatient in 1975. I'll let them in. It's your name, Sid Jones? Oh, that's what I'm called, yes. Won't you come in? Put the cuffs on him, why don't you? He's your spy. What are you waiting for? Jones, is it true that you showed uh, Mr. Uh, Sellers, is it, that you showed him an, an invention of yours last night? Oh, yes, it's still down in the basement if you'd like to take a look at it. Sergeant, you'll be making a great mistake if you arrest this man. Have you lost your mind? Sergeant, I can prove beyond any question that I am not a spy. Will you allow me to show you the proof? Watch him, Wilson. He's up to something. We got only your word, Mr. Driscoll. Go ahead, Jones. Thank you. Judy, will you help me with this? Wilson, are you out of your head? Uh, what's back of that looking glass, Jones? What, what's the glass got to do with this? Well, that's what I'd like to show you. There's no danger, I assure you. No danger, he I says. Just don't try anything. Tootie? The third button? Yes, the third button. What's happening? That, that's no mirror. Look at that thing. It was turning all milky, foggy. Wilson, why don't you do something? He can't get away. Give the guy a chance. I think it's ready now, Tootie. Stop her! For God's sake, somebody stop her. She's disappearing into that looking glass thing. Goodbye, Doug. Goodbye, Kathy. Thank you very much, both of you, for all you've done. Stop right there, Jones. Stop or I'll... Or you'll what? He's gone, you idiot! You let him walk right through that looking glass. It's changing again. It's... Look, Kathy, it, it's making a picture. Oh, my God. A park. It's a beautiful park with trees and flowers and people walking around. And not in those miserable spacesuits either. No. It's bright, pretty clothes. And children... Play. Oh, Doug, it... It must... Look! There's a dog, a little poodle. For God's sake, what kind of mirror is that? Break through it, you fool. Smash it. I don't care what it is. Smash I, it. I guess you're right. Now, please stand aside, all of you. What are you going to do with that gun? Just use the butt of it to break the glass, ma'am. Now, please stand clear. There's nothing back there but the wall. Just a plain blank wall. Oh, um. Uh... I, I almost forgot. Here's that release you wanted Sid to sign, Mr. Driscoll. I don't want the damn thing. I don't want anything to do with him and his 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 magic mirrors. I I don't want any part of any of it. I don't think you really have a choice, Mr. Driscoll. That was a park we saw through the looking glass before the sergeant here smashed it. And if they have a park, we have solar energy. We couldn't change it if we wanted to. A park where there was a desolate wasteland only a few minutes ago. But wait, it wasn't a few minutes ago at all, was it? It was over 2,000 years in the future. And what this implies is that there are at least two quite different futures, both possible. Which in turn implies that we have, at this exact point in world history, reached a crossroad. I'll be back shortly. Perhaps 
perhaps we shouldn't be surprised if uh, one day before too terribly long, we hear that solar energy is in the process of being harnessed. In any case, I believe that 6D48M, alias Sid Jones, has given us something to think about. Let's hope the right people do the right kind of thinking. Our cast included Anne Shepard, Jack Grimes, Evie Juster, Russell Horton, and Ken Harvey. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Thank <laughs> you.